And uh, so with that, I will look forward to one of uh, the gentlemen providing myself with the link inside of the text. And uh, we'll take it from there. Yes, I'll, I'll get it. I, I just don't see it at the moment. Give me. It takes me. It usually takes. I usually have a little bit of lag when sure. it comes to this. I okay. I got it. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Let me mute that, and I shall give you the link in a second. Wonderful. All right. Okay. So well, here's when we start talking trivia. Yes, yes. And uh, start us off in trivia because I get the feeling that my trivia stuff will wind up going deep because I do have many questions for yourself, Douglas. You're kidding. Really? Jesus, with all the other things. <laughs> That's a, uh, well, you can give it a try. I don't know if, I'd, uh, if uh, I'm, uh, well, you know, well, let's well, see if I, we can hear. Hold on for a second. Well, let's start see if talking I can... trivia. There we are. Yes. So we do hear an echo. Good. Um, let me get right. the share link and uh so uh this this stuff is that is it like trivia stuff you wanted to ask or, or stuff well, that it's it might be it might not be um i was wondering what do you know about the uh what do you call it the at t they call it the long tower uh it's at uh 33 thomas street it's supposed to be this building that's supposed to be nuclear proof oh yeah new york yeah, 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 I walk past it all the time. I, I had no idea what it was until like the other day. Oh, yeah, well, you're not alone in that. Everybody was thinking it was uh, some kind of uh, NSA building or uh, this, this some kind of uh, men in black type affair. But uh, the reality is that it's a uh, it's a corporate communications facility uh, because of the uh, the necessity to keep communications going during an emergency. Uh, they're actually uh, doing New York uh, a solid by making certain that that building is the most impervious of all of the uh, structures in New York in case yeah, there's an electromagnetic if pulse. Building, if that building were to go down, that would, that would affect affair, international uh, communication. Yeah, probably. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's connected. I wouldn't say that the whole world is connected to to that building, but quite a bit of it is. Yes, through New York. Yes, so uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, it's an impressive building, and it looks ominous as hell. Yes, I, I love the design of it. Uh, they, they, I believe they call that architecture style brutalism. Yes, yes, it it, it certainly. I love it. It's, yeah, it's it's, it's 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 like the fucking most badass goth gothed out like black metal looking building you can imagine yes 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 all they need to do is paint it black and this shit would be fucking dope oh i like it the way it is but uh you know. <laughs> and uh so i'm going to be uh dealing with the promotional banners for now so um i invite anyone to uh you know fill the bandwidth with trivia without distracting myself at the moment because it's so hard for me to multitask especially after the usual stresses of simply trying to get on uh and uh so now live and burning bandwidth and uh i go got on. a little bit of trivia mm -hmm. um in in the news supposedly humpback whales have been spotted in the new york harbor great you know, and and uh there there have been pictures seen like uh i saw pictures of it like outside of the statue of liberty like it's pretty interesting Supposedly, the food source that they eat has actually gone further in towards this, the urban development areas, which oh. is like outside of Manhattan, outside of Staten Island, you know, New York Harbor. So it's it's quite interesting to see, to, to know that they're um down there. Yeah, and uh, what uh, hey, how did this? Uh, you've seen also what Jess Roge put up a uh, a link to, uh, but of course I've, I've heard this elsewhere as well that. Uh, there is a beaked whale that they feel may be a new species that they're just now sighting because of all. Oh, the... wow, really? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. These are some great. <laughs> I've seen about that, too. These yeah. Some nice times to be alive, man. I love it. Yes. Yes. I'm excited. Okay. So, uh, so, okay, good. Peter Moon is finally responding. So that is good. And he is saying he'll be okay, ready. Get back on. What was that? What's up, brother? I was just saying, what's happening? How you doing? Uh, good. I'm uh, same as always, making tamales. Just 
doing all these smileys right now. I uh, I had one of my daughter's friends come over today and help out, and was able to speed up the process probably by like a uh, couple hours. So pretty cool, pretty productive day. Been at it since about 9 a.m. And uh, that's wonderful. Uh, so both of you, Derek and Pacwan, I gave a link to that uh, Chicago uh, article because I thought both of you could relate where they were talking about uh, dealing with COVID by staying indoors and um, I guess making tamales. Is, is yeah, what... making tamales, yeah. I see that. And you know what's funny, Douglas, is that's uh, literally uh, a lot of, and I, I see it I see it on Facebook all the time with like a lot of my friends and people that have bought tamales or the family, now they're making tamales. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's cute. I like that. I like it. That is. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually it's it's a holiday thing though. Every every especially Christmas time, that's like big with the with uh like Mexican heritage is tamales. You know, uh, I guess it, right, as of recently past couple of years they've adopted it during uh, Thanksgiving or you know even if they don't celebrate Thanksgiving they just you know have dinners with their families and stuff just you know because that's you know trending. But uh, they still have tamales. You know. Yes. So, yeah. Those are two big holidays. I do it. Oh, actually, three, three through the years: uh, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and uh, Easter. Wow. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Very uh, generally, uh, how would I say it? Sacred kind of holidays, in a sense. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, Thanksgiving, of course, has its controversies, but we won't go there right now. <laughs> we try to see the pleasant. Uh, and uh, Did you guys know that they found a uh, they found a species of bee in Australia that's blue. Cool. Yes, I, I think I heard that, that but I didn't. So, yeah, that is so amazing. They call it the blue band banded bee. Mm -hmm. Wow, amazing. And uh, I know that there's some really big specimens that uh, I, I forgot where I read about them, uh, but uh, it's amazing the insect. What's that? What's that, Derek? So I'll try to look that up. The, the yes. Blue, blue. Yes. We'll talk about blue honey. Huh. That's a, that's a pun, by the way, for all the people listening. And uh, <laughs> yes, uh, having to deal with Brendan Zogid and his psychedelic mushrooms. Yes, that he. Uh, oh yeah, the shrooms. Yes. Did you guys did you guys see that they uh, they developed that quantum device that performs 2.6 billion years of uh, yeah. computation yeah, for minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yo, I think I, I actually brought that up last week, I think. Um, or was it like the recent transmission? I, I don't remember. But yeah, yeah. Um, that's what that's crazy. Think. Yeah. Do you know, do you know, like all the all like to, to have that much computation in four minutes? That's like uh, that's uh, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. <laughs> yes. No, it's very, also very, very awesome. dangerous. Because, you know, look at, if, if we think of, uh, I always think of these things like a child, mm -hmm. sort of like, and then this is sort of where I have this childish naivete, but I always think about what we can do with it as far as, you know, creative, creating things. Right? Right at this point, it's, it's nothing that can be done with it. It's what can it do with us now? <laughs> I mean, that's four minutes. How long has this been, how long has this thing been on yes. that it hasn't yes. already, uh, figure these these equations or other things out you know well like, the, 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 that's the already, it's built into the system like you know well, the, like that's the, something that's uh yeah the ability yeah. to calculate very fast is not the ability to think so this is not a thinking machine it's simply a very very extraordinarily astronomically incalculably fast calculator that's what it is and uh, you know, uh, uh say yeah. Yeah. facing the environmental environmental challenges that we're facing today yes. we need something that can calculate yes. that yes yes, yes. i thought it was something like well because when, when when i hear quantum when i hear quantum you know something's quantum i i automatically assume it, for it to be quantum it has to be uh some form of uh sense have some kind of sentient to it you know that, that has to be self-aware or know that it's a machine or you know just just something to calculate 2.5 billion years worth of data in four minutes it's like lots of uh processing going on you know different different possibilities outcomes or you know just yes it's very powerful but it's uh it's it's simply it, it really just number crunching at the moment and uh in terms of the communist chinese we don't even know if what they're saying is true so the, uh, yeah. the, the point is that uh, it was decades agone 
in United Germany that they uh, developed teleportation. And uh, after that, uh, they just got the house nigger Michu Kaku to go out and, uh, and try to decry it and claim, oh, it's not really teleportation when it, that's exactly what they developed. And uh, just because you have that, um, the first question was what to do with it because they're obviously not, the Germans weren't, weren't teleporting in any great size or quantity. They were simply doing it at the molecular level. And uh, the molecular level, I mean, literally just uh, quite small bits, but there was where the magic lay. They were going to use that to just sling info or data bits so that would do it instantaneously that would be uh, equal to this machine or faster depending on how it was applied be faster yeah right, and, well, and that's like what they're yeah. they're just not promoting like they're like they just uh figured that one out too uh if like it, it wasn't just this year but it's like i think like the past two years you know where they they successfully teleported uh what was that just like uh it was. It wasn't even. It wasn't nothing major. Something, but, uh, on, something on a quantum scale. Yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah. Exactly. Well, that's that's exactly. major. That's major. But it's not. It's not the what we are ultimately. <clears throat> what we ultimately. It's not cutting edge. It's not cutting edge. Well, yeah. well, I mean, it's no, not. That, well, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. they're just now promoting that they yeah. figure that out. But clearly, the Germans had to figure it figured out. You know. Right. What, and, and and then the, sixty, seventy years ago. Oh God! It was like no. Um, well, in terms of the computing, that's very different from what you're thinking of now. When you're thinking about World War II and you're thinking about something similar to primitive anti-gravitics or the um, what was. Um, the, the, the what they were dealing with with Diglok or the the bell system uh that was of course uh Wright brothers level in terms of experimenting with very vast and powerful um forces but uh when it comes to the uh, uh the the teleportation that was comparatively recent but also very long time ago we're talking about it had to be uh fuck 90s. It, it had to be in the 90s yeah yes that's correct yes it had to be the 90s thank you <laughs> thank you that was good i i couldn't have gotten that out without you uh so it was around the 1990s the psychic here. <laughs> yeah and they never um uh a after that um while the americans spent all this time decrying it and trying to claim that it was nothing uh the um the united germans es essentially put it under wraps for obviously for national security reasons What's been done with it since that point is is unknown, and and um, so what? The, that, but obviously they haven't done anything with it that has impacted the world scene. Uh, but uh, one would think that they would have tried to come up with uh, this kind of number crunching or calculations with their machinery, um, and maybe they simply maybe somehow got lost in some kind of black budget development, uh, like black hole like the americans do with their projects i mean the americans have all kinds of uh technological advancements that i brought before that uh could render all kinds of things safer on the battlefield for the troops and uh and and uh then they uh uh I, let me tell brent i'll bring one but they never put them in the field uh you know so there you have it i mean they remain in this research and development black hole uh, I will bring you on. So let me tell you this. I will bring you on. All right. And so let me. Um, okay. So let's go and bring Brandon Zogit on. Just take this and. Uh, all right. Try and work with this. Okay. See if I remember how to do this without screwing myself up. And uh, Brandon Zogit, here we are. Crystal River should come on again soon, but she's so iffy in terms of her schedule. So uh, we'll see what happens with uh, Brendan, and he can help take us to the top of the hour because he's only here on his lunch break. He says he has to obtain food. Okay, a um, few minutes. All right, just tell me when. I'll tell, just tell me when. There we are. So, uh, yeah, so other than that, the, um, the Chinese communist uh, computing uh, system, which is doing the crunching at such high rates, um, I don't understand how, if they have that, why, the, um, why this is something that uh, cannot flexing. be. They're basically flexing, just like, uh, Putin, just like Putin was flexing when he did that whole spiel, you know, 
around the time Trump took office, he was saying how his uh, they have these new nuclear warheads that can do such and such. They're flexing. Yeah, well, the the, the nuclear warheads is is just kind of Jeez. bullshit. <laughs> kind of, it's like. Mr. 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 Ping has to have his uh, pissing con. He has to, you know, throw his dick size in there because, you know, this is, this is what these guys do. I mean, uh, in the worst case <laughs> scenario, at any rate, uh, they they take over the world, and so what? Because at that point, uh, they'll they're just going to choke on it. <laughs> I mean, imagine them trying to enforce that level of. Uh, of uh, surveillance that they have in mainland China and the rest of the world all together. And it was just like, it, nobody oh, would stand man. for it. And at that point, they just no. collapse. I mean, uh, it'll, it'll be like the video game home front. If anything, uh, the, you know, the majority of the world will have a blast just blowing things up, like, uh, you know, <laughs> telecommunications towers or whatever 5G that they set up. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it would just be... It, take a look at their Belt and Road Initiative is, is already kind of running into those kinds of problems uh, just by people being unable to pay for it. So uh, they, they just try and put everybody into debt and all the rest of that. Anyhow, you get my point. It would be just as big of a mess if they, if they did that as anything else. Uh, but uh, aside from all of that, um, so uh, trivia, of course, you're, you're welcome to get back on the road to trivia till Brendan gets his food and scarfs down enough before he decides to speak. Uh, mm. all right. well, and by the way, uh, Selena Khan did such a wonderful job with the 3D as always. Selena Khan, you're an angel. And of course, you're my guardian angel. I love you dearly. Thank you so much, honey. Yeah, that technology is pretty cool. Um, it would be pretty interesting to use that 3D uh, stuff to to make sigils for spell casting. That would be interesting. <laughs> That'd be pretty sick. Um, I, I wonder how much it costs. Um, I mean, Selena pays for it, uh, but I, I suppose you could you could you know just get it from Facebook like she does, or find it someplace else. There must be a way I, to download. There are ways to rip it offline, of course, but I don't want to speak about that too openly because <clears throat> I am, after all, as the rest of you, surveilled. <laughs> That's right. Well, we all are now at this point. Uh, yeah. Any, anybody so, affiliated? Uh, I, I guess. I guess uh, the, the 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 people in well, there are no people in that tower. It, it's literally just machines. But that tower can have fun just just collecting massive loads of data data about me for no reason that's going to serve no purpose whatsoever right no i um i i i think people go in and out but it's not i wouldn't say it was heavily staffed i wouldn't say it was no. heavily staffed and I, yeah, I, yeah you know there are yeah there are well to get in you need a card so it has a card entry yeah. so they do have that level of security oh you at least without putting a card in yeah at, at least if anything i would think that one of the and regular the buildings right across the street so i mean oh, of course nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna do any stupid shit yeah yeah i mean uh at any rate uh but it's just a, it's just a good play it's just a good you know i i would think you know if 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 shit was gonna hit the fan and things were just going helter skelter that'd be a good building to take a refuge in yes almost certainly well, certainly, unless, of course, some fire happened in the building or something, uh, then it, it, yeah. it, it, any of those data places, whenever you've got some kind of fire that takes place, uh, you'll you'll wish you were dead rather than being in the building. Uh, because uh, you want, to, want to be in around the block and that stuff. <laughs> well, well what place. I mean to say is that if you're inside, what happens is they uh, basically flood the place with this foam that I, I saw these training uh, uh, videos on, on, on that uh, for the security who worked in such buildings. And uh, the uh, you, you only hope is to hit the floor and just lay flat. And then the, the foam just, you know, basically compresses you. <laughs> you know, I mean, like it literally floods the place and compresses you and, and pretty much chokes all the oxygen out of your lungs by just, uh, you know, depriving you of it because it like... Uh, uh, essentially is trying to smother whatever fire there may be to protect as much of the components of everything as possible and therefore all the, the data within the components. So uh, it, uh, the, the job is to suck all the oxygen out of the room so it can literally perhaps potentially collapse your lungs or, you know, uh, it, it's just one of those things that uh, you, there's a lot of potential for bad things to happen. Of course, at the worst, you would... Um, you would suffocate to death. <laughs> I 
and you bet if you survived, you might have a collapsed lung or two, uh, potentially, uh, or uh, uh, I understand it'd be exceedingly painful, uh, you, you, what other results might, might happen, so... Uh, it was just, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was because I, I never had a position in one of those buildings, so I never had to prepare myself for, for such a potential. But uh, it, it sounded really bad, and uh, so I just kind of laughed at it and, and just felt sorry for whoever had those contracts. But, um, you know, the chances of that, that happening are very minimal, but then again, they, they increase with each passing day as such places become targets for potential terrorism, right? So, mm. It's a good point. It's yeah. Good point. So uh, anyhow, so I I don't understand why Brian Brendan uh, bothers to like write me these bizarre like updates. All he has to do is uh, you know tell me when, but instead he's like saying, "Welcome to the car." Five minutes. It's like uh, you know I don't know, just say it to him again. Anyhow, we are officially starting the program right now. We may have. Uh, uh, we will have Brendan joining us within a matter of a few minutes, but I want to thank everyone for um, driving me to fill the bandwidth with trivia to the top of the hour uh, by bringing up several issues. And uh, now that we are at the top, I will officially thank um, the lovely Selena Khan for, as always, putting our promotional banners in three dimensions. And uh, she is an angel and uh, my own guardian angel and uh, nothing could be done without her. Mwah. And, uh, and and so aside uh, from that, I do want to um, bring Pack One more or less on to just uh, start us off uh, just before Brendan gets here, and then if Brendan comes, we'll interrupt Pack One, have Bre Brendan do his bit, and then go back to Pack One, just so he can update us on what's going on. And uh, because and then we'll bring on Selena Khan because of. Uh, uh, her own time limits, and then uh, Derek, and then Jameson, uh, and uh, we're just going to have everybody kind of update us in uh, the latest roundtable, so uh, Selena Khan is uh, returning my affections in the private messages, God bless her, and uh, I love her dearly, so with that, pack one, uh, before Brandon comes and joins us and rudely interrupts you, what is, uh, how's, how's your family, and how are things going with the vaccines and everything else? Yes, uh, we're good. Everything is good. Um, my wife is still working just as much as ever. Uh, at this point, her whole patient list is nothing but COVID patients. There's, I mean, you have you have essentially what would be normal patients, but not as not as much now. Uh, it tends in the field, uh, in the medical field, you get uh, what what pe they would consider pain seekers, which are just like our frequent flyers, also they call them, but just people who like pretty much have a long-standing uh, condition, fake condition, whatever, and they always admit themselves in the hospital. You find that more locally, like in urban cities like Flint or whatever, just people getting off the street so that they're not in the cold, you know. They get checked up, they get meals, uh, they get pain medication. Um, one of the one of the tell signs is they always ask for that that one with the D the the um, dot dial it dial it. Oh, right. I know what it is. Right. I know what that, it's called. That, that, it's called that, that, dilated. That. But they that's how they that's how they play. They're like the the D the da da uh da uh, I Donnie Donnie. Oh, I, the oh. delighted. They they're pain seekers and they're frequent flyers. But you don't get them as much now because COVID. Because they're like you know fuck that shit. Right. <laughs> I score on the street. Oh shit. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's yeah. how bad it is. But by, by the way, I mean, um, that's bad because the street is so bad that that people um, do what they can to get shelter, and that includes going to jail. Uh, so um, yeah. It, yeah, if they're avoiding the hospital, then uh, where they get some added goodies and stuff, then it's it's the things are very bad with COVID. So the people are not appreciating this. Go on. Yeah, yeah they're not there, and that's that's how serious you know the shit is because. Um, like I said, all patients between her and all her fellow nursing friends, all patients are uh, are essentially COVID patients at this point. Um, <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's no regular patients anymore at this point. So um, they're dealing with that. Uh, I guess I thought I thought that it was going to be like another week or two, but apparently by Monday. Um, the vaccine will be there will be a vaccine from a company available on Monday um, the hospitals are not making it mandatory so you know uh, it's by choice and uh, I just know 
they've they've said that upon the first and this is you know to ease minds and stuff um the first shot after the first vaccine you get because it's a double vaccine the first vaccine you'll be 50 percent immune to the coronavirus and upon the final shot which is 10 10 days to two weeks between shots uh you'll be 95 percent immune to the virus um and i i know i've seen i've seen the um the the bell palsy um diagnosis from what i've read up it was only in like three people or four people and they're not really they're they're kind of looking at those people's medical histories and their you know their family's medical histories to possibly see if maybe it was something uh genetic or you know that you know that caused it because they're the only ones that have so far developed the the bell palsy i know that was a big scare uh, but um I think the most the most worried my my wife is about this vaccine is um you're not supposed to drink for two weeks after you get it so she's like shit you know she likes, <laughs> she likes to come home and you know have a bottle of wine or you know a couple shots and you know go to sleep till the morning so but uh that's that's the worst so far that she's she's uh been in fear for this vaccine oh my god i don't blame her i mean the drink is the only thing that makes life bearable uh with what she's dealing with we've got brendan here with us now um and uh so brendan um do uh catch us up on everything and hello yeah take whatever time you that was good to hear pac yeah how's it going sir and uh brother how's everyone doing yes douglas i'm here i made it much the better for your company of course and uh do tell everyone um before you go anywhere, catch everyone up on what you and I dealt with with the um, uh, website Bluehost that uh, we uh, yeah. essentially are dealing with some real tech level espionage. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Like, so someone, um, Douglas, got a message about like from the website's end on their safe on their security check, they found uh, some some corrupted files basically in in the archives and. So we uh, basically called up the company, they walked us through it, and then I did the back-end work and removed those bad files. So the website's back on, back on, back up and running. And uh, we didn't lose any files at all, but it was interesting how like uh, most of the files affected were the ones where he was talking about the Russian vampires and various um, uh, you know, espionage-level things that Douglas has, uh, came across during his career so it's like they were targeted obviously by um what i think were possibly some russian agents or who knows i mean well, i'm pretty sure it was the russians because it was all the almost stuff certainly that, it was yeah. all the stuff that i started off with back when i became a public informant and the first thing i right. talked about was russia <laughs> that was the, and so it was, right the, so yeah. most of those early talks were the ones affected so yeah yeah and uh it was that includes where i was speaking about the russian uh use of uh the um zombinol or the uh yes the, yeah the pharmaceutically derived version of the zombie formula perfected by the haitians and and etc yes. and, and passed on to them by the cubans so it was all of the stuff that uh they they targeted specifically and it's just really right. old stuff and it's just buried right. it was like the, but but it was also essentially in its own way the route to all the other files so it would have infected yes. all of the other files eventually but they started with that and so but the way that bluehost presented it to us was obscene they presented right. it in the most alarming manner <laughs> possible where they didn't explain anything and said instead that it was uh that this was um, that we had violated some kind of policy, which apparently was the, right. the policy of not infecting. You sites. can't host malware, basically, is what they were saying. Yeah, uh, which to, wasn't our intention, ever. So right, right. right. So, so uh, yeah. So, you, you, if, if if you're finished up with that, then by all means, go on to what else you feel uh, should be emphasized, including the fact that just in time for Christmas, we're going to have that double planet form in the sky, which I think is, is yes, very, yes. yeah, portentous, but I'm not quite sure what it's portentous of. You could perhaps explain that. I mean, it's um, something that hasn't been visible for like 800 years at least. Mm -hmm. So it's something very unique. And if we have a chance to see it, well, right now it's raining where I'm at. <clears throat> so there may be, you know, some weather interference, but um, Aren't they calling, than... calling it the the second return, uh, like the the Star of Bethlehem? That's like some some of the ways. There's I've, I've, there's I've seen many it many theories. Uh, yeah, that's one of the ways. I guess it's a good way to get people to look at it. But it's like um, 
with the Star of Bethlehem, uh, if you look into the history and stuff, it wasn't an actual astronomical event. I mean, they've tried to yeah. associate some astronomical events with it. And uh, the last one happened around, you know, or not the last one, the time before that, it happened during biblical times. So I, I just kind of feel like that's like a way they're trying to promote it, you know, like trying to get oh, people yeah. to for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's what I'm saying. It's good. It's like at least, you know, people will go and look at it. But um, it's something that happens normally, actually, every 20 years. It's just that um, typically it happens closer to the sun in um, the zodiac that's close to the sun. Like almost never does it happen at night in the, you know, on the the evening sky, essentially. So it's something that's just extremely rare, um, coinciding with all, you know, all the stuff we're dealing with. Um, for me, 2020 was the best year because astrologically, you know, there were so many, so many things like tonight there's like a geminid meteor meteor shower if anyone like i don't have a clear sky i think it's tonight and tomorrow it peaks so if anyone has a chance to see um the geminid meteor shower it's going to be one of the most um what is what's the word for it most frequent uh meteor rate so it'll be like 100 meteors per hour so you'll be able to see something if you stay out there long enough Good. and they'll be radiating out of um castor and pollux which is gemini and it's like if you go out at night you look up to the uh southeast you'll see orion and then to the left of orion will be uh, like top left you'll see um of course gemini and so it's like you know you if you have a chance to look at it it's definitely worth it so and then after like douglas was saying in two weeks it'll be the du the double planet which is jupiter saturn conjunction the closest degree they've been in so not only is it not been visible in 600 years, but it's also the closest that they've been in possibly even longer than that. They'll be within one degree of each other, which makes them like a double planet. And, um, you know, from my perspective, that's like, for me, I'm able, I want to see it because that will confirm, uh, you know, my views on the cosmology and like the Vedic stuff. Uh, we don't have to get into it right now, but like, you know, just being able to see that will kind of give me more perspective on it. Well, uh, yeah. And uh, then after that, like and I was saying this before, the most important thing is this is happening in Capricorn and Capricorn represents like the system. It represents it's an earth sign. It represents like the body, the earth. And then after that, it's going both of them, Jupiter first, and then Saturn. Uh, by 2022, they'll move to Aquarius. And so, you know, we have this hype around like the age of Aquarius. Well, now it's really like it's double Aquarian energy, like. So we're in the age of Aquarius, and then you have the main grahas or planets going into Aquarius. So we're going to see, you know, changes. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's so obvious. Like, I don't even have to say it. You know, we're going to see more changes, you know. Uh, and in a sense, it'll be a good thing because uh, Aquarius is, you know, it's like a more not it's about knowledge, like actual knowing, not like theoretical knowing. It's like actual knowledge, like practical knowledge. It's about um, more electricity, more practical stuff. Like, uh, for example, Nikolai Tesla, his ascendant was, of course, Aquarius, you know, and his rising or his nakshatra was, um, or his ascendant nakshatra was um, one called, uh, it's called Ardra, which is uh, associated with like Shiv energy, like massively. So, you know, his chart was just all electric, basically. Wow. And, and then we could see where we get, you know, all of our electricity comes from him. So, I mean, these things can affect reality. They do, in fact. And so, you know, um, it is it is something positive, though. Mm -hmm. Very positive, like the situation. Because, oh. uh, yeah, like, because also Aquarius is like, you know, humanitarian, you know, coming together, helping each other. So there are many, many positive things about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so in, and in terms of your own work, how is it going? Oh, today it's not bad. It's raining a lot, so there's less people, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Oh, thank God. <laughs> but as usual, when I leave for two days, it's like I get, like, the lo you know, no one does any of the stuff, and I have to you know, pick up the slack, but it's no problem. Oh, my God. It, yeah. it, it makes you reluctant to leave work, but, uh, it, you yeah, know. Yeah, pretty uh, much. Uh, well, sh give a shout-out to Maria Gregorich and let her know that I gave you yeah. the, uh, the skinny on the situation in Canada, so you're seriously ruminating or considering, you know. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, much love and appreciation, uh, Michaela, and I am going to consider it fully. And, in fact, like, it may happen, you know. We'll yeah. have to see. Because I've been looking for a room and I, you know, like, I, I think, well, did I talk to you last night, Douglas? I don't even remember. 
remember. I don't remember either. I think we did. Okay. I mean, I, you know, I didn't sleep after last talking to you. I just want you to know that. I'll warn everybody right. else about that as well. <laughs> Understood, because I was pretty out of it. Like, I had my friend come back from, he's back from the Navy for a couple of weeks. And so, um, let's just say he's a bad influence. Let's just put it that yes, way. Yes, has so he been I was, hanging out? I was a bit out of it. You guys have literally been hanging out? Well, I saw him last night. Okay. So that's why when I called you, if I was like, you know, oh, okay. not coherent, it would right, have been a uh, situation. Right, but... right. Oh, shit. <laughs> Tell everybody about anyways, what happened when he saw an attractive girl for the first time. I mean, there's there's, there's girls on the <laughs> aircraft carrier, but they're not girls by any normal definition of the right. word. So, yeah. Him he's... and his friends were out in the mall. Yeah. And and they, uh, and this is his word, so don't, don't like accost me on this one, but he was like, she had the fattest ass ever. And like, they all saw her and like, all these idiot like navy guys like they couldn't even talk they were like babbling and shit you know like something you see out of a cartoon yeah and like he described the situation like the first time they saw a hot chick after like a year and i was just like you guys are fucking sick like pathetic <laughs> the word is pathetic, pathetic. Yeah, like... but i mean i get it i guess if you're on a ship for like whatever you know he was he was in stuck in chicago during a lockdown too so you gotta understand that but it was just like like, they didn't know what to do. Like, they saw, like, the first hot chick they saw, like, they couldn't even function. Like, they were, their brains shut down, is they, what he said. They started spazzing. They, they, they... Yeah, basically, yeah. It's, like, ridiculous. I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> that is so fucking sad. It is, it is so sad. It's just awful. Yeah. Uh, well, and... he signed up. They signed up for it. <laughs> I, I know. And, and uh, there's, there's got to be something wrong. I mean, obviously, it's just... <laughs> It, well, it's like I said, it's partially due with COVID. Like, no, no one's allowed to go near each other. Like, they're they're all like locked in their barracks and shit. Well, when the we're on the when they're on the ship, what are they doing? They were you know, they were going to bars and then they shut down the bars. So I think that's part of the reason too. Bars on the like, ship? They had no contact. No, no, they were allowed to leave. It was it was still docked. It was getting repaired or something. Oh, oh, okay, yes, because so uh, they were like, you know, they were in harbor or whatever. Right, because yeah. because I know this much. Uh, but believe it or not, the French, uh, they have bars on their ships. The French, holy uh, shit. Yeah, yeah the uh, uh, the British, they used to they used to issue like at least one alcoholic beverage a day, like a small cup of quote unquote grog, and they stopped doing that. Yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, with the Americans, of course, they were always dry or theoretically dry, but they were like drinking rub and but alcohol. But then the, the officers have like you know. Yes, they're yes. Like, they're like scotch and shit. Oh, God, it's awful. It's awful. Yeah, it's, it's just the hypocrisy, the, the de right. degenerate decadence. I mean, oh. and uh, I but, think you brought up a story, like, from World War II where they were saying, like, oh, you know, we found all this alcohol, but they were using it as, like, an excuse to, like, I forgot what it was, but. Oh, it had to do with Roswell with the, with the, the, with the child-sized coffins. Where right, they, yeah, it, yeah. yeah their this, explanation was, oh, we were just bringing booze, smuggling booze. It, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is like, it, which is basically what they were saying is we're drinking on duty, and this is the atomic bomber wing of yes, the United yes, States. Yes. Uh, and they, so you could just imagine the normal enlisted men. Thank you. Thank <laughs> and you. officers and all these people, yes. Yeah, I mean, just, just crap i mean just insanity <laughs> uh, you know and then uh, uh at any rate this, this is why any anyone who's but ever, basically uh, talking to him i got like the you know i got a perspective on how really fucked it really is <laughs> yes yes more than he you can imagine me, he told me he, i was like so how's the ship he was like it's so janky like even the telephones are like non-electric mechanical telephones and i was like so it's basically a string on a fucking tin can and he was like yep yeah. But, <laughs> so they don't even use like electronic telephones. Well, there's logic behind that at least because that's in case of an electro. If it blows up. Yeah, electromagnetic pulse. Yes, then then at least you've got. Okay, so that that's more practical. Yeah, yeah. but but uh, yeah, uh, but but uh, go go on. I mean, aside from whatever horror stories that you, you right. got from him, how are how are things going with yourself otherwise? And uh, or is that pretty much? I'm, your, yeah? I'm doing okay. I mean, uh, as good as I can be. Like you know considering <laughs> considering the situation but like you know situation normal how, how much do you owe in student loans oh probably like at this point like oh 20, enough to pay off the national debt yeah 20k <laughs> 20k or so 20K. Like oh god that's not so bad but it's bad anyway none of this stuff that you know it, all this stuff shit if i go to canada i won't pay it thank you thank you that's why that's why that's what i told him i said yes <laughs> fuck good get on the run become a fugitive as a matter of fact you consider yourself a, a refugee a political refugee seeking asylum right. from persecution called Steve seriously Lowe. 
Yeah. And, and, and uh, that's, th- th- there's this horrible persecution. The Canadians program. would agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's my, right. my wife's Canadian. Well, she got dual citizenship, but she owes a hundred thousand right now. <laughs> to, right. to whom? Right. Most people. Yeah. Like, yes. To, to, not to Canadian schools, does she? No, to American schools. She went to have uh, UMM Ann Arbor. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Yeah, and uh, yeah, well, she's, she's fuck you. I've got to relocate back up to Canada. Like I said, they're seeking a hundred million uh, people by you know the end of the century, and they want they want to bring in well over a million just uh, you know next year uh, or the year after that. Uh, uh, you right. Know, it was it, like by twenty twenty two or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well over a, you know, a million a uh, million and a half by twenty twenty two. You know, we we were going over that and. Uh, so this is the time for to relocate. Honestly, your family would just be so happy just to be out of uh, Flint, Michigan. Jesus Christ, it sounds like hell. <laughs> but um, uh, but so so go on, uh, uh, you know, Brendan, and and uh, with what few minutes you have left, uh, you know, share. With... Yeah, I mean, that was pretty much it. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, it, it's, it's unless it... you can jog my memory. I mean, I'm still recovering from last night, so like, who knows? Oh, okay. What I was going to talk about is gone. Okay, well, we, we don't need to give people all the details, but uh, Brendan has, uh, aside from the fact that he helped me uh, just recover the uh, the website and prevent it from getting shut down, because this is what they were threatening, was that they were going to delete the website. Right. This is how they like phrased everything, even yeah. even the files, everything, like, yeah. Yeah. All the backups, like, yeah. Yes, that's right. And so, and by the way, I got this in the middle of the fucking night. I got this email in the middle of the night when most people would be asleep, and they gave me 48 hours. They gave and it me... was on, like, yeah, like a timer, like these fuckers. Yeah. And and so what happened was I called my dear friend, Brendan Zogit, who was high yes. out of his fucking mind. And he was still able to handle it. He was still able to do this, uh, you know, in the middle of the night. And the only good thing we can say is that Bluehost has 24-hour um, service, where at least we right. can... T- yeah. yeah. Thank God for that. They were extremely helpful. Good, yes. Yeah. And did your young lady speak very good English? Her English was good, but she was clearly like Filipino or something. Right. Right. That's mine. Was Filipino too? Uh, I'm right. pretty sure of that. And and uh, but she spoke. And when the, I was explaining the website, I was like, I was expelling it like you spell it. I was like, diet and then rich. Yeah. And she's like, oh, you're Douglas Diet Rich. Like she thought it was like a diet company or something. Yeah, she thought it was literally a diet company that this was yeah. like, yeah. And like I was getting rich off dieting or something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're, you're, the only reason that Brendan Zoga is a vegetarian for real is because he can't afford the fucking meat. Really. I mean, yeah, he's just so pretty cool. much. Yeah. yeah. That's what I tell people all the time. They're like, how do you buy food? I was like, I buy like a 20 pound bag of rice and it lasts like six months. Like, Ugh. oh, shit. Oh my god! Like pretty much like three or four months if you know how to use it. Like, yeah. oh my god! And uh, uh, from I, the first lockdown, I have so many beans and stuff that like I'm good for another year. That, that, if that, anything happens. Oh my god! Yes, and uh, and 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 Selena Khan, of course, she just assumed it was my potty mouth. She says, "Oh, it must be the FCC. They're, they're going to, you know." Get, yeah. I'm like thinking, "Good God, if it were that bad." Good I guess. Mean, <laughs> we're at the point where the FCC were after my website. There would be no fucking hope. I mean, at that yes. point. <laughs> I mean, at this point, they can't even like people on on like YouTube and shit. I mean, they say whatever they want, so they can't really. Yeah. Like little children are like saying cunt and shit. Like I mean. Yes. yes. Like I go outside and I like kids outside. Like literally, kids around me say the most craziest shit. Yeah. Like. Like yeah, like, <laughs> like six year olds are talking about like. Yeah, just like the I don't even want to repeat it. <laughs> like, Basically, what, what are six years olds talking about? What you give us a hint? What are they talking sex? Oh, just like the most. Well, yeah, but like the most like vulgar, disgusting. You know, it's from the internet. It's from browsing too much internet. They're like, what are six like, year olds doing with access to the fucking internet? I mean, because is... their parents like let them give them phones and shit, and then they're like, you know, well, I mean, I used to do it too, like run around town with my friends, and we would just talk about shit, like, like yeah, like you know. But this is I can't even remember what the kid was saying, but it was just like so crazy. I was just like, oh, my God, See, this is why this is why okay. he was like, he was like, yeah, you fucking giant. Like, fucking oh, they're censoring you. Oh, shit. They're censoring you now. Oh, shit. Fuck, what? My God. Oh, my God. What, what is that? Yo, I think it might be um, Pac-1. Uh, oh, possibly. shit. Oh, is it? I, uh, okay. Right. Is he all I'll right? I'll turn my mic off. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Oh my god! I said, yeah, that was interesting. But yeah, like, see, 
it's not even worth repeating. Yeah. <laughs> so, something about like something about getting fucked with dildos or something and like like you know oh my having god. like you know this, just this, like some crazy shit that children shouldn't be saying oh, and okay, i was just this, like oh my god this this is, this is why, the reality we're in yeah this is this <laughs> is why you've got to not allow anyone on the internet without adult supervision until they're 18 it's like driving we've pretty got, much yeah, <laughs> yeah. treat it like driving I and mean, this is crazy and uh but, but nowadays it's like so just what is the word uh ubiquitous like it's everywhere like there's almost <laughs> nothing you could do anymore uh well yeah well all it takes is i have family yeah. that like you know like they're like that too like she's younger and like it doesn't matter like you could take away the laptop and somehow they still get in you know they have like a phone or whatever you know like they'll still get online and cause trouble like i did it too when i was younger uh, yeah. Like, when we were growing up, we had, like, stuff like AOL Messenger and shit, where, like, the parents didn't know what was going on. Like, you know, like, they had no idea what the internet, how to use it or anything. And us kids were just going off. Like, D- dude, they sure still don't. Remember. They still don't compared well, yeah, to the kids. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean. So oh it's my... the same story. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the, the kids always are a step ahead in that regard, but... Uh, you know, it's like the uh, the safety bottles. You know, no adult can open them. Only children can open them. That's the... Uh, <laughs> uh, the so-called childproof. Yeah, that's right. So-called right. childproof. And, uh, but there you have that. And uh, so aside from all of that, uh, honestly, it, it, it's just a, a pleasure to have you here because you did so much. And, and I really need to thank you. Without giving too thank much you, away, Alex. I'll say this. Uh, um, Brendan is at work on another project for me, and we've almost completed it. Where what happened was there was a television series called uh, Sequest uh, uh, DSV, and uh, it was uh, produced by Steven Spielberg. And uh, what happened was it was very similar to the George Lucas uh, affair, where, uh, where where basically, as a matter of fact, you might as well tell people we're, we're going to bring up Peter Moon later, and we'll probably continue along this round of discussion, or it may come up organically. But you can tell them just, uh, you know, you and I were looking through all of those books that Michael Aquino had published, and how <laughs> yeah. he was so involved with George Lucas, and 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 we really began to wonder, right. you know, is this fucker really dead? And 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 so yeah, yeah. give us all your impression on all that. It's... Well, it was just like there was just so many, so many books like written. And uh, just like, and the, just quickly on the George Lucas connection, how uh, in uh, in uh, you know Aquino's book, it was he was talking. He literally called it like titled it a Star Wars parody. So like, yeah, and, there, and he Fire didn't Force. get sued for it. Yeah. So yeah. clearly he's affiliated. And then one of the chapters was it was called uh, you know like something about the Seth. Yeah. You know the Seth. And then I, that, that's when it clicked in my head. I was like, oh, the Sith. They're evil. They're the dark side. They're they're the same as Seth, yeah. you know. So like George Lucas totally took that. I mean, you know, yes. calling it Seth, Seth and Sith is the same fucking word. Yeah. Uh, so he's obviously affiliated with uh, Aquino and like that group, you know. Yeah. Uh, aside from what I've said, which is purely yes. anecdotal because it's my experience, right. but I saw uh, Aquino when he was writing this book, and he had put together about half a thousand pages on this Star Wars book that he titled Fire Force. I never really right. thought about it until Peter Moon brought it to my attention that it had actually been published years ago. And then, um, so Brendan looked it up. And then after that, we found just, you know, all kinds of books written by Michael Aquino. I mean, so many that were credited to him that that's. <laughs> yeah, it was like, it was like so many, so many, like, and all on different topics, like varying topics and uh, like, you know, like unrelated topics. Like one was it had like the yeah. European Union flag with the swastika. Yeah. You know, explaining that and, and the Star Wars. You know, so many things. Like. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jameson is asking, what if George Lucas and uh, and, and and Michael Aquino are the same guy? I mean, no, but uh, you know, in, in in a sense, they're they're a product. In spirit, of, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in spirit, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Or uh, an ideology, who knows, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, Peter Moon uh, goes in deep about how the, uh, the George Lucas was having psychics uh, focus on the cameras and, and put, casting a spell so that the viewers would come back again and again. And that's what made Star Wars this all-time bestseller was people kept coming back again and again and again. They were right. literally entranced. The word is entranced. Yes. That's what Aquino said. So um, I remember growing up with him declaring he had a big part to do with Star Wars. That makes sense when you think about how, as I said, uh, you know, George Lucas was given total run of the Bay Area rapid transit system before anybody knew the son of a bitch. 
You know, it, do, right. it doesn't make any sense. And and so, right. and then him and Steven Spielberg were the best of buddies. And then, but uh, just like, um, it was a situation similar. And a lot of people yeah. also don't realize that yeah. George Lucas, he was the one that, he was like the head photographer for Woodstock. So like that movie Woodstock that everyone sees where they're like, who took the blue acid and shit. Like all that footage was taken by George Lucas and his crew. There you go. So he, he was getting paid to do that high profile shit before anyone even knew who he was. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, years later, he's the richest, you know, guy in Hollywood, you know, so. Yeah. That just adds to it. It adds to it. Yeah, the fucker sold his soul a long time ago. Yeah. It, it, of course, uh, it, of course, nobody wanted it, and that's why he yes. looks so sad. He's, 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 he's the soulless reject. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It just goes exactly. to show money doesn't buy happiness, but still, I wish I had his problems. That's all. <laughs> that's. <laughs> yes. Oh my fucking god! It, it's like the rich keep getting richer, and uh, it, it, it's the the ec- the economics of the situation. It, it doesn't even make right. any fucking sense. Uh, and and so guys like yeah. uh, our man Brendan are working his ass off, and uh, it, it, it's just <laughs> like this is why I said you might as well go to Canada, where at least you've got the social you know right. net and all that stuff. So. Uh, there must be some hints you can give Brendan Pack One because if your wife was Canadian and you used to go up there all the time, I mean, like you know, until they finally identified you as a member of the Taliban and shit, and then, <laughs> and then went, yeah, the biggest, the, the worst part was Halloween when everybody thought that Pack One was dressed as Osama bin Laden, and then they found out it wasn't a costume that he really looked like that, and then they began to call the SWAT teams on him, and at that point was when he finally decided to shave. You know, that's. That's a fucked up life, and uh, you, you know this is this is what happens when you have a poor se- sense of fashion. You know, just a poor sense of uh, uh, awareness of politics. That uh, <laughs> so, what can you tell Brendan Actually, if he uh, wants to become Canadian? Uh, aside so, from not uh, looking like you, aside from not you know going bald yeah, at the top and beard at the bottom, so you look like a Keep so you look like hair, an Al Qaeda skinhead and shit. <laughs> 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 Pretty much, yeah. There you go. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Say a a lot and uh, say, say you love stroking elks, dog. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> 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 fucking. Uh, I like maple syrup, but I don't know like if all of Canada's. Hey, and Labatt. Hey, and Lab Labatt Blue. Don't fucking forget Labatt. What is it? Labatt Le Blue. The, the beer, it's Canadian beer. Oh, that's oh. right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and Crown Royal. Crown Royal. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. There, there, you, go. Go. there you go. Hey, see? So that's hey, the and, mix. And, and wear a poppy seed on your collar. Or a poppy flower. A poppy on your, on your fucking flower. Okay. Uh, I'm a dick. Um, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I love Canada. Canada, man. Just for the record, don't don't hate me. Don't keep me barred. They're listening. I I right. love Canada. <laughs> um, no, seriously, man. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Yes. In Toronto, uh, her family lives in a little village. Well, it's not a village, but it's like a you know, it, right. it's crazy. You go to Toronto, you'll see like a Jamaican part of Toronto. It's almost like yes. L. A. It's almost like L. A. Dude, seriously. Um, on on my on my on my wife's um, I want to say it was her twenty fifth birthday. Um, we went out and, uh, we went to like this Russian part and there was this Russian bar and like the, the, nice. the, the, hoik, the, the, uh, the, 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 the scythe and the hammer was literally the, uh, the, the sign <laughs> to walk into the door, man. Like you walk right in under that. Well, I had on, I had on Air Force Ones cause I'm a ghetto ass motherfucker. Yeah, there we go. There we go. I had on I had a dress shirt, good good jeans, you know, but I had on Air Force ones. They're like, no, you don't come in here, and oh I was like, my God, that's, I had about two. Th- I was, out, yeah, well, no, these are big motherfuckers too, and uh, <laughs> I, I pull out like two thousand dollars in cash. It goes, I guess I'll go spend my American money somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, oh. that's, I should you not. A guy from behind him, from inside the door, open up the door. It was like push him by his shoulders. Like no, you come in. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. We get we get put at this VIP table. Like and, and this bar is dope. I have to go on my phone and find the name of this bar just so I just say it. But we went yes. in and we were like, dude, there were like pictures of Lennon everywhere and everything. And like <laughs> we got like we got like bar service like they bought us bottles and a charcuterie board all sorts of shit it was it was it was beautiful anyway um yeah it's dope i'll tell you what um 
there's so many things to be experienced out there that are that are nice. I, I've never had a problem, you know, like going on the subway or anything. We were there like during Pride Month too, so oh you see a lot God. of crazy shit at that time. Yeah, like and they have this crazy Pride parade out there and stuff, which you know, whatever. That's dope. Oh, that's cool for them. And yes, so, uh, thank it, you, it's just, thank you, Pac One. I have to go back into my my work, but I shall oh, talk oh, to you guys. Shit. No, it's no problem. Yeah. But I heard. Yeah, go Canadian, man. They get they get yeah. they get money. They get money monthly. Oh yeah, well, See you later, I'm Brandon. on board then. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Have a good night, you guys. Good night. Thank you. Blessings. Good night, All right. Okay, there we are. And uh, so, pack one, please. Uh, you know, take your time. Uh, you know, round up what you were saying, and then uh, you know, I'll bring Selena on for a little bit. Uh, but you know, take sure. your time, catch us up on uh, everything that's going on. I'm just so. I'm always stressed when I think about your wife and uh, the the fact that she won't have the um, yeah she can't drink for two weeks. I know that's going to be rough just because that's how she kind of unwinds. That's it's how everybody unwinds. So that, yeah, that's that's the worst part about it for her is just having to unwind and uh, not being able to drink for two weeks after the second shot. Well, that and then I guess uh, uh, supposedly. Um, when you get the second shot, you come down with uh, somewhat of a COVID, mild COVID symptoms mm -hmm. for 24 hours. And uh, one thing I can stress is that uh, that's unfair for our nurses and our frontline doctors and, you know, people like that. Um, they don't get a day off. So when, and when they get sick from that second shot, they have to go down for 24 hours. If they have to work the next day they have to take out of their own time call in and you know waste their own vacation time personal time you know whatever time they have accumulated because they wanted to prevent and be you know real productive american citizens you know and and be safe um i just feel i i feel that's kind of messed up so that's that that's the down part too you know because after after we just came back from from having our daughter she starts off at zero, you know, so you have to work so many hours to earn so many hours of vacation time or personal time. And, um, it's that, that's, that's the down part about it. But other than that, uh, she's, you know, she's doing what she's got to do. She, she wouldn't, she's not scared. Like that woman is not scared at all. You know, oh. she's like, I'm going to take the vaccine. I'm going to protect my family. But when it comes to those patients, you'd be, I mean, out of all her, out of all her, she's, they've had people quit every week. They've had yeah. three, four nurses quit a week. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, so, and there's a super lack of, uh, nursing assistants, which is like a, a certified nursing assistants, just pretty much, um, someone who goes to a class for four to six weeks and get trained on how to wipe ass and take blood pressure and stuff like that, which they're still in the equally amount of, um, danger, you know, when it comes to taking care of these patients stuff but uh they they don't you're finding there's no nursing assistance on any floor mm -hmm. some patients you get need uh what are called sitters so that's someone who has to sit in that room the whole time you know at the whole shift they sit in a room and in front of a patient you know that never changes whether it's the covid patient or not you just have those certain types of patients who need that and uh that's dangerous so they have nurses that are doing that right now you know mm -hmm. um but she's 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 fine she's mm -hmm. like she she doesn't worry about having covid patients she doesn't you know she's like i'm gonna get the i'm gonna get the shot and you know i'm gonna get the second shot and we're just gonna keep pushing like life just keeps going on so she's strong with that so that's uh one thing um she's other incredible. than that I, yeah. yeah it's but it's real it's very yeah. real he, i see it all day long on my facebook feed i see people who you know in those those last minutes they're you know hooked up to machines they're crying that this is real like you know and, 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 gonna... and some of them are they're crying in denial right that, that this can't be real when they're dying of it even yeah. yeah 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 i mean it's just like i wear my mask everywhere um i i go out i go to a store even if it's those automatic doors that open up you know and even if i grab a sanitizing wipe to wipe my cart down and do my shopping and pay my money come out and hit the hand sanitizer at the at, in the store i get to my car i sanitize my hands i like you know i get home i take a shower i wash my hands take a shower i wash my hands then take a shower before i even reach into my underwear drawer you know like just even if it's not contact whatever they say it doesn't it can't be admitted through contact like why not be safe yeah 
Yeah, Why not? Because, I mean, at this point, it's so close to home. There's so many people dying of it. There's so many just unnecessary. Unnecessary because us as as a people couldn't fucking tuck our nuts and just hunker down for a couple months and not worry about anything else. Like, you already bought up all the toilet paper and all the fucking milk and all the cleaning supplies to stay the fuck home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So true. If, if only we had stuck with that and uh, just made, you know, instead they wasted it all and threw it all away. Uh, yeah. And and so, yeah. I mean, it's unspeakable. It's it's unspeakable, and we're we're all going to pay the price. We're paying the price. We're paying the price for this. So, uh, all I can say is thank God that you're helping to bring the reality of this home to people. I'm I'm just. Uh, uh, very proud of you. I'm very proud of your your wife. I, I'm so sorry. What was her first name again? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thank you. It takes me so many times with names, especially when I haven't met a person personally <laughs> or, or spoken to them. So do forgive me. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, honestly, uh, Elizabeth is a credit to us all. And um, so, aside from that, is there anything else you want to say before I invite? Uh, uh, you know, Selena to talk for about uh, fifteen minutes, take us to the top of the hour, and then. Uh, um. Yeah. Other than that, uh, I just all I can say is just you know, um, for everyone to be safe, you know, just uh, don't don't take for granted, you know, um, what seems like um, so, just because it can't be seen, just you know, it doesn't mean it ain't real. That's yeah. that's 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 the most. If I could just stress to people that we're in a time where easily being offended having um the slightest of uh unverified opinion you know like do your research with shit you know look things up you know don't just be quick to hop a bandwagon because you see a meme or or whatever you know daniel roller says the best a meme is the virus of the mind once that shit hits the subconscious you're easily swayed to one side you know don't don't always go with the news don't you know like form your own opinion do your own research understand that look we got two million plus people who have contracted it you know we got what three hundred thousand people that have died from it just like i mean don't don't say oh that's just that's that's one percent that's two percent no fuck that that's a substantial amount of people that's essentially a whole city worth of people and and you know if you want to be proud of your country and your United States of America, you know, I'm not I'm not judging people on, on what they support, what they feel. But I'm telling you that this shit right here, this is real. It's threatening not only our lives, our children's lives, the way that the whole world is going to operate. At this point, you have people that are putting certain plans together that, you know, may require you to have a, a, a vaccine that you don't know about. You know, you don't know what comes from this just because as us being independent American citizens couldn't just tough it up and, and follow a simple procedure. Now look how far it's spread. We're in our second wave. You have other countries right now that are at zero percent, zero percent infections. Yeah. People who are getting over this shit and look at us, yeah. look at us, look at all these gatherings, look at people still want to go to bars and concerts. It's real. It's real. It, there's, there's, I mean, as someone who, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I don't care about the system. I don't. But I know reality. I know reality and the facts of reality. The facts of reality is this shit is real. It's spreading. People are not doing their part. And until you sit there and do your part and hold your own weight, we're going to continue to see this. Thank you. God bless you. That was wonderful, beautiful, and and very important. Honestly, thank you so much, dear brother. We love you. Absolutely, my brother. We pray for Elizabeth every day. Okay. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and of course, your entire family. And, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I hope, uh, by, by the way, I, I do hope, I, I think you, you hear most of what I say about uh, coronavirus on my transmissions, right? You do listen to oh, the majority of my yes. transmissions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yep. I stick in, and uh, if uh, at the end of the night I fall asleep, I catch in in the morning right to where I left off, and... Uh, tune in to the rest oh good good so then you've you've heard how serious i've been about this and what i yes, good. Yes, absolutely. i know i know you're serious and you know what's funny douglas is well it's not funny because this isn't a funny situation but right. last year and and i've just started uh to recently see articles about it that coronavirus has been here since probably october november of last year 2019 right um and the the reasoning is because i have a sister 
and there's other co-workers of, of my wife's who were sick prior to January. And, and it was funny because you started talking about uh, flu season last year. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, I, I'm really scared for the flu season this year. Like it'll be the first year in almost 10 years that, that I think I'm just going to get the shot. Like, you know, I've never needed it. I've always been fine, but I think I'm going to get the shot. Like something serious is coming. Right. And then, you know, then, then Corona hit. Um, I mean, I no tell signs. I'm not no psych, nothing like that. But like, it was almost, you know, felt like last that, that entering 2020 it almost felt like, yo, like. I need to, I need to buckle down on my shit, you know. But it's it is very serious. It is, and um, unfortunately, it's just it's uh, it's here. Yeah. <laughs> it's here, you know. Yeah. Because I do listen, and uh, I I I I know how serious you take it. You've always, even with the regular flu, you're serious about it, you know. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, thank you so much. And and we have got the combination of the twain this winter. So uh, yes, it's okay. it, yeah, it's a it, it's just um, it's it's a hard winter. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a very dark a very dark winter. And uh, so um, again, our love, our prayers, and uh, love, yes, and we'll speak again soon. Okay. Yes, sir. Care. I'll be in. Thank you. And uh, and that was Pack One Morales. Uh, hey, Selena, do you want to come on now? I talk for take us to the top of the hour. Tell us about something that happened recently with yourself or anything that comes to mind, honey. Uh, let's see if she's around, if she responds, uh, and uh, if she doesn't, then I'll get Derek Talley to give us a situation report and an update. Right, is Selena uh, taking a break or something? Okay, yeah. So give us a situational update on what's going on with yourself. Yeah, um, oh, there you are, honey. Sure. Um, yeah. Just, just give me one second. Sure, take your time, honey. Headphone. Yeah. Well, um, you know, just the usual stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I work, so some work-related incident. Yeah. Remember last... Uh, transmission. Oh. I was here briefly, and I said I had to go meet a client. Um, so basically, um, uh, this is the client that uh, I am trying to, you know, hook up and, and get some business from her. Um, this is a woman. She's a doctor, medical doctor, and um, uh, she's from China. Oh, my God, what a success story! Um, so, anyways, she fled from China like years and years ago many years ago when she was very little with her family so she ended up um, in New York and then you know uh, went to school grew up all this and then she bought this property um, it's in Chinatown Mm -hmm. and then you know when she purchased the property and all this it was like dirt chip Um, like no one realized that what she turned this place into now is this Chinatown in New York City itself in the heart of New York City no 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 it's it's in Queens there's two Chinatown one is in Queens Flushing okay Um, the other one is uh, downtown Chinatown New York Manhattan so um, anyways, I was very happy that I was able to get in touch with her. So we are uh, in a business transaction right now. I'm working on it. So I had to meet her, drop, drop some documentation. So, so I went there. I was like, I was speeding up kind of because I was a little late. Uh, that, that's what I do. And um, I speed up. Only. I do have something um, that uh, uh, which is kind of like a pass um uh like i got this pass from um detective my client friend um mm-hmm. uh detective david so so that that's what i do but i never pulled over for spitting up but i know when to spit up and then reach to my destination so i didn't want to be late so i did my work and coming back i noticed that on the other side of the, i'm on the highway um coming east from queen so at this side of the highway, um, I saw a car. I saw like a, well, ch- ch- two children and a woman and a man. Um, so I just saw um, the man only. 
on the other side, there is a pullover place. There's this, you know, little stop that people can go park, um, use um, payphone, but they don't have the payphone anymore. It's not, it's kind of like obsolete now. So they had it back in the day. So right. what I did, I went over, I took an exit um, and then went over and then went uh, t- to reach these people. Like I wanted to know what happened and I felt like, you know, they had a flat tire. So I went there and I see, I was like, I, oh, I, God, um, hopefully, you know, it's a family. So um, I reached there and then I, you know, um, that, uh, and help them, like, they don't have the, what is it called, battery booster? Is that what it's called? Uh, uh, that uh, you, you know, uh, charge the battery? They had battery Right, 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 the, ba- the jack, dying, right. So, yeah. Right, the battery booster. So basically, yeah. I went there. I said, "Well, do you do you have battery booster?" They're like, "No, we don't have anything. They don't speak English because you know New York is different. It's like a cultural kaleidoscope. You, everywhere you go, all kinds of people, um, like different races and all this." So, so I said, "Oh, I'll help you out." And they're kind of very quiet. They they were very surprised that out of nowhere, what, why this woman would come and help them. So they're kind of like a little bit you know, overwhelmed. So I said, don't worry, I'll call AAA. AAA is a service that roadside assistance that people uh, purchase and, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, so you pay uh, the membership and you have the service. So now I called, the problem is that when, if someone have the uh, 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 this AAA card, they have to be present because they need to know that it's a genuine person. Like I can help 30 people uh, but I'm the only one, you know, paying, um, but they're not pe- getting paid by other people. So that they're very strict. So when they came, uh, you know, it was like 20, almost like um, 15, 20 minutes, you know, I'm just uh, sitting in my car. And then I noticed there are a few people. So I noticed this woman and um, child, so children, two, two children. So, and I waited 20 minutes later, they sent someone, they fixed the tire and everything was fine. And then uh, so it just 20 bucks that they, um, they had to give it to these people. So they were like, um, it's not that they don't have money, they do, but at that time they didn't have enough cash because it, they had to pay by cash. The way it worked is another story. So um, so they had like almost $10 and I had like, I never carry money few, except for 2 $3. So I'm looking and searching, they need $10. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I found like a whole bunch of change quarters because I use quarter for um, uh, meter uh, parking for different places and great neck especially. So I made it up to like pennies, like um, dimes and nickels and all this together. I had eight dollars. So I had to make two dollars worth of change, make it ten dollars. So and then now they um, gave them money and they were on their way and I, you know, I left. And so that's what happened that night so it was kind of like you know i it happened like another time it was a long time ago that's the time i shouldn't have done this thing because mm-hmm. it was this man uh i don't know i don't think anything uh wh- wherever i go what, i i just think that person need help so i'll help so uh yeah it was very unsafe but everything went well uh, that time Mm-hmm. like three four years ago um so yeah i just helped them out uh, the man has the booster so it works so that that's a body so that was something happened but um oh so let me tell you a little bit about dr keely she, she's the client that it's amazing that uh what she's doing and how she did all this thing that um she lived here by herself she had no relatives she just studied, worked, whatever, and became, I'm using this as in not necessarily like uh, just a story that how someone wanted to do something and that's exactly what it, they wanted to do. And they, you know, they became successful. So she's one of those story that what I do is that I um, transcribe people's story and then I give it to um, our, our company at this point, Douglas Element. And is their story as in like um, a success story? So I create that all these graphics and all these things. So 
so that's what I was preparing uh, this evening. Um, and oh. I'm done. But uh, wow. so these are, the, are the things that I engage myself, you mm-hmm. know. It's a lot of experience, a lot of stories. Like if I, uh, if I transcribe everything that what I know, all kinds of stories that it's unbelievable that how much I know other people's personal matters just because I am um, like uh, you know licensed agent they feel safe that you know these are the people are helpful they can uh, trust people like you but everybody is not like that most people are very selfish they will go about just to make money and all these but um, so it's just uh, I enjoy doing this thing um, so that was uh, so that uh, so that's how I, my day went. It's a big project with Dr. Keeley. You will see her um, maybe um, on uh, on my page, on your page probably. I, I uh, oh, wow. that up or something. Yeah, you're always so, welcome um, to, to post such things on my page. Yeah, yeah. yeah I wanted to ask you that because, you know, you and I are like, we hardly speak and you are so busy all the time. So I didn't, you know, you sleep and then time difference and all these. So, yeah, so that's good to know. I will, I'll be proud to, uh, I'll ask her as well. Yeah. It's okay to, but yeah, I mean, I, this, these are the reason that, you know, I reach out to people all different ways and then it gives it's such pleasure that you know I did something for people and uh, we are here in this world not just you know um, uh, feeling bad about what we have or what we don't have and uh, you know and then um, consuming everything but there are many many things that we all can do bring the unity of like you know you did this there shouldn't be any difference between people except for you know all we're all, all equal but we all do different things we kill people or we save people from enemies or whatnot so depend um what we choose to do so those are things matters to me so i you know i do a lot of research but i was reading this uh, book about um, it's a book um, that uh, from my college, uh, you know, I was studying uh, uh, psychology and I wanted to become a psychologist. So I changed my mind. I didn't finish. I went up to like, you know, um, third semester, uh, sorry, um, third year of college and I didn't finish it. But I learned so much more without going, finishing my degree and all this. So when I, like, I have family um, that, uh, that, you know, we have a lot of family friends. They're uh, distant friends, they're close relatives, um, close friends and whatnot that, uh, that I always, you know, share ideas and all these things that all, of, all these doctors and um, few nurses and all this, uh, they all share different things. Like, um, so about this Corona thing, it, it's just so like, I'm not gonna go into this, I'm not gonna share what is my point of view and all this, but one thing that I would say to people, like Pacon was mentioning, which is amazing, that, you know, do your common sense, clean your hand, wash your hand, wear a mask if you have to, if you, um, and then it, it saves, um, you know, from getting sick. Um, not necessarily everybody um, will die from it, but it's a sickness that it can cause uh, other sickness from one to another, another, and so on and so forth. So why not? Uh, maintain hygiene that you protect yourself so uh, but uh, yeah so it's, it's, it's interesting time that we are now that um, that what will happen I don't think no anyone should think of in, in a sense of being worried and concerned or having anxiety I, I do talk to people like just the regular people that there some of them are fear to death frightened so frightened and some are like it doesn't matter. So all kinds of people has all kinds of thoughts and ideas and you know response to uh, this time. So um, I, I believe like what Brendan mentioned that it's gonna be a good time. It's gonna be all good. We will have more. You know, people will be awakened to a point that they will realize that the, what is the meaning of life over here in this planet? Um, if we don't change ourselves, uh, then we're the one here. We're the one. Uh, doing everything uh, so why not you know uh, think of everything as a unity co- a consciousness and, and, and uh, operate yourself from that thought and ideas and you know uh, be be there for each other so 
yeah, so that's my point of view. Wonderful. Oh. So, uh, I, I have a question for you. Uh, I wanted to know. Yes, sir. Yes, I wanted to know what program you use to do the 3D uh, graphics because the 3D graphics you do are pretty incredible. No, it's not, JMO. Uh, what I would say to you that as much as it looks or sound that it's a difficult work, it is not at all. It is rather very easy. It's 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 it's, it's a matter of like, for example. If you're an art, you paint, whatever you do, that's, that's an art, that's creativity, it comes from you. But over here, like you become a good driver, you drive very well, it's a skill. Uh, so two different things. So over here, it's not some creativity, some incredible thing. Anyone can do it. These are, these are all um, uh, uh, mobile apps. You can buy like $10, oh. $20, you subscribe. Uh, they became very strict lately because People like me, I'm like a thief. I steal everything and no one will know, figure out in their lifetime uh, that what I do is just amazing. But, you know, like I teach this thing to kids, like, you know, relatives, friends, you know, some I have a few agents that I'm very close to them, their children. They're like, they see it like, they're like, what did you do? Where did you learn? So, by myself? <laughs> I taught myself. So. Yeah, I mean, if you want to know, maybe we can one day um, speak of this thing. It's very, very easy and simple. Just, um, you know, if you really want to work on this thing as like, you know, helping people, since you mentioned you don't want to work, which is fine. Everything is work, you know. You you don't do anything. That's a work, too. Oh, like, well, maintaining but, life is work as well. So you well, don't have to make money, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm willing to put the work in and the time to uh, learn how to use the but, software. Yeah, to that. I'll, I'll show it to you one day. Uh, probably, like, definitely, if you're more than welcome, maybe um, whenever you have time, um, Douglas, you, and whoever wants to join, we can go over it probably like next uh, transmission. Um, just very simple, very easy. So it's not something like what I understood you as. Trust me, you will be like surprised at how simple and easy it is. So, uh, don't sweat on it too much. Like uh, uh, how difficult it is. It's very, very easy. I'll be more than happy to show you. Cool. Thanks. Oh, yeah, God you're welcome. You. Yes. Well, honey, you've been so wonderful as always. God bless you. You took us to the top of the hour. I'm going to uh, ask uh, Derek to give us just a quick update on himself while I try to bring Peter Moon on. Okay. Yeah. So. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, take your time. I'm sorry to answer. I just wanted to say something take your time. to um, Derek yeah. that I've been like uh, trying to call him. We were uh, like, I wanted to um, uh, like give him some ideas about real estate. So um, that would be something that anyone can join the call after hours. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can show some brilliant, unbelievable idea that how easy it is that if I can master this I haven't I did a couple times but if I see that you know if I have enough money and if I can invest uh, as low as $300 but it's not that I do it for people I will show you where to go how to do it you can spend like $200 $300 so these are like that secret that people who doesn't want to work for anybody like I cannot work for people I don't care how much money I, I would make but I cannot have a boss and uh, tell me, do this, come to work at night, oh, you're late. Uh, that's not my thing. I'm an extremely freedom-loving person. So, yeah. Um, so what I was going to uh, say that Derek, Douglas, um, whoever, come join. And I'm going to sh share this, that you all can be benefited from. I look at um, the world as in, like, you know, if I know something, I will share. And, and wow. that's my joy. Uh, so, yeah. That's wonderful. So, Derek, I will call okay. you probably. Like, yeah. all right? we'll, we will coordinate with each other and we'll have a discussion. Wonderful. Definitely, definitely. And thank you, Selena. That that was oh. uh, good. You know, I actually, one of those um, seminars, I think it was uh, a rich dad, poor dad. Oh, guys, my God. Don't, uh, don't go near to... these people. Oh, my God. Don't go near these people. They'll I'm suck glad you said blood. that because, see, I went to the free one, but the free one was just the advertisement. Before you pay four hundred dollars to go to the next level one, yeah, and you know, and people yeah. were telling me, well, if you pay four hundred dollars to go to the next level one, are you ready to pay fifteen hundred dollars to go to the the next level one, to where you really get the real secrets, you know? And then it's like, 
You know what? I don't know if I want to, you know. So I'm, I'm glad I got someone who's an insider to help me. Absolutely. Listen, I've been with these people, and they have no idea what I spoke to them about, what they did. I said, you guys are a bunch of fraud. You did things and all this. So they gave me some free um, classes that was extremely helpful. So, um, yeah, we'll go over it, all these things. That's <laughs> okay. <very powerful. laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm very right. vocal. I'm very vocal. If somebody does anything in front of me unfair, believe me, I'll stand up and I'll very politely tell them about what a piece of shit they are. <laughs> so, that's, so that's how I, that's the world I live in. Right. So, you know, if you're good, loving and kind, we're friends. If not, then F you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> All right, Thank so you, I have Selena. To... You're, you're, oh. you're a sweetheart. You're a sweetheart. Oh, you're Selena. all good. You're all good, loving friend. I love you guys to death. You know, you're very sweet, loving people. Everybody. Yes. So I'm gonna go now. Oh God bless. And you. I'm gonna post something on your page, Douglas. You will see it later. Yes. Something sir. interesting. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Talk to you soon. Oh, and I I'll listen you. to listen yeah. to you until I fall asleep. Yes. Honey. Take care, guys. Good okay. night. Good and. Night. Uh, I, I think I forgot I something. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go to, uh, uh, like, uh, I haven't been to, um, yes, Paquin, thank you so much. So I, I'm planning to uh, New York, uh, going to New York Monday, t one of these days, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, to meet a friend. Uh -huh. um, so basically, I'm going to go to where, my usual place, that, um, you know, the Central Park, but I'm not going to Central Park, it's cold. So I'm going <laughs> to go to this building that I go I've been going there forever, ever since they had this building. So it's called uh, Warner Center. Uh, oh. It's right across from the Central Park. So oh, I know like 30, that. Yeah, 30 seconds walking. Like you go diagonal, you're just there. I go there to do groceries sometimes. I also drive around and obviously I enjoy this. So that's, um, and I'm, after like, when was I was there? Like last time was like um, sometime in March, probably this year. And then um, to, to meet a client but uh this time i'm going to meet a friend and then uh just and also see what's going on I'll drive around and take pictures and i'll post it to douglas's page and all this so it's going to be like a little venture or you know time out from whatever it is that i will take off for a day and then and that's what i'm going to do wonderful oh god bless uh, you thank thank you guys we'll, we'll speak soon and uh, until next time take care everyone yes, be I safe know. Oh, we love you. Bye bye. God bless you. Derek Talley, do me a favor and bring Peter Moon on for me. I can't bring him on again. Uh, it's the same problem I had last time. I don't know why. So, thank hey. goodness you're here to help produce. Oh, thank God. The light had been Peter Moon right now. Wonderful. Derek, I can there he is. How's it doing? Yes, we have uh, we have the hey, delay in the background, so make certain you turn the. Uh, uh, I had to turn off my uh, my the transmission. That's yes. all. That's all that was. So I turned it off, and I'm here now. Understood. Thank you, dear Peter, and uh, we're so glad to have you with us. Uh, there is a lot to talk about. By the way, uh, you saw, of course, the come unique that was sent to myself by uh, Bluehost, and. Uh, yeah. So, and you probably saw the later communique that I forwarded to yourself from Bluehost as well, in which they followed up after Brendan Zogit helped myself. Uh, well, he took care of everything by clearing uh, the site of the malware within those particular files. But the reason it's important to bring that up uh, with your own uh, testament to uh, what happened was that I was actually on a call, a Skype call with yourself, when that email came in and it was quite late and uh, it, it came in at a time when most everybody would be dead asleep and wouldn't be awake for hours and hours. And uh, it was, of course, my schedule is very different. So I happened to catch it. And uh, what happened was that uh, it was, by the way, I have not slept since then. So I do want everyone to know that I have not slept for at least um, well over 24 hours. And now I've gone through this in the past many times in my life. But I'm a lot older now, and I try not to do this. And uh, fortunately, I it was really catching up on sleep many of the days beforehand. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to really perform, so to speak, throughout the night. So I want everyone around me to understand that if you get the impression that I'm going to start falling asleep, which would be likely if sometime when I was monologuing were that to happen, 
then uh, then then by all means, uh, you know, um, do bring it to my awareness that I'm falling asleep on air, which I've done in the past and uh, actually have slept talked, uh, you know, my version of sleepwalking. I've actually been, you know, did some sleep talking uh, on record in the past. It's amazing that, uh, you know, people tolerate that from me. But um, I'm bringing that up because of the severity of what happened, because as Peter Moon can attest, they were threatening to shut the website down and delete the totality of its contents. And uh, this was because it was uh, it was stated, not insinuated, it was stated outright that I had violated um, their um, various what, what the fuck was it? it was something Peter where the agreement or something the uh, which the, the, the agreement and you don't you, and it was it was impossible to understand. Thank you. Yeah. What the agreement was it wasn't stated. Yeah. Uh, it, but they it, I and I think it had to do with corrupted files. Yes. Or what were. Yes, but uh, the nature of the files, as you can attest to, because you saw the titles, were very old files from when I first became a public informant, and they all had to deal with the Russian theme. They all had to deal with uh, the Russian uh, zombies and, and vampires and uh, various things that I was saying about Russia when I first uh, uh, outed myself as a public informant. And so this is, as Brendan, it, Brendan Zogid insisted, that this was not something from anybody we know in the in the mainstream of the usual suspects this is not something from this is like this was russian espionage level shit and uh they targeted that specifically because of the russian content and um so apparently that's a very sensitive topic and uh and we're betting it was the russians that that did this and uh because that file uh that was like because it was the first stuff i ever did it was like stuff that was the root of everything else that was uploaded from that point. So it was going to inevitably corrupt the rest of all the files on, on the website. So they did us a solid by bringing it to our attention, but they did so in the most god-awful way and in a way that was totally senseless and in itself um, it, it was not conducive to communications. So fortunately, as Peter Moon pointed out immediately, the phone number was there and I called them and bigger and whale shit, somebody answered. So they have 24 hour a day service, which is remarkable. And, uh, and the young lady was a Filipina, but she spoke very good English. And um, so we were able to get much done. And thank God, even though Brendan Zogit was high out of his fucking mind and, and uh, you know, altered, uh, he was able to handle it. And after that, um, I relayed the uh, communique to Peter Moon and, and some others that it had been you know, the corrupted files had been deleted. And uh, so there we have that. It's, it's just a, a remarkable situation. And if you have any further observations to make in that regard, please do. And then, uh, you know, follow up with everything else you want to talk about uh, tonight. And there's plenty. The I'll say about Bluehost yeah. is that um, I used to use them to host my website. Mm -hmm. And they were very uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult to... Uh, put up posts and, and put links in them and uh, and they would work very willy-nilly you know mm -hmm. if I put up a link or put oh it was it was very frustrating sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't and I don't know if that was the issue I had with them or I had some other issue with them but I got some help and they were trying to tell me I needed a certain type of line that I have to get from AT&T in New York City, and it was going to cost, oh, it was something exorbitant, like $3,000 a month. I mean, it was stupid. I, why are they giving me this stupid advice? Well, who does this guy think he is? Uh, anyway, they were they fixed their problem so it was better, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't have to do anything, but I have a, a, eventually junked them. Yeah. I, I got rid of them. Understood. Because I, I have a, a much better... I, I don't know if it's the, the site I have now is good for delivering courses and that sort of thing. I don't know it's the best site for a blog, um, but uh, so, so be it. You know, Blue Blue Coast has its, uh, but they do respond. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's good. Oh, the things I'd like to address mm -hmm. before we get into uh, well, the, whatever you want to address in patent, but. Uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes, I want to uh, warn people about Canada. 
-hmm. Canada it is a very beautiful uh, place to go to. I, I'd say Vancouver, which I've been to, is just gorgeous beyond belief as a city. And as you get into British Columbia, uh, it's just beautiful. I would say the same. Uh, I haven't been into the province of Quebec in many years, but that was beautiful. Uh, Montreal is, a, is an old city. Quebec is even older. The Quebec City, but it was just the, the country. So it was beautiful. People are nice. Toronto was maybe the one I liked the best. <laughs> That's English. You don't have any French there. You get the English. <laughs> And it's just different. You don't have the Catholic overtone to it that you do in, in the entire province of Quebec. But the thing is, it's very nice on the outside, and the people are nice, but the government is very much more totalitarian than anything we have in the United States. Even with Governor Cuomo, who's just been accused of sexual assault, or sexual harassment, not assault. Uh, even with his tyranny over New York State, it isn't as bad as what you have in Canada. If they want to uh, investigate your business, their, their equivalent of the IRS can walk right into your office and say, okay, get out your books. You do not, they, the IRS cannot do that here. You can hire a tax attorney here. You can put them off. You can say, I will come to you at a, at a later date. They cannot do that. There are, uh, they can make you knuckle under much quicker and much faster uh, than the United States can and will, despite the problems we're having in the United States now. Um, I have a friend, many years ago when this malicious stuff was going on and all the crazy stuff during the Clinton administration and he was so disgusted with the politics of the United States, he moved to Canada, uh, British Columbia. I warned him not to. His son never forgave him. It ruined his son's life. Well, I hope, I mean, not ruined, ruined, but, you know, he, he, he disconnected from all his friends in school. He, he wasn't, he didn't fit in up there. It was just, it was horrible for the kid. And consequently, he realized that he was wrong to do this because the grass looks greener on the other side. Canada is, you know, the taxes are horrific. Uh, what they did do that was a positive, in my opinion, was they gave, during COVID, they gave each citizen 2,000 Canadian dollars a month. I don't know if they're still doing that. Uh, whereas in the United States, the... Uh, both the Republicans and the Democrats had the audacity to give people $1,200 stimulus check and think that it actually did something. <laughs> it's utterly <laughs> and insulting that, oh, yeah, we get over, you get another one. Oh, this is going to be 600 It's going to be, who, people, this is, this is like throwing nickels at a bum. It's, the, the, the one thing that was good that they did was pass this, uh, unemployment bill that some people have taken advantage of but it, that really was helpful they also loaned uh, small businesses money um, and then you hear of ridiculous situations like Trump's kids getting millions of dollars and Tom Brady the football player getting millions of dollars for his company uh, but but you know they have businesses so they're on the rolls there's, I suppose there's nothing illegal about it because you can't discriminate but that was good, but this. So anyway, Canada is very socialistic, and also the medicine in Canada is free if you're a citizen. But when I went to get my teeth done in Los Algodones, Mexico, many years ago, mm -hmm. I saved a bunch of money and uh, got a very good job done on my teeth, certain uh, crowns and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I there was nothing. I was the only American in there. The rest of them were Canadians. Who were not happy with their whether it was medical or dental they weren't happy with their medicine in canada so it has a very bad reputation where it used to have a good reputation mm -hmm. uh medicine in canada which is free from the high taxes 
so anyway, I would uh, warn anybody. Uh, I would ask extensive questions of expatriates who've gone to Canada and where they are and before you make a move. Um, that, that's my advice on Canada. Yeah. Um, no, it's appreciated. Yeah. Uh, believe me, all these perspectives are necessary. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, in terms of uh, you know what you've just said, uh, I, I'm certain that uh, maybe things have changed a little bit with uh, the medicine, with uh, with enough people complaining. Uh, there had to be some improvement, but uh, it's it, the one thing that I can say is that um, uh, throughout the rest of the world, the developed world, of course, we have socialized medicine. America, the United States of America, is really the outlier in that regard, and yet at the same time we do have an industry that has profited to the point where it can afford to bring people from all over the world where the majority of people who truly want to become MDs are motivated to come to the United States and they, they come to the United States because of the private industry that is a fact that makes uh, doctoring uh, profitable and so two, 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 two points on that too and uh, Romanian in Romania I was told very early on that if you have a you know, the, the medicine there, uh, I think, is either free or nominal. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem is you have to pay bakshish to the doctor. Mm -hmm. that, that's like, you know, a bribery. Bribe. You pay for the side. Mm -hmm. Now, I said, I said, well, what is it? I said, well, if you just go in, they'll do the operation, but they'll do it wrong. If you pay them the money, they'll do it right. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I mean, what kind of mindset is that? And I, I basically asked, you know, Paula, when I got married to her, I, I asked her this story. She goes, yeah, that's true. Now, <laughs> uh, just blatantly, yeah, just, just bluntly, well, I, I mean, casually. It's kind of hard yeah. to imagine them doing wrong. Like, oh, maybe they'll leave some bacteria in there or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine them actually doing that. But uh, I have uh, a friend in Romania introduced to me by David Anderson who is a medical doctor, he, he got his MD in Oregon. Mm -hmm. He was studying in Oregon when I met him. He was actually uh, uh, trained as a nurse. He had a nursing degree and he stayed in Oregon and he come to Romania during the summer to, to attend Atlantic Ron and act as, a, act as a medical person. Mm -hmm. And he ended up, he could have been a doctor in, in the United States. He got his license here but he ended up coming back and practicing in Bucharest because he says, I can help many more people in Romania than I can in the United States. Part of that is a result of the uh, limitations or what they impose on you as being a doctor, where you're, you're more of a button pusher in a robot than you are a healer. So he, he, he went back to Romania and he actually was the one, if you remember, who arranged or would make arrangements for Amanda Ute right. to get her operation in Romania. Yes. If you remember. Yes, I remember that. And yeah. Yeah, he, he was, he, he says, yeah, it'll cost this much. I know he, he doesn't do that operation, but he knew where to get it done and to get it done reliably. And a uh, really great person. Um, so, I mean, I've known him you know, for like 12 years. Right. And it's just, uh, so, so anyway, that's, that's one perspective on doctoring. The other thing about doctors is they are, uh, I just recently saw this uh, on television, that they are in the highest category of risk for getting COVID-19. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the health professionals, particularly the doctors, because they're working right amongst them. Of course. And, Part of, see, there's sort of a very strong karmic payback here because doctors are not allowed to practice true, healthy medicine. They do a watered down bunch of shit with <laughs> allopathic stuff. And it's, it's very harmful what they do in many respects. In some respects, they do good things. Like if you have a broken bone, they generally can set that. Um, 
but sometimes they don't do that either. Because I know a guy who was uh, basically paralyzed for life because they wouldn't they wouldn't fix his broken leg, and it cut off his blood brain barrier, and he became a paraplegic no. because they stopped him sitting there in the ER. Oh, you know, this this is an ER that you know instead of you know if his parents did that, they could have driven him down to the next hospital and fixed him. Right. This is so the Hippocratic oath. I mean, that's where we get the word hypocrite. Yes, uh, yes. Not because Hippocrates was a hypocrite, but because doctors take a Hippocratic oath and do not follow it. Yes. Um, and and so this is a um, this is a problem. So when they refuse, the whole industry refuses to do therapy like ozone therapy or anything that is actual healing. They're getting punished because this is there is so much bullshit involved in the medical community it is just heinous so the, this the, in other words when you begin to work for a system there is a point when you pay for it um so th this is an unfortunate thing and a lot of other measures could be taken as for the vaccinations there's um there's it is outrageous for them to say this thing works when never in the history of the world has there been a vaccination that's worked so well in one year they 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 say they've tried it on 40,000 people and first off i wouldn't believe anything they tell us about their controlled study i just wouldn't believe them but if you even now they're they're setting up what do you call it? Emergency centers next to the vaccinations for people who have bad reactions. Mm -hmm. And there are bad reactions that are intended to happen and people are gonna get sick. They tell you this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, uh, I, I don't know. My only experience with a vaccination in modern times was I had an argument with a friend. This is, it goes about 20 years ago. He says, oh, I gotta get my flu shot. I said, what are you getting a flu shot for? Mm -hmm. And we argued about the, the why you should get a flu shot. Uh -huh. and, and I didn't hear from him for about three weeks. He I died, said, right? <laughs> he says, I got the flu. He got the, he took the oh, flu shot and okay. he got the flu so bad. Uh -huh. It's so bad. Uh -huh. And, you know, so, I mean, it doesn't mean it was an honest flu shot. Uh -huh. doesn't mean it wasn't. So you, you've got to, uh, I, I, the, the, but the, the illness is, as everybody's saying is real. Uh -huh. One of my friends in Romania, I spoke to today. He got he got it, and oh, he shit. said it was. Uh, I said, "How bad was it?" He goes medium. Okay. He did not have to go to the hospital. He stayed at home. Okay. You know, how's your daughter? Well, well, she's she's got the symptoms she can't taste, so she's got very minor symptoms. Oh my God. So oh. it's it's a very real phenomena, uh -huh. um, but um, and and the other thing is, I like this. Uh, I like people wearing masks. Mm. <laughs> I, I don't necessarily want to wear a mask myself. Uh. I, I don't like, I like people wearing masks because I, I don't like their illnesses and their, like, I hated, always hated working in a environment with an office where other people bring in their shit. Uh -huh. and so I, I said, I, I feel a great amount of freedom from other people other people's uh, pestilence when they uh, when they wear these masks, especially at this time of the year, oh. especially at this time of the year, which is the cold and flu season. Oh. And and I have been taking what my uh, Rom another Romanian doctor friend told me to take was vitamin C, big doses of vitamin C, which is at least three thousand milligrams, um, and uh, vitamin D three. 10,000 I units, international units, and 40 milligrams of zinc, mm -hmm. 40, 50 milligrams of zinc. I take these every day. So does Paula. So far, so good. Well, that's great. That's great. By the way, um, my late and sainted sire, the man who raised and guided me, uh, Chief Petty Officer of the United States Navy, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, uh, retired. He... Um, one of his distinct memories from the Navy was there was an asshole officer who he didn't uh, particularly like at all. 
and uh, the guy was, uh, they were in Taiwan, I believe, uh, when this happened, um, or it may have been someplace else, but it was definitely a tropical environment. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that impacts white men severely, many of them. And uh, so uh, in this case, the officer was a bit overweight and uh, comparatively speaking, of course, you couldn't be too overweight in the Navy in the old days. A lot of people don't can't begin to imagine this now. And uh, in many branches of service, oh, you'll see fucking fat people like you wouldn't believe. Uh, guys that look like weebles, uh, that they'll wobble, but they don't fall down and shit. But, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, and my father recalled one ship's doctor who was particularly strict about this because he had seen what had happened on a full ship, as had my own father. And uh, what people don't understand is that the old ships in particular, it's, it's not like ships these days. The modern aircraft carriers are nothing but they're like the fucking Queen Elizabeth. They're floating hotels uh, and, uh, you know, they got gyms and shit. Uh, you know, there, there would have been no such thing on, on the old World War II aircraft carriers. And uh, or, or even though my dad was a carrier sailor, he had been on some ships which were smaller at times and he hated them. Uh, the, uh, you just, the smaller the ship, of course, the more smaller the entries and uh, exits, uh, the egresses, the gang planks, uh, the, the gangways, just all the passageways. And, uh, you'll probably get the best feel of it in, uh, the Star Trek film, The Wrath of Khan, when you see men just trying to escape from burning sections of the starship and the, uh, hatches are closing. And, uh, well, in, imagine those hatches, uh, not like what you see in Star Trek, which is comparatively luxurious, but in a ship, they're literally like something you would have to kneel to get through and squeeze your legs and kind of get into a fetal position to get through. And uh, this would be the normal uh, egress or hatchway inside of a ship. And uh, this is so it could be more easily sealed during a fire and that way you could contain the fire in one part of the ship and hopefully uh you know keep it contained but uh when you get a ship that's on fire or sinking and you get some guy that's overweight and they get right to the porthole or the egress which is the choke point and they get stuck then everybody behind them dies and they die horribly they either die by suffocating based on burning chemicals that burn their lungs out uh, or they burn alive or any number of things that could happen or they drown uh, if the water's flooding in and so my father and that doctor had been personally witness to this so my father had nothing but a sense of satisfaction when he witnessed this doctor sentencing uh, men who were uh, just slightly overweight to diets and he would say you know uh, limited rations for like uh, uh, two months or something like that to make certain they lost, uh, you know, 20 to 30 pounds so that in the event of an emergency, they wouldn't take down half the crew with them uh, by blocking up a porthole. So uh, he came from that kind of background, but this officer was slightly overweight, and that was probably why my dad didn't like him. <laughs> he instinctively disliked him. And um, the officer came up to him uh, during flu season and said, Hey, did you get your shot? You know, he was like, uh, and he was like sweating and uh, looked like he was flushed. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and my dad was senior enough as a non-commissioned officer, chief petty officer, where he actually, you know, had the temerity to ask, did you get yours? <laughs> and the guy said, yeah. And uh, my dad didn't say anything, but it was obvious the guy didn't, wasn't taking it well. Uh, and then um, the, you know, my dad went to get a shot. And then uh, learned that the officer had collapsed and died. <laughs> that was so. Uh, he died uh, pretty much within hours of getting his, getting the shot. Mm. Thank God. And while well, encouraging other people to go around getting them. Okay, now, of course, there's many factors here. Um, the man m may have been in poor health. There may have been cardiac issues dealing with a slight case of overweight that may not have been manifesting overtly, but may have been like uh, just a congestive heart failure, like the art arteries being clogged in, combined with tropical, the tropical environment and the, the, the temperatures, of, the ambient temperature of the tropics uh, combined with the flu shot itself. But the flu shot was definitely a comorbidity. Nobody denied that. Everybody just said, uh, you know, it was definitely the shot that killed him. Uh, so these things, they happen. And, and statistically, they're going to happen. 
and Peter Moon is it's exactly right there. You know, um, it's very frightening that this is the, no one, no, you know, there's been no situation in the history of humanity where a mass vaccination like this has ever been railroaded through so quickly. And yes, uh, and it's an important point because people are going eight over, you know, either the, either Biden or Trump. But the one thing they have in common, they really share a belief in the vaccine. And I think this is this. It says so much that they, they really believe and they both agree on the vaccine and they both want to take credit for it, uh, which, you know, may be. They may rue the day they, they said that. They may not, but they may. We I, don't know how yeah. all of this thing is going to work out yet. Right. I mean, obviously, we can only hope for the best. And uh, I, myself, will probably get it. But that's how it's looking to me now. I, I may change my mind on that, but I will probably get it. But I, I you know, I understand why people would be reticent. Um, See how other people do with it first. Yeah, consider it carefully. Particular people of your own, you know, genetic, you know. But that's an important point. That's that's an important point. But you know, one thing I can say is they're giving it to the most vulnerable first, aside from the frontline workers. Yeah, yeah I said it. Yeah, the yeah. elderly. I mean, I I could see it killing off people in nursing homes. Yeah, because they're already vulnerable. <laughs> Why do, why do they need to be vaccinated? They're in a nursing home. You go to a nursing home to die. You don't go there to sustain your life, to recover. You don't recover from a nursing home. Right, right. In rare instances, you might, but it's that's like a prequel to hospice. Yeah. And I, I once went into an, I mean, once went, I, I've been into nursing homes a few times, but uh, I went to visit one of my Moorish friends and you're going through all these like people that are, you know, it's like they're they're sitting in front of the elephant burial ground and they look at you and they smile. They're happy to see any form of life, yeah. but they're just sitting there vegetating. And it's, it's like, man, this is life is done. It's, life is done. They're parked. They are parked. And my friend that I went to see was so delighted to see me. And I had brought the shaman of the Montauk Indians with me. Mm -hmm. Another one of his Moorish friends, or maybe we met her there, but he was he, he was so indignant with the doctors because he had been a health person that used to sell herbs, and he would not take. He was so adamant and insulting to them, <laughs> uh, and I told him. And the problem he had, uh, he wouldn't take the diuretics which were to reduce the swelling in his ankles. Mm. And I said, you know, you need to listen to them. They were they were so kind. Mm. The doctors were so nice and compassionate. They were really good doctors. And they said, you know, he doesn't listen. And I said, well, I'll talk to him. And I told him to follow the doctor's advice because I said, they're trying to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And I think he followed my advice for one day. Mm -hmm. And that was it. In other words, he was in charge. Mm -hmm. And it, it, this doesn't work. Al Bielik was like that, too. Or was he? Was, he? It, oh, he was. In, they, they, uh, somebody explained to me this is an A-type personality. They're, oh. they're in charge. I mean, like, you know, what, Alexander Haig. I'm in charge here. <laughs> well, you know what that reminds me of in both those cases? It reminds me of Timothy McVeigh when he was en route to the execution chamber and he recited the poem, I am the captain of my own ship. I am what was it the guardian of my soul or the or the decider of my fate i can't remember the exact lines of the poem but that's what that reminds me of is timothy mcveigh that, that is a much more intelligent use of the principle than <laughs> what these other people who weren't anywhere near as you know deranged as timothy mcveigh <laughs> you know he's like he's like yeah yeah well he did what he did and maybe he thought he was i don't know i, I mean Maybe he thought he was doing it for the right thing. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's, and... it's, hard, it's hard to say. I, I, I have to admit, it, it is difficult for myself not to have some level of sympathy with Timothy McVeigh. <laughs> because... well, there's a lot more that went on there, but that's yeah. a whole other yeah. discussion. Yeah. That, that whole 
I mean, even PBS implicated uh, Bill Clinton. Yeah. In, 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 in that PBS yes. yeah. had a documentary. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. But but oh, back to Canada. Yeah. For people that want to move from their location, very important. Uh, something called astrocartography. Astrocartography. You can find free sites. Uh, Astro Deets, I, D I E N T S, Astro D I E N S T. Uh, and there are some other sites that will, you can kind of look at your astro cartography uh, for free. You can also pay to get it done, which might be better. But astro cartography is showing where uh, planetary lines run through different continents, suggesting where you should live. And so each continent will have you know, there'll be areas on each continent. So I want to show you how, just as an example, I never heard of this, but one time, uh, one of my, uh, you know, acquaintances, I, I mean, I could almost call him a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, he, <laughs> well, because we weren't like friends, you know what I mean? We knew each other. He did, he did the Montauk, he did the astrology of Montauk for me uh -huh. to help me, uh, that sounds like it could be the title of its own book. The Montauk of Astrology? Or the Astrology, Astrology Montauk, Montauk. He, yeah. <laughs> he did this. He basically was the one who kind of really made it really certain that I should go to the book convention where I ended up meeting uh, the OTO and Marjorie Cameron. He says, there are people there who will help you with your with your book. And they did. Uh, cool. So anyway, I went to him years later. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the reading, he said, oh, let's look at your astro cartography. Right. And he's looking, he says, God, you've got a line going right through Montauk here. Wow. Uh, now, when we blew it up, it really wasn't going through Montauk. It was going through Block Island, which is an island off the coast of Montauk, which belongs to Rhode Island, not New York State. He says, you should definitely go there if your line goes right through there. But that, he, but it does you want to be within a few miles or even 50 miles of where your lines go. So Montauk was a, was a, a important uh, indicator of where I could or should be. There was another line that ran through Long Island that ran right through the church where I was married on Long Island, mm -hmm. my Neptune line. Oh, so I said, wow, this is right through Centerport. I was married, you know, we, we did a second wedding in Centerport. We did one in Florida, uh, and then we also did a second wedding for her family and friends up in Long Island. Wow. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, but it was running right through that. Now, he also, when he looked at it, he says, oh, you, he says, you're bi-coastal. He says, you've got <laughs> Venus and Mars line, you, 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 Mars line running right off the coast of California. And, and I think it, it, one of them runs right through, uh, goes, it, right next to San Francisco, runs right up through uh, Marin, mm -hmm. uh, makes contact with the land. It's basically right off the coast, which is I, right, I mean, I was born off of that line right. uh, in Southern California. And so, in other words, um, and I think my, my daughter had a line that runs right through uh, San Francisco and down California. She's in California now because I did hers. Now, right. uh, I also, have, when I switch continents, I have a line that not only runs through where Atlanticron is in Romania, this is like where Jupiter would be my home, where I'd want my home. I also have a, my Chiron line, which is the planet of the wounded healer, goes right through Sarmis and Jatuza, mm -hmm. right through Transylvania. So that that's like where my, I guess my uh, marital wound was healed. Right, but, but by the way, so people know Chiron was the uh, leader of the centaurs, the that was that the, the, who taught Hercules, and uh, and of course by some iterations of the uh, homoerotic Greek mythos, uh, may have been his lover. Actually, was in some iterations. But uh, anyhow, hmm. my mother was a Sagittarius, so I'm very fascinated by the centauroids, and Chiron is one of the centauroids, which are planetoids or an asteroid belt that is between uh, Saturn and uh, Uranus, 
uh, which you, you, Uranus is uh, the actual pronunciation. Let's all stop saying Uranus because that brings to mind horrible images. <laughs> Warren. Uranus. Uranus. Yeah. Uranus. Uranus. Yes, or People Uranus. Call right. Nobody but, calls it Uranus. Uranus. Yeah, I prefer that though, and uh, because... nobody will know what you're talking about. True enough. True enough. But by the way, you used the term uh, diuretics earlier when you were referencing to uh, that which uh, you know basically wrings the liquid out of the body that causes the edema, the swelling of the ankles, and and ultimately the failure of the heart and all that. The uh, it, it's pronounced uh, diu diuretics, as in diuresis, uh, so that it's not confused with diuretics or things that cause diarrhea. Just, just so you know, <laughs> medical, medical terminology. So, uh, so there you have that. And uh, so, so yes. Uh, by the way, to to uh, just reaffirm what Peter Moon was saying about astral cartography, uh, Noreen Helphand, um, who I intend to bring on at some point in the future after I have, you, you know, just a, a a talk with her first, and uh, I I do want to bring her on again uh, um, some sometime soon. <laughs> but uh, I'm getting some messages about that already. Uh, but uh, Noreen Halpand is, uh, um, she did my astro cartography. And she did this uh, before I went down to Australia or uh, Arizona. And uh, it, oh my fucking God. She said, oh, you know, where you were born in Taiwan uh, and uh, based on your chart, uh, you've got these lines that go through Australia. It, now, bear in mind, of course, Australia is an entire fucking continent that's basically the size of the United States. Uh, but uh, where I was speaking in Australia, uh, it, you know, was several different cities on either side of the coast. This was bi-coastal as an experience. And uh, he, so, so um, she said that I had the combat line going through that, that, that basically both in Australia and in um, Arizona, I my combat line went through there. So she was predicting uh, just uh, a, a kind of violation or, or violence or or or, or just uh, you, you know violence or a violation, and uh, and that shit is is just beyond right. I mean, <laughs> what she said was was uh, like, oh yeah, it's it's just no. No describing how right it is. It is. It was right as just as as rain. Right as right can be. It, there's uh the, there's no overstressing how she read it to a T uh, while dotting every I. It, it, it's like uh, uh, my experiences in both cases were indescribably horrific. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's uh there there we have that. So so take that shit seriously. It's it's nothing to dismiss. Uh, well, yes, I also had a friend who went to an astrocartographer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when he heard about it through me, mm -hmm. I wasn't telling him to move, and and he uh, was willing to pay the astrocartographer. That the guy looked at his chart and says, "You don't need to move. You're not going to pay me. <laughs> he won't take his money because he was doing very well mm -hmm. where he is, mm -hmm. and uh, so no, okay, stay where stay where you are." So, uh, and obviously, if people are doing well where they are, there's only two reasons people move, either because, well, if they have to, but if it's because they're not happy with their employment factor, mm -hmm. or they might be, they're either, they're unhappy and they think the grass is greener on the other side, mm -hmm. or they think they can do better somewhere else which is not always the case i mean if 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 in other words they might be have a good job like this guy and he thought well maybe i can do better elsewhere uh but i i think the the real issue with him was and it still is is protecting his kid from well then he wasn't he didn't have kids but he, he didn't want to have kids because of vaccinations uh and now uh now he has to deal with that. He does have a kid, and uh, and it was it has nothing to do with COVID. He just <laughs> doesn't trust. Well, well, with everybody being quarantined and staying indoors and nothing else to do, I'm sure there's a mini baby boom going on because of COVID. There's got to be a lot of COVID babies out well, there. He had his kid way before this, but, but the yeah. So, so it's you know anyway. Some people 
it's good to be in a spot where you're supposed to be. And I guess because I live primarily in California, New York, I was in Florida for seven years. I don't know if my lines went through there. But uh, yeah, it's it's good to live where you're supposed to live. Understood. Um, yeah. So so that's that's something to consider. Yes. And then yes. we can get on to uh, George Lucas. Oh, sure. Any, anything you want. We were talking about, uh, Brendan Zogat and I were talking about George Lucas earlier and how, uh, to use Bren's uh, terminology, how sketchy he is and always has been and how his connections with Michael Aquino are, are all too obvious and uh, how I told Brendan how you brought to my attention something I well, told I, I, heard, I heard you talking and I, he, I was impressed that he, he was familiar with that book. Uh, what, what was it called? Uh, oh, Fire Force. Fire Force, yeah. Yeah, it, and... Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a uh, Brendan asked a uh, solid. I'd actually be curious to read it. I'd be curious to read, <laughs> read it. I don't know if I will, just because. Uh, yeah, and then him bringing out the Sith with the set. Yeah, that, that that's good. Uh, yes. That that that's. Uh, he might have got the idea, and of course, you know, uh, he is a Lucas is a staple of the Bay Area. Of course, of course. Yeah, he's even gone to sushi restaurants that I've, uh, you know, frequented in the past. You know, he's he is what he is, but um, he's a lot more than what people think in the most negative sense. Um, by the way, I do want people to know because I haven't slept all, you know, for over 24 hours <laughs> that I am going to go mute when I need to chew because I also haven't really eaten in uh, over 24 hours dealing with what Brendan and I dealt with. While well, Brendan was all fucking higher than a kite and shit. Uh, but Brendan asked a solid question, and uh, Peter Moon brought up a solid point. When uh, Peter Moon brought up uh, to my attention uh, what I hadn't thought about in, you know, literally maybe decades, uh, the uh, uh, Michael Aquino's writing the book Fire Force, and Peter Moon was pointing out how did he have so much time to devote so much energy as to make it so many pages because it's a uh, fairly um you know it's it's not it was voluminous yeah yeah it, it, it's well certainly um his output is voluminous and when uh brendan zogan and i were looking at his sheer output of books the number of books that michael aquino has had published uh rivals that of peter moon's and and may may exceed Peter Moon's in terms of number, uh, and 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 so, as Peter Moon said, how does he how did he have, the time, to do this? And and it's conceivable he may have had, ghost writers who were cultists of the Temple of Set, who were writing books under his name. Uh, that may have been the case. I I know he did a lot of writing himself, and I remember when he was working on Fire Force. And I just never really thought about it. There were so many other things to pay attention to. But I do know that um, uh, Michael Aquino was very much, uh, cl he, he made the claim, the assertion, that he was responsible for Star Wars and uh, the Indiana Jones. And anybody who remembers his old website, I doubt it's up anymore, but Michael Aquino's old website while he was alive, if you would visit it, he would have a picture of his head photoshopped onto the body of Indiana Jones. And his co-religionist, his co-Satanist, uh, Mr. Uh, Alexander, uh, Paul Alexander, J Colonel Paul Alexander, um, he was the man who developed, quote-unquote, non-lethal weapons technology. His head would be uh, basically photoshopped onto the head of Indiana Jones's father or something like that, you know, uh, which I guess was Mike Lachino's backhanded compliment of saying he was older. And uh, so these two old farts had this fantasy that they were these adventurers and shit. And certainly Aquino brought that up on Above Top Secret, when after I outed myself as a public informant on Above Top Secret, Above Top Secret never allowed myself on again, doubtless due to Michael Aquino, who was then brought on to Above Top Secret as their regular columnist. So I don't know if that shit's accessible anymore. I'm sure Brandon could find that shit via his Wayback Machine and his technique of finding some stuff he's been finding for myself. But um, Michael Aquino uh, was on Above Top Secret for years, and, and he would uh, basically answer everybody, you know, ge in general. He'd answer people's questions about all kinds of bullshit, but at the same time, he would proselytize the, uh, his uh, chaosism, his, uh, his entropic worldview, and his religion 
which was then by that time uh, beyond the Temple of Set. Uh, he started off as still being part of the Temple of Set and then moved beyond it openly. Uh, and uh, and Jameson Reese, of course, brings to our attention he also taught at universities. This is true. And um, so aside from all of this, uh, Michael Aquino also, what was it he, he also did with the, um, he was also saying that he and Colonel Paul Alexander were uh, space agents. I mean, literally fucking space agents, part of some secret space program that, uh, you know, I've described in the past. But, you know, he made it sound like, uh, you know, they were glamour boys as opposed to like part of some bureaucratic aspect of it. And uh, so he was like one of the pioneers of what would now be the quote unquote space force. But he's um, the epitome. He's the epitome of someone who went to Cub Scouts, got all his badges, yeah. went to Boy Scouts, got all his badges, yeah. went to Eagle Scouts, got all his badges or whatever they call them, yeah. then goes to all these universities, gets all of his diplomas, yeah. and he is he, you know, he's just credential happy. Oh. And uh, he becomes like one giant credential. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And, and that's part of his authoritarianism. So he would uh, promote himself based on authority that you must. Uh, it, it, oh, um, so no, our, our, our lady Selena Khan, I almost said Noreen, is asking uh, which uh, university did Aquino teach at. He taught at the same one that my gang brother Beaver went to for the latter stages of his uh, accounting which was, uh, I'm trying to fucking remember, uh, I keep thinking Golden Gate University, but... Um, it's it, Golden I, Gate University, yes. Yeah, it's Golden Gate University then. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm actually uh, looking at a website yeah. of a PDF, uh, which is www.wracane.org uh, slash doc slash Aquino vitae.pdf. And okay. it, it, this guy's got so many fucking. He's got so many. Uh, holy shit! They talk about hungry for knowledge. Yeah. Well, he that was diff yeah his addiction. And uh, thank you, thank you. And do send that link to both myself and Peter Moon, and I'd appreciate that. And so Selena Khan was saying, is that state? No, it was a private university. Uh, uh, Golden Gate University was a private university that he taught at. And, uh, and, and so thank you for asking, Selena. And uh, it, it was, um, yeah, it, it's just a, a local private university in San Francisco, San Francisco based. And uh, so um, in terms of the other point I was gonna make about that was that, uh, so Brendan was looking at all these titles that uh, were churned out by Michael Aquino and he asked, you know, a solid question, do you really think he's dead? And, and, you know, it was a strange feeling because when I was looking at all that, all the, the books that had been published by Aquino, uh, most infamously his uh, book full of foot bullets, you know, called Extreme Prejudice, in which he says he was the victim of, uh, you know, this massive nationwide Christian conspiracy to persecute, you know, Satanists and shit. Uh, he uh, basically, you know, he, I almost got the feeling, you know, Maybe he is alive, but then again, um, I don't. Yes, yeah. I don't think my, in, intuitively, intuitively, I would say he's dead, mainly because his wife Lilith became so active, which, for whatever reason, either she was unable or did not dare to act as offensively as she's been acting up while he was alive. It, it was like uh, once. I get the feeling that she took the initiative because of his death and, and that she feels free, that she feels uh, free of constraints. Um, and uh, th th that's the way I, uh, you know, interpret that. By the way, I'm going to go mute for a little bit. I'm going to have to get some calories into myself. I'm going to let Peter Moon kind of take it from there with George I'll, Lucas. I'll talk about George Lucas yeah. while you do that. Thank and you. I don't have a whole lot to say about George Lucas, but I will then... I, after that, digress into Patton. Uh, but George Lucas, of course, Douglas was talking about and, and the connection with Aquino. He was very connected to Montauk, uh, according to Preston. And I, I will address that in a bit. But this is right off of Wikipedia. It says, after graduating with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Film in 1967, he tried joining the U.S. Air Force as an officer. 
but he was immediately turned down because of his numerous speeding tickets. I, I don't even know how the Air Force would, would know he had speeding tickets because you know we didn't have the internet back then, but apparently they did. He was later drafted by the Army for military service in Vietnam, but he was exempted from service after medical tests showed he had diabetes, the disease that killed his paternal grandfather. And if you see pictures of George Lucas, he looks you know, very physically unfit and like he looks diabetic or even maybe like he has goiter or hyperthyroidism or something like that. In 1967, this is from Wiki, Lucas re-enrolled as a USC graduate student in film production. And here's the key point. He began working under Verna Fields for the United States Information Agency where he met his future wife, Marcia Griffin or Marcia Griffin. I, I believe Marcia Griffin was Preston Nichols' cousin, but I'm not sure of that. But you know, here's the key, United States Information Agency. Um, I had never, and the reason I was even looking this up because Douglas and I were having a private discussion about it. And then I ran into United States Information Agency and I'd never heard of this thing. And one of the reasons I never heard of it and many of you, if not all of you have not heard of it, is because it was kept confidential. It was not meant to be no. Right. Just like right. The, just like the Office of War Information, which it obviously is the successor to, just as the CIA was to the OSS. Please go on. Yes. Yes, and and just like the first motion picture unit, the first motion picture unit operated out of um, uh, the Hollywood Hills. To the top. It's now owned by some famous movie star. I forget his name. Uh, Jared something, uh, but rock star. He's more of a rock star than a movie star. But that that was uh, it's called Wonderland. It was called Wonderland. It still is. It's where they they do all these military movies. It was right down the street from where Robert Heinlein lived, and where Hubbard L. Ron Hubbard stayed with him uh, prior that prior to meeting Jack Parsons. Uh, and where he was allegedly sent in by the U.S. Navy under the direction of Robert Heinlein, uh, who was already a friend of Jack Parsons. But anyway, the United States Information Agency existed from 1953. I think it actually goes back before that. But it says, from 1953 to 1995, devoted to public diplomacy. Uh in 1999, the broadcasting functions were moved to the newly created Broadcasting Board of Governors. Now, that's something else we could look at. Uh, I haven't looked into that. Is an independent agency of the U.S. government which operates various state-run media outlets. Uh, that's something we can look at when I finish diatribing about the U.S. Information Agency. Um, so it no longer is an agency, just like the Office of War Information is no longer an agency. Um, it is, its exchange and non-broadcasting information functions were given to the newly created Under Secretary of State for Public Dis Diplomacy and Public Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, so basically, you have the U.S. State Department as your information agency, and it's going to be interacting with the public. Now, this goes back to 1953, and Dwight David Eisenhower, who said the purpose was to establish, was established to streamline, streamline the U.S. government's overseas information programs and make them more effective. Its stated goals were to explain and advocate U.S. policies in terms that are credible and meaningful in foreign cultures. Two, to provide information about the official policies of the United States and about the people, values, and institutions which influence those policies. Here you see a lot of propaganda films, not only about Japan and, and the World War, but about drugs, about communists, about all that stuff that went on in, in the McCarthy era. To bring the benefits of international engagement to American citizens and institutions by helping them build strong long-term relationships with their counterparts overseas. Four, to advise the president and US government policymakers on the ways in which foreign attitudes 
will have a direct bearing on the effectiveness of U.S. policies. And then it goes on to say uh, that propaganda has played a large role in how the U.S. was viewed by the world during the Cold War. Uh, American propagandists felt as though the Hollywood movie industry was destroying the image of the United States and other countries. In response to the negative portrayal of the U.S. from communist propaganda, the United States Information Agency existed as much to provide a view of the world to the United States as it did to give the world a view of America. The purpose of the USIA within the United States was to assure Americans that the United States was working for a better world. So this is this whole uh, m method of communicating is what people in the 60s upchucked on. They just threw up over the Pollyanna-ish uh, moralizing television shows like Leave it to Beaver and uh, shows of that ilk, the Westerns, the it was just a bunch of crap. This is how it was viewed in the 1960s. We can't take it anymore. And so then you had a real counterculture emerging to combat against this propaganda. This isn't the way things are. So uh, he says, Dwight, Eisen Dwight Eisenhower says, audiences would be more receptive to the American message if they were kept from identifying it as propaganda. Duh. So you, know, <laughs> you, would, try, you would try to make people, uh, make it more genuine, uh, you know, Gloria Steinem, CIA agent, admittedly, you know, being the woman's rights stuff. And it's it's like it's all a bunch of crap. And and they say in the 60s, these people were viewed as the bad guys, the, the, the military, the press, anyone over 30. And to tell you the truth, anyone over 30 was very predisposed towards not getting it. They just didn't get it. Now, there were some people that did, but by and large, it's like there was such what they, they called this word generation gap. We don't have, have the same generation gap today. There's always a generation gap, but it's much different. Whereas uh, my generation of, of parents were much more involved an understanding of what went on in their children's lives than say my parents were, uh, or not just my parents, but the whole generation. They were clueless, absolutely clueless as to what was going on with their kids. And and furthermore, they couldn't understand what was going on with their kids. Yeah, and, and by, by the way, what was your opinion on Philip Hiley? Uh, his surname was spelled W-Y-L-I-E. And he was one of these science fiction writers who was a peer, you know, he was around at the time of um, A.E. Van Voigt and, you know, L. Ron Hubbard and all the rest of them in the Golden Age. And uh, he, Phil Hiley, um, he produced A Generation of Vipers and uh, a lot of other... Uh, How do you spell his name? Oh, Philip, and then Hiley was spelled W-Y-L-I-E. Um, you would probably instantly recognize his books. I never heard of him. Oh, okay. So, and, I mean, I've, I've read about the golden age of science fiction uh -huh. uh, and certainly read many of the authors. Um, pulp science fiction, no, n just just never heard of him. Wow, he uh, was one of the first guys who came up with the Superman kind of character. I mean, even before uh, the, you know, Man of Bronze and all the rest of that. So he was old. I mean, but he was but always he's kind 10 of... years older. He's about nine years older than Hubbard. So he was already on the scene. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. I, I just just not familiar. I'm looking at his Wikipedia. I, I'm just not familiar. Yeah, um, he he was always trying to be hip and cool and 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 down with the kids. So he wrote books like A Generation of Vipers, where he was trying to say tell the he was trying to tell the adults what's going on. But he was trying to, he was using all of these like uh you know buzzwords from the day and uh these days of course his, his stuff is unreadable it's just too dated because of those buzzwords that were so contemporary at the time are just too distinctively you know 
different from today. It's just like, hey, is this your bag? Hey, <laughs> you know what's? It's just it's just stuff we wouldn't say if, anymore. If you want to see the 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 words, look at the. If you ever want to see the the, the language they used in the probably around 1960, uh, I certainly remember it growing up. Was a 77 Sunset Strip. If you can, you, they have YouTube's of that, and just some of the, like uh, the, the the, they even have a song about Cookie. Cookie was the guy who would comb his hair, and uh, and he was this character, you know, Private Eye, yeah. and uh, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. was like the the more mature one of the of the gang, and they would uh, use words like Daddy O. Wow, that's that's, you know, that's Cookie man. Wow! Yeah, yeah. You know, yes. What's your bag? And and it was it was so ridiculous. It sounds really ridiculous now, but but at the time that was the other one that got the most airplay was uh, Bob Denver, who most people know as Gilligan, was uh, played Maynard G. Krebs on uh, Toby Gillis, <laughs> <laughs> and and that's where you know we grew up knowing. That's where I I learned what a beatnik was from from Maynard G. Krebs, uh, the people know as Gilligan. And he was, uh, yeah, he used words like daddy-o and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and and p- kids did use those words right. to it, a certain right. extent. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, it, and it's amazing how dated uh, slang or, um, you know, uh, the the in-words uh, can be the terms. Uh, I, I think these days... Uh, what uh, people like Brendan or younger people are using are pretty easy to adapt to. They're nothing like uh, the kind of words uh, that used to be used. Uh, I used to make fun of my father by saying, oh, when you were young, you would say things like uh, uh, the bee's knees and 23 skidoo and vote. He says, no, 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 that was before my time. That was even before his time in the 20s, of course. Uh, he was born in 1919. So the, you know, the people who were saying that were adults, uh, young adults, you know, while he was, uh, he, he was just basically learning to walk. Uh, but, uh, so I had yeah. fun with that, that, but anyhow, so, uh, but also say the beatnik culture in Southern California, where I live kind of got just upended and knocked away by the, the surf culture that was so much, uh, promulgated, uh, by reason of the music of the beach boys, right? That, that like, so there was a whole surf hip culture that was emerging in in but that was primarily relegated to southern california it it do, doesn't really work up in northern california or oregon <laughs> um, it's too too cold it's too cold and and then then that was completely supplanted by the whole hippie thing yeah. that that just then that the hippie thing was bigger than all of them yeah, that, yes. that, that took the took the the beaten culture and ran with it, but it completely, you know, just swallowed it up, yes. uh, and that became and even to the point where in the nineteen seventies, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the the baseball players had long hair too, just not as long as the hippies, but they were, it was hair was the culture. Oh yeah, that was that... After, after that that musical hair. Yes, uh, yes, big that... influence. Yeah, that was the thing I couldn't stand about television series, like uh, the aspect that made Battlestar Galactica unwatchable to myself. Uh, I loved the Cylons because the Cylons were bitching. I mean, they were uh, they they were all glitch and draws. They were all bling, but uh, the human characters I just couldn't stand because they all had long hair. That, that didn't make any sense because you know they, they were trying to portray them as being a Western styled military, uh, but you know they all had long hair. It was rather preposterous. But uh, so there you had that. Um, I'm I'm going to continue eating. You're doing such a great job. Uh, I, continue eating yeah, and, yeah, and so i was talking about the u.s information agency yeah, which is important and uh, yeah. as i say this is uh i invite people to, to to look in it's just but it's such a continuation of the office of war information and, 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 and it's it so was, damning it's so damning for george lucas so please yeah go on. well yeah that that that's how i discovered it yes it basically says he is a u.s information agent uh and you know Spielberg, all, all these. Now, the the woman that brought him there, um, let me see here. Um, the woman that brought him there was uh, 
I got to go back to his uh, back to his wiki page because uh, I lost it. She she was a Vera um, Vera Fields. Now Vera Fields is an American film editor, sound engineer, uh, in, entertainment industry executive. Uh, most worked mostly on smaller projects that gained little recognition. Um, film instructor at USC, which is where she would have met her one major studio film, El Cid, led to her only industry recognition in that phase of her career, given a Golden Reel Award for sound editing. Um, I, I don't, she says she had established close ties with directors Peter. Bogdanovich, George Lucas, and Steven Spielberg early in their careers and became known as their mother cutter. The term cutter is an informal variation of film editor. The critical and commercial success of the films What's Up Doc, American Graffiti, and Jaws brought Fields a level of recognition that was unique among film editors at the time. Jaws in particular was enormously and unexpectedly profitable and ushered in the era of the summer blockbuster film. Fiener Field's contributions to this success were widely acknowledged. So, you know, she knew how to cut film uh, and apparently <laughs> cut it pretty well. I, I don't know. Uh, she worked on Death Valley Days, which uh, Ronald Reagan starred in, quite illegally, by the way, because he was uh, part of, you know, he was the head of the uh, Screen Actors Guild. Um, and and he gave a if you go back into the congressional record, uh, Reagan was was grilled by Congress in about 1962 for his role with the Screen Actors Guild, and and, and every answer he would give was, well, uh, I don't remember, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, he was just telling the truth. He was already getting senile. <laughs> That yeah, was his 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 standard uh, his, his standard work. I, I mean, she was quite. She was the film editor on Jaws, and uh, it says the editing of Jaws has been intensely studied for over thirty years. So it's it's a classic, I guess, in terms of editing. And I always heard that uh, Spielberg liked to, you know, manipulate his audience, have them on the edge of their seat. Uh, maybe he learned some of this for her. I, you know what I mean? But it, um, anyway, um, I, I don't know what her role was other than she knew how to edit films. But she certainly uh, worked for the United States Information Agency, probably more as a as a cutter, mother cutter than anything. I don't know if she, you know, was just probably told what to do. But when we go back to the Information Agency, I'll, I'll go to the page, which I have not looked at, is... It's now the U.S. Agency for Global Media, which oh. sounds much more sinister. <laughs> it operates various state-run media outlets, like Fox News, CNN, and, and CNBC. It doesn't say that. I say that. Uh, it didn't mention Fox <laughs> News, CNN, and MSNBC. It describes its mission, vital to U.S. national interests, or to inform, engage, and connect people around the world in support of freedom and democracy, and uh, of course that could be that could be interpreted as either pro-Trump or anti-Trump, or pro-Biden or anti-Biden, in accordance with the foreign policy objectives of the United States. It supervises Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio e Television, Marti, Radio Free Asia. Alhura TV and Radio Sawa. Uh, it it currently has only an advisory role. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, like we advise you to uh, uh, shut down or or yeah, you... yeah, do this or you'll be shut down. Uh, <laughs> so this basically tells us that it's all, you know, it's 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 all controlled. We I mean we know this. We just don't necessarily see the agencies in uh in action 
Well, well, the beauty of this is that we now know that when the Office of War Information went black, went off the books, we know where it went. And the continuity is very similar to the CIA. Uh, what I can't understand is why they changed it again. At the time that it um, shut down again, uh, what was assumed by um, perhaps yourself, but certainly by Brendan, was that it uh, was then uh, transmogrified into the Department of Homeland Security, which is a good call, but rather all-encompassing even beyond what it originally was doing. So um, it's, it makes sense that they simply changed the name and became something else. But what do you think would motivate them to do that? What, what, what well, it's, it's the whole concept of the, de of the, the deep state. The deep state, uh, not necessarily in the Trump uh, sense lexicon, yeah. But the the deep state is like more like the Death Star. Uh, it, it's like operating. It uses all these agencies, and it, it can fire people from the agencies. It can do what it wants with the agency. You know, the agencies are just basically puppet artifices that people can be fired from or hired hired into and you know it's 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 like a joke like the uh you know the, the center for disease control is not even a government agency it's a private agency mm. but yeah. it, it chills as a government everybody thinks it's government because they rhetorically treat it like that right. right and it does the services of the government it might as well be the government uh, right and, and, you know, so many agencies like the IRS and the, uh, what's the other one, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, they have dubious foundational credentials. Right. Uh, to right. put it politely. <laughs> but they serve the function. They are the, uh, you know, they're like the government of Germany. They, they govern Germany. They're not the legal government of Germany. They're the occupied. So, you know, the federal, we're occupied by the IRS, the Federal Reserve, and probably a host of other, well, by the Democrat Party and the Republican Party. You cannot uh, avoid these parties. You can't. I mean, they're, they're, they have, they control things. They are political. If you think about political power, it's all in the politics. So the, the, they are the police, the government. It's either Republican or Democrat. Yeah, and and, uh, and, 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 and well, anyway, go ahead. Oh no, no, no! I'm I, I, I'm still you know trying to get calories into my body, but yeah, you're doing you're doing so well, and I'm so glad that you came on tonight. And uh, obviously, uh, you, you know, you give myself a chance to kind of center myself and uh, just uh, get myself together. Um, you can keep chewing, and I'll talk about George Lucas's connection to Montauk. Which, yeah. Oh yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Which is. Uh, of course, this is from Preston Nichols, and Preston Nichols grew up in East Islip, um, and you know he had he had always a a very unusual interaction with celebrity, um, and, and I think I remember talking. The, the one thing I, I guess just to verify his some of his stories is um, I had once asked his father. I said, you know, he's talked all about all these rock bands that he worked with. I said, did you ever see anybody? He says, only once. And he said that um, he came home one day, perhaps after work, and he said the Beach Boys were in his living room. And they were uh, getting apart from Preston. They, they were and getting a, a what from Part musical part or amplifier. He was fixing their amplifier. They oh, needed wow. help. Uh, by the and, way, you should tell people while while you're there. This will send you on another ta tangent. Just Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, how he fell under the mind control of his psychiatrist, who was doing everything to him, including, as far as I understood, fucking him. And this was a guy, and um, it was just incredible. I, I never heard that he was having sex with a psychiatrist, but he certainly was manipulated. There have been documentaries on that and also the Beatles were particularly Dennis Wilson the drummer uh, and the only one of them who could who could surf the only Beach Boy who could surf um, he was wrapped up with Charles Manson very tightly holy shit <laughs> very tightly um, 
and and that's that's all been in documentaries and whatnot. It it wasn't really that well known at the time. It's only come out, I think, in the last 15, 20 years, of how how much the Beach Boys were. It's not something they really wanted to talk about. But yeah, no uh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and the. And the Beach Boys, the Beach Boys were very uncool in the late 60s. They were, they were the epitome of cool uh, up until the Monterey Pop Festival. The Monterey Pop Festival in 1967 was, was, there were three pivotal music events in the 60s. One was the Newport Folk Festival, which got Bob Dylan you know, his star, so to speak, uh, and Joan Baez. And then there was the Monterey Pop Festival in 67, which the song uh, written by John Phillips for that festival was the song, All Those Who Come to San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear a Flower in Your Hair. Right. He wrote that song for the Monterey Pop Festival. Wow. And that that was where people discovered, I think, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, uh, and they really got big airplay. Of course, the Jefferson Airplane, I don't know that they needed to be discovered, but that helped them. Uh, but the one group that was a, that didn't show up were the Beach Boys, the Mamas and the Papas. You know, of course, that was John Phillips. But the, the Beach Boys didn't go because the publicist said, they were afraid it would spoil their image because they <laughs> were sort of like... It, it, yeah, all uh, American. Sure. They were square. Well, com they, they were trying... The, 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 you know, surfers were not quite hippies, so they were their own sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, the, the Beach Boys were trying clean to be cut. Clean cut. They, they was, yeah, clean cut. That's what they were. And then it was a big mistake PR-wise, and they... Like, and they didn't fit in. Their whole mindset didn't fit in, even though they would go to India and become friends with the Beatles and go with this this guru guy, I forget his name, Maharishi. <laughs> Mr. And, Rapist, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and so they they went on a spiritual trip, and they then they started to wear long hair. I always felt it was a cheap imitation of the Beatles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe it wasn't, but but it but whatever, um, and and so anyway that 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 was sort of just a uh, side digression on the Beach Boys, but anyway, uh, the Beach Boys were incredibly talented, and they had uh, they were Preston's in Preston's living room. The way Preston told the story later was that they were in the backyard and they, they got the equipment fixed and they went in the backyard and had a concert. And all the kids from all the neighborhood came around. Well, the father, you know, verified the story basically for me. He says, I came home and the Beach Boys were in my living room. And I said to him, I said, you know, did you ever think that their name, last name was Wilson? He says, no, that's interesting. Because, of course, the Wilson name was so prevalent in the work I did uh, uh, trying to verify Preston's story. So the, the Wilson synchronicity name was, was very prevalent. But anyway, uh, the other one was, um, I think Duncan uh, said one time he saw Linda McCartney in the neighborhood. And she had, I think she grew up right near Preston, Linda McCartney, Paul McCartney's wife. So he claimed to, to, you know, to, to, to actually do the Beatles. Uh, he did many of these records, like at Sergeant Pepper, was so much of him, but he doesn't get any credit on any of these things. Uh, Alan Parsons was the credited guy on uh, Sergeant Pepper. Preston would go into great details about the recordings of these things. Uh, it, it, you know, it wasn't always something, you know, certainly they weren't taking notes because so much of that, but that's a whole digression. That's the book, The Music of Time, you can read. And George Lucas sort of fits into that book. I don't know. He's mentioned to some extent. I don't remember how extensively. But what basically, he said that he got a call from Mark Hamill, 
Now, Mark Hamill is his childhood friend. And Mark Hamill's father was either an army or naval intelligence. If I think he worked in both. And I did get a verification of, of that from one of the ladies who used to come to our Montauk night, who was a local teacher. And she was a friend as well. And she said that this makes sense because she said Mark Hamill was her student. And he would he would say crazy things like my father works in the CIA. My father works in the CIA and he has horrible grades because he was always off doing music and he was playing music in uh, the bubblegum music, the 1910 Fruit Gum Company, uh, I think the Ohio Express. He did songs like this. He was he was a master songwriter, lyricist, musician, as was his brother. And they don't really get any attention for that. You see Mark Hamill's musical ability surface when he plays Amadeus. And uh, he plays it, I think, on Broadway. Hmm. Uh, you cannot play Amadeus and, and on Broadway and not be a consummate musician. Um, David Hulse in the movie was not a consummate musician. He didn't want to do the movie, according to Preston, because he didn't want to be... Uh, appears so effeminate, which he is very effeminate. So he didn't want he didn't want to be. That's just sad. <laughs> to be that well, insecure. He was he was a, he was already you know Luke Skywalker. You know he didn't want to compromise that image. He's also in a movie called Time Runner, Mark Hamill. Right. A low budget movie, which is, you know that's a, that's an interesting movie. Well, well there's so one in which whole... he, there's there's a few of those cheap '80s films that he was in. You just can't believe it's him. He's he's just queer looking as hell and looks like a total fucking clown. It's uh, so I I don't know what the fuck he was working worried about with Amadeus. Maybe, um, but uh, he... well, yeah, yeah, see, this these are stories. But anyway, so uh, Preston and Mark were 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 friends childhood. He knew him as Mark Kikowski which is his real name. Now, I've had whole run-ins with the Gakowski family, not directly, but that's a whole nother story. Uh, but um, Bob Gakowski was like the president of Madison Square Garden. And then he's the one who merchant, after, after he left Madison Square Garden, where he was the head of the Knicks and the Rangers, president, because MSG, Madison Square Garden, owned the, the, the New York Knicks and the New York Rangers. So... After that, he, he moved on to merchandising sporting equipment. So when you see all of these, you know, like, I, I think it's gotten to the point where if you want to call your Little League team the Dodgers or the Yankees, you can't do it. I don't think you can do that anymore uh, because they own these names and stuff. Yeah. It, it, it's yeah. almost that, you know. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah I don't know if sure. you can. I'm surprised. I, I I I thought it was always like that, but it's probably they never enforced now, it. I, I played for the Yankees and the Dodgers when I was a kid. It was no <laughs> big deal, you know. You yeah, it was a little league team. You got a uniform that had the NY on it for New York, and 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 you know, or it said Dodgers across the the front of your T-shirt. It, yeah, it wasn't a big deal, but uh, like like, and it got so ridiculous that when my daughter i think it was the second grade they did a play a school play which you know you go to see it was actually pretty good and it, it was based upon this tv show who wants to be a millionaire but they, <laughs> yes. they could not do that they could only they so they had to make the show who wants to be a million times better Delightful. so they were was very popular they were making fun of the show they did a good job but they had to call the show who wants to be a million times better instead of who wants to be a millionaire i mean this is how stupid it's a school play <laughs> this is how much commercialism has gone awry so anyway um preston got a call from mark hamill and says how would you like to come work on a film i'm working on a film it'll pay twenty dollars an hour and Preston says, that sounds good. Uh, and he went and worked on Star Wars and did the sound. And he told me that they had, as you mentioned earlier, uh, psychics directed around the, uh, you know, behind the, the cameras to 
put the intention for people to come watch this again and again and again. Yep. And as I was telling Douglas yeah. privately, yeah. when I worked on L. Ron Hubbard's letterline, that he got more letters about Star Wars than he did about Scientology. And and they were saying, oh, this reminds me of the, you know, the Scientology whole track. I don't know. They were all, everybody loved Star Wars. Every 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 story was story with letter about Star Wars was just oh this is the greatest thing that or ever, and uh, so it, it was just people were going again and again and again, and that and that was the idea. So Preston said that he worked with George Lucas and he got in a fight with him. He, he was uh, not a physical fight, but um, Preston was a, a genius when it came to sound engineering. He worked on the movie, I think it was called Earthquake, and he actually had it worked in theaters to where the, the seats would start shaking with sound vibration, but it was too much. It was like a real mini earthquake. It, it was actually got a bit too dangerous. Right. That, that reminds me, because that could cause panic in theaters, that reminds me of when they tried to... Uh, introduce smell into theaters as a new sensation along with sound and sight then they said okay let's do smell and so during a western when they were pumping in smoke uh, because they were basically lighting a fire and they were around a campfire they were just trying to put in the smell of smoke and everybody thought the theater was on fire and it caused a mass panic that was that's yeah Preston working on the shaking the shaking seats is along those lines it's it's amazing that people even think that something I mean, who would even for a moment even think about that without thinking that all the way through? <laughs> it's beyond me. Um, but there you have that. Um, because uh, that's what George Lucas was about, giving a visual. Yeah. Giving a visual. Mm -hmm. He loves visuals and emotions. He says this. I've seen his interviews. He's like changing your emotions with visuals. Uh, Spielberg does that, too. And I, I mean, there is definitely room for emotions in artistic presentations of film. But, you know, there's something to be, I, I'm much more intellectual oriented. Uh, I'm not, not devoid of the emotional concept and that's important, but yeah, it's, it's almost like the emotion over the intellect. <laughs> you know it's 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 and people are people are such emotional sponges it's amazing it's like they will respond emotionally that's where you have to reach people they they respond better emotionally than intellectually yes whether that's right or wrong it's just what is it's, it's just what it is. yeah it, it is what is and so when you emote when you change the mood or the mood and visuals can do that it's and George Lucas. I will say this to his credit because I wa I was watching some interviews with him, uh, and one of the things he said was that he was kind of bemoaning Star Wars because he says they've just basically taken it and they're they're and this is not just Star Wars they do it with. He says when you do something original and innovative that gets attention, like say when he did Star Wars, it, it was a success. Then what happens is everybody wants to do a knockoff on it because they say, oh, that works, so we're going to make... He says, so there was all these science fiction movies that came out. And he says, basically, they all sucked. <laughs> this is when somebody did something successful. So let's all do it. They do this in sports, too. If somebody does something that works all the other teams will tend to imitate it. And it's it's just the way people are. But in the movie business, it's horrendous because you do a, I'm trying to think of another example other than other than Star Wars, but uh, well, like, it, you know, it, Lord it, of the Rings did it, not begin a bunch of fantasy movies. No, thank God. Uh, but they we already bled through all those. I mean, long time ago they bled through those around the time of Star Wars. They started doing a bunch of uh, knockoffs of the Lord of the Rings type themes. Only they were different types of fantasy films that uh, didn't try to uh, encompass the scope of Lord of the Rings for obvious reasons. Nobody had that budget. 
uh, but, uh, you know, Peter Jackson, who finally did the Lord of the Rings. I mean, we're talking about a guy who started off, as you've probably heard me say before. It, with, porno? Yeah, with Gorno. With, yeah, gore pornography. This is what... Yeah, um, uh, 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 Francis Ford Coppola was doing skin flicks as well. Oh, yeah, but the, the, that's, um, there's a difference between conventional porn and gorno <laughs> i mean you know people getting sawed up you know it's all special effects but nonetheless you know people getting sawed up chewed up cannibalized spat out i mean this is what we're talking about is that's what, the... what peter jackson was doing yes <laughs> he's got a reputation for uh you know really bad stuff it is well he should <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not even going to say it. Because, yes, but, but we can imagine. We can imagine. I mean, honestly. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and, in spite of that, uh, he does have some ability as a director. Yeah, it, yeah. and, and, and uh, oh, my God. Uh, so, so there you have that. And, but, but he's got the sponsorship, okay? And um, it, it, it's like... Um, it's almost if you're given that much money, I can't imagine how anyone could fail. But then, of course, we saw what happened with the uh, the so-called brothers who became sisters with the Polish name, uh, the Wachuski brothers or whatever. I, 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 you know, I've, I've I purged their their name from my memory. I don't know why I do, but they're so fucking. The Wachowski brothers. Yeah, Wachowski brothers. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, should I say the Wachowski sisters? Yes, that's <laughs> yes, yeah. And and for those of you who don't know, the Wachowski brothers both have had sex changes or or they claim they've had sex changes i for all i know they're just putting on wigs and they say they've had sex changes because they look so fucking ugly why are they doing what they're doing it it, it doesn't make any sense I, and and uh oh. it, it's, it's uh, i mean <laughs> I, you know, I'm just going to let go of that because I can't go anywhere but down with that. I'm just going to go into the gutter and start making fun of them. And that's fine, you know. I, I, I don't mind making fun of them, but, you know, where can you go beyond that? Um, I, I, it, it, it's just, uh, you wonder why people... If, 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 they destroyed their own franchise matrix. Yeah. You could make them. Yeah, go yeah. On. And, and, and uh, you know, just so Peter Moon gets it, it's like, um, you know... Are they uh, the guys that did the matrix? Yeah! Yeah, yeah. and, I, and what I, else... I, 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 I did see the first Matrix movie, but uh, it, but I was like, really, I think I saw it on TV. I was not interested in that. And, you know, you see David Icke come out writing his book about the Matrix. And, and so now everybody starts using that as a go word. Right. And, and I don't like that, you know. Yeah, that's just lame. It's just fucking it's lame. Like, it was like, play, it was like, you know, it's like it gave him an idea, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, it's that jump on the bandwagon mindset. It sucks. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, yeah. In other words, yeah. And let's, let's, everybody's and, and shape shifting reptilian. Everyone was doing the bullet time after the Matrix did the bullet time where they slow everything down. So now in movies, even today, when they have special effects, everything's slowed down. And it's lame. It's like, dude, <laughs> nothing in real life, real life, bullets don't go that slow. In real life, some, a car is not going to flip over at like, and like, as if it's like floating in space, you know. It's just, well, sometimes it's, people do have that experience when they they go through something like that. But but yeah, I mean the movies are. It's just like and what George Lucas is saying. It's like this isn't about, you know, it's not about creativity. It's about, uh, it's just about it's a copycatism, mm. and and he's now doing stuff that he said would never work. He's you know in other words he's doing inventive stuff now because he has the money to afford it. And he's he's interested in experimental film. Uh, we hope that this isn't like, you know, Dr. Frankenstein type films, but <laughs> we don't really know. Um, so so anyway, uh, he you know, Preston worked for George Lucas and he also said that George Lucas, and I could ne I've never been able to verify this because it's kind of hidden through corporations and I, I don't know uh, he said that he bought the Montauk Manor. And the Montauk Manor is a big building. Montauk, you can't miss it if you go there. It's built on an old Indian burial ground. And it's sort of like you can buy condos there now. You can also stay at it. And it's, um, 
it really shouldn't be there because of the Indian ground, but nevertheless it is. There's a lot of tunnels underneath it, which they've even shown on TV. Um, that's a that's kind of how I discovered the underground, the the real one, from somebody I knew who stayed there and told me about the tunnels. They let him go down there and look at them. Uh, they were definitely rum running tunnels, but they extend into the town and and whatnot. So George Lucas, according to Preston, was was involved uh, on some level with Montauk. It would make sense that he was connected to the Presidio, and now we know he was part of the. Uh, this, you know, the, this, this, yeah, the successor to the Office of War information, uh, which puts him right up there with Satan and, <laughs> and the deep state itself. Uh, it, it's, it's uh, um, yeah, he's, he's definitely someone now that hopefully no one ever trusts him um, who listens to us. Not to mention, of course, that he uh, made certain to purchase uh, the property in the Presidio that he did and, you know, him and Disney, they set about destroying all evidence of so much that was committed at the Presidio. Um, so much in terms of crime, so much in terms of uh, crimes against humanity, uh, crimes against children. Uh, all that is, is now all the evidence on the surface world is destroyed. All that remains is the tunnels underneath the Presidio that are sealed and it would take major engineering efforts to blast them open and um, uh, that's uh, you know perhaps that's for the best right now uh, but uh, this is the um, this is the horror uh, that I have exposed and uh, you know and I do remind people that um, it is unhealthy to be overly fascinated with this to the point where people claim that they're seeking justice or something like that often are fascinated with this sort of thing and uh it's uh definitely uh not to be um you know really i always look very suspiciously at people who um who say that and um because uh say what I say that oh i'm so interested in helping the children i want to save the children oh, you know because yeah, i bring yeah. up uh, you know, obviously, when I became a public informant, the fate of many children was the um, was obviously one of the things that I addressed and, and what had been going on when I originally uh, was hemorrhaging the information was what that was the direct cause of the quote unquote satanic panic that they later on did damage control on and did everything they could to dismiss. I mean, this just went on and on. Uh, but uh you know, when it comes to uh, the, the children, and I might go a bit into it um, uh, tonight, you know, Jameson Reese is, is putting into the uh, text box, he says, ev almost everyone who says that abuses children themselves or they're an abuser of child pornography, which enables uh, the abusers. Uh, it's the same thing. It's just one step removed. But um, the QAnon Republican candidate, uh, he was just arrested and charged with possession of child pornography. And that, of course, was uh, the um, the QAnon candidate that uh, was, uh, you know, there's so many of them, and a number of them won. We have QAnon candidates that are sitting in Congress now uh, working with people whom they are convinced are uh, trafficking in human children. Uh, this is, uh, the, the you know, the so-called... Um, people who are fighting the conspiracy are now part of the state that they despise. Why are they even running for election if they feel that the government is so corrupt? It, it, it's one of these things that just doesn't make any sense. Are they trying to get in on the action? <laughs> it's, well, it sounds like it sounds like this is one of them already. You know, in other words, yeah. if I was a QAnon person, I'd say that's a somebody had infiltrated QAnon so he could discredit it. If, it, if I was a QAnon supporter, I would say that. Right. Which is not. But, um, yeah, I mean, and, and then the whole QAnon thing, it, it's like, well, where did all this inside information go? It does, it, the problem is it, it just chokes on itself. It, it does. It's, it's it, really it, run its course. It's run its course. It's run out. So I can't believe people are still. The only one I can understand kind of giving it a wink and a nod is Trump, but only because it, it supports him. That's all. That's the only reason. No. You know, yeah, yeah. Pat them on the back, so he gives them a wink and a nod just because they're patting them on the back. That's all. Right. Uh, by the way, the individual that I'm talking about is um, uh, Ben Gibson. I think his name is. 
Uh, I, you know, I'm trying to blot his name from my memory. I know it's inescapable. I'm going to have to talk about him in a, an hour or so. But Ben Gibson, uh, of course, I, this goes without saying, and this is how I found out, he's an active airman at Barksdale Air Force Base. And so uh, the fucker's 34 years old, and he was arrested with uh, his mate, so this 30-year-old guy named Jared Kutz, who was also charged with possession of child porn. And both is of the these airmen, is the airman now? A bit, but which one of them is? You said he was. He had won an election. He um, himself, a, he's a failed candidate in this ca his case. Oh, but, but, so he, um, didn't he didn't win for, for but, but we But we've got QAnon candidates who did win, who are serving in Congress now. <laughs> they haven't been caught with child porn, have they? Or no, but I think it's only a matter of time, to tell you the truth, because, I mean, you know, so many of the people involved with that, I mean, the, the whole thing is hashtag save the children and, uh, you know, it's all they talk about is, uh, you know, child trafficking. Uh, I remember that guy who was the Olympic, uh, y you know, swimmer who I, I knew and he was just in, he bought in all the way into that. It was sad. It was just so sad. And uh, it just didn't make any sense. But then anyone who buys into it, it doesn't make any sense. But that was the power of Michael Aquino and his legacy. Was that uh, all, I, all I will say is this when it was a, a few months before all this uh, police mm -hmm. uh, discrimination started, mm -hmm. anti police stuff. Yeah. Um, it was in, six months before I said, and, and nothing to do with any of any abuse they might have been uh, perpetrating. It wasn't in relation that I said, I, I sure wouldn't want to be a policeman. Every time I'd see a police, like, I, I wouldn't want to be a policeman. Because, you know, what if you're sitting there in a car and somebody comes by you, comes by you at 85 miles an hour giving you the finger? I, I don't want to go chasing after anybody like that. <laughs> they're, they're, number one, they're crazy, and they're also dangerous. Yeah. Even if you don't bring guns into the equation, who wants to go chasing that down? You know what I'm saying? Like, what a, what a crummy job that is. Yes. What a dangerous job it is. I don't want that job. Yes. Now, I feel I, I feel the same right now about uh, these Democratic politicians that soon will be taking office. I wouldn't want to be any of them. <laughs> Just wouldn't want to be them. I, I don't uh, I, I certainly don't envy them anything they have. I, I think they're in. I think they're they're all in great peril. I can't say from what angle. But I think they're they're taking very dangerous jobs. You know, they might have been better off building the Golden Gate Bridge, which was a very dangerous job. <laughs> With a high casualty rate. This is the way I feel about them. I, I mean, I think they're in, in, I think they have real shitty jobs. And that, uh, you know, without saying that they're earning their pay, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's it, it. You know, it's. It might make some justification for all the perks they get. I, I don't envy these people, but but so, so be it. Um, so if we're done with George Lucas, I can go on to General Patton. Yes, please. And uh, I presume, of course, that you did hear what I had to say about it on the latest episode. Yes, I did listen to it, okay. and it was very, uh, very detailed. I, I I've heard much of that stuff. Uh, not, I don't know if I've heard all of it. I didn't know that Bill Riley had, had put his name on a book about George, General Patton. Oh, yeah. And he also I mean, put his name on a book about uh, Japan in World War II. I forgot what it was. But <laughs> it was I forgot even what the subject was, but it was about... Yeah, he, he sums it up. He did, one on, he did one on Christ. I think he did one on Lincoln. He tells you all you need to know. He's, he sums it up. And, <laughs> you know, he's, he's a very authoritative... Uh, take on it are you are you being uh, facetious <laughs> well I mean, this is his viewpoint he tells you all you need to know i mean i'm saying this is his viewpoint i don't i don't i don't you know pay any attention to anything he says i mean sometimes i'll i'll see him in a soundbite or something and, yes. uh, you know, he, he was pretty pretty nauseating <laughs> but but you know he got he got popped for sexual indiscretion yes yes 
<laughs> well, they all do. We were bringing up the fact that Neil deGrasse Tyson was popped for sexual harassment, but he gets to keep his job at the museum and shit. So, you know. Not like that. That motherfucker still, still gets to go do these talks and, and just does his uh, Stars Academy shit, you yeah. know. Yeah, that, that is, that is, that it is. regurgitation of scientific facts, which I actually was interested in for a while until I found out that the motherfucker had, had the Bill Cosby syndrome. <laughs> yes, it's disgusting. Um, Shit, man. Yeah, there, there are some cases where there is favoritism of black man because they say, oh, let, let's, let's keep, we need that black face in this environment, you know, just to you know, it, it inspire black Yo. kids to science. Yo, uh, I, I have the question, how many of those uh, um, people knew what Bill Cosby was doing and enabled it? Uh, oh, God. All of them. All too many. Uh, but it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's awful. It's, it's just awful. It's unspeakable. So, um, it, anyhow, um, thank you. Thank you for your input there. And, uh, so yes, by all means, Mr. Moon, let's let's go to uh, General Patton and um, and uh, what your um, what, what your own you know uh, give us what you found out in all your years. I I took it I take it I presume that you probably found out quite a bit about him when you were writing the Spandau Mystery. Well, yes, the, uh, okay, in this, the Spandau Mystery, right? And this is a I, I this gave me cause to revisit the book. I'd like to reread the whole book as a as an audience. Mm -hmm. he, even though I authored it, because when I finished it, and I think I even commented in, in the epilogue that I could write about ten more novels on off of this, mm -hmm. and and they would interest me to do it. I just don't have the time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, it, I always wanted to write a novel. I did. It's done. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't get a lot of air anymore. I mean, it, it did sell mm -hmm. in the beginning. I, I don't push it. Uh, some people write and say, "Oh, you should do more of this." Yeah not time uh, it's more important that I work with Douglas right now however this book the reason for this book the Spandau mystery was because my uh, Chinese doctor Magdalena Go Parmesan had was working on me and she said you need to write a fiction book you should write a fiction book it will do good it will make a movie out of it you should you should write a fiction and she was sort of picking up on the fact that maybe I should have done Montauk as a fiction book. However, I took what she said to heart. It took me about two years to write this book. And I, I said, what would I do? And I basically said, well, I started looking at the historical threads I had. I had Noble Drua Lee, the Moorish prophet, Rudolf Hess, and uh, who was the third one? Aleister Crowley. All plausibly having been at the same location August 12th 1904 1903 I forget which date it is I think it's 1904 they all could have been in Cairo they were all in Cairo during that time period but I had them there all at the same day staying at the same hotel they don't necessarily interact with each other but it's kind of a, a pathway of crossing so anyway one of the characters, the main one of the main characters in the book, is a guy I created the character. His name is Hugh Wilson, and he was picked as a favorite of Patton, and he's incredibly loyal to Patton, and he is now living years after, and he becomes a major player in the work. Now, I mentioned that we're the the name Wilson earlier. Patton was a Wilson. His maternal grandfather oh. was known as Benito Wilson. He was the first mayor of Los Angeles and Mount Wilson, now occupied by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, was named after him. Oh. So anyway, this guy had, Hugh Wilson had said, you know, he was, Patton liked him personally and he, he had sh demonstrated heroism in battle and he's portrayed as sort of a generally good guy uh, in the book, and uh, but he's still a general, and, and I don't say that with compliment or with derision. It's just a general is a yeah. general. Yeah. Um, but anyway, 
So but here I am doing a narration. Now, it was interesting as I listened to you talk, there were, I was surprised at how many points I had gotten. I think I found one that might have been a little off mm -hmm. on, on my part, but most of them were totally in sync with what you were talking about. Wow. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> as, okay, so I'm now going to start narrating from page 14 of the introduction. <clears throat> spare people the rest of it and spare my voice. <clears throat> Let me get a sip of water here. Take your time. There's no rush. And uh, in the meantime, I can... Uh, Ready. You know. As the war came to a close, most everyone expected that Patton's Third Army, undoubtedly the Army's finest, would be assigned to the final march on Berlin so that the Americans could beat the Russians to Hitler's lair in the bunker. Instead, and much to the surprise of all, the Third Army was ostensibly assigned to go after the German National Redoubt sometimes colloquially known as the werewolves. The press and public were fed a line that Otto Scorzini was gathering the remains of the German army for a final last stand. It was further stated that they were protecting Hitler, who had moved to a bunker in southern Germany. Historians have always questioned why Eisenhower sent his best general on such a lark when intelligence reports clearly indicated there was no national redoubt that was of any threat to anybody. Actually, there was a redoubt of sorts, but it had little to do with the military. The real mission of Patton's army was to go after the sizable fortresses where the Nazis had developed avant-garde weaponry and flying technology. This included the actual technology of the atom bomb that was later developed at Los Alamos for use against the Japanese. The bomb was the most forceful and useful of the technologies discovered in the German arsenal, but there were also a host of exotic craft and engineering designs. Many of these were not perfected yet, but some had reached a significant degree of evolution. These included flying wings and mysterious radar gemming weapons that are sometimes referred to as Foo Fighters. It also included the prototype of what later became known as flying saucers. Patton's Third Army collected a vast array of technolog technological information which was indeed the biggest prize of World War II. That is exactly why Eisenhower put Patton on the job. As the Third Army carried out its assignment, they also discovered key files from the German War Department, which had been strategically moved out of Berlin by the Nazis. Amongst the archives from the capital city came an equally unsuspected discovery. While it was not quite as exotic or sensational as the flying craft, it was potentially more powerful. This included the most comprehensive files on Freemasonry in Europe. Just as Jews, gypsies, and Slavs were vigorously purged under the Nazi regime, so were the Freemasons. The Nazis even converted a Masonic temple in Berlin into a public museum designed to show the public the evil nature of Freemasonry. And this is all based upon what I've read, by the way. It's not me making it up. The, but files, still... found, yeah, the files found by the Third Army, however, were never on public display, for they were far more sensitive. They included one of the most extensive network of financial dossiers ever collected, and that included network charts of various bankers or financially influential Freemasons in countries. These charts listed their names, affiliations, and their rank or degree in Freemasonry. Although not exclusively so, an abundance of these names were Jewish. From a cursory inspection of the chart, it was plain to see that anyone who had access to it and also knew the secret communication codes used by Masons could access financial streams that reached from Tierra del Fuego to China and then back to anywhere else you might imagine. After the capitulation of the Third Reich and the seizure of their resources, Patton became the virtual guardian of those assets. By reason of his military duties, he was not only the most knowledgeable, but stood in the center of the hidden political currents swirling around post-war Europe. It was in the midst of these currents that he inherited the intelligence files of Reinhard Galen, the German chief of intelligence on Soviet matters. Patton first, Patton's first assignment in the post-war period was that of military governor of Bavaria, where he obtained a dubious reputation for cavorting with and gaining the admiration of many top Nazis. He was soon relieved of his Bavarian command on the pretext that he not only cavorted with former Nazis, but utilized them in key positions. Disgusted with the way German citizens were being treated after the war, Patton knew that hiring the old guard was absolutely crucial if he was going to bring water and electricity to the cities, as well as maintain the other necessities of running a civilization. What really tipped the scales against Patton, however, and now this I'm making up, the most of what you've read there is just straight out history. 
What really tipped the scales against Patton, however, was when he arranged for a modest little Oktoberfest gathering that included many key Nazis. That might not be inaccurate. It all began as the officers became inebriated and both sides let their hair down with each other. It was then that one of the German generals presented a gift to Patton in appreciation of his hospitality and kindness to the German people. The gift consisted of a case of films. The Third Army had already seized an extensive film library from the Nazis, but there had hardly been time to view them all. The German general who presented this gift to Patton readily acknowledged that these films might already be in the library Patton's army had confiscated. They were not, but he also made an offer that could hardly be refused. Telling Patton that these films would explain so much to him about the history of the war, he suggested to show some of them that very evening. The German also offered to translate the films. It was here that Patton and Hugh Wilson discovered for the first time the important role that Rudolf Hess had played in the evolution of the Third Reich's technology. To the utter astonishment of the Americans, these films began with Hess giving a presentation on the goals and overview of the Vril Society and the role they would play in developing a vast new array of flying craft. This is all based on truth or what I've read. These lectures were either given to or sponsored by the Vril Society, a secret society which was really not so secret. Its purpose was to revolve revive the ancient culture and ideals of Atlantis. This might easily have been dismissed as the ravings of a crackpot, but when the actual films of flying craft were shown and the German translators relayed Hess's meticulous instructions and detailed descriptions, it stunned the Americans. The Germans that were present, however, were not surprised in the least. It was Hess, they said, who created and administered the Hitler Fund, a bottomless pit of capital that was contributed to by German industrialists. Sizable portions of this fund were dedicated to exotic projects that have remained largely secret to this day, only one of which was the Brill flying craft. As a leader and advocate of the society, it was the chosen role of Hess to establish superior air technology in the form of flying discs. It did not take long for the wild events and discussions of what transpired that night to make their way back to the Allied command. Eisenhower's reaction was swift and strategic. Based upon a pretense that Patton was enjoying too much fraternization with the Nazis, he was given a new assignment that required him to depend upon the Nazis even more than he had in the job as military governor of Bavaria. Patton was assigned to write the history of the war with particular regard to the German point of view. This required a full inspection of files and films, but also involved discussions with the individual German generals. So it was that General George S. Patton stumbled upon one of the greatest military secrets of the 20th century. His camaraderie with the Nazis only made him more threatening to those who already feared him and wanted control of the incredible new technology that was discovered. Once the full ramifications had been reviewed by the Allied command, an accident was arranged for General Patton. While driving to a hunting site, his car was suddenly rammed by an army truck. It was a staged accident and not a very good one. The truck had to inconveniently turn into Patton's car in order to hit him. Patton did not die but was temporarily paralyzed. Making excellent strides towards recovery, his doctors listed him in good condition, but he was terminated by other means. The file on the investigation of his death has remained classified to this day. The story, however, does not end there. Um, and I'm going to go on a little bit more. That's kind of the neater part, it's but there's another part incredible. that we were going to... Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, no, it's incredible. Um, You've got it down so yeah, well. Go on, right. please. Yeah. For all of the controversy he created with his superiors... Patton also inspired a loyalty that could not be matched by his rivals. There were officers and soldiers, all intensely loyal to Patton, who were not fooled for a minute by what had happened to their leader and they, that they loved and who had gotten them through the most harrowing period of their life. Wise in the old ways of the military and the ridiculous culture it could foster, these loyal officers and servicemen created their own corps, a small group of patriots that swore to do everything in their power to avenge Patton and more importantly, to preserve and protect the Constitution of the United States against all foreign enemies. They no longer trusted their superiors, but knew the best course of action was to apply all they knew of military intelligence to be effective. Their first course of action was to remain silent, observe, and be extremely careful not to manifest any disaffection with their superiors. While remaining silent to a large degree, they cached many of Patton's files and created their own intelligence files. As far as they were concerned, this was warfare, and they were all proven warriors. This group and the officers who manned it became a secret and extended unit of G2, Army Intelligence. 
eventually this group gave rise to other groups that were launched into society for different purposes. The most conspicuous of these groups was the John Birch Society, a group which was eventually headed by General Patton's cousin, Congressman Larry Patton MacDonald. MacDonald, who inherited many of these files, utilized them as the head of a private intelligence agency called Western Goals. It did work that the CIA and FBI were not allowed to do by order of law. Like his cousin, MacDonald was assassinated when Korean Airlines Flight 007 was shot down over Russian airspace in 1983. The actual black box was never found. In the center of this maelstrom events was Hugh Oliver Wilson, a young enlisted man who happened to be Patton's favorite soldier. And this is sort of where uh, he, you know, that's sort of, that, that sets the, the, the grounding for the novel. Uh, it's, it's, and he is like the hope of the future. Right. Uh, and that's basically what I had to share. Uh, and and we, we talked one time about doing a, a show on Larry McDonald, uh, because he is a real character who was kept Patton's cousin and was shot down over Korea. Right, right. And, um, and, and of course, a lot of people don't remember that, but there was a, I forget the number of the flight, Korean uh, Airlines, uh, KAL, whatever, and then the Soviets came up and just brazenly shot it down. It was in it was just horrific and there were many people on it it was very suspect about who was on it many of them were highly conservative politicians in the day when that term meant something that meant that they were um staunch anti-communists uh james and reese says peter love your writing style very eloquent and uh and, and of course uh, uh yeah peter needs to start doing audio books as well so uh it's uh uh, you know, that's something uh, that you should seriously consider if you haven't tried doing that already. Maybe your voice would have a hard time. It takes time. It takes time. Yeah. I, already, I already know how to do it. I can go into my dark room and put up egg cartons for sound and I can do it. But yeah. It takes time. Right. Well, well, and, yeah. but, but, but anyway, uh, back to, uh, what, uh, yeah, Larry McDonald, this, there were even people that swore he was alive and still may be. I don't think he is, but th but there was a lot of rumors that he was still alive. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that often happens with people like that. We are, uh, you know, we're, how would I say it? We wish they were alive. And so that's as far as it goes, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, speaking more about the subject, in a sense, you've said it all. Uh, honestly, it's it, it's it's hard to go beyond that. Of course, uh, you did invite me to remind you. We don't need to go there right now. We can go there in a few minutes when we feel we've covered this some more. Because uh, I'm just stunned at what you wrote. It was so, it, you know, because I know that you wrote this before many of the books on Patton came out that were. Um, well, 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 yes, but the thing is, the reason I wrote this book, other than converging things, was it's like. When you can't get it information mm. by going to the library, mm. and I wasn't going to get them in these books, I, I mean, I, I did read a, a fair amount of stuff on Patton what I could, but I, it's like if I couldn't get it, I was trying to get at it by the creative novel process, because th this book goes into different caverns and corners of the of. It's not just all about Hess and Patton. The first chapter is about uh, Hugh Wilson discovering uh, Hess's death or Hess's murder in, in Spandau prison and he compares it to the hanged card or I write about the, the hanged man and, and the tarot and it's it's sort of like it all emanates from Hess's death and all of the sort of associations it ends up at Montauk mm -hmm. it ends up at Montauk and it ends up uh, with a lot of Moorish elements involved. The Moors get involved in helping this investigation. Um, and Alistair Crowley appears. Uh, I remember one of, one of the people I read it was, I, I, he was a friend for a while. I don't know whatever happened to him. He, he wanted time travel because uh, to go back and save his brother. Really <laughs> passionate about it. But he was an esoteric person. He was really moved by the chapter I had about a I have a seance. Uh, I think it's a seance with, uh, I forget who's involved in the seance. And I have the Vril, the Vril girls. Mm. She's not a very attractive Vril girl. <laughs> She's an, in fact, I got this not from, not from um, my own head. 
-hmm. but it was supposed to be true. One of the Brill ladies uh, was a old lady, probably overweight, if I recall, uh -huh. and I think the ectoplasm comes out of her vagina, and she's naked when she does the the channeling. Good God! And and th this is uh, this is I think what I heard from my German contacts, mm -hmm. uh, and it's you know not not because some of the Brill girls, I mean, they're usually portrayed very beautifully. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and this one was you know it, at least in the visual department left something a little to be desired. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's sad <laughs> so but what i would also say about the germans because i was there in 2007 mm -hmm. i i was invited to bavaria mm -hmm. and the highlight of the whole experience for me was qigong mm -hmm. you know, teaching them qigong but but the thing is is the thing with the germans are very when a jerk when a when an american talks about a past life mm -hmm. It's going to be very aggrandized, in, in my experience, uh, or very almost comic bookish. Mm. Like, like, maybe I was Cleopatra and you were Mark Antony. Or <laughs> yeah, always some bullshit. Of, of, of that ilk. Yeah. When the Germans talk, they're dead-ass serious. Yes. yes. They're, they're, not, they're not living in this, you know, feedy-weedy uh, world of... Maybe I was, maybe I'm not, maybe I could be, you know, no, no, just Germans are pragmatic. Yes. And when they think, they think pragmatic and they're not prejudiced about, uh, about metaphysical things, whether they're right or not is another question, but they're, they're emphatic in their iterations of, of such things. And it, it's a, it's a totally different, and of course, I had exposure to Germans in Scientology, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been to Germany twice, and, and certainly studied them enough. And it's, it's in some ways, it's the, the mindset is very pleasant. Right. Well, I mean, there's a, a lot. Bathroom, oh, I'm sorry. Go, on. go to a bathroom in Germany. Uh -huh. you, you're afraid <laughs> to leave a mess. <laughs> in America, it's it's almost you know. Uh, you're obligated to leave. Yes, I was about to say. Throw the paper towels on the floor, piss in the sink. You know? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it, it's... No, no, you because you, you get the idea that if you did leave a mess, they're going to know it was you. <laughs> I'm going to confront you. <laughs> uh, why are, why, I don't know what the case is now, but certainly for the longest time, there were so many Germans in Scientology. What, what was that about? What was... Well, I would say when I was in Copenhagen, uh, I was also told that the porno district in Copenhagen, which was quite extensive, was, was kept alive by Germans. They used to drive up. They were the big customers. Germans had a lot of money. Germans had a money. They had big organizations in Switzerland and in Germany. Because Germans, look at it, it was affluent. And it was also very, you know, a dynamics to Scientology, if, if applied properly, is very pragmatic. And and the, the Europeans would apply it much more pragmatically. And uh, it, it was quite popular in, in there. So, uh, and, and also the other thing, one of the things that made Scientology work in uh, in Europe was that, and particularly in Germany, again, is the Teutonic mindset. The Teutonic mindset likes a leader. In America, uh, now people don't aren't followers. In Germany, they want a leader like Der Fuhrer that they follow, and so Hubbard was a leader. Uh, and and they would they would follow, and if it was a path that was made sense to them, they would follow. So they could be, and I don't say that it's just a different culture than America, and they 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 they, they, they do things. It was also very popular in Italy, and, and that that was Italy because, uh, you know, they're so emotional in India. 
I mean, in Italy, they're so emotional that when you touch them in the heart where they live and it helps them, it's just, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, it's just like, and, and it's just like they talk like word of mouth. So it, it was, it boomed in Italy, it boomed in uh, Germany. Uh, Denmark was sort of the headquarters for Europe. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I don't know, I wouldn't say it boomed in Denmark so much, but that was like the headquarters, whereas Los Angeles for uh, the United States. And uh, yeah, so, so, so much for that. But anyway, go yes. ahead. No, that was wonderful. And uh, so aside from um, all of that, I, uh, it's, not nice. it's about 11 p.m. where you're at. Um, I take it, as a matter of fact, it's, it's more like closer to 11.30, heading towards 11.30. Uh, you've done wonderful tonight, and, I was, and, and you've, uh, thank you for blessing us with your presence tonight. I uh, definitely appreciate it, and it was uh, very, um, uh, it, it just so affirming to have you read what you uh, did about Patton. And as you said, very little was off about that, and this was something that I know you drew the conclusions on. Uh, based on research that you did at the time that uh, was before many of these books uh, came out on uh, the subject. But uh, it definitely, I'm, I'm so glad that you listened to that part of it. Did you, what did you get out of what I said about the, um, the sound barrier and, uh, and, and perhaps... I, I didn't get to the part about Chuck Yeager. I, I just didn't get there. Okay. Uh, okay. But w with regard to the Spandau Mystery, anybody who wants to read it, you can get it at skybooksusa.com. You can also read it on um, ebook format on Kindle, iTunes, or Nook if you want to read the rest of it. And I want to just emphasize that if where that where that book ends, the next sequel was going to be the two main characters who did all the good work and cleaned up the mess at Montauk were headed straight towards San Francisco for a vacation where they were going to encounter the Presidio. Right. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's where they were. That's where they were gonna go, and uh, and then they were gonna go to go to be they were eating at the Cliff House, and and then somehow, you know, they were gonna get get involved with this Aquinoitis, uh, and I, I didn't know where it was gonna go from there. But I already already picked that, so now I don't have to write the book because. Uh, I got to, I'm working with Douglas and, and this is where it all goes. It, it's, it's uh, definitely. And, uh, and we're going to have a lot of this come out and, um, Aquino's death, I, I think makes a lot of it more, I mean, not that we would have been frightened to say anything when he was alive, but his death does make things just a little easier. And, uh, the, um, uh, so, uh, Aside from uh, all of that, uh, we love you dearly. Um, and how about yourself, Jameson? Do you have anything that comes to mind to ask Peter Moon before he uh, before he takes his leave of us tonight? Well, I just wanted to say I wanted to uh, give you my thanks for those uh, for those two exercises. Um, the uh, the one that's supposed to uh, work on the lymphatic system. Right. I feel much more energized after doing it. And for the breathing one, sometimes I, I'll reach a point where I'll start to feel kind of lightheaded. But um, afterwards, I realize that I feel like I have a lot more energy. Well, you, you, oxygen is, is what is like the fuel to the body. And it's, you need oxygen. So I'm really glad that you, you, you know, responding so well to them and that you had the good sense to do it. This also reminds me, Douglas, mm -hmm. I was going to teach you a... Yes, a about the face tightening and the elasticity of the neck and muscles. Is that something that you can also... Uh, um, I mean, we're happy to have you go into I that. I teach you right here, right now, and anybody can benefit from it. Great. Uh, and in fact, I didn't really realize this, but one of my friends told me that, that martial artists will sometimes teach this but they keep it rather guarded. Um, it's th this is an exercise. Okay, um, it's not very ple we're not on camera, so it's not very pleasant to see. But <laughs> but if you take your face, you can all practice this, and you just scrunch it up and move it. In other words, you elast 
exercise your cheeks, your nose, your, you know, all the place where you get wrinkles on your face and you move it. You're moving the fascia. You're getting the blood into all of the areas of the skin. You're moving this. You're not using your hands. You're just, you know, uh, wincing and moving and moving your nose around, moving your lips around, moving in every which way you can. And you do this for uh, a few minutes a day. It's going to increase the elasticity of your face. It's going to bring blood into those areas of your face that the face doesn't get a lot of exercise. It moves with the head. The head moves around, but mostly on top of the body. So you're going to give your face and, and if you breathe, in while you're doing it, it will help. This this does wonders. There's also, uh, I'll, that that's one exercise that we will do wonders. Just do it. And it's like I can, Douglas, I can, I realize I can coax you into uh, Qigong through your through your own vanity. You know? <laughs> Why not? You know, you, you will look better. Anybody will look better uh, versus the alternative um, of not doing it. The other thing is, and this is very good for the uh, the neck, so so people don't get turkey necks. Um, is if you, uh, and I once taught this to to a friend of mine who was about to go to, I don't know if she was going to the chiropractor or surgery, and she didn't have to after I did this because she had a what was it called a herniated disc. Uh -huh. This fixed her herniated disc. But okay, now if you can imagine. You're sitting upright in a chair, and you're gonna, as you breathe in, you're gonna take your chin down to your chest, and breathe in. When it gets down to your touching your chest or as far as you can go, you exhale and take it back up. You do that in, breathing in, going down the chest, exhaling up. You do that 12, you know, 8, 10, 12, 24 times. Do it at least eight, preferably 12 maybe 24. You go down that, that way. Then after you do that, you go backwards. You breathe in, extend your head all the way back as far as it will go, and then you exhale. You do that the same amount of times. Then you're going to do, do four variations. That, that was two. Then you're going to go to the right. You're going to breathe in, and you're going to just look laterally to your right all the way back and breathe in. And, we'll, and you're going to exhale. But when you go side to side, you're going to focus on where the cowlick of your head would be. This is called the primordial mind. That is, it's like if you were a yarmulke, a Jewish person would wear a yarmulke, it's right in the center of where that yarmulke would be. It's the primordial mind. Now, the reason you go there in this exercise is you'll find out that you can extend your neck further than you could if you weren't focusing on that area. It'll go back further if you're focusing on the, the top back of your head. You Peter, do that. And also the Bindu chakra. The, the B-I-N-D-U? Yes. Okay. Okay. So then you go left and you do the same with the left. And you do that 12, 24 times. This will prevent the, the turkey neck. I've had a friend who had a, a bad turkey neck. She's a very beautiful woman, too, but she was older. And I taught her to do this, and she got rid of her very bad turkey neck. You know? So she was wearing a scarf. I said, why are you wearing a scarf? She said, oh, I'm hiding my very bad turkey neck. That's not okay. what she called it. And I taught her this, and she it went away. So oh. uh, it was, yeah. So So this is, you know, really good for... Uh, you know, helping the, you know, the eyes and any of the, the breathing, uh, will just the general breathing, like the exercises that I showed, Jameson, uh, that will help help your appearance and everything, because it just it gets the blood flowing, the blood must flow, the blood is what gives you all of your nutrients, all of your rejuvenatable stuff the oh. blood must flow and if the blood flows into the areas it can heal it can rejuvenate it and do the best that it can do so that is that is what i wanted to share with you douglas when i wrote to you about that
Wonderful, thank you. Uh, you did, give me progress reports. Uh, yes, as okay. what you were trying to deal with. Yes, okay, I'll I'll, I'll do that. And uh, collagen is good too, internally. Okay. The right collagen, okay, is very good for internally. They sell collagen now and Trader Joe's and whatnot. Uh huh. It's good for the joints, okay. uh, but the best way to take collagen according to a doctor friend of mine who was also my editor she said you take nox gelatin pure raw nox gelatin which is from a pig mm -hmm. nox gelatin from a pig is better than cow gelatin or horse gelatin because we're closer to pigs mm -hmm. and then you take that but you have to mix it with something like honey or you know a sweetener so that it'll it's palatable and then you chew it and masticate it mm -hmm. and, and that'll give you that'll increase your gelatin and, and help your collagen and all that. But they have a lot of collagen products on the market now. Wow. And and uh, the Knox collagen is spelled K and like Fort Knox? K N O X, yes. Okay. K N O X. Knox gelatin is just a it's just a type of gelatin you buy in the store. It's a brand. Mm -hmm. And it's in packets so you can make jello. It's jello, but it's not jello because it doesn't have sugar in it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not it's just pure gelatin from a pig. Right. It's a, well, I used to buy it in the grocery store. My ex-wife and I used to take it. I, I haven't done it in a long time. I'm taking some other collagen product. And then we buy a big vat of it, you know. It, it was, you know, shopping was different in the 1990s. <laughs> you had to have specialized sources and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's much, you can you can get almost anything off of the internet. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, uh, well, thank you, sir. Love you, too. Another thing yeah. is I know that you're going to, because of what I said, I know it's going to stimulate you to, to go more into the deeper occult aspects of, of areas that I was talking about, Patton. Oh, yes. You didn't address the other night. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we may not do it soon, but mm -hmm. I, I know it'll titillate your your intellect your art elect or, or, or all of the above. Mm -hmm. And I would also recommend the movie that Douglas referred to, Brass Target. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very good movie. I think it's about 1972. It's a very entertaining movie. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives you a flavor of history about Patton and the OSS and why they wanted to get rid of him. And, and it's also depressing as well. All of, all of that is, is depressing just to think about that individual and how he was taken down by his lessers. Uh, it's, it's, it's beyond disgusting. Uh, th there was so much uh, good that could have been done by that individual had he, um, had he continued uh, in his mortal coil uh, incarnate upon this earth. Uh, so it's... Uh, well, it, that, that, that's an important lesson. Yeah. And... and it's, it's also not unlike Trump, if you take him at face value, going up against the deep state. He ain't going to win, okay? If you take him at face value, he's going to, you know, go up against it. The, there's no way. No way. Uh, you can go the same with Jesus Christ, going up against the deep state of the Hebrews and the Romans and the Greeks. Not going to work. That is the, the hero's tragedy. Whatever hero you want to take. Uh the hero is not going to make it in this world. He's not, not, not on that level. That's part of the tragedy. Now, I'm not saying there are, there are obviously heroic stories in the world. But even Tesla, who's not a hero in that sense, but he's a hero in another sense. They, they all get upended. It's, it's the nature of Malkus, meaning the world. Mm -hmm. It's it kind of like uh, it, you know. The, the, I'm trying to think if what well, you kind of have the story of Buddha overcoming stuff. Mm -hmm. He does pretty good, and, and he survived no less than three acknowledged assassination attempts. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. I didn't know that. That's of great interest. Yeah. Um, but yes, you have. You know, the heroes kind of. Uh, I'll have to, I'm going to do some. I think about that before I go to bed tonight. Mm -hmm. You know, are there any heroes who kind of uh, didn't end up like Muhammad Ali? You know, 
<laughs> well, that's a uh, fate worse than death, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think he was unhappy, you know. He come, but but then again, do we have any heroes that don't end up? Uh, Hugh Wilson in the book ends up in a, in a heroic way. He, uh, I think, he sends a communication from the other side, and when he tells everybody, he makes it. You know, he crosses over in the book, but he tells everybody it's it's certainly not like what you think it is. <laughs> it's very different over here. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, it's like it's very different. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do some work on is there, is there a good example of somebody who did something really heroic and kind of like, um, I, you know, if you put Christianity into it, Christ, you know, is killed and then he rises from the dead. That's that's heroic, but you know, you got to put it all in quotes for a number of different reasons. Mm-hmm. See if I can find a better story where the person just kind of like uh, lifts off into uh, kind of achieves nirvana. Right. Well, well definitely, uh, as always, uh, you're deeply appreciated. And what I'll do is I'll have, um, once you're off the stage tonight, once you uh, exit stage left, I'll have uh, Jameson Reese uh, take the stage for a little bit and uh, then I'll go into monologue. Uh, that may be at the By the moment. way, excuse me, Hirohito almost fits that bill. Thank he you. Almost yes. fits that bill. Yeah. Except, it, you know, because he was involved in such unsultry things, it's it, you know, it kind of puts a pall on it, you know. But well, then, technically, that would make him an anti-hero, which is still a hero, but sort of like a sort of, you know, it's a it's a, it's a different archetype. It's he sort he like did some great things. He did. He said he's the closest one I can think of right now, though, because. He did succeed and, and basically go off into the sunset. Yes, and he saved his people. He, sa- he saved yeah. his people. And, uh, and that required, of course, doing monumentally monstrous things, uh, unfortunately, because it was monumentally monstrous times. And uh, it, it was... Uh, he understood, the, he understood to, to, to enough to rise to the occasion. Yes, yes. Or sink to the occasion, well, such as the case may be, to the level of his enemies. But he... He knew his enemy, and he knew that uh, that the you know you stare into the abyss, uh, the abyss stares back, and uh, the monster enters, and uh, that's that he was a product of his time, and uh, he answered uh, the need uh, to respond to the monstrousness of his times, and uh, the in- interesting thing is most Americans, of course, have no idea anything about him, or well, they will after this book. And uh, that should uh, do more than everybody's moralizing has done in the past with uh, when they've talked about, quote unquote, Japanese war crimes, which uh, make no mistake. The interesting thing is how I still run across some of these old comments. I haven't run into comments like this in a long time, but then I don't do interviews anymore, essentially. But uh, I remember in old interviews when I would talk about World War Two. Just some of the comments from people would say things like, uh, oh, yeah, maybe if, you know, you expose some of the Japanese war crimes to him, that would take the wind out of his sails. Like, as if I hadn't been basing my entire exposition on the fact that the Japanese had committed to uh, these uh, ghastly atrocities by a humanitarian definition in order to perfect these weapons of mass destruction. I mean, there's some kind of super massive disconnect here uh that people uh, don't well, understand they, just have, they haven't they haven't read the information yeah yeah they're just not listening oh, but by the way but, so but I, yeah i'm sorry well but, but, but if if i was thinking if if, yeah. if i uh could face hirohito and say hey, why don't you uh come to america and straighten out this mess you know uh, uh run for presidency and he'd, he'd look at me and he'd say are, are you are you, are you crazy? Are you- <laughs> yes, he would say that. But you know what was funny was, of course, and you know this, um, it was uh, his first trip to the, the United States, which was after the war, his first trip on the ground, because it's, it's, it's fairly certain he was in the Mikado when it flew over Los Angeles, because the Mikado was considered a sacred craft. It was almost like it was not supposed to take off without his being in it. It was like his, uh, his, his uh, Mishkan, his, his kind of, uh, his, uh, his Ark, as in the Ark of the Covenant sense. So um, in that sense, it was like, uh, it's, 
it was always assumed he was on the craft when it was flying over Los Angeles. And uh, he, uh, when he um, won the war, so to speak, and came to the United States, the first thing he uh, demanded was, I want to go to Disneyland, which, of course, you know, Peter Moon and I have gone over this before. He brought up how pathetic it was that Khrushchev couldn't go to Disneyland. They wouldn't let Khrushchev go to Disneyland. Right. <laughs> but Emperor Hirohito went to Disneyland, and he was buried... He, when he was buried, one of the things he was buried with was a Mickey Mouse watch that he, he was buried with in his uh, tomb. Uh, so it was almost like uh, uh, just a war trophy. And um, so, uh, but uh, one of the things that I, um, I, I, I presume then you also didn't get a chance to listen to what I said about uh, Britain's Pearl Harbor or what happened to... Uh, oh, yeah, I did. In oh, fact, yeah. I found out that I, you can even read a lot independent on that on the net as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did listen, and, and it was, yeah, and, and I, I also supplemented that with reading stuff on it, because there's there's quite a bit about how the Britain got the hell kicked out of them. By the <laughs> yes, that was they fun. suffered much more than the Americans did in, in their attack, much more. Uh, yes, yes, that, that, that is the true. The Americans didn't lose any territory. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's they, true. They didn't lose Hawaii. Yeah. They eventually lost the Aleutians, but... But well, they, they lost really... the Philippines. They lost the Philippines. It's, it's, uh, which was, oh, okay. yeah, which was enormous. Yeah, that was enormous. And that was all, by the way, that all took place within, I mean, think about it, within 72 hours. That was all, all within 72 hours. And then, uh, then uh, pretty much uh, uh, two weeks of follow up. It was like a, a fortnight of infamy, really, uh, in which the Japanese overran uh, pretty much all of Asia. And, uh, yeah, but for and lost more than they lost more than the Philippines. Though they lost Thailand, they lost all that stuff. Oh yes, lost- yeah, and and the Dutch, of course, lost the Dutch East Indies. Uh, so, so, so definitely. Uh, so, no, thank you for listening to that. I look forward particularly to what your response will be when uh, you hear what I say about uh, Chuck Yeager. So that would, uh, and um, we can bring that up the next time you're he's with just, us. He's just not a very compelling character to me. He's, yeah, he's no, no, I get he, it, but it's not about him. It's not about him. It's just how, basically, he's peripheral. He's really peripheral to the story of breaking the sound barrier. I, I can understand why. <laughs> yes, he himself. I mean, he's, he's an amazing character who, who, who really... He didn't get the credit he deserved, but he, it seems like he I got an awful lot of credit later in life. Oh, God. I, 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 I deconstruct him I, <laughs> viciously. I deconstruct him viciously. He got plenty of credit, and he was like, you know, he was making money off fucking video games. I don't know if you know that. There was the Chuck, no, Ye- no. The Chuck Yeager video game where you, you got in and you played. You were Chuck Yeager, you know, uh, shooting down the enemy and shit. Uh, and anyhow, the, what was very funny about that, just before you go to sleep, just provide a humor anecdote for you um the, the one guy i knew named harry henneberger was a u.s marine corps um n- aviator of course the marines were under the navy so they flew off aircraft carriers so he was in world war ii and uh harry henneberger was uh he, he developed that same kind of look because many of these men they, they looked alike because well the american public was much more homo- homogeneous in those days and, um, and the guys who were brought into the officer corps tended to be even more homogeneous. They, they looked like they bred them in tubes or something. And uh, <laughs> so as he got older, he became the spitting image of Chuck Yeager. And he used to be an aviator. But, of course, by the time I knew him and my gang brother Beaver knew him, we just went to see him most of the time because he was lonely and shared his dope. So we were usually just getting all potted out over at his place. And he would relay, you know, new age bullshit, uh, you know, about, oh, you know, his whole trip was, yes, I was once a warrior, but now I'm all peace and all this bullshit. And it, it was all it. But anyhow, uh, because of that experience, uh, the running joke between Beaver and I when that game came out with Chuck Yeager, because he looked so much like Harry Henneberger, was that uh, instead of flying, you were just basically in a plane that it would be something like a like a psychedelic experience. Where, you know, he'd be admonishing you, unlike Chuck Yeager telling you, watch your six. He'd be admonishing you, you know, get back in your body. Get back in your body. No, it's, it's, it's very funny. He's like, yeah, the, the Chuck Yeager autopilot. Uh, yeah. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Like, like that, like that, like the, the, the characters in Dune, the guild. Yes, yes, trying to ground you and shit. Well, <laughs> yes, well, you're flying high uh, on the spice. Yes, that's right. It, it's uh, but <laughs> but uh, 
Yeah, in, in, in terms of, uh, so, so I do hope you suffer through that. Believe me, you won't be suffering. It, it, I mentioned Chuck Yeager very little, but in, in context, I totally deconstruct him. And uh, no, he didn't deserve uh, much credit. And, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, it's unreasonable. It, it's, it's, after, it's after the, uh, the, the patent stuff? Oh, it's before. It's it's before. Patton was actually the last one. I'm sorry. I was surprised. So you okay. you almost started. I, I, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go back and look. Yeah, it was right. it was it was shortly after you left. It was shortly after you left. So you know, once you exit the stage, on that, then it'll be uh, you know it'll be shortly after you exit the stage that I start talking about it because uh, there was so much to talk about that night. I had to start you know as soon as I could. In a sense, I'll be doing that tonight because I have a lot to talk about. Indeed, tonight's entire episode will be one that I'll have to beseech you on bend at knee to review the uh, totality of, uh, at least I'll, I'll probably give you a timestamp to start off, but um, I'll be speaking heavily about Taiwan tonight because I had someone ask me about Taiwan and its history. And so um, even though this will have nothing to do that I can see in any immediate sense with any of our books. I, I'm very interested in anything you have to say about Taiwan. So if you could timestamp it, it'll be great. Great. I'll, I'll do that. And, uh, you know, um, tonight after I finish transmission, if I still have uh, any wherewithal within me, I'll, I'll do the same for the uh, Chuck Yeager part for you. And um, well, you seem to be doing good. You're staying awake. So I'll, <laughs> I'll let you. Uh, Thank you. Love I'll, you. Dearly. I'll say good night. And yeah. And, and share our love with Paula. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Bye-bye. And skybooksusa.com. Everybody visit skybooksusa.com. Now, I want to go to the live stream before I turn things over to JMO for a bit and thank everyone. you, you got to try this energy drink called C4. C4. <laughs> well, you know, I, I noticed you it's recommend... C4 energy. Shit. Uh, it sounds sounds potent. Uh, I noticed... Stuff you... has this, the stuff has this... Uh, uh, the stuff is a horrible chemical soup. I'm sure it's unhealthy, but it has this stuff supposedly called carnosin. Which is, which, is, which is a patented form of beta al alanine. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it sounds well, awful. Whatever it, <laughs> well, whatever it does, I can say that with the DXM, I get this tingly rush, and it starts to feel like there's this electrical surge flowing <laughs> through me, and it's just so freaking cool. I'm hooked to it. Hooked. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, I was going to say, I tried some, uh, fuck, what, what, what is the stupid energy drink? The Herba Mate. I was trying some of that company, Guayaki, the Herba Mate, and, and um, the flavor that they had was blackberry mint. I mean, the other flavors, the majority of them are okay. Uh, you know, it's not anything really, you know, overwhelmingly great, but uh, but this one, blackberry mint, was awful. It <laughs> It was just awful. It tasted like liquid shit. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I'll, uh, that, that of course, that for those who don't know, Herba Mate is supposed to be an herbal energy booster. Um, it's probably too organic to have any real effect on someone like me. It's, it's, it's just too st organic. Uh, but, uh, you, you know. Have you ever tried, uh, well, that's why I recommend you try something called Modafinil. <laughs> 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 No, I'm dead ass. If you like staying up, I, I I don't know how I was able to get it prescribed to me in the past, but I did get it prescribed to me, and it was, dude. Well, the thing is, for me, honestly, I slept like normal. I did. It wasn't like staying up all night, but but it but you'll be fresh, man. Okay. For some reason. All right. I, I it's mean, a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical grade drug used for uh people who work really long shifts uh -huh. like 12 hour shifts oh wow okay wow cool it, it sounds like something that uh you know our man derek tally should be checking into driving the trucks the way he does and uh but uh you definitely appreciate your bringing that up as a matter of fact you know write some of this down uh i was hoping that uh peter moon with the exercises he's he's trying to teach he needs to he needs to put this on film he needs a. It may not be pretty to look at, like he said, but he needs to put this well, stuff on film. He does have. He does have some of it on his uh, YouTube channel, and that's how. Uh, that's how I learned of it, because he uh, gave me a link to his uh, YouTube channel, so I subscribed and I uh, looked at uh, those exercises and I started to do them. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, twenty minutes at most. You know, because you know that's 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 about how much I can pay attention to one thing. Right. My attention span is just shot to fucking shit. 
We'll join the club on that one. Uh, all I got of us the attention have, span of a gerbil. Yeah, all of us have very short attention spans. Thanks to the information age, we're just over inundated with information. There is such a thing as over information, and we are overly informed. Uh, of course, I would insist my transmissions are different because I'm providing people an education, which is a lot different from information overload. Uh, it's vital information. It's not junk information. Thank you. Thank you. Junk information like, oh, what color is Kim Kardashian's toenails? Who gives a shit? Well, that's not that. I guess you could call that information, but it's more like what would be like data dumping. <laughs> that's just data dumping. It's and not. It, well, yeah, yeah. well, there's and then there's the fake information like the UFOs, the aliens. Oh, yeah. I, my, my folks were watching something on like Roswell yesterday. Oh, my <laughs> God. On it. Yeah. They they like totally fell asleep on it, and and, and 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 these guys are going in talking about Roswell and the UFOs and the aliens, and I'm like, oh my god, they need to re rename this. They need to rename the History Channel, the Bar Channel. Yeah, which it, is it, the yeah. Baby Boomer Alien Revisionist. Channel. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, and and it's like. Uh, Honestly, I don't see how anyone cannot fall asleep with that, that Roswell shit. It's, it's uh, you know, um, people should have fallen asleep on that decades ago. And, and um, you know, all, all aside from that, though, it's, it's not even worth talking about. In, in terms of what is worth talking about, by the way, thank you for what you've brought up. I want to say hello to everybody in the chat room. And there are a lot of people tonight. I'm really happy to see everyone who has been here. If I've missed you in terms of saying hi earlier. I apologize. I want to say hello to All Junk Mail. All Junk Mail is a wonderful individual and says, Hello, Doug. Good evening, everyone. I forgot whether it's a male or a female, but I risked a kiss there. Underfell Girl Sands is, of course, Sarah Shields, who says, Hi, everyone. Have a nice transmission, Douglas. And Daniel Larola was, Hi, H-I-G-H. Said he had his grill on for some steaks to scarf down that evening. And uh, so there you go. Um, and no vegetarianism there, uh, despite all the potty smokes. Uh, Caleb Deslodio Caleb Delodio, uh, says, uh, says, are you serious? You're going to get a shot from the military? <laughs> what the fuck is this? Long live the Japanese Empire. Is that you in the picture? <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> Okay, he's all, uh, he or she is all over the place, but hugs. Uh, and Spartan O Negative, God bless in return. Spartan O, Neg o Negative donated 20 United States dollars. Uh, I, I think that goes into my bank account. <laughs> I have to find out more about this. I'm going to... Yes, um, actually, our lady Selena Khan and I are still investigating this. It goes somewhere. And um, uh, hopefully it doesn't go straight to YouTube and they take it all. Uh, I haven't really been following up on it because I've been so busy and we haven't had this function for very long, the button. But don't be discouraged from donating and Spartan or negative. God bless you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dear brother. So let me say hello to Spartan or negative. Spartan 10. Oh, Spartan uh, 10. Oh, negative. Spartan O oh, negative. And negative goddess plus okay and uh, let me get that out of my system oh and uh let's see now in terms of uh what else has been going on it's just been so much and i uh it was sad that derek didn't get to express too much of what's been happening to him but uh he went the other day to see uh, his girlfriend, so to speak, uh, Arika, if you might remember her, she was on the show briefly in the past. Oh, yes, 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 the mermaid lady. Yes, yes, and, uh, and, and so let me say hugs, okay, hugs, hugs, and, uh, and, and in terms of the mermaid lady, she, uh, was, um, doing, um, some high wire acrobatics, so to speak. Cirque du, Cirque du Soleil stuff. She was doing Cirque du Soleil, wow. uh, stuff, and, uh, which is not surprising, and, uh, because she does seem physically fit enough to do that, and, um, so let's get this over to Spartan or Negative, and shout out to them. Uh, he says, hello, brother, wonderful, and, uh, Stro underscore show 22, Stro show 22 says, I live in Ontario, the only reason I've heard of Canadians leaving for medical care is for special or very specific care, also dental is not covered. What? <laughs> Fuck, 
Fennel's not covered in Canada? What the fuck? Oh, you know. Uh, Veronica Pereira says, Buenos noches a todos. Send buenos noches a todos, uh, senora. Mwah. And Nathan Brooks says, Saludos. Yes. Saludos in return. Bill Lyon says, Could listen to Peter all day. Thank you. And he says, Yeah, Jimmy playing the Star Spangled Banner until Animal Sounds. It was total war, says Marty Methuselah. Yes. He was speaking of the Emperor. And uh, anyone know what platform Douglas is using? I'm going to. Um, Asked Peter on his Facebook about the exercises I was saying about that, that about the History Channel the other day. Uh, Bill Lyons is probably talking about. And by the way, shout out to Bill Lyons. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, Bill Lyons is, of course, uh, um, someone I don't see much of, but hopefully we'll see more of him in the future. And uh, yes, he was probably joining in with all of us in condemning the History Channel for just being a farce. Uh, at this point in history, it's, it's, you know, it's disgraceful. Um, so what we're going to do is we're already at the top of the hour almost. I'm going to have Jameson carry us on, carry on for about um, 15, 20 minutes maybe. Uh, and we'll head towards the bottom of this hour, at which point I'm going to start monologuing very aggressively and uh, take over from there. But the first thing I'm going to do is take a short trip to the restroom and refresh myself. Uh, and um, I've pretty much uh, taken in enough calories for now, and I'm uh, thankful to the gods of my ancestors that Peter helped cover me while I was doing that. Uh, couldn't really do that while everyone else was talking in the opening hour. And this will give Jameson a chance to catch everybody up on what might be going on with him, whether or not he's changed his... I gave him some ads for this new full facial helmet that kind of covers it, but I doubt he found that... Uh, he was saying that, uh, was it, uh, you wanted room for headphones? Yeah, 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 I have to be able to have my headphones on. Through Aren't it. you worried yeah. about, like, crossing the street and getting hit by a truck or something or some other kind of oncoming vehicle? or <laughs> We're not being able to hear it? I move, I move like a fucking cat. I'm fast. Mm -hmm. I'm fast. I've dodged cars to the point where people would think that, people would want to see that shit on YouTube and say... Whoa! He almost got hit by a fucking red truck! I'm impressed that you can be so fast after the way you've abused your nervous system. <laughs> but, I'm very, but, very fast. Cool. Uh, yes. You know, I, I just, I, it, it's, I'm addicted to moving fast. Okay. And uh, even when I'm in my house, like, I run up and down the stairs. I don't, I don't walk up the stairs. I, like, skip double steps because I just have to do it. Yeah, because when I move slow, my body hurts. Mm -hmm. It hurts moving slow. Okay. So when I'm walking down the city streets and there's some stupid asshole on the sidewalk who has to take up the entire fucking sidewalk, looking at a fucking goddamn cell phone, not doing anything, just standing there, I literally am like, oh, you fucking moron! So I have to literally like jump into the street and dart right by them because they're fucking. Like a bunch of dumb cattle that just don't move. Especially out here on Staten Island. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Well, thank brother, you. Brother, yeah. People of all ethnicities out here <clears throat> who are born on Staten Island, I don't know what happened. But what I didn't find out was that they used to have... Uh, where I used to go to high school, they used to actually have nuclear waste mm -hmm. containment. Okay. Wow. Around Mills Field. Uh -huh. and, New uh, yeah. And Bill Lyons, by the way, thank you for, for sharing that about the nuclear waste. It explains so much about about everybody in your area. <laughs> right? And, and, and anyhow, Bill Lyons says, eternally grateful for your work, Douglas. And I move like a cat as well. So thank you, Bill Lyons. Bless you. Hugs. And so what I'm going to do is refresh myself. And uh, I'm going to be uh, going mute now. And uh, I'll leave the stage to Jameson, and uh, you're confident um, you can handle it, I'm sure. Yes. I got this. Yes, I know you do. Okay, then. Let me um, go mute, and I'll be back in about, you know, 15 minutes at the longest. All right, thank you. Good, sir. All right, so, hello, good people of the world. I recently <sighs> found out that I am a moon child. What that means is that I was born on a full moon. Now, there's a website where you can search uh, and see if you were born, what, what the moon phase was when you were born. 
Um, it's called MoonGiant.com. And uh, apparently when I was born, the, 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 the moon was full in the house of Sagittarius. Now, I was born on June 3rd, 1985, which is 0603-1985. And the irony is I happen to, have, I happen to be born at 3.06 a.m. in the morning, which is like if you flip 603, you get 3.06 a.m. So that's, <laughs> that's a really interesting one. I think I, I went into that before, but this explains people... All right, so let's go into what it means if you were born on a full moon, according to this website. The full moon is well known for driving people to lunacy, aggression, and in extreme cases, even lycanthropy. While it is unlikely that being born under a full moon will literally turn you into a werewolf, it is true that the moon is intimately tied to a person's emotions. It may have more control over you than you may think. When a full moon occurs, the moon is located directly opposite the sun. That means that your sun sign, which controls the mind, and your moon sign, which controls the heart, are in conflict with each other. As a person who is born under the influence of a full moon, your life tends to be driven by internal struggles between what you know is logical what your heart truly wants. No fucking shit. Worse, you might have a multitude of different desires pulling you in all sorts of different directions. This is the reason why you may come off as inconsistent or indecisive to others. This can also be an asset in some cases as your friends may find your unpredictability and to be attractive and exhilarating in situations where stable and consistent behavior expected is expected. However, people might consider you to be flaky or even two-faced. Despite this, it might be counterproductive to suppress your emotional side. Generally, people who are born on a full moon are more attuned to rhythms, both in the natural world and internally. You can become more successful if you can harness your natural ability to ride the highs and lows of your emotional cycle and leverage it to, the, to live a life balanced in between the extremes of your personality. This is especially important since, as a child of the full moon, your emotional energies can be very potent if you channel them appropriately. The trick? Allow yourself to give in to the pull of emotions and desires. They should not give me that advice. That's a very bad fucking idea. I do not... That's the last thing I need to do is give in to the pull of my emotions and desires. Especially the ones that might seem too unconventional or crazy. They don't know me very well. At, they don't. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. If they knew me, they 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 would not want to. They they would probably erase everything they just wrote. Being a, <laughs> being able to listen to yourself and follow your truest, strongest impulses is what's going to pull you out of the stagnation that can come with wanting so many wanting so many contradictory things. Being honest with yourself allows you to feel more grounded since your energies are going to be more harmonious and focus on what truly makes you happy. This energy is what draws people to full moon children, but in different ways depending on your personality. If you're an extrovert, which I am not, your energy will be channeled outwards. Extroverted full moon children tend to have a powerful luminous presence. When you walk into a room, people notice. Like, like we notice whenever the full moon rises into the night sky. You are capable of being extremely active, fun, and wild. All the traits that make people gravitate towards you. For those of you who are introverts, which I am, your moon energies tend to be channeled inwards. People might not be conscious of it, but you have this subtle inner glow that is inexplicably, inexplicably attractive. You have a touch of quiet lunacy about the way you hold and express yourself, which intrigues people and makes them want to be around you, and you probably won't even understand why, which just adds to your mystique. Actually, it makes life a living hell because I don't want anyone near me, <laughs> which uh, most of you who have listened and heard me probably already know. You'll also want to pay attention to the phases of the moon since they're intimately linked with your internal energy. 
During the waxing crescent moon, you should take advantage of the momentum of the rising lunar force and begin planning for the future. Set ambitious goals, but also break them down into small realistic steps. You're more likely to come up with a successful plan during this period, of course. You should also review these goals periodically, and the waxing Gibois moon is a great phase for that. If you've prepared sufficiently during the waxing moon phases, you're likely to feel more energetic and inspired when the full moon rolls around. Like you can do anything as long as you set your heart to it. Really listen closely to your heart during this phase. They, again, they, these, I, I don't know who the hell wrote this, but um, do not listen to, well, I should not listen to my heart. Bad idea. It's likely that all sorts of impulses and, and desires are going to rise to the surface of your consciousness. You may feel compelled to take a risk and do all sorts, sorts of crazy things that will horrify your rational side. Yes, I am. I cling to my rational side because uh, that's the side that seems more safe to me. That might may not be such a bad thing. However, combined with your increased energy, optimism, and alertness, no, there is no optimism here. You're actually more likely to succeed in whatever goals you choose to pursue during this moon phase. It still pays to be careful, though. It's possible to get too drunk on the brilliance of the full moon, which can make you overestimate your chances of success. On the flip side, people who are born on a full moon generally feel tired and lethargic when the moon is wandering, especially during the wanting Gaboas moon and waxing crescent, wanting crescent moon. Your ebbing energy makes this period an excellent time to let go of any anger, tension, and anxiety. Yeah, as if that can, that is, if that's possible. This, lethar this lethargy reaches a peak during the new moon. Since the moon's energy is completely blocked by the earth during that period, this may be a good time for you to rest, reflect, and regain your energy. Don't try to do anything overly ambitious or taxing. Having regular downtime to just chill is essential. Without it, you won't be able to shine your brightest during the, your full moon moments. You've been experiencing an unusual rate of failure recently? Oh, you have no idea. It may be because you've been driving yourself too hard. In that case, a new moon mini vacation might be... What the fuck is a moon mini vacation? Who the fuck comes up with this shit? <laughs> the most dangerous moon phases, however, are the first quarter and third quarter moons. During half moons, you are equally under the influence of the moon's darkness and light. All your internal conflicts will surge to the surface, and you can't find your inner balance, and this can lead to a complete mental breakdown, which is like every other fucking day for me. For a child of, <laughs> for a child of the full moon, the most crucial key to success is the ability to balance your inner contradictions. You need to be able to ride with the flow of your natural energy cycles instead of fighting it all the way or letting it take control of you completely. Oh, I just wish I could just let it take over sometimes, honestly. You know, I'm one of those people who actually wish to be possessed, but... Well, no. no let me take that back. Uh, I've been possessed. Um, let me... That. Let's just finish this up. If you can master the art of maintaining an active equilibrium between emotions and logic, between your dark side and your bright side, between the external and internal, that's when you will have awakened to the full potential of a full moon child. At this stage, you are exceptionally competent at executing any task and bringing it to full completion. Nope. Being practiced in reconciling different aspects of your contradictory self. Nope. You, <laughs> you are known for your skill at negotiating complex social situations. Nope. Where you can <laughs> where you can connect to people, where you can connect people to each other, even if they hold vastly different views and perspectives. Nope. Since you've learned how to listen to yourself, you're also great at listening to and understanding others. Nope. You are highly emotional. Nope. Spontaneous. Nope. And empathetic. Nope. And most importantly, you never apologize for being who you are. That much is that much I can't agree with. I don't apologize for being Jameson. 
Explore the other moon phases below, blah, 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 blah. Well, anyway, yeah, I hope that was somewhat entertaining. Uh, and there's also this other groovy website for people who are really interested in, like, astrology um, that I found. Uh, let me see if I can get it again. I have it somewhere here. But uh, it's, it's very interesting because you can see exactly where each planet is and what house each planet is in. And it allows you to make the interpretation yourself instead of uh, going to these bogus astrological fucking websites where people have this fairy floaty language that is just bullshit. So based, the website is called The Planets today.com slash astrology dot html and uh as of right now uranus is in taurus uh mars eris and chiron are in aries neptune in ceres is in pisces jupiter saturn and pluto are literally right on top of each other in like uh they're they're in like Capricorn, but they're like approaching Aquarius. Um, Mercury, Luna, and some other planet, and and the Sun is in Sagittarius. Venus is in Scorpio, as is the Moon. And uh, Humea, I don't know what the fuck that is. That's in Libra, and Make Make is in Libra. And uh, Th those are planets way out in the Kuiper Belt, just just so you know. It's, uh, I'm oh, sure you okay. knew. <laughs> the oh. Kuiper Belt is trans-Neptunian, meaning way out beyond Neptune, way out beyond Pluto, actually. But they they try ah. not to count Pluto anymore, and uh, which is sad. And I think they should, uh, you know. So it's it's. It, but anyhow, the, you know, astro astronomy is really not that different from astrology in the sense that you know it's full of fucking bullshit <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean I mean they have that asshole Neil deGrasse Tyson so yeah <laughs> thank you thank you what more do we need to know thank you yeah that's that says all you need to know take your time by the way with whatever you were doing what when I put the earbuds back on you were doing something like what the fuck was that like some kind of test like was this like a test like am I psychotic or something it sounded like that like do you have empathy for it no way <laughs> do you have like it sounded <laughs> oh, like oh, oh, oh no 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 they were I was reading off something that was talking about people uh they're, they're called full moon children people who were born on full moons I found out that I was born on a full moon oh oh okay and um... and so that that's why I'm always at war with myself inside of myself and I'm always like my own worst enemy Okay, is that what they say? Or yeah, yeah, the emotional side and the rational sides are at odds. Okay, and um... I'm, uh, uh, I I was born with a full moon in uh, Sagittarius, and my son is was actually in Taurus. Mm -hmm. So, go figure. Right, right. Well, definitely. You know, I didn't pay attention to the astral cartography, and uh, boy, did that come back and bite me in the ass. Uh, so, uh, so there you go. Um, I take astrology, uh, well, certainly astrocartography seriously. Uh, Miguel Landahar is uh, joining Marty Methuselah in, uh, you know, uh, tagging around the timeline, and that's cool. And uh, Miguel Landahar is a person who uh, feels he's incarnated uh, through um, many uh, lifetimes, and. Uh, Aside from all of that, uh, we hope to have him on the show at some point in the near future. Best uh, that you... I think this is my first lifetime, but uh, but I'm told that. <clears throat> but then again, you know, I'm told that I had some other lifetime in the uh, what do you call it? Oh gosh, uh, oh, what is that fucking star system? Anyway, you know. Granted, you know, I, 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 I really didn't take that seriously when I was told that, you know, I had some, uh, uh, I, 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 I was alive in Andromeda, Andromeda or some shit, and I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Did, there's a uh, limit to how much um, I will take people's magical advice on certain things. Granted, the other things were accurate, but, 
you know that when it comes to when, when we start talking about past lives and aliens and shit i'm like okay no 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 not gonna listen Yes, well, uh, yeah, uh, no, I hear you, I, I, I hear you, and, and, and well, it should be, uh, and uh, aside from... Because the... likes to keep it real, you know, and, and, and my thing, and that's my approach to magic as well, you know, I don't approach magic as, oh, dude, yesterday I, I meditated with Balthazar in my bedroom, <laughs> like, he had long blonde hair, he's like, dude, we're gonna rock out, and we're gonna, like, just smoke weed, dude, like... And you're gonna come with us to the realm of the gods. That's not how I do magic. <sighs> my my approach to magic is what can I affect in the real fucking world that will give me feedback so that I can know that I fucking did it. <laughs> yes. Hard sorcery, if you will. Well there you go. And uh this... type of stuff like uh Let's see if I cast a spell for someone to get hit by a car, and then I find out that person got hit by a car. There you go. That kind of stuff. There, there are people who certainly deserve that. Uh, and uh, all of that aside, um, on a, a little bit less controversial note, um, uh, do um, continue occupying uh, the stage for a little bit. I'm just going to go a little bit mute here to finish slurping up this tea, uh, get some... Uh, make myself hydrated enough towards where I can speak for a long period of time once I start. Let me take a look into the live stream again and see how they've been responding. Like start slurping down them energy drinks, man. The oh. caffeine buzz. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we've got eight hours. I'm going to, uh, or a um, little less than eight hours. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, yes, about seven and a half. I better get started it's very soon. Uh, our man Bill Lyons says uh, he, he says he has a printout of the phase he was born and he thinks he's a crescent. Now I get what he means. A crescent moon. Okay, that's that's where that comes from. So, uh, okay, you're inspiring everybody to look into themselves in that regard. Uh, was there, uh, like, have you ever tried mundane astrology? Like telling the fortunes of using astrology for entire nations or, or the like? Uh, no, that's not my, 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 my I, I, I basically have the approach of like, let me see if I can, you know, learn this stuff myself. Because I don't like going to astrological websites because they, they always have this fluffy sounding language and it's just like bullshit. And, and you, you will get everything you want if you do this. And you get everything you want if you do that. And it's like, well, oh, Usually that entails oh, a donation, does it? Oh, shit. <laughs> People pay money just to have themselves uh, reassured that oh, things are gonna go okay. No, that's 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 not worth my time and money. Um, I, I I look at astrology as a way of seeing uh, the way nations interact, act and whatnot. You know, so so things like on a political stage, I guess, would be like more affected by astrology. I don't see how it affects. It n never has affected me. On an individual level, mm -hmm. yeah, because I sort of take the same stance that Carl Jung had mm -hmm. taken. He said that there's no evidence, um, based on his psycho psychological research, that the astrological bodies pay, have any impact on, you know, how people are oriented. And granted, you know, while I while I can accept he had that. A perspective I think there that it may pay, pay play like a very tiny role in certain things but I think on a macroscopic level when we're talking about nations and groups of people it definitely does have an impact mm -hmm. okay yeah well uh, uh, yeah there we are uh, that would be more like along the lines of mundane astrology where one uh, you know casts horoscopes for entire nations or political parties or the like or establishments institutions bodies of people and oh uh, if i could get paid doing that shit and i could convince them you know i'll i'll get like some silk purple pants and like maybe this like a fucking a fucking carpet that i can like uh put like a electric scooter with like a carpet on it and make it seem like I'm like a, a genie from like a Disney movie or some shit. Be like, Mr. Joe Biden, I am your astrological advisor. I think it would be auspicious for you to do this such and such. 
get paid fucking shitload of money just to talk shit. Oh my god, I would love to do that. Uh, it's uh, it, actually yeah, nothing is stopping you. You could uh, you could give it a try. Yeah, give it a, a lot. I, I, I think you. Like, yeah, I think that I think you've got a lot of people skills. You got. <laughs> I don't have any people skills whatsoever. I am the equivalent of a mad scientist mixed with a feral child, as far as people skills is concerned. Yes. Yes. So, um, uh, aside uh, from so at some part, uh, at some point, I'll start screaming, yelling, and scratching, and biting people, and growling. What are you looking at? <laughs> and they'll be like, "What the fuck happened to him?" Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess me and Noreen help and have that much in common, huh? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there, there we are. Yes. Yeah, she does. No. Oh, yeah, she she does that shouting. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and they 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 were they've encouraged that at Revolution Radio. It seems they've really uh, that. wow. Yeah. So so it sounds like the more insane you are, the more they like your, your platform. Or, or well, they're, they're they're seeking entertainment to a great degree, and that many people find that entertaining. Uh, they, they're, they're, their lives are so dull; they need somebody to shout for them to get their adrenaline rush because you know their their lives are otherwise. Yeah. So. So you yeah, know. that's what the fat big Alex Jones is for. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, and and uh, but you know the one thing he's not he's not a female, and so Noreen Halpern is kind of a combination of Alex Jones and Michelle Malkin. So there you go. That's it's it's like that. So she kind of you know. Um, yeah. By the way, I didn't see Harlan uh, Sampson out there lately. Oh yeah, she was there. Lately. Yeah, she was, and. Uh, so um, aside from that, uh, the um, uh, do uh, do me a favor and was, were there any other stories that uh, Derek Talley put up? That... I had a shitload of stories that I could go into. Oh, uh, could you over the next few minutes? I'm going to go mute for a few minutes. Just like... yeah, 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 no doubt. Okay, so I found this. This one's interesting. Uh, there's a giant fire pit in a desert known as the gates of hell has been burning over 50 years deep in the heart of turkmenistan's karakum desert a fiery crater glows day and night known colloquially colloquially ah, as the door to hell or gates of hell this fire pit has been burning continuously for over 50 years so what is it this crater so what is this crater filled with fire and how did it end up in the desert for those answers we need to look back to turkmenistan's history in 1971 back when the country was a part of the soviet union soviet engineers came to the desert in the search of oil fields a drilling rig was set up to check oil quality in the area but they quickly realized that they weren't drilling into oil at all Instead, their heavy rig was situated on top of a large pocket of natural gas that couldn't support the immense weight and soon collapsed. <laughs> I don't believe I'm laughing at that. That's fucking horrible. <laughs> the entire camp crumbled into a giant bowl-shaped cavity called the Darvaza Crater measuring 230 feet across and 65 feet deep holy fucking shit can you imagine dying from collapsing into a fucking crater of a fire pit holy fucking shit talk about fucked up ways to go <laughs> it is enormous and soon scientists had a real problem on their hands not only did the collapse have a ripple effect that caused other multiple craters to open up, but natural gas was rapidly escaping. As natural gas is mainly made up from methane, which sucks up oxygen and makes it hard to breathe, there was a real concern not only for wildlife, but also for people living in the nearby village of Durwizi. In fact, these fears were warranted because not long after the collapse, animals in the, in the desert began to die. That's when scientists sprung into action and decided to burn off the gas as natural gas can't be trapped. They expected the process to take a few weeks, but they were wrong. 
The flames have been burning ever since. In fact, scientists still don't understand how much natural gas is fueling the fire. Now the Darvaza crater attracts hundreds of tourists a year who come to take a strange come to take in a strange and sinister looking phenomenon. Are you fucking serious? People are that fucking stupid that they would go out there in a place where the ground fucking collapsed just to see a pit of fire. Holy fucking shit. <laughs> Oh, God, I love humanity. It's just so amusing. In 2010, Turkmenistan's president, Gurbanguly, holy fucking shit, I can't spell that, I can't even pronounce that last name, Berdimuhamedow, visited the crater and said it should be closed up. How the fuck are they going to close it up? And in 2013, he declared... <laughs> the part of the desert containing the crater a natural reserve however as of today the gates of hell still burn brightly at night its wicked orange glow can be seen for miles that is fucking hilarious did you know that in um in the history of russia they had what was called a uh they had like a gas line they had like a gas pipeline fire that wouldn't go out. So what they did to put to put it out was they set off a nuclear bomb. And that fire fire finally went out. And of course the whole place was radioactive. So what the fuck are they going to do then? But 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 you know, it's just, it, it out of humor, I have to ask, why don't they just nuke it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, knowing Russia well that's what Russia does best anyway alright that was amusing so um, let's see what else we have and I got some stuff I got some good stuff uh, you guys just gotta give me a little ah here's something interesting right up my alleyway New Hypothesis argues the universe simulates itself into existence. How real are you? What if everything you are, everything you know, all the people in your life, as well as the events, were not physically there, but just a very elaborate simulation? Philosopher Nick Bostrom famously considered this in his seminal paper, Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? where he proposed that all of our existence might just be a product of a very sophisticated computer simulations ran by advanced beings whose real nature we may never be able to know. I think that's plausible. Now, a new theory has come along that takes it a step further. What if there are no advanced beings either, and everything in reality is a self-simulation that generates itself from pure thought? The physical universe is a strange loop, says the new paper titled The Self-Simulation Hypothesis, Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics, from the team at the Quantum Gravity Research, a Los Angeles-based theoretical physics institute founded by the scientist and entrepreneur Clee Irwin. They take Bostrom's simulation hypothesis, which maintains that all of reality is an extremely detailed computer program and asks, rather than relying on advanced life forms to create the amazing technology necessary to compose everything within our world, isn't it more efficient to propose that the universe itself is a mental self-simulation? They tie this idea to quantum mechanics, seeing the universe as one of many possible quantum gravity models. One important aspect that differentiates this view relates to the fact that Bostrom's original hypothesis is materialistic, seeing the universe as inherently physical. To Bostrom, we could simply be part of an ancestor simulation engineered by post-humans. That's also plausible. Even the process of evolution itself could, be just, could just be a mechanism by which the future beings are testing countless processes purposely moving humans through levels of biological and technological growth. Makes perfect sense. In this way, they also generate the 
supposed information or history of our world. Ultimately, we wouldn't know the difference. But where does the physical reality that would generate the simulations comes from wonder? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me, let me reread that. But where does the physical reality that would generate the simulations comes from wonder these researchers? Well, what if that, well, and my thinking here is that what if the reality of the people who created the simulation which we're in, what if their reality is also a simulation generated by other people who are in a simulation themselves generated by other people who, and so on and so forth. I, I, I think this goes on infinitely, like a sort of fractal loop, because that kind of makes sense. If you really trip really hard on something that has you seeing fractals and psychedelic Im imagery, it sort of makes sense. Their hypothesis takes on a non-materialistic approach, saying that everything is information expressed as thought. As such, the universe self-actualizes itself into existence, relying on underlying algorithms and a rule they call the principle principle of efficient language under this proposal the entire simulation of everything in existence is just one grand thought how would the simulation itself be originated it was always there say say the researchers explaining the concept of timeless em emergentism according to this idea time isn't there at all instead the all-encompassing thought that is our reality offers a nested semblance of a hierarchical order full of sub thoughts that reach all the way down the rabbit hole towards the base mathematics and fundamental particles this is also where the rule of efficient language comes in suggesting that humans themselves are such emergent subthoughts and that they experience and find meaning in the word world through other subthoughts called code steps or actions in the most eco economical fashion that makes sense that also makes sense in correspondence with big think physicist david chester elaborated while well, many scientists presume materialism to be true, we believe that quantum mechanics may provide hints that our reality is a mental construct. Recent advances in quantum gravity, such as seeing space-time emergent via a hologram, also is a hint that space-time is not fundamental. This is also compatible with ancient Hermetic in Indian philosophy. In a sense, the mental construct of reality creates space-time to efficiently understand itself by creating a network of subconscious entities that can interact and explore the totality of possibilities. Wow, that's deep. The scientists link their hypothesis to panpsychism, which sees everything as thought or consciousness. The authors think that their panpsychic self-simulation model can explain the origin of an overall arching pan consciousness at the foundational level of the simulations which self actualizes itself in a strange loop via self simulation this pan consciousness also has free will and its various nested levels essentially have the ability to select what code to actualize making while making syntax choices the goal of this consciousness to create meaning or information well, maybe its goal is just to get high. <laughs> if all of this is hard to grasp, the authors offer another interesting idea that may link your everyday experience to these philosophical considerations. Think of your dreams as your own personal self-simulations, postulates the team. While they are rather primitive by super-intelligent future AI standards, dreams tend to provide better resolution than current computer modeling and are a great example of the evolution of the human mind. As the scientists write, what is most remarkable is the ultra high fidelity resolution of these mind-based simulations and the accuracy of the physics therein. Actually, in my dreams, the physics are really fucking warped because I notice sometimes when I try to kick someone in the face, 
for some reason my legs don't work the right way or whenever I try to punch someone in a dream it's like my arms don't move properly so everything's really jacked up in my dreams uh, well dude, maybe physics are off in everybody's off. dreams dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh so that's a common thing yes that's that the dreams dude they're the, the dreams they don't the, know how many times in dreams that i woke up and i was like trying to continue to dream and i found myself punching like the air in my sleep and i'm like what the fuck <laughs> oh, yeah, the, you know those sorts of things happen oh uh, you know this is like we we all have that uh and uh it, it's 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 very common uh, you need to socialize a bit more uh, get out a bit more is what i would have said uh, if i were speaking to somebody that i had faith yeah, would do that I, I, of course I, I these, this is the age time. of covid this is the age of covid so you don't want to encourage anyone to get out more so uh it's uh Honestly, i i go out every day i have to despite covid because oh, oh, if that's I... true that's different though you're going out in the sense that you're exercising and you're kind of it's still it's still lonely it's still an isolationist kind of out yeah yeah, yeah. it is isolation yeah and uh so it's it's not a it's not a social uh out but th that's that's okay oh uh, i mean you are what you are and um, that's fine so what I'm going to try and do is uh, get my act together. You're doing fine. You brought us to the bottom of the hour. As a matter of fact, uh, a little bit beyond. And I, uh, you know, should have, uh, you know, come on sooner. But uh, it's been, you know, it's just been like uh, trying to psych myself up. I always hate doing the solicitation, but it's something that has to be done. <laughs> oh, yes. And, and uh, so it. Yeah. I do that i have to give my cat her medicine so i, I, I notice your cat yeah your, your cat yeah, is she was like meow, yeah, meow. Your, your cat's very much uh um so your cat like i don't get it is your cat enjoy the medicine or something most cats no wouldn't... no 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 the thing is about the cat is that i have my door closed and she wants to come into the basement uh -huh. Because she likes being, because all the cats, they seem to gravitate towards me. They like being in my room. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, you're and, open to them. You're not hostile to them. You like cats. so. Yeah, I love them. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, like, when I'm on the program, though, like, I, I have the door closed because I don't want all the noise from, like, the other family members upstairs to, you know, filter into the transmission, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, understood. Und understood. And, uh... So, uh, in terms of uh, giving the cats medicine, do you need to... I mean, you can do that while leaving the sound on. It won't bother me. Uh, and uh, then you can turn it off when I start monologuing uh, in seriousness. Well, but I, I, I'd actually have to go upstairs and, and uh, leave this platform for a little bit. So, uh, I'm going to take a fast break, if you don't mind. Sure, okay. Then I'll, I'll start my bit. I'm going to... Uh, uh, Okay, going to start uh, inhaling and uh, getting ready to monologue. And I uh, thank everyone for their patience. And I thank you, James and Reese, for doing what you did. Uh, you're definitely performing a service. And uh, it, uh, it helps. Every uh, little bit helps in these, uh, in these grim and terrifying times. And uh, so when it comes to uh, James and Reese... Uh, uh he is he just did what he did to help get us uh keep us on track keep every the bandwidth burning uh then uh you know i have to uh, kind of do what i can do to uh, uh do my part and uh it's just not easy sometimes uh tonight is one of those nights because i never uh got any sleep uh the day beforehand uh like i normally do but uh you know such is the um uh, such is the nature of the beast and uh today was very much a a beastly day in so many ways okay um i am probably going to have to cover britain and brexit more uh with the next episode uh tonight we're just going to do what we can with uh this side of the um this this side of the atlantic and this side of the pacific namely america for a, a little bit and then go straight to taiwan for the rest of the night now um all right this is my struggle uh, to educate everyone in regards to this and mein Kampf. 
my struggle be thine own contribute to the struggle at paypal.me forward slash Douglas Dietrich where I do ask everyone uh, five hours let me see so if we've got 12 minus 5 we've got five six seven we've got seven hours left okay I do ask everyone of course to uh, uh, mark myself use the option on PayPal to indicate myself a friend or family in order to prevent them from taking out a big bloody cut their pound of flesh and uh, we be we now be accepting PayPal contributions at uh, DouglasDietrich.com. In all due acknowledgement unto our own personal hero, we ask it of everyone moral and fiscal support on behalf of our dearest English brother in battle, John Henry McMills Warrington, whom you can friend and follow at Facebook uh, timeline Facebook.com forward slash John dot Warren, and of course subscribe to his mega channel on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Megator, which be spelled M A W G O T A U R, he being the property manager thereof, who also serves as Team Thrax, Dietrich's Art Dragon's ultimate post episodic producer, and our final productions archivist at DouglasDietrich.com. Mm. For where it no for he nigh all videographic works of the internationally recognized renegade military historian would have been lost. So if financial aid no be prohibitive per budgetary constraints, you electronically relay monetary assistance via PayPal, where you can donate to the Maggot Man, aka John Warrington, by clicking send on your PayPal account page and then entering his email address, John underscore war at hotmail dot com. And you can PayPal him at paypal.me forward slash Magator, with Magator being spelled M A G G O T A U R, he being of course, the man who, of his own initiative, downloaded the majority of what I published on YouTube into his own personal hard drive so we could reconstruct my legacy in the, within the material world's cyberspatial data matrix. And um, during the periods that, well, the three times that everything I had was literally scrubbed from the Internet. Uh, and during such times, it was John who served as a bridge between the Akashic Records and uh, the uh, cyberspatial data metrics of the material plane on which I, as a virtual persona, interact with yourself within the matrix. And now you too can do your part to help in the fight against total annihilation. Spread the word about Douglas Dietrich, that he, the biological son of Adolphus Jacob Hitler, which you can find out more about at DouglasDietrich.com forward slash 2019 forward slash 05 forward slash 08 forward slash Douglas Dietrich, son of Adolf Hitler, fighting against white supremacist neo-Nazis. Confer a while there. A footnote, a footnote on mine bio sire, which uh, be on the homepage of showsdv.com. And uh, once you've availed yourself of the educational information to be found thereon in both sites, uh, take it upon yourself to spread the word far and wide to all and sundry that the scion of Adolf Hitler, Douglas Dietrich, be alive and well and resident in the city and county of San Francisco. And, if at all possible, uh, educate and enlighten others. Uh, and, of course, uh, inform them to electronically relay their own contributions at paypal.me forward slash Douglas Dietrich. Uh, uh, marking myself as extended family or indicating myself as a friend uh, because we're all friends and extended family here or people wouldn't be sponsoring. Yes. Uh, and, of course, uh, people are forever asking, Renegatus uh, Humanus uh, Arma uh, Maza Eriducio, the renegade human weapon of mass instruction, what they can do to fight the pedopath of philocracy, such being our present Slavo Western government by Patriarchy of Pathological Pedophiles, you can all help spread awareness by supporting myself. Now, I'm getting some incoming message. Uh, from our man Jamo Reese. Well, you're not knocked off the call, uh, Jameson. You're right here. Uh, um, uh, the um, so well, I had to I had to get myself back in to join the call. So I think I might have hit the wrong button. Uh -huh. Then and, your, your mouth sounds full. Are you like what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just now getting dinner. It's 12.42 a.m. in the morning in New York, and I'm just now getting dinner. <laughs> Understood. No, no, no. Uh, understood. Uh, so um, you're on. Uh, no worries. And um, so I'll, I'll go on with solicitation. Thank you. You can. Uh, and uh, so um, 
there we have it. People are forever asking the Renegadus Humanus Arma Abmaze Eruditio, the Renegade Human Weapon of Mass Instruction, what they can do to fight the pedopathophilocracy. You can all help spread awareness by supporting myself. We have a new contribution page on DouglasDietrich.com where you can make us donation online using either the credit or debit card by pressing the red donate button, which will take you to where you can use credit or debit without needing to indicate myself, a friend, or a family member. And uh, that, of course, uh, means that you may not want to deal with the hassle of indicating myself as a friend or a familial relation, which you might find distasteful, in which case one would wonder why you're supporting myself financially, but um, such... Yes, yeah, it is. Uh, simply go to DouglasDietrich.com. Otherwise, uh, to click the yellow donate button, should you want to use PayPal or to reward yourself after you've donated via credit or debit card by logging in and accessing the archives on of our website, which is through the yellow donate button, which takes you to the PayPal uh, page at showsdd.com, which is also the page where you uh, register and log in for access to the archives on sponsoring or supporting myself. All sponsors will be granted exclusive electronic access to both my videographic and audio recorded archives through to this year from the 2011th year in our Lord, the very year mine own late and sainted matriarch, the grandma dame Diana Lin Zuchin. Right. Uh, Takabayashi Hideko Dietrich was murdered, assassinated, and I immediately aftermath the uh, uh, Sanjuichi Sensemi, the 311 terror attack on the Fukushima Daiichi, or uh, Big One cluster of nuclear power plant facilities on site, the 7,000 Isles of the Greater Japanese Empire, when was deemed by much of the Native American uh, cosmological reckoning that the first rays of the dawning of the sixth world broke upon us, and magics could again be worked conjointly with Mother Earth to redeem the folk upon her. But not on YouTube anymore, where on the intra-global crises analyst Douglas Dwayne Dietrich long ago on established his high-profile visibility platform for rationale or personal security by way of public promotion. Only on contribution will their membership be processed within 48 through 72 hours, between two to three days for full he says to all mine archives, meaning all those videos that John Warrington saved, aside those on the Maggot Douglas Dietrich channel and the YouTube channel named Taboo Bros 2. As managed by mixed martial arts maestro Daniel Arola, whom you can visit at facebook.com forward slash daniel.arola.3 of Damage or Daniel Arola Martial Arts Group Incorporated Cali Combatives. Optionally mail either checks or money orders, never cash, to the personal residential address of the Mr. Douglas Dietrich, which itself be listed on douglasdietrich.com forward slash donate dash two. The most important thing being that people regularly donate what they can within their means. Foremost among Exus Daddy D's donors aside is mistress and manager Selena Khan and his former webmistress, Lana Shea, be our most beloved greater British brother in battle, the Team Thrax, Dietrich's Art Dragons, heavyweight lifting keeper of the spirits, and YouTube uh, Bizarre HD channel managing mixologist, George Edward Knight, whom you can friend at facebook.com forward slash george.e.knight.7. He beam my own personal hero, who has substantially delivered towards my salvation from the streets and who self-produced videos entitled How the United States Won World War One and Why We Are Still Legally at War with the Third Reich, both be factually substantiated per my known expositions. Uh, and uh, trailered upon his channel uh, at Bizarre HD, which you can subscribe to at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Bizarre HD, which itself be spelled B-I-Z-A-R-E-H-D, is uh, the... Um, uh, Thousand Year Reich in Exxon, or uh, subtitled the uh, Third Reich's Flugelrad and Hanabu Technology. Indeed, the last Dithraka Govies, the son of Dithrix or son of a dragon's uh, Anglo corrupted as Dracula's expositions via YouTube would not be possible sans generous benefactions from my listeners on a monthly basis. The Amerasian agent of the Peacock Angel, Tavush Maliak, be the only person on the surface of this world with the insider knowledge and experience necessary to lead thy resistance against the Russell sub satanic occupation and anti godly insurgency. It bearing no end of emphasis that you, D, Anglo corrupted as Jedi, literally Master D, or the Master of Enlightenment, myself, is not paid to articulate mine expositions and have never once been remunerated for my services rendered unto thyself and all thy holdest dear, and incomparable sacrifices to myself, most tragically of all my loved ones in my most singular and quite unenviable role as the ultimate public informant at personal risk fell at large. Your taxation cannot support myself as I be denied access to the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. 
benefits and or services due to dishonorable discharge. So again, go to paypal.me forward slash Douglas Dietrich and enter mine remunerative compensation, the very survival of the human species be at stake. And I am not exaggerating. Do not wait. Donate now. It be appreciated beyond my ability to express in any language. As well, forget not to subscribe to the YouTube the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash c forward slash Douglas Dietrich and tap click on that notification bell in order to receive notifications that live streams have started. Even if you be subscribed, you will only receive notifications if you select all in notifications. To reemphasize, subscribe to the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash c forward slash Douglas Dietrich and tune in at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That would be 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time every Sunday and Wednesday night and tap click on that notification bell in order to receive notifications that live streams have started. Finally, most importantly, above and beyond all else, subscribe and support at DouglasDietrich.com and donate at PayPal.me forward slash Douglas Dietrich. All sponsors will be granted exclusive access to the online archives, including all video and MP3 recordings of Douglas Dietrich from 2011 through to the present. Simply go to the yellow donate button, bring yourself to the show's DD dot page and uh, there you will be able to uh, log in, register and log in to the archives to reward yourself for sponsorship. In terms of shout outs, shout out to Salman Sheikh who sent myself a quarter of a hundred United States dollar money order and to the Baron Benestanius who was able to uh, send me a Christmas bonus. Wonderful human being, God bless him and uh, Happy Hanukkah! The Festival of Lights uh, began Thursday evening this week last and will last until sundown this Friday. In terms of the weekend, what was? Over 108,000 coronaviral patients are hospitalized nationwide. That's a record high for the seventh day. Uh, multiple people were stabbed and 23 others arrested during post-election protests in Washington, District of Columbia. Uh, Trump's angry mobs sparking terrorism fears. Uh, indeed, the quote to remember is, I don't know how this ends without violence and death. As more than 200 Republican members of Congress ignore their oaths to the Constitution and abet Donald Trump's uh, autocratic attempt to overturn the election results, their cowardly silence is damn near ensuring that someone or multiple people will end up dead. Uh, Clint Watts, a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security at George Washington University told MSNBC's Nicole Wallace Wednesday this week last, I don't know how this ends without violence and death. The pattern of threats is unmistakable and it is growing. As a brief overview, reflect upon the plot to kidnap the Michigan governoris. Uh, are militia members showing up at the home of Michigan's Secretary of State while she was decorating for Christmas? Violent threats directed at Georgia's Secretary of State, his family, and random election workers, and a Georgia election official's urgent warning that death threats in the state will get someone killed, and death threats made against the Arizona Secretary of State and her family. They always go for the woman, of course. They're extremely gynophobic and misogynist to the core. Uh, and uh, the Arizona Republican Party asking whether people are willing to die for Trump's cause. Uh, and armed protesters showing up at the homes of Idaho health officials and terrorizing their families. Finally, a man shooting an intensive care unit nurse on her way to work because he felt she was part of the COVID conspiracy and that COVID itself was a hoax, but that somehow she as part of a medical industrial complex was profiting therefrom. Mm. As the aforesighted Watts pointed out, many of the most concerning threats are arising in states where militias and fringe right-wing groups have traditionally thrived. Idaho, Michigan, Arizona, and Georgia. Uh, this is, of course, uh, extremely alarming. Uh, as a security expert myself, I, like Watts, also believe the worst is yet to come. The relatively close election created a delayed response of sorts where people were waiting for an outcome and Trump's cultists believed he might still prevail, but they now have had time to think about what they want to do. They have heard continuous false claims, which they want to believe, and now they are being pushed and pointed to places to mobilize. The dynamic was only going to get worse in the months ahead after Trump is ejected from the White House and the coronavirus starts to be less of a threat and there's more public targets as people start returning to public life. But as the threat of 
violence has grown, the vast majority of Republican lawmakers continue pouring gasoline on the pyre. On Wednesday, 17 Republican attorneys general joined a doomed pro-Trump lawsuit seeking to overturn election results and subvert the will of the people in a handful of states. And on Tuesday, this week last, Republican leaders Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy torpedoed a symbolic resolution that would have recognized Joe Biden as rightful president-elect for the purposes of the inaugural ceremonies. And many Republican lawmakers continue making various legal and rhetorical efforts to push support for Trump's authoritarian, autocratic coup attempt. Uh, meanwhile, Trump himself is issuing clear calls to violence Thursday before spouting more unfounded giverish, claiming that he actually won the election until it was fixed. Trump uh, tweeted that we will soon be learning about the word courage and saving our country. The toxic mix of events has left MSNBC's Wallace practically speechless. It did so on Wednesday on a show deadline White House. That's the name of her show, Deadline White House. And uh, she was wondering how re how could Republican lawmakers and even reactionary media personalities possibly fail to draw the line at stoking violence over an election Trump so clearly lost. Well, the former Republican strategist Steve Schmidt responded, that line is in the rearview mirror. They crossed it. We cannot be fantastical in wishing that what has happened has not happened in our thinking. It has happened. And Schmidt has gone on to assert that the Republican Party is no longer committed to the American ideal of representative democracy. He himself was so testifying that they all know that Biden has won the election. What they're doing is for no purpose other than power. The Republican Party is an organized conspiracy for the purposes of maintaining power for self-interest and the self-interest of its donor class. There is no fidelity to the American idea and ideal. Now, there's a rough transcript that my son wrote for me uh, and um, rather typed that for me. So I have this before me in which Nicole Wallace says, I do not understand how elected Republicans like Mitch McConnell and even right-wing hosts like Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh do not say today there's a line that can't be crossed and that's violence. By the way, I'm checking into the uh, uh, chat room and they're asking about the cat door, which is cute and that's fine. And uh, then, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, Steve Schmidt, his response was, uh, that line is in the rearview mirror, Nicole. They crossed it. They crossed the Rubicon. They crossed it in the month of November. We cannot be fantastical in wishing that what has happened has not happened in our thinking. It has happened. We've watched it play out. We've watched Trump and his loony attorneys. We've watched the, decel the declarations of fraud. We've seen United States senators, members of the White House's representatives. They all know that Biden has won the election. What they're doing is for no purpose other than power. The Republican Party is an organized conspiracy for the purposes of maintaining power for self-interest and the self-interest of its donor class, there is no fidelity to the American idea and ideal. There is no fidelity to the ideas of classical liberalism or American democracy. The whole fight in the history of the country has been who gets to participate in the American idea and ideal. In 2020, there's one side, and I'm proud to be on it, that says it's for everybody, for black people, for Latinos, for gay people, for every American, right? It belongs to all of us. That's not what the other side believes. They believe that they should rule over the majority of the country by any means necessary. The debate that has been about do we get to participate in this great experiment has now become one whether we continue with this great experiment at all. That's why they are so radical. There has never been a force that has achieved power or is within reach of achieving power in the next election that's been so hostile to the history, the foundings, the essence, and the entire meaning of the country, as is this Trump and Trumpist movement that has taken over lock, stock, and barrel the Republican cult, which is no longer dedicated to American democracy. It is dedicated to Trump and Trumpism and to his familial dynasty to defense of his indecencies, his autocratic manner, his corruptions, and apologists for the profound damage he has done. Now, Codebreakers uh, in San Francisco finally cracked the Zodiac Killer cipher sent to the San Francisco Chronicle back in 1969. It's something like a Trump tweet. It reads, I hope you are having lots of fun in trying to catch me. 
I am not afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner because I now have enough slaves to work for me. Now, QAnon is the umbrella term for this sprawling set of internet conspiracy theories that allege that the world is run by a cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who are plotting against the, well, against Donald Trump, the person of the individual Donald Trump, while operating a global child sex trafficking ring. And QAnon Republican uh, candidate was arrested and charged with possession of child pornography. Now, one of the great strangenesses and perversions in the QAnon conspiracy theory is that part of what Donald Trump, a man who was good friends with the convicted child molester Jeffrey Epstein himself, is doing in his fight against the deep state, it is, which is per QAnon to clean up a vast child sex human trafficking cabal. The idea that there are powerful people engaged in illegal human sex trafficking that involves underage children is very believable. In fact, Donald Trump seems to have intimately known some of those people and even hired the former Florida Attorney General Alexander Acosta, one of the main perpetrators who cut a deal to let one of those human traffickers off with a hand slap, as well as, of course, Rudy Giuliani, who was at West Point when he absolved all of the perpetrators of mass crimes in child sexual abuse en masse in a massive trafficking and exploitation ring. He absolved them of all guilt and made certain no one would ever face justice. Anywho's QAnon theorists have evolved the Hillary Clinton and Pizzagate and whatever else Judeophobic globalist bullshit theory that makes them feel like, like they know what's going on. It's like chemtrail conspiracy theory with a touch of sex and child abuse because QAnon is even more of a religious cult than Pizzagate was. Mm. It is indeed the future of the Republican Party. And all such religious cults uh, define themselves, or usually help define themselves by saying other groups of people do terrible things to children. And guess what? Republican QAnon conspiracy theorist and failed Louisiana candidate Ben Gibson was just pulled into custody midweek last on Wednesday and charged for, yes, of course, four counts of possession of child pornography involving juveniles under the age of 13. To truly understand how profoundly hypocritical and grotesque the Q movement really is. They will sweep this under the rug like they do with any fact or piece of reality or logic that conflicts directly with their convoluted narrative. In recent months, the QAnon folks have used this blanket child trafficking conspiracy theory to argue against COVID-19's true danger and the need to overthrow our government and install a billionaire with dozens of sexual assault allegations against him into power. Is everyone who believes... Uh, in QAnon, a secret pedophile? Yes! <laughs> in fact, I am certain that the overwhelming majority of people that believe in QAnon are practicing pedophiles and really obsess over child human trafficking and the powers that allow us men like Donald Trump and Alexander Acosta and Rudy Giuliani to support known pedophiles because they themselves support such to carry on with their own proclivities. And such a group of pedophiles as QAnon that intensely focuses on child human trafficking as clearly manipulated by logic-free conspiracy theories, they are a great target for people who prey on such people. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's how predators work. Just ask Donald Trump and the Magabites who have given him hundreds of millions of United States dollars to fight for an imaginary coup d'etat. Now, WGNO reports that the 34-year-old Gibson is an active airman. Yes, of course, defending you. Oh yes, those great military servicemen, all those baby raping Satanists. And he's stationed at Barksdale Air Force Base. He was arrested along with the 30-year-old Jared Kutz, who was also charged with possession. Both men are from Bozier City. Uh, Gibson came in last in a four-person race 
for the 4th Congressional District of Louisiana a couple of weeks ago, receiving just over 6% of the vote. Republican Mike Johnson held on to a seat easily. Uh, but of course, uh, many of these QAnon candidates are now in Congress and they're working alongside people they are firmly convinced are trafficking in children, probably wanted to get elected so they could get in on the action and are just looking for some intern, well, some boy bud or girl cunt among the interns. Now, in terms of the week ahead, it's time for American authorities to move fast and break things. There's a long-expected showdown between government regulators and mighty Facebook that could become a defining moment for Silicon Valley right here in California, south of San Francisco, and the way we use social media. More than 40 states and the Federal Trade Commission have filed parallel lawsuits that uh, prove Mark Zuckerberg's $800 billion United States dollar social media giant is acting as an illegal monopoly and uh, prove that it is using its massive wealth to buy up rivals in order to crush competition. Now, of course, Facebook denies the charges and, uh, well, they claim Washington is moving the goalposts after previously clearing its acquisitions. The government offensive against Facebook comes in the twilight of the Trump administration, but the bipartisan nature of the complaints led by New York's Democratic Attorney General Letitia James suggests that the Biden administration won't stand in its way. If it's successful, the lawsuits could have grave consequences for Facebook. The FTC hopes to force it to sell off photo sharing app Instagram and messaging app WhatsApp. And uh, Ian Conner, the director of the uh, Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Competition, it has gone on record to say our aim is to roll back Facebook's anti-competitive conduct and restore competition so that innovation and free competition can thrive. Well, so there can actually be some free fucking speech that's not controlled by Mark Fuckerberg. Um, the truth is that Facebook doesn't have much goodwill in Washington. It is so huge and influential that there are multiple reasons for lawmakers to harbor concerns about its operations. And uh, we all know it has never done enough to stop the spread of falsehoods, conspiracy theories, and lies that pollute American elections. And uh, we all know its dominance of online advertising poses an unfair threat to traditional media companies. And Fuckerberg's combative appearances before congressional committees hardly endeared him to the power brokers on Capitol Hill. Facebook is not the only Silicon Valley behemoth in Washington sites. The Justice Department and 11 states filed suit against Google in October, alleging it stifled competition to ensure its own dominance of online search and advertising. Google categorically rejects these charges. Both cases are already drawing comparisons to the U.S. government's case against Microsoft, which included years of trials and appeals and ended in a settlement. Hey. Meanwhile, in a flurry of tweets, Friday into this weekend, Trump claimed credit for not starting any wars, described his much scrutinized call to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky as a, even better than perfect, and called on FDA Chief Stephen Hunt to get the damn, and he spelled damn D-A-M, get the damn vaccines out now! Ow. The president wrote, I just want to stop the world from killing itself. Hey, please vacate the Oval Office and that will help. <laughs> He's refused to model mask wearing, the man who wants to stop the world from killing itself, and he's encouraged Americans to flaunt COVID-19 lockdown rules. Yes, the man who just wants to stop the world from killing itself. Meanwhile, more than... 30,000 people in these United States have died of the virus in the first 13 days of December alone that we know of. Pfizer's first shipment of its coronavirus vaccine will leave a Michigan uh, facility. Well, it, I believe it left it today or yesterday. It's expected to arrive at 145 sites in all states Monday. Both the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have approved its use for people over the age of 16. About 20 million people could get vaccinated in the next few weeks. I would be one of them um, if I could be, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, but um, that's just me. I, I would risk it, yes. 
But, uh, you know, I can understand uh, reticence on the part of many people. Uh, this is something that, uh, hey, it's, it's got its risks. Uh, now, the thing that I can um, uh, say about uh, the, uh, uh, about this is that uh, on the plus side, we, well, the worst week of the pandemic brought the best news so far. The vaccine is here. All that's left to do is wait. The next six months, the next half year, will be vaccine purgatory. Now, and welcome to vaccine purgatory. Now, we've spent 2020 adjusting to pandemic normal, and now a strange new period is upon us. Thus, the waiting begins. There are a few things you should know about this new phase of the outbreak. Um, in fact, there's four I can think of. First, we don't know how long this purgatory will last. Operation Warp Speed officials have laid out an aggressive timeline to get nearly all Americans vaccinated by June, the mid, uh, well, mid-year next. But this presumes several pieces going perfectly. Second, it may matter where you live. While a CDC committee sets recommendations of how to prioritize initially scarce doses, each state ultimately decides how to allocate the vaccines it receives. Three, decisions are still being made about who will get what when. The decisions still being made about how to prioritize vaccines will dramatically color individual people's experiences over the next few months. But ultimately, getting out of purgatory will require reaching herd immunity, which is something we can only achieve collectively. Now for, finally, plans to vaccinate the general public remain completely fuzzy. When vaccines become most available to the general public depends on a few unknowns. First, how many other vaccine candidates like AstraZeneca's and Johnson's and Johnson's will actually also get authorized. So, that leaves us with that. Let me take a look at the latest incoming message or notification. That's from George Knight. And uh, so, didn't get through to uh, Brian Hall last night. Hopefully he'll leave a message. And uh, now, Georgia is the center of the American political universe as early voting for the Senate runoff starts Monday, tomorrow. The winners of the two races next month will determine which party controls the U.S. Senate. After baseless lawsuits, recounts, and conspiracy theories, the people tasked by the Constitution to pick up, well, to pick the president, a.k.a. the electors, meet tomorrow to cast their ballots. President-elect Joe Biden is projected to win 306 electoral votes, sealing President Trump's fate after the Supreme Court rejected his last-ditch effort to overturn the results. And United States health experts will be gathering again to discuss a second vaccine candidate. The FDA Advisory Committee will review Moderna's coronavirus vaccine Thursday and make a recommendation on whether to authorize it. Yester Septimania, or last week, it had a similar meeting for the Pfizer vaccine and voted to approve it. And President Trump himself signed a one-week stopgap bill that extends government funding to Friday of this week, giving lawmakers more time to reach an agreement on coronavirus relief and broader legislation for a fiscal new year. So um, that brings us to another day and still no stimulus deal from Congress. While a full relief package has eluded lawmakers for months, there was some hope that Congress would tack some sort of stimulus measures onto a bill to ward off a looming government shutdown that would start, well, it would have started today 
or yesterday, yeah, actually Friday into this weekend, if Trump had not signed what he did. A short-term spending bill on the table would keep the government open for uh, another week until the 18th of this month, but days away. But it's itself facing pushback from reactionary Republican senators who want language to prevent future government shutdowns. And Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, an independent, who wants a provision for another round of stimulus checks. Meanwhile, the European Union has reached a final agreement on its own two trillion United States dollar package to rebuild the Eurobloc's faltering economies. So, uh, again, uh, with what's going on with Brexit, I'll check into that with our next transmission. There's just too much going on, uh, and I won't be covering it exhaustively by any means, but... Uh, so, Jameson Reese says a useless government shutting down more or less makes, uh, wait, what did he say? More or less makes, let me read this. It's just another regular day in paradise. <laughs> there we are. Ooh, shit. Uh, get that up there. Yeah. And, uh, so there we have that. And, uh, now, um, let me try and, um, center myself here because we've got, uh, oh, we've got, um, just so much shit going down. Uh, you know, we've got... Uh, it's, it's almost too much for me to try and cover before I get into the history of Taiwan that I have to cover in response, as I promised, to an individual who asked about it. And uh, Now, otherwise, everything Donald Trump has done since losing the election has validated fears that a second term would have deeply imperiled American democracy to the point of no possible return. Enraged by his loss, the president is debasing the notion that elections are free and fair, a fundamental underpinning of a political system based on consent. Trump has tried to corrupt the electoral system by pressuring local officials to subvert the vote outcome. He exposed others to threats of violence by stoking conspiracy theories about electoral processes they oversaw. He persuaded more than 120 members of the House of Representatives to join his effort to contradict American voters. And after years of working to bend the justice system to his whims, he is considering firing even his loyal Attorney General, William Billy Barr, for recognizing the election was fair. The President insults truth itself when he claims that he won landslides in states where he clearly lost big, like Pennsylvania and Michigan. He has made a mockery of the United States court system with a string of frivolous suits. And now he's turning on the conservative Supreme Court majority that he himself built because it wouldn't even consider his absurd but dangerous effort to ignore millions of votes. Meanwhile, he's ignoring the terrible rising toll of a pandemic that is now worse than it has ever been. After months of acting in a way that almost certainly means more people will get sick and die. Trump did not just set out to destroy confidence in the election to assuage his own embarrassment at losing. As he pointed out himself in a Fox News interview over the weekend, he's taking revenge by harming his rightful successor. Himself going on record to say, I worry about the country having an illegitimate president. The courts have thwarted Trump's unprecedented effort to crush American democracy. He will be gone in 36 days or so. But the damage is already done to Americans' trust in their political system and in the American presidency itself. And the Republican cult go us down a dangerous road. A troubling number of Republicans. The overwhelming majority still refuse to acknowledge President-elect Joe Biden's victory. And they're setting a most dangerous precedent. Donald Trump did not win the 2020 election. That outcome has been obvious for more than a month now. 
and yet the president and his supporters refuse to accept the result. Instead, they've pushed baseless claims of fraud and chosen to attack the democratic system. Perhaps more disturbing, no members of the Republican establishment are willing to challenge this anti-democratic stance, or so few that only 27 of 249 congressional Republicans have publicly acknowledged President-elect Joe Biden's victory. With this, I forewarn that the Red Republican Party is setting a spectacularly troubling precedent. The president's supporters were never going to accept the results. When they say the 2020 election was stolen, Trump cultists are expressing their view that the votes of rival constituencies should not count. To humor them, the Republican cult is abandoning electoral democracy itself. This embrace of the president's attempt to overturn the results of the election is both shocking and horrifying. And the party is, ergo, headed down a most dangerous road. In elections going forward, not trying to steal the election will be seen as rhino or Republican in name only behavior. Now, three weeks and three days from now, voters in Georgia will choose the state's two senators and with that vote decide which party will have a majority in the chamber. Just maybe by then the rest of the Republicans in the Senate will have publicly admitted that President Trump lost the November election. But that concession, which should be something Americans should take for granted, no longer comes as guaranteed. Trump's open defiance of the election result, which many Republicans initially brushed off as nothing more than a temper tantrum, has turned far grimmer, more serious, and longer lasting, thanks in large part to Republican officials who have enabled him. Tomorrow, the members of the Electoral College will meet in their state capitals and formally ratify Joe Biden's victory, but it's no longer clear that even that will end the effort to subvert the election. Some Trump cultists in the House say they plan to challenge the result when Congress meets on January 6th, the day after the Georgia runoff. Now, the drive to overturn the election by ginning up groundless claims of fraud has split the Republican cult itself. The fault line showed plainly this week as 17 Republican state attorneys general, many of them ambitious for higher office. Several Republican senators and 106 Republican members of the House publicly backed a long-shot effort by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton to have the Supreme Court throw out the election results from Georgia and three other states Biden won. A few Republican elected officials, including the attorneys general of Georgia and Ohio, publicly opposed the Texas suit. Alaska Senatoris Lisa Murkowski said Friday into this weekend she was surprised and really disappointed by the degree of support the move had received from her fellow Republicans. Senator Mitt Romney, the Republican from Utah, called the idea of further challenges to Biden's victory madness. But who the fuck cares what that piece of shit says? Many more, however, simply stood uneasily on the sidelines, attempting to avoid taking any position at all. And, as Christ himself said, Be thee either hot or cold, but if thou art lukewarm, I will spit thee out. Those are the most damned of all. The consequences of that split in the Republican cult have played out most dramatically in Georgia, one of the twa states that gave Biden his closest victories. Trump's claims have pitted his ardent cultists, including Senators Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue, against those who oversaw the election, including Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and his predecessor in that job, Governor Brian Kemp, whom Trump has publicly denounced. That internal fight has added still more uncertainty to a double runoff election that remains impossible to predict, an election that turns on turnout. Only a few things can be said for sure about the January 5th runoff election that pits Purdue against John Ossoff and Loeffler 
against the Reverend Raphael Warnock. The most important is that fewer people will vote in a special election a few days after New Year's than the roughly 5 million who cast ballots in the presidential contest. It's a cliché of political analysis that election results depend on turnout. In truth, most elections depend on a mix of persuading swing voters and mobilizing your own supporters. In this case, however, the cliché is true. After a year of non-stop campaigning, the number of persuadable swing voters is almost surely so tiny as to be non-existent. Victory will go to the side that does the best job of minimizing the drop-off from November. In that first round, Purdue ran almost exactly even with Trump statewide, getting slightly more votes than the president in the Atlanta suburbs, slightly fewer in the extremely pro-Trump counties in the state's northwestern corner. Ossoff, by contrast, ran nearly 100,000 votes behind Biden. A significant chunk of Biden's voters appear to have taken part in the presidential contest, but didn't fill out the rest of their ballot, a fairly common occurrence in elections. The pattern in the Loeffler Warnock race is more complicated since they're running in a special election to fill a vacancy. The November election in their case was a free-for-all featuring multiple candidates from each party. Biden, however, did a bit better than all the Democratic candidates combined. So the Republicans, especially Purdue, start out with a bit of an advantage, but several big factors could erase that edge and Trump plays a large role in each of them. Start with black voters? who were the key to Biden's victory. Ossoff ran most seriously behind Biden in Atlanta and parts of South Georgia, a pattern that suggests he didn't do as well as he needed to among black Georgians. That's a problem he encountered in 2017 when he narrowly lost a special election to fill a seat in the House. The history of Georgia runoffs might suggest that problem would get worse in January. Turnout among black voters often has declined significantly in the state's runoff elections. But Warnock's presence on the ballot and the prospect of his becoming the first black senator from Georgia could help keep black voter turnout high, helping both Democratic candidates. So could Trump. Many Democratic strategists feared that the party's voters, many of whom were heavily motivated to defeat Trump, might lose interest in voting once he lost his re-election bid. But Trump's refusal to accept the results and his attacks on the legitimacy of the vote have kept Democratic motivation high. In particular, Trump and his chief lawyer, former New York Mayor Rudolph W. Giuliani, have made a race, well, they've made race itself a key element of their claims. You know, the blacks are all, the niggers are all voting twice and shit. Because they all got that black shadow. They've repeatedly asserted that Trump had the election by the balls, but it was stolen from him by corruption in cities with large black communities, such as Detroit, Philadelphia, and Atlanta, even though the biggest swings against Trump came in suburban areas, which you know historically are fish belly white. Those barely veiled attacks on the legitimacy of voting by black Americans could act as a powerful mobilizing force in and of itself. At the same time, Trump's attacks on the election have kept fervor high among his strong supporters, his cult base, even though many of them believe the November election was fraudulent. There's little evidence that they'll pass up a chance to vote in the runoff. But the strife might hurt Loeffler and Purdue among a small but important slice of voters, traditional Republicans, actual conservatives, who voted for Biden in November because they couldn't stomach Trump anymore but who weren't ready to cast a vote for a Democratic Senate candidate either. Just as the videotaped killing of George Floyd this year caused a significant number of white Americans to reassess their reluctance to believe what black Americans have long told them about systemic racism, Trump's own virulent race-based attacks on the election might cause some white Georgians to reconsider their doubts about what Stacey Abrams and other black leaders in Georgia have long said about race bias in the state's elections. Moreover, as Georgia's Lieutenant Governor Geoff Duncan, a Republican, said in an interview Thursday this week last with Judy Woodruff on PBS's NewsHour, 
The attacks on the electoral process itself may have seriously damaged the Red Party's image with less partisan voters. Uh, to quote his T, uh, well, I think uh, what he said was, let me look it up here so I don't misquote it. Duncan said, a small group of folks have been willing to put out misinformation based on fractions or slivers of the facts or truth and spun it out there to large crowds and said, hey, look, we don't like the outcome of this election, so we're going to stir the pot. He concluded that at some point, Trump supporters will start to realize they've been duped. He's so saying, it's not American. It's not democracy. This is not our finest moment. And my hope is that we quickly move past this. Good fucking luck. Dunk. We are headed towards civil war. Even the court's conservatives, however, to their credit, seem to recognize that this was not a constitutional controversy that merited its involvement, but a crude power grab. And in doing so, the Supreme Court handed Trump and his Republican seditionists the ultimate loss. But there has to be a reckoning. When the state of Texas asked the Supreme Court this week to disenfranchise millions of voters in four other states, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, it said that it was doing so because no other remedy or forum existed. The Electoral College casts and counts its votes tomorrow, and Texas claimed the Supreme Court was the only venue that could protect its Electoral College votes from being canceled. It was the only court that can hear this action quickly enough to throw out those four states' electors and force their legislatures to choose new ones. Presumably, the new electors would be more to Texas's or rather to Donald Trump's liking. The president had asked to join the suit, which he called the big one, like his dick, or what he likes to think his dick is. Perhaps four years of dealing with a president who rewards inflated tributes to his power had given someone involved with this lawsuit the impression that such an outrageous argument might just work. It did not. On Friday evening, into this weekend, the Supreme Court of the land, in a brief order, threw out Texas's lawsuit, concluding that the state had no standing to even bring it. With that, the big one is done. There'd be no forum or venue under our Constitution to do what Texas and Trump wanted because what they wanted was utterly unconstitutional. As Pennsylvania's reply, submitted by attorneys for the state, including Attorney General Josh Shapiro, put it, Texas invites this court to overthrow the votes of the American people and choose the next president of the United States in what would be a seditious abuse of the judicial process. It is a relief that the justices refused to even entertain that invitation. The only ones who took even the tiniest step in Texas's direction were Justices Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas. Alito, in a short statement that Thomas joined, said that he did not believe the court had the discretion to deny the filing of a bill of complaint because the case fell within its original jurisdiction. In short, certain disputes between states are heard directly by the Supreme Court rather than working their way up through lower courts. But Alito added that he would have granted Texas no other relief. The state had asked for an injunction to halt the Electoral College's vote counting, among other things, and that he expressed no view on any other issue. Even the court's conservatives, then, seemed to recognize that this was not a constitutional controversy that merited involvement of the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. But instead, last but a crude power grab. And yet so many other supposedly serious figures in the Republican Party did not. This lawsuit was not some folie à douce in which Trump and Texas, or more precisely Texas's Attorney General Ken Paxton, who has his own legal problems, 
got caught up in their own private madness. No fewer than 17 states that Trump won signed on to what's known as an amicus curiae brief, urging the Supreme Court to take Texas's suit. Missouri's Attorney General Eric Schmidt played a leading role in that effort. But all the state officials who put their names to it rushed to do something beyond shameful and beneath contempt. So did the members of the House of Representatives who similarly expressed their support. There be 126 of them at last count. Two are from New York, Alice Stefanik and Lee Zeldin. Many of them are not marginal figures. The list includes Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader. It is enraging and also profoundly sad that these Republicans value our democracy so little. Why were they so willing to treat a system that, for all its flaws, has proved sturdy even in the Trump years as a disposable partisan toy? How could they, without mortification, back a brief that included the suggestion that the election must be corrupted because the chance that Trump's opponent could have won the four states was less than one in a quadrillion, their words, as if they were quantum computing. There is no acceptable justification. There needs to be a real reckoning. If prominent Republicans do not now use the court's decision to renounce Trump's campaign to overturn the election, they will do real and lasting harm to the American empire. The early signs are not good. The head of the Texas Republican Party put out a statement suggesting that law-abiding states might want to form their own union of states. In other words, secede in confederacy. Whilst others, as of Saturday morning, were silent. Trump, of course, is unrepentant. He tweeted, all in the uppercase, We have just begun to fight! It was never enough for Republicans who supported the suit to tell themselves that they could be as ridiculous as they liked because the Supreme Court wouldn't go for the argument anyway. If they didn't know how much Trump's efforts had eroded his supporters' faith in the integrity of the electoral system, they should have realized it from reading the briefs that Texas and Trump filed, which, perversely enough, cited those doubts as a rationale for why the Supreme Court should intervene. Texas argued, the nation needs this court's clarity, as if the court should reward them for creating confusion by throwing out electors. Trump's brief made that point even more crassly. It said, The fact that nearly half of the country believes the election was stolen should come as no surprise. Arguing that, by ruling in Texas's favor, the court would allow us voters to find solace in an election result that excluded illegal votes. All indications are that by illegal, Trump means votes that were not cast for him. Actual, specific allegations that there was fraud backed by evidence are conspicuously absent from the Texas and Trump briefs. In short, Trump argued that because he threw mud on the election system's machinery, the court was obliged to junk it off. There is so much that is so wrong with the Texas and Trump filings, not just legally, but factually. The Pennsylvania reply referred to a cascading series of compounding defects and a surreal alternate reality. The fallacies include Trump's own assertion that since no candidate has ever won the states of Florida and Ohio without winning the presidency, and he won both of these states, something must be amiss with the results. As numerous commentators have pointed out, that premise is simply not true. Nixon won Florida and Ohio in 1960, but John Fitzgerald Kennedy won the election. Of course, it doesn't even matter. There is no clause in the Constitution saying that if a candidate wins both those states, balloons instantly fall from the ceiling and the lucky contestant is awarded the presidency. The fake Florida-Ohio standard may be a final example of how Trump's constant lies serve to distract and disorient anyone who tries to keep up with him. 
Exempt like Richier, a person might spend a lot of time actually contemplating the election of 1960. Perhaps it was stolen from Nixon. Without getting to the bigger conceptual fan fantasy and ultimately fallacy. Similarly, Texas argued that the power to decide how electors are appointed, which the Constitution giveth to state legislatures, had instead been seized by others, the state government officials and shadowy actors. They had, Texas claimed, used the pandemic as a justification to make us the elections less secure, in some cases for partisan advantage. Each of the four states replied that Texas was factually wrong about what the actual practices in their states were. In its reply, Wisconsin wrote, Texas's basic arguments about how Wisconsin state law works are flat out wrong. Pennsylvania put it even more bluntly when addressing Texas's list of the supposedly murky practices there. Untrue, false, utterly false, and nonsense were the descriptives, among others. I swear I read bullshit somewhere, but I guess I entered that myself at some point. And Texas was legally wrong, because any changes were, in fact, in keeping with the existing laws of those states. Pennsylvania's brief said, Texas's suggestion of a wide-ranging conspiracy is a fantasy. More than that, Texas was constitutionally wrong in thinking that it could, as Pennsylvania put it, dictate the manner in which four sister states run their elections. Georgia referred to the dispute as Texas's attack on Georgia's sovereignty. The Supreme Court didn't even get to those arguments. It stopped at the first major flaw it came to in the case. Standing! This is the principle that a party bringing a lawsuit must have been injured in a way that is judicially cognizable, which, in effect, means that it has suffered a real, not a speculative or th a theoretical, injury of a sort that the law can recognize and potentially redress. Texas made a convoluted argument about how it would be harmed if Kamala Harris, as a black female vice presidentess, ever had to break a tie vote in the Senate, which didn't even track logically. But she is a black cosmogenate, a black Asian, a Blasian, and female. Um... That's threatening. Texas also claimed that it had standing to sue the states because their actions debased the votes of citizens in plaintiff state and other states that remained loyal to the Constitution. The very framing of that argument. The imputation of disloyalty to the Constitution on the part of Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin is an act of bad faith. To put it mildly, it is also a dangerous provocation. Pennsylvania replied, Texas suffered no harm because it dislikes the results in those elections. That state saying, Texas has no legitimate interest in overturning the will of Wisconsin's voters. Georgia's reply said, There is no allegation that Georgia targeted Texas. Adding that, while there was no evidence that Texas would be harmed, Georgia certainly would be if its election results, which, as the reply noted, have been counted three times by now, were ignored. Michigan, too, said that Texas was attempting to disenfranchise millions of Michigan voters in favor of the preferences of a handful of people who appear to be disappointed with the official results. Disappointment, mind ye, is not a legally cognizable injury. The court agreed saying that Texas had no judicially cognizable interest in how another state conducts its elections. Courts obviously have a role in protecting election integrity and ensuring that individual voting rights are not violated. But Texas is not, say, a voter who has wrongly been subjected to a poll tax. And, as each of the four sued states so noted, Trump and his allies have brought dozens of suits in courts across the country, many of which judges have heard, and some of which have reached the Supreme Court. He just keeps losing them. The Supreme Court was the only place the president and his allies could goest 
because they'd already gone everywhere else. Most importantly, Trump went to the voters on election day and they chose Joe Biden. Now, one among the creepiest true crime tours in America is the Tucson Murders is True Crime Tours. The Tucson Murders True Crime Tours provide a historic crime investigation into forgotten lost crimes in Tucson, Arizona. These small private tours are hosted by the Mr. Ben Baron Astenius, a true crime researcher and enthusiast who will personally take us the to real historic crime locations related to these crimes in Tucson. Relive these events and hear the untold stories behind the stories. The Baron Ben specializes in the seemingly ever-developing case of the late serial rape killer Charles Howard Schmitty Schmid Jr., alias the Pied Piper of Tucson, an aftermath tour. See theunfinishedman.com for uh, the, uh, well, excerpts from his yet-to-be-published book by that title, The Unfinished Man, and scenes from his uh, currently in production cinematic documentaries. Uh, but other cases, such as the strange case of Morris Brady, the Dr. George Marvin Tejardine case, and the Red Rapist, are also within his repertoire. As, in fact, are all the crimes that shocked the Southwest throughout the 1960s, the very decade I myself entered this veil of tears. These devastating crimes stained a city so deeply they may never be removed. For tour information, contact thetucsonmurders.com. Spell Tucson as Tucson, T-U-C-S-O-N. Put the word the in front of it. Thetucsonmurders.com. Or telephone the Baron Ben Astenius personally to privately guide your tour at 1-520 forward slash 323-3406. That's 1520-323-3406. And forget not to subscribe to the Man of the Soil YouTube channel. You'll know you're there when you see the young blonde with big tits and uh, a green shirt that says Ace Hardware. Uh, and of course, a lot of men will have their wear get hard. And uh, after that, you can regale yourself with seeing uh, Ben Astenius, that's for the ladies, in his jumpsuit uh, that he wears as a sprint car racer, uh, telling you about the advantages of AstroTurf. No need to water, no need to mow. Uh, why, you can just stare at your yard the rest of your life and uh, never worry about maintaining it again. Well, to a degree. Uh, at any rate, beyond that, you can get the aerial drone footage of uh, all of the, no, not uh, dive bombing on various civilians in Armenia, but instead the, uh, well, the landscape work of the Man of the Soil team. Yes, the men in brown who will come into your yard uh, and provide you the greatest show on dirt. That's his statement, not mine. And um, that, um, well, that says it all, uh, of course. Uh, I've got a question from J. Spliv, J. Spliv, yesterday. He said, DDD, sometime in the past you named an Asian country or people as the only country or people who successfully defeated their oppressors or something like that. I forgot the context. Do you remember? You know, the vagary of this question made me, it forces me to go all over the place. It's going to take forever to answer this question tonight. It will take the rest of this night, but it's worth it. You're in for an education, so prepare yourselves and take your fucking notes. This is like, um, well, it's class time and we've got a long way to go. So we want you all to uh, settle down, sit back, and prepare yourselves. All right. And our man, George Knight, says, Thank you so much, Douglas. Off to work uh, for a few hours. We'll be back to listen in on the last of the transmission. Much love to you, Douglas. Much love to uh, George Knight. Like I said, I called uh, Brian William Hall. Hopefully he gets back to my soul. And uh, left him a message. He did not respond. Uh, we're playing telephone tag. Or he cunted out on me. I have no idea. We'll, uh, we'll find out soon enough. Now, um, I definitely uh, want to um, emphasize the fact that I may try to contextualize this 
uh, in a manner that uh, people will appreciate the uh, contemporary nature of the history I provide. All history, of course, is contemporary. And uh, most people have uh, no real appreciation of the fact that history never ends. Um, we've got a, uh, a situation with Taiwan that is perennial at present. And what I'm going to tell you about tonight is the first Formosan or Taiwanese war against the world. And this is a responsive transmission to this question. When it comes to what this individual, J. Spliv, J. Spliv asked, and I keep thinking it, he means like a uh, marijuana joint, J. Spliff, you know, J. like Mary Jane, Spliff. Anyhow, I informed him, of course, what he was referencing was my own true homeland and heartland of Taiwan, or rather the Republic of China uh, as reestablished on Taiwan, the hundred islands thereof, because there's the main island and many other islands that belong to Taiwan. Now again, I'm going to check into the uh, chat room. See, we've got six hours remaining. Bill Lyons says, buckle up. Yes, that's the correct word for it. Um, we are um, we are there. Well, do indeed buckle up. And uh, let's uh, Let's get down to it. So, they overthrew European colonial occupation, long prior establishment of modern Republican status, and what makes their accomplishment singular, historically singular, was the fact that they overthrew in the gunpowder age, the age of the flintlock, they overthrew the Spaniards, Dutch, and Portuguese all while they were fortressed in what were the most advanced and impenetrable fortresses of their day. So people understand this. Um, these fortresses were the key to European occupation of the rest of the world. I call them Renaissance fortresses. In Africa, to show you the industrial nature of early modern chattel slavery, these fortresses where they took black slaves into that the African blacks had captured and sold off to the Europeans, these fortresses were called factories. And they produced, of course, human chattel, or slavery. And these fortresses were heavily armed with cannon, and they were able to withstand assaults by the mightiest African kingdoms. When you had victories on the field by indigenous or native nations, it was plenty, it was often, and it was decisive. But no nation on earth was ever able to lay siege to and successfully break European fortresses based on the star system pattern of construction that developed for maximum coverage of all surrounding areas by artillery that the Europeans deployed in the field. What by the era of the Vietnam War would have been called fire bases, but on a grand scale, more like castles. No one except the Taiwanese. Now the past is never dead. It is not even past. My listeners should not be limited to those interested in Chinese history because the subject matter encompasses the range of parallel European versus Chinese civilizations. The recent expansion of the Chinese Navy beyond home waters to other continents renders my unique insight most timely. 
Now, I'll get into this by introducing just how flawed the Trump legacy is concerning China first. Very quickly, you need a briefing. This covers the shadow government, or contends with it. And it concerns the Trump State Department swan song, a strange, flawed China paper. The United States-China conflict may be the defining 21st century challenge, but the recommendations of the Trump paper, not writ by he, mind you, they stand out by what they fail to address. The U.S. State Department's new China strategy paper, which was released on the 20th of November, brings to mind an old line from the British playwright Tom Stoppard, which went, It's half as long as Das Kapital and only twice as funny. I mean, this document is a slog. It is a mix. There's no other word for it of, uh, well, I would call it... Uh, a bill of particulars about China's aggressive tactics, off-strained explanations of Marxist-Leninist theory that recall a college political science paper, ideological jingoism, and ultimately 10 ideas for what the United States should do going forward, and recommendations that are most notable for what they fail to address. The topic of the paper is an urgent one. The world has, as the Trump administration's 2017 national security strategy put it, re-entered an age of great power competition. Now, it is common to talk about relations with uh, red, uh, revanchist, revisionist Russia and the communist Chinese empire in this regard, but while red, revanchist, revisionist Russia's destructive power, both its arsenal of nuclear weapons and Russian President Vladimir Putin's penchant for invading neighbors and propping up autocrats must be taken seriously, the Russian empire is a waning power. China is a waxing one, and its dynamic and growing economy and variegated assertions of influence beyond its borders as well as its revisionist approach to the international order make it the key actor in precipitating a new era of global competition. The behavior of China's dictatorial regime and its intended medium-term trajectory are relatively clear. The response of the world's democracies and the American leadership within that response is the central geopolitical question of our time. The State Department paper rightly notes that the administration of U.S. President Donald Trump disrupted what had been a relatively consistent bipartisan approach to China since the Richard Nixon era. That approach was premised on two ideas. First, that the best policy outcome from an American national interest perspective was to knit a rising China into the international system. Second, that measured and incremental engagement would, over time, produce the outcome once China saw the benefits of its participation in such a system. By the end of the Obama administration, rising concern with Red China's unfair economic practices, Chinese Communist dictator Xi Jinping's increasing repression and centralization of power, and Red China's more aggressive international posture had increasingly undermined confidence in this approach. A new bipartisan consensus emerged relatively quickly. It was time for a different tack. The Trump administration has indeed brought a change in approach, but like so much else, its execution has been what can be charitably described as a mess. To the extent that anyone in the administration has made efforts to identify and lay out a coherent strategy, these have been obscured by Trump's oscillations between, on the one hand, fawning over Xi and endorsing his use of concentration camps in Xinjiang, Wigeria, where the Caucasian Turkic Muslim minority is being exterminated via mass sterilization of both sexes. And on the other, calling for the novel coronavirus to be named worldwide by United Nations recognition, the China virus, in an attempt to distract from his own lamentable mismanagement of the pandemic. Whilst the Trump administration called attention to Red China's unfair trade policies, 
It also alienated all American allies and launched a unilateral tariff war that led to higher consumer prices in these United States and forced American taxpayers to underwrite tens of billions of dollars of subsidies for our country's fucking farmers. Then Trump's desperation for the promised outcomes of the first phase of a trade deal that was supposed to mitigate the damage of the tariff war caused him to downplay the pandemic in the early months of 2020. The red Chinese purchases of American agricultural goods that were supposed to follow that deal, well, they never happened. Over at the State Department, Secretary Mike Pompeo went on a jingoistic world tour warning of red China's ambitions. It's hard to point to any partners or allies who have found his vituperative message illuminating. Meanwhile, the administration's arms control lead, Marshall Billingsley, went through a mortifying weeks-long public song and dance in a futile attempt to shame the Chinese into showing up for nuclear arms control negotiations. Well, they did not, and Billingsley and his team didn't just waste precious time that could have been spent negotiating with the red revanchist revisionist Russians, they also made the United States look pathetic and weak. Against this backdrop of erratic American behavior in the waning days of the administration, the policy planning staff, sometimes referred to as the State Department's internal think tank, released its paper. Near the beginning, the authors declared that their purpose is to step back and take a long-term view, elaborate the elements of the China challenge, and sketch a framework for the fashioning of sturdy policies that stand above bureaucratic squabbles and interagency turf battles and transcend short-term election cycles. Holy fucking shit. From the outset, a reader is wont to marvel at their apparent lack of any sense of irony. Undeterred, the paper's authors attempt to elaborate a consistent framework for the United States' defining geopolitical challenge in this 21st century, all the while working inside an administration whose most salient consistency is its total inconsistency. It's not surprising, therefore, that the paper's recommendations include doing things that the Trump administration has failed to do and advancing policies that Trump himself has repeatedly sabotaged. Exemplary gratiae, the paper's first recommendation is that the nation must preserve the constitutional order. Well, never mind that the report was issued weeks into Trump's futile, ongoing effort to deny that he lost his re-election bid and to sabotage constitutional transfer of power. Three of the other report recommendations revolve around the rules-based international order, shorthand for the international system, designed and underwrit in significant measure by the American Empire and its allies after World War II. That includes international law, various international institutions and organizations, and the American system of alliances. The paper's authors call for the United States to strengthen this international order and to evaluate institutions and alliances to make sure that they be fit for 21st century purposes. All well and good, but by any measure, Donald Trump has undermined both the universal principles that underpin that order by, among other things, cozying up to dictators and human rights abusers and the organizations that sustain it, where... American withdrawal from these organizations has, in many cases, created a vacuum that the communist Chinese are all too happy to exploit. Trump's self-described America First policy has embraced an antiquated approach to international politics that, in general, deprioritizes the kind of relationship building that leads to stable long-term expectations and instead prefers a transactional approach that leverages American power one interaction at a time. The paper seems, in part, to call for scrapping Trump's misguided approach and instead reassessing and embracing the value of alliances and partnerships, this is good. But the way in which the State Department authors talk about the closest American partners raises questions. Particularly striking was this passage about Europe, which oddly refers to Europe and the UK. Post-Brexit, Britain might not be part of the European Union, but while its political arrangements have changed, its geography has not. Europe and the UK have emerged as an important front in the strategic competition between the United States and China. I'm reading what the authors wrote. And China, they continue, welds its economic power to divide Europe and the UK from the United States and pull European nations and the British toward Beijing. The British apparently no longer consider themselves Europeans. 
you know, one wonders if they'll consider themselves human within a generation. But, okay, enough about the downbreeding. Of course, it should be a strategic priority of these United States to work with European allies and, you know, even the fucking Brits and partners uh, aside either of the twain to devise as much as possible a shared response to China's behavior. But this framing does not advance that objective. Instead, it reifies an unhelpful and increasingly common narrative that depicts Europeans as stuck in the middle of a tug of war between Beijing and Washington. To buy into that framing is to do the communist Chinese government's work for it. It would like nothing better than for Europeans to draw an equivalence between the American and communist Chinese empires. But there be no equivalence, nor is Europe the rope in a tug of war. It is the largest group of consolidated, modern, industrialized democracies in the world. And the EU is the second largest economic actor in the world after the American empire. Washington should not regard European nations as a front in a bipolar struggle, but as a fellow, well, as fellow stewards of the rules-based order. At the same time, Europeans who say they don't want to be asked to choose between the American and communist Chinese empires should be reminded that there is, in fact, no fucking choice to make. If they are to remain Europeans, they must remain committed to European values including those of democracy and human rights, and see themselves as part of the global community that will stand in defense of those values. If Americans are going to find the partners they need in Europe, the United States cannot see or treat Europe as a battleground or a collection of pawns. A new report by the Republican majority on the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, chaired by Senator James Risch, demonstrates a much more robust understanding of this point and reads neither side of the atlantic can respond to the china challenge alone the only successful path forward is to work together now much of the paper i'm still referencing otherwise is premised on the idea that americans do not sufficiently understand the nature of the chinese government the ideological underpinnings of the chinese communist party and the way that these determine the most pernicious aspects of chinese governmental behavior it is no doubt true that american policymakers should seek to develop more nuanced and accurate understandings of china's politics and society in the years to come and the state department paper is unintentionally evidence of this dire need. Its authors assign too much weight to what they alternately call Marxist-Leninist or socialist ideology as the ideological underpinning of Red China's global ambitions. Uh, the paper declares, The communism that the CCP professes is more than a mode of authoritarian domestic governance. It is also a theory of globe-spanning universal society, the ultimate goal of which is to bring about a socialist international order. But today's Chinese Communist Party Central Committee is not made up of revolutionary partisans philosophically committed to the international triumph of the proletariat. They are the quizzling kleptocrats who inherited a repressive regime from the previous two generations and are trying to maintain their iron grip on power for as long as possible. In general, their professions of commitment to communism, like their increasingly virulent nationalism, are more of a means than an end. But far more problematic than the way that the paper misunderstands Red China is the way it misunderstands the United States, its present challenges, and the likely sources of its future strength. Three of the paper's recommendations focus on American education with the aim of improving the quality of public servants, well, and citizens. This section of the report pays appropriate homage to America's founding values, its constitution, and its institutions, even if it also takes petty swipes. Well, by way of example, the authors write with Trumpian flair, America's grade schools, middle schools, high schools, and colleges, and universities have to a dismaying degree abandoned well-rounded presentations of America's founding ideas and constitutional traditions in favor of propaganda aimed at vilifying the nation. 
However, the promotion of liberal values is necessary, but not sufficient to strengthen these United States into the 21st century. The paper calls for serious study of the history of America's efforts down to the present day to live up to principles enshrined in the Declaration of Independence, not least through the establishment and preservation of a constitution of limited powers. It further asserts that this will enable American citizens to grasp the nation's interest in maintaining an international order that favors free and sovereign nation-states. Really? 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 There is no question that there is value in civic education that teaches the nation's history. But to the extent that Americans and members of other democratic societies have come to doubt their governments, this can be traced less to the fact that they do not know their history and more to the fact that they be unsatisfied by their present circumstances. Nowhere in the paper can one find a call for resetting U.S. capitalism so that it more closely reflects the free and fair competition that it is meant well, that is meant to create the shared benefits of a market economy. Nowhere does it call for investing in education, health, caregiving, and other aspects of human capital, or in infrastructure and technology so that citizens may contribute to the national competitiveness of an advanced post-industrial economy and be free to engage in the pursuit of happiness in the 21st century. Nowhere does it highlight how systemic racism is not just a source of injustice, but a gross distortion that breeds inefficiency and impairs American moral standing and economic competitiveness. Nowhere does it identify the need for the United States to best communist China in the race to transform the sustainability of the economy through innovation and green energy. Nowhere does it address the collapse of the American middle class, whose strength and productivity led to the triumph of the United States and its allies in the last decades-long geopolitical contest that was the Third World War we call the Cold War. Chinese authoritarianism cannot win the era unless the American empire forfeits the fight for a more perfect union at home. A strategy for competing with Red China or any other authoritarian country must include not only maintaining sufficient military power and reaffirming the values that underpin a free and democratic society, but also ensuring that democratic societies deliver for citizens better than any other form of government. The superiority of the democratic model must not only be asserted, it must also be demonstrated. And in this quest, the United States ought to see itself not as a solitary superpower curbing the threatening behaviors of an authoritarian behemoth, but as the leading member of a community of nations. And Americans should recognize that in order to prevail, they must maintain not only their military might, but also their moral power, as measured by the way in which they uphold, in reality, not just in rhetoric, the equal dignity of individuals. The State Department's paper can be acknowledged as an attempt to fill a real gap. The United States has not yet landed on a framework for understanding the challenge communist China poses as an empire, an enemy empire, or a single phrase or term for organizing its response to that challenge. Now Axios, which broke the story of this forthcoming paper before its release. And through connections I cannot release, I got it ahead of time. They reported that it was inspired by the United States diplomat George Kennan. For a foreign policy thinker to present themselves as Kennan-esque is a little like a novelist presenting themselves as Tolstoy-esque. It's kind of like somebody saying that I'm Hitler-esque in how I impact the world. It's way beyond any average person to even hubristically make that declaration. Kennan's post-World War II era defining analysis of the Soviet Union still holds up. Kennan's heirs on the policy planning staff have certainly not emulated his parsimony. Kennan's famous X article was but 16 pages, and his equally famous long telegram was 19 pages long. While the State Department's Communist China paper contains half a hundred pages of text, 
and more than 20 of endnotes. What's worse, they have not produced a comprehensive strategic framework either. So that introduces where we're at and why what I'm going to educate you in is so fucking timely. As China comes into greater conflict with the West, and the United States in particular, now is the time to consider the long arc of this relationship, because China has dominated the West before. Indeed, the Chinese history of the world is that of a superpower interrupted, which means we have to go back to the early beginnings of China's dominance over the West. In the West, Chinese history is commonly framed as having begun with the First Opium War, giving the impression that European powers always had the upper hand. And did China even have a chance to win the Opium War? Now, my great relation, one of my ancestors, is Commissioner Lin, the man who was China's Judge Dredd. He ran China's police forces, which was all they had left to fight the Europeans with. The most consequential war involving a European nation in Asia in the 19th century is the 1839 through 1842 Opium War. That war was fought between a large British expeditionary force composed of nearly 20,000 British troops and three dozen of the Royal Navy's modern warships against about 100,000 Chinese defenders. The war lasted for nearly three years that witnessed several campaigns fought at battlegrounds, usually hundreds or even thousands of miles apart, in southern, central, and northern China. Some of these battles were fierce, bloody, and protracted. Others were lopsided and peculiarly quick. It was also one of the most controversial military conflicts in British history, largely due to the tenacious campaign within the British government by the trigger-happy liberal interventionist foreign secretary Lord Palmerston and his equally fierce opponents led by William Gladstone, who called Palmerston's opium war with China a war more unjust in its origin, a war more calculated in its progress to cover this country with permanent disgrace. Over the Tory party's vigorous objection, the House of Commons reluctantly passed Palmerston's motion for the conflict with a narrow vote of 271 to 262. The Opium War still haunts China with an indelible historical and national syndrome of victimhood and vengeance, making the defeat in the war the most potent rallying cry in today's China for revenge in the thinly veiled call for the restitution of a Chinese dream, making China the most destabilizing actor in the Indo-Asia Pacific region and beyond. Military historians have long determined that the outcome of the war was already decided before it had started as it was a war fought between the industrializing and technologically advanced Great Britain, which had the world's most powerful navy and the backward land empire that was China under the Manchun rule. However, were there any missed opportunities for China during the Three-Year War? If we cast aside the teleological analysis from the winner's perspective and add a few what-ifs, the question to ask might be, did China ever have a chance to win the Opium War. Now, during the drawn-out conflict, China held advantages over the British in terms of strategic depth, numerical superiority in troop strength, familiarity with battle terrain, spirited resistance at some key battles, and excellent coastal fortifications at key points such as the entrances to the Pearl and Yangtze rivers. But these advantages were not fully utilized by China during the Opium War. In fact, many of them were squandered mindlessly. China's vast landmass at its strategic rear had given the government in Beijing a penchant for favoring a war of position, spreading its troops all over the place, with coastal fortifications as its chief line of defense to stop the British barbarians at the front gate. 
As a result, this advantage in landmass also created slow mustering time and troop movements throughout the conflict. While the coastal guns at the fortresses in Guangdong, or Canton, where Hong Kong was to be established, and the Yangtze River mouth did give the British a very hard time. The British conducted a war of movement with its large, some of them steam-propelled, Royal Navy ships moving quickly up and down along the coast of, well, all along the long coast of southern, eastern, and northern China, looking for the weakest links of the Chinese coastal defense chain to attack, achieving overwhelming successes. Had China been more flexible on its positional warfare strategy, but instead let the British get through the coastal area, luring the enemy into China's vast hinterland to fight on land, the outcome would have been very different indeed. It would have also obviated the devastating effects of Britain's far more powerful ship-mounted guns that outranged the Chinese coastal gun batteries. Only on a few occasions, when the British made tactical errors by going deep inland, outside of the ship's guns range, to places like the village of San Yuanli, did they suffer very greatly. But the Chinese high command did not catch the strategic cues provided by its enemy's errors and modify its war-making approach. So, the land mass also misled China to underestimate Greater Britain's ability to resupply and reinforce its expeditionary forces from its many colonies through South and Southeast Asia. On paper, China maintained an 800,000 strong military force with about 30 to 40 percent of them equipped with firearms. But much like today's Chinese People's Liberation Army under the Communist government, these were troops who had lived in peace for generations, sans any combat experience. Many were extremely lax in training and readiness, with a significant number of them being also hopelessly corrupt. In the end, Emperor Dao Guang could mobilize only about 100,000 of them incrementally, which oft took months to muster at the reinforcement points of rendezvous or battle stations. In contrast, British troops, including most of the 5,000 Royal Army soldiers and 7,000 Royal Marines and sailors, were richly experienced, battle-hardened, and highly disciplined as a result of their prior services in various colonial wars in Africa and other parts of Asia. The same can be said about the quality of commandership. While the British commanders such as Admirals George Eliot and Sir William Parker and negotiators such as Charles Eliot and Henry Pottinger were experienced and of ample wiles, China's commanders and negotiators were usually wrapped up not in sound tactics and stratagems, or stratagems but in moral outrage over the opium trade, yet simultaneously in great fear of the emperor who could easily put them to death over tactical or negotiation errors, big or small. To be sure, there were many truly heroic and brave Chinese soldiers and commanders, but they were usually outgunned and poorly commanded. Thousands of them fought to the last second before they were killed in battle or committed suicide to avoid a dishonorable surrender or capture. Yet frequently, their key commanders, such as General Ji Shan and Yang Feng in the pivotal Battle of Canton, where Hong Kong would be established in the spring of 1841, were hopelessly incompetent and cowardly, resulting in a complete route for the Chinese. The Opium War was also a psychological war. The Manchu court's stupefying arrogance with regard to imperial protocols and diplomatic decorum incensed the equally arrogant British, who were determined to humiliate psychologically the celestial Middle Kingdom and destroy the extraordinary self-righteousness and moral superiority of the Manchurian court. Furthermore, during the war, the British commanders were able to recruit Chinese mercenaries, whom the Chinese government had rightly called race traitors, to fight for the British side in pivotal battles such as the one for the control of Yuman and Chuan Bi in January of 1841. In February of that year and March of the next, the Chinese seized first the British transport ship Nurbuda and then the Brig Allen in the Chinese-held island of Taiwan. Hundreds of their crews were captured by the Chinese. On the 10th of August in 1842, Four days 
before the official Chinese delegation left to surrender to the British and negotiate a peace treaty. The Chinese troops in Taiwan executed 197 British prisoners on order from the Chinese emperor, Dao Guang, who wanted to kill the British prisoners in order to release our anger and enliven our hearts. The British understood the psychological value of destroying its enemy's pride and will to fight, but three weeks later, within a fortuit knit or 14 nights, the British forced the Chinese delegation to sign the mother of all unequal treaties in modern Chinese history, the Treaty of Nanking, that, among other things, gave Hong Kong to Britannia in perpetuity. Sir Henry Pottinger, the British chief negotiator and plenipotentiary, who was an expert in human psychology and moral warfare, demanded that the Chinese sign the treaty on board His Majesty's ship Cornwallis, the ship named after a great British humiliation at Yorktown, Virginia, during the American War for Independence, and the ship that had humiliated the U.S. Navy's USS Hornet during the War of 1812. Apparently, the British knew all, and well, they knew about revenge and humiliation. While the United States may have forgotten about all the past humiliations in its bilateral history with Greater Britain, the Chinese have not. The humiliation of the Treaty of Nanking that ended the Opium War of 1839 through 1842 has become a primary psychological impetus in today's China for national rejuvenation and imperial restitution. China might have missed the chance to win in the 1840s, Will it miss again in the 21st century? Will it miss it in its quest for global domination? But from the first direct contact between East and West, the arrival of the Portuguese in South China in the early 16th century, the Chinese were dominant. In 1517, they appeared near the famed trading haven of Guangzhou, strange and unruly barbarians in wooden sailing ships. The language they spoke was an unintelligible mystery, their eight vessels puny by the standards of Zheng He's treasure sampans, or super battle junks, as the Westerners would call them because to them Chinese ships look like floating junk. And the ultimate origins of these Fishbelly Whites was a completely hazy, or at least hazy enough to point of myth and legend. But like all other seaborne Rufians, they wanted to trade for the rich silks and the other wonders of China. The Chinese came to call them Fo Lang Yi, a generic term used at the time to refer to Europeans, meaning smelly ghosts. More specifically, they were the Portuguese, and they were the first Europeans to sail all the way to China. The adventurous mariners from the Kingdom of Portugal had burst into the Indian Ocean in 1498 when Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Africa and found his way to the southwestern coast of India. It was an earth-rattling moment. Until then, Western Europe had been on the fringes of a global economy driven primarily by exchanges among China India, and the Islamic world of Dwar al-Islam, the land of submission. Portugal was on the fringe of that fringe. All that would change. The arrival of the Portuguese in Asia heralded the coming ascendancy of the West, Europe, and later America. The Portuguese incursion was an equally crucial turning point in the Chinese history of the world. In fact, it would alter the course of China's history more drastically than anything that came before with the possible exception of the original Qin unification in 221 BC, 221 years before Christ. It was one of those rare moments in time when Tua historical narratives that had been meandering along quite separately suddenly came crashing into each other. They quickly became entangled and would never again be unwound. The Chinese couldn't have known any of this in 1517. To them, the Portuguese seemed just like any other trade-hungry barbarians who had ventured to China by boat 
horse and camel over many centuries, whether Sogdian, Indian, Persian, or Japanese. The Portuguese brought from Europe very different notions of trade and diplomacy than the Chinese had ever encountered before. More than that, though, the Portuguese were carrying on their wooden caravels an entirely unfamiliar culture from those the Chinese had previously met. Unlike the usual barbarians who tended to adopt, at least in part, Chinese cultural practices or participate in the rules and norms of the Chinese world order, the Portuguese and the Europeans who followed them to Asia thought their own civilization was superior. A clash was coming between peoples who each believed their civilization to be better than all the others. The Chinese were simply unaccustomed to and unprepared for this sort of challenge from outsiders. Foreign barbarians could defeat China militarily and even overrun the empire, but in Chinese eyes, the Mongols, Zhongnu, or other foreign pests, never upset the Chinese self-perception of exceptionalism. Many of the supposed conquerors seemed more like the conquered. The Chinese simply bred them out of existence. The Zhongnu no longer exists. Many of the supposed conquerors would then identify themselves as Chinese within but generations. The Europeans, fully confident in the value of their own civilization, would present an entirely new threat to the Chinese world order. There were already signs of what was to come from the earliest days of the Portuguese presence in Asia. When da Gama and his successors sailed into the Indian Ocean, they entered a world of well-established, multicultural trading networks and practices that had existed for aeons. In the past, new entrants had simply joined the fray, including the Chinese. Zheng He, for example, wished to impress the world with Chinese power, but did not seek to dominate the region and its trade. Wherever the Portuguese made landfall in Asia, the Chinese had already been. In southern India, da Gama was told tales of light-skinned, bearded men who had visited the coast generations earlier. References to Zheng He's fleets, which had sunk their anchors off the coast almost a hundred years ago. The Portuguese, however, were bred amid the mercantilist brutality of Europe, where separation among trade, war, and power was barely perceptible. They intended not to simply participate in the trade between East and West, but to control it. And they used, they deployed, new aggressive tactics and superior weaponry to impose their will. When they reached the flourishing entrepot at Malacca in Southeast Asia, the Portuguese sought to conquer which they did in 1511. The maritime states of South and East Asia had never seen anything quite like the Portuguese before. Bottled up by the paranoid Ming, the Chinese were not quite aware of whom they were dealing with and what they were up to either. In the early 16th century, the Portuguese were about as much of a threat to the great Ming Empire as gnats to an elephant. And at first, the Portuguese did little to challenge the Chinese system of trade. They sought relations with China very much like the standard seaborne pir pirates and barbarians had been floating to Guangzhou for centuries. The 1517 mission carried Tomé Pires, a former pharmacist appointed by the Portuguese king as the country's first official envoy to the Ming court. The Portuguese intended to become a vassal state of the Ming Son of Heaven and participate in tribute and trade like other barbarians to gain access to lucrative Chinese goods. Their goal, in other words, was to join the Chinese world, not subvert it. But things got off to a rocky start. The flotilla, under the command of Fernão Pérez de Andrade, was denied access to Guangzhou by a local naval commander. The suspicious Ming were constricting foreign trade. Portugal was not a formal tributary state and, therefore, was not recognized by the dynasty's officials as having the right to trade. After a month of waiting, Andrade threatened to sail on anyway, 
and the nervous local commander relented. Once at Guangzhou, Andrade unwittingly alarmed the town's fussy functionaries by firing his cannon in salute, a serious faux pas in Chinese protocol. The Ming authorities were no more amused by Portuguese boasting about deposing Malacca as king, a longtime loyal Chinese vassal. Fortunately, the honest and diplomatic Andrade smoothed matters over, and soon the two parties were exchanging pleasantries. The Portuguese were dazzled by what they found in Guangzhou. Its incredible wealth far surpassed anything back home. One contemporary Portuguese account records their wonderment at a lavish ceremony to welcome a governor returning to the city. It reads, The ramparts were covered in silken banners, while on the towers reared flagstaffs from which also hung silken flags, so huge that they could be used as sails. Such is the wealth of that country, such is its vast supply of silk, that they squander gold leaf and silk on these flags where we use cheap colors and coarse linen cloth. Andrade had arrived at an auspicious moment when the emperor, Zheng De, was less hostile to foreigners and international exchanges than most of his Ming predecessors. Chinese officials in Guangzhou agreed to accept Pires and his retinue to await permission to visit the emperor. When Andrade departed in 1518, he left relations with China on a solid footing. One Portuguese scribe recorded, Andrade had arranged matters in the city of Guangzhou and the country of China so smoothly that, after he had left, commerce between Portuguese and Chinese was conducted in peace and safety, and men made great profits. Well, not for long. Portuguese bellicosity quickly undid Andrade's good work. His brother, Simão de Andrade arrived on the China coast from Malacca in 1519, but this Andrade was a significantly different personality. By one account, pompous, arrogant, and spendthrift. He almost instantly alienated his hosts by building a fort on a Chinese island, forbidding other foreigners from trading ahead of him, and then abusing a Ming official who tried to assert control over the situation. By far the worst affront, Sai Mao committed was purchasing Chinese children, which he said were to be his servants. The Chinese, however, thought the Portuguese roasted the children for dinner, a claim that even made its way into the official history of the Ming Dynasty. The Portuguese went so far as to seize the children for food. One Portuguese writer lamented that within a few days their wretched behavior earned them the reputation not of friends and allies but of vile pirates and enemies. The reports of this atrocious behavior sent to Beijing doomed the already troubled Pires mission. The Portuguese ambassador had made his way to the capital where he awaited an audience with the emperor himself. The climate was somewhat hostile. Chinese officials sent memorials to the court condemning the Portuguese for their ill treatment of the King of Malacca and advocating that the Emperor reject the Perez embassy. Making matters worse, Perez handed the court a letter from the Portuguese sovereign King Manuel I that the Chinese found impertinent. It was composed in the manner he customarily adopted towards pagan princes, according to a Portuguese description. The death of the emperor in 1521 signaled the end of the mission. Perez was hustled out of Beijing the next day and sent back to Guangzhou. There he was forced to write to King Manuel of the emperor's demand that the Portuguese restore the Sultan of Malacca to his rightful throne, and Perez was held hostage for compliance. He would never leave China alive. He did manage to die there of old age. Sometimes kept in harsh conditions and fettered. Well, he died there in 1524. Well, yeah, he was young, but by that time he described that he had aged a hundred years. So he did die old. He aged really quickly with, well, with the treatment that Portuguese behavior wrought upon him. 
The situation got uglier still when a new flotilla of Portuguese came to trade shortly after the emperor's death. When news of his demise trickled into Guangzhou, local officials ordered the Portuguese and all other foreign traders to depart. But the ordinary Portuguese, already conducting business, refused. The Chinese assembled a sizable fleet and attacked the outnumbered Portuguese, sinking one of their vessels and taking prisoners. On two other occasions, Portuguese trading ships and Chinese battle sampans, or war junks, as the Euros called them, came to blows. Then in 1522, another Portuguese squadron showed up off the Chinese coast with a commission to forge peaceful relations with the Ming. They blithely sailed into a Chinese onslaught that sank two of their three ships. It would be as if the Nino, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria entered America and the Indians sank two of them, and Columbus had to turn tail and sail on back. The unfortunate Portuguese captured in these engagements endured a horrible end. Ooh. I mean, if you think that one guy, Perez, aged quickly. One surviving eyewitness recounted, 23 individuals were each hacked to pieces alive, losing their arms, legs, and finally their heads taken the last so that they would suffer all the while their genitals were stuffed in their mouths and the trunk of each body was wrapped around the belly in two chunks the portuguese were pushed to the shadows of the china trade barred from official exchange they spent the next 30 years engaged in the illegal but still vibrant trade that evaded ming control on the black market, yet eventually they were brought in from the cold. The trade with Portugal proved too lucrative to ignore, and local Ming officials began to see the usefulness of these belligerent newcomers. In 1557, Ming mandarins in southern China allowed the Portuguese to settle in a trading colony on the peninsula of Macau, a short distance from Guangzhou. Within five years, a community of about 900 Portuguese had collected there, building two churches and some modest homes. As trade became more liberal, the colony flourished even more. To the Chinese, Macau became a truly foreign place, with strange architecture, stranger people, and unfamiliar religious processions. Some local Chinese saw the settlement in Macau as a bad omen. Others complained that it was no longer even part of China. One European noted in the 1580s that it was the natural tendency of the Chinese to fear and to bear ill will towards foreigners. They called the Portuguese foreign devils. Other than Macau itself, however, was that the colony existed at all. The settlement was clearly outside the usual rules of trade and diplomacy that governed the Chinese world. Portugal was not able to forge formal relations with the Ming court like other countries that traded with the empire. Macau survived because it profited local officials and merchants who possessed the authority and nerve to defy the central government. An official Ming history criticized one such independent-minded Mandarin for valuing the precious goods of the Portuguese, pretending to forbid but secretly allowing the evil to continue to grow. From their inception, relations with the West ran by different rules. The Chinese, however, retained the upper hand. The Portuguese had some nifty military technology, most of all their highly effective cannon, which the Chinese duly noticed. But the handful of ships they were capable of deploying on the Chinese coast could not possibly challenge Ming supremacy. In fact, the expert seafarers of Portugal learned a thing or two about shipbuilding from the Chinese, including the practice of waterproofing wooden hulls with a coating of bitumen. And just in case these phalangi got out of line, a wall and a gate were constructed across the narrow point of the Macau Peninsula in 1573, and the Portuguese were forbidden to cross it. Significantly, little farmland was enclosed on the Macau side of the wall, which left the Portuguese dependent on the Chinese for food. The Ming could simply lock the gate and starve these barbarians into submission. Macau existed only at China's pleasure. 
other gnats from the far off Western Ocean were swatted just as effortlessly. The Spanish, led by Miguel Lopez de Legajbi, sailed across the Pacific from Spain's empire in the New World and took control of Manila in what became as the Philippines. Almost immediately, in 1573, the first shipment of Chinese goods was dispatched from Manila to Acapulco in Spain, now Mexico, what was then New Spain. And the Spanish, like the Portuguese, tried to forge formal trading relations with the Ming, but got nowhere. Nevertheless, Manila became a major hub of the China trade, and bulging Chinese junks brought prized porcelain and other products that then got shipped on to Mexico via Spanish galleons. Next came the Dutch. The first Dutch vessel appeared off the coast of Macau in 1601. The Portuguese chased off the competition, but they were back soon enough, too soon if you asked the Ming authorities. These Ong Mao, or Red Airs, as the Chinese called them, earned a reputation even worse than the Folang Ji. In 1622, the Dutch occupied islands off the Fujian coast, starting constructing, well, started the construction of a fort, and dispatched an ultimatum to the Ming authorities. If they didn't allow Chinese traders to conduct business with them, the Dutch would attack Chinese shipping in coastal towns. When they didn't receive a satisfactory response, the Dutch plundered hamlets and burned Chinese sampans round the city of Jamen. That was too much for the Chinese, who assembled a naval squadron in early 1624 and attacked the Dutch position, eventually forcing them to evacuate. Unable to gain a foothold on the Chinese coast, the Dutch instead settled on the island of Taiwan, where they erected a stout fortress called Castile Zealandia. Chinese sampan sailed to this Dutch outpost to trade. It wasn't the kind of trading relations the Dutch preferred, but it was all they had. These new barbarians, despite their persistence, were pushed to the margins of the Chinese world. This is what brings us to the myths of military revolution, which is considered the key behind European expansion and Eurocentrism, which is resultant the belief that the Europeans are, of course, the center of the universe. Their own version of what they accused the Chinese of via centra, sinocentricity, or a China-centered view of the world. Now, as an interventionist military historian, your Vulcan intervention, I critique all explanations of the rise of the West in the early modern period premised on the thesis that military competition drove the development of gunpowder technology, new tactics, and the Westphalian state, innovations that enabled European transcontinental conquests. Even theories in international relations and other fields that posit economic or social root causes of Western expansion all too oft rely on this notional military revolution thesis as a crucial intervening variable. Yet the factors that define the military revolution in Europe were absent in European expeditions to Asia, Africa, and the Americas, and conventional accounts are oft marred by Eurocentric biases. Given the insignificance of military innovations, Western expansion prior to the Industrial Revolution is best explained by Europeans' ability to garner local support and allies, but especially by their deference to powerful non-Western polities. This is realism versus revisionism. The understandings of an early modern military revolution are crucial for fundamental international relations concerns, including the rise of the sovereign state and the modern state system, as well as the European conquest of much of the rest of the world. My own historical realism re-examines the process of European overseas expansion in the early modern era. I have always critiqued the military revolution thesis that recurring great power wars drove military innovation and state building in Western Europe, which subsequently gave these states a competitive advantage that they used to dominate non-European polities. This notional thesis is a bedrock of much historically oriented social science. 
Even theories that posit economic or societal factors as the fundamental drivers of European expansion from 1500 to 1800 oft times rely on the military revolution as a proximate cause or crucial intervening variable. Given that military force has long been regarded as the ultimate decider under conditions of international anarchy, the history of warfare is crucial as the raw material for generating and testing theories of international politics. Yet developments in military history oft times filter through only slowly and partially to the social sciences, and both areas have suffered from a deep Eurocentric bias. In substantiating my facts, the first empirical aim of mine own realist military history is to challenge the revisionist idea that Europeans won victories abroad by using the same style of war that they practiced at home. Technology, tactics, and broader changes like the rise of large professional permanent armies and what is conventionally referred to as the Westphalian state developed to fight great power wars in Europe explain very little of the growing European presence in the Americas, Asia, and Africa up until the late 18th century. The military innovations said to be decisive in Europe were almost entirely absent elsewhere before the Industrial Revolution. Instead, early modern European expansion in the Americas, Asia, and Africa was largely carried out by tiny forces of adventurers and chartered companies who adapted local tactics and usually did not possess any significant technological advantage over their opponents. Historical reality instead foregrounds the crucial importance of local support and indigenous allies in enabling Europeans to first establish and then maintain the terrestrial nodes of their largely maritime, networked, overseas domains. The Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, English, and others inserted themselves into pre-existing rivalries, exploiting and being exploited by non-Western actors in pursuit of commercial, diplomatic, logistical, and military advantage. Even more significant was a judicious European recognition of their own inferiority via the Asian empires, which elicited European deference and subordination. On the rare occasions that Europeans challenged these non-Western great powers in the early modern period, they suffered rapid and salutary defeats. Even the West's main military technological advantage, the gun-armed sailing ship, failed to alter the strategic balance. The final empirical phase of my arc of narrative tonight should briefly note, if I'm able to reach it, the obvious yet underappreciated point that at the same time as Europeans were expanding into Asia, Asians were conquering far more substantial swaths of Europe. This Ottoman expansion into Eastern and Central Europe exhibited a mastery of military revolution techniques that oftentimes anticipated and surpassed their European foes. A more global view premised on the agency of powerful non-Western actors serves to correct the undeniable Eurocentric bias in international relations. This bias is starkly visible in the geographic focus of historical articles. Those dealing with the period from 476 uh, Anno Domini to 1919, the year in which mine own late and sire, the man who raised and guided me, Chief Petty Officer George Joseph Henry Dietrich, retired of the United States Navy, was born. That were these articles I'm referencing, all published in the dozen leading international relations journals from 1980 the time in which I worked with the Department of Defense, through to 2007, the year my late and sainted sire, George Dietrich, was murdered, thanatized unto death. This Eurocentric bias is particularly obvious in quantitative work. Thus, Jack Levy was forthright in introducing the data set via his 1983 University of Michigan study entitled Great Power Wars, 1495 through 1815. 
in which he set forth that the concern of this study is with the modern great power system, which originated in Europe about five centuries ago. The Eurocentric bias of this study is deliberate. The system centered on Europe is of greatest historical interest to most Western scholars, and most theories of international behavior and war have been derived therefrom. The correlates of war data set only include states before 1919 if they have been recognized by both Britain and France, systematically excluding non-Western powers. The huge disparity revealed between the historically oriented international relations articles on Europe and those on the rest of the world is replicated in military history. It is estimated that there be two or three orders of magnitude more work on Europe than any other region. The British historian Jeremy Black of the most excellent order of the British Empire has described how this bias plays out in history. To quote his team, the tendency is first to focus largely, if not exclusively, on Western developments, and secondly, to consider those elsewhere in terms of Western paradigms. Thus, for example, the focus in discussion of military revolutions is the West. The definitions are Western, and insofar as non-Western powers feature, it is to record the success of their Western counterparts. By the way, in all fairness, he's not effusing. He's actually criticizing. A central aim of my realist historical narrative has ever been to challenge and correct this pervasive and enduring Eurocentric bias. We, perforce, must begin by establishing the importance of the notional military revolution thesis for international relations. I will summarize the origins of the revisionist European military revolution thesis before then outlining how this thesis is said to explain its European conquests in the early modern period. The military revolution debate, including that about the rise of the state, began as an exclusively European concern. The crucial innovation of seminal books like those entitled The Pursuit of Power subtitled Technology, Armed Force, and Society since A.D. 1000, uh, published in 1982, as writ by William McNeil and especially The Military Revolution, subtitled Military Innovation and the Rise of the West, 1500 through 1800, which was published in 1988 by Geoffrey Parker, and more recently perpetuated by scholars like Philip Hoffman via his book entitled Why Did Europe Conquer the World?, uh, published in 2015, has been to link the military revolution in Europe with the global rise of the West. We must remain squarely focused on this link for now, rather than contributing yet another diatribe on Europe. There are, of course, other explanations of European dominance that privilege non-military factors, from economics to culture, but I maintain that in international relations and the social sciences more generally, the military explanation is dominant. Even those like whom I will address in passing within tonight's ARCA narrative account for the rise of the West and the dominance of the sovereign state on economic, cultural, or societal grounds still include military superiority as a crucial intervening variable. Although my paradigmatic intervention carries implications for historians, it is primarily aimed at political scientists. The period of interest here would be the early modern era from around 1500 until the late 18th century. Most historians and social scientists agree that the time around the beginning of the 19th century represents an important historical breakpoint and the end of the early modern period. Bounding the scope of the argument to the period before the end of the 18th century reflects the importance of relatively sharp military change after this point. The economic and technological transformations of the Industrial Revolution and the ideational changes of nationalism. Now, in introducing the military revolution and European expansion into international relations, well, as to be discussed later in Arc of Narrative tonight, should I have the breath to reach that happy conclusion, the military revolution remains a live issue for historians, especially its global implications. However, does it really matter for international relations and social scientists more generally? 
the Military Revolution Thesis seeks to answer some of the biggest questions in international relations. Why is the world comprised of sovereign states, rather than the multiplicity of different political forms that existed in Europe and elsewhere previously? Why was the West able to conquer and transform much of the rest of the world, thereby shaping the fundamental constitutional order of, of the international system as it stands today? This view of early modern history still directly shapes current socio-scientific thinking on these subjects. Following William Thompson's idea of the military superiority thesis, delineated via his article entitled The Military Superiority Thesis and the Ascendancy of Western Eurasia in the World System, as published on pages 143 through 178 in the 10th volume of the Journal of World History back in 1999, Paul MacDonald's book entitled Networks of Domination, subtitled The Social Foundations of Peripheral Conquest, published in 2014, summarizes the dominant state of thinking in international relations on why Europe conquered much of the rest of the world by doctrinarily replicating the military revolution argument. So to read therefrom, a paragraph. European warfare underwent a profound transformation beginning in the 16th century. On land, the spread of gunpowder-based weapons, as well as specialized fortifications designed to resist these arms, transformed the nature of combat. European states were increasingly compelled to raise large standing armies, which were dominated by highly trained and well-drilled infantry. Although driven by competition between European states, the unintended consequences of this military revolution was to widen the gap in military power between Europe and the rest of the world. The social science account I alluded to earlier, Philip Hoffman's Why Did Europe Conquer the World? puts forward the same argument. And to quote us therefrom, Europe's fragmented competitive geopolitics and incessant warfare meant that Gunpowder technology, the organizational application of this new technology in warfare, and the fiscal administrative underpinnings of war advanced further in early modern Western Europe than elsewhere. Capitalizing on this advantage, Europeans then used their superior gunpowder weapons, forts, and ships to build global empires. In presenting the conventional wisdom, if we can dignify it with that term, in international relations as based on the military revolution thesis, it is important to consider the sophistication and nuances of some of the leading accounts that oft suffer by simplification, as well as considering alternative perspectives. Charles Tilley's later explanation of the rise of the sovereign state via via the work entitled Coercion, Capital, and European States, A.D. 990 through 1992, take his pains to acknowledge the importance of enduring diversity, different paths to success, and the importance of capital as well as coercion. So too is Hendrik Spruitt careful to identify his areas of disagreement with the military revolution thesis in his work entitled The Sovereign State and Its Competitors, uh, which was published in 1994. Thus, does he argue that changes in military technology cannot explain increased variation in political forms? And similar to Tilly, Spruitt is at pains to emphasize the diversity of forms that arose at the end of the medieval era as changes in trade reshaped social coalitions, leading to the rise of city-states and merchant leagues, as well as sovereign states. Yet, for both scholars, their empirical fo their focus is almost exclusively on Europe rather than the central goal of my theme in the present phase of narrative, which is explaining early modern European expansion. And what of more critical Marxist accounts that are presumably very different from the military revolution thesis? In foregrounding property and class relations, scholars like Teschke and Lacker persuasively argue that the early modern period was fundamentally distinct from the latter era of modern capitalism and high imperialism in the 19th century, they also see the military revolution thesis as, to quote us from Ben Oteshka's work entitled The Myth of 1648, subtitled Class, Geopolitics, and the Making of Modern International Relations, as published in 2003, constituting 
The dominant paradigm of state formation theory in contemporary scholarship and serving as one of the key intellectual legitimations for mainstream international relations accounts of the rise of the modern state system. However, in drawing their evidence overwhelmingly from Europe, these scholars have relatively little to say about relations with other regions. To the extent that non-Western actors are even mentioned, the portrayal is one of passive victims of domineering Westerners. In this sense, whatever their differences, Tilly, Spruett, Leiker, and Teshka are, like the advocates of the military revolution thesis, representative of the Eurocentric imbalance I have dedicated myself to exposing. Alexander Anievas and Karim Nisantioglu's work on the rise of the West is in a different category, both in their attention to the problem of Eurocentrism, because they are, after all, Romanian, and in their extensive consideration of the Mongols, Ottomans, and Mughals, as well as various actors in the Americas, Africa, and Southeast Asia, in their work entitled How the West Came to Rule, subtitled The Geopolitical Origins of Capitalism, published in 2015 by, ironically enough, Pluto Press, which means money. These authors advance a theory of uneven and combinative development. The rise of the West is said to be the result of the interaction of the supposedly singular European experience of feudalism, which created a distinct development path in the West, unevenness, and geopolitical competition both within Europe and between European and non-European powers, or combination. Despite its explicitly critical stance, it is notable how much of the military revolution thesis is incorporated into this account, with prominent citations to all the other authors I have aforesighted, notably Parker, McNeil, and Hoffman. First is the idea of Europe as a uniquely competitive military environment which forced European states to quickly adopt military innovations. In contrast, Asian empires are said to have faced much less competition, and hence were less innovative in warfare. The second, Europeans are said to have used the same military innovations developed in Europe, which gave us them a decisive comparative advantage in the means of violence and in their fiscal and organizational capacities in their early modern campaigns of intercontinental conquest. In specifying these decisive military advantages, the authors again follow the military revolution thesis in speaking of drilled infantry, deploying muskets, and gun-armed sailing ships. Thus, in sum, and notwithstanding some important exceptions, for most international relations scholars, the military revolution narrative remains the presumed foundation of why the world is the way it is and how it got that way. The influence of this thesis extends well beyond just reactionary and Weberian international relations scholars. More broadly, given the huge consequences for contemporary international politics, examining the history of European expansion is too important to be left to the historians. So let's look at the origins of the military revolution thesis. Historians' work on a purported military revolution in early modern Europe is a crucial foundation for international relations scholars' understanding of the evolution and rise of the sovereign state at the expense of other forms of political organization that populated the medieval system. It is equally important in explaining the expansion and dominance of the West over politics in other parts of the world. Although there are many variations on the basic military revolution thesis, this phase of narrative must concentrate on the work of its leading exponents. In 1955, Michael Roberts' essay entitled The Military Revolution 1560 through 1660 was published in the academic anthology titled The Military Revolution Debate, subtitled Readings in the Military Transformation of Early Modern Europe, by Westview. As edited by Clifford Rogers, and arguing therein between pages 13 through 35 that the century of 1560 through 1660 the hundred years in between saw a revolution in military affairs that exercised a profound influence on the course of European history. It stands like a great divide, separating medieval society from the modern world. 
Of course, this period includes the Treaty of Westphalia, that much international relations scholarship has conventionally regarded as a similarly profound date in marking the triumph of the sovereign state. This correspondence is far from coincidental and underlines the significance of early modern history for contemporary international relations concepts and theory. Although a military historian himself, Roberts was putting forward a much broader argument about the origin of the state and the contemporary international system. The military revolution argument brought the subfield of military history, previously rather isolated, into the core concerns of history more generally, but also indirectly into those of the social sciences as well. There are four key components to Roberts's military revolution thesis. Tactics, strategy, army size, and socio-political effects. The sequence begins with innovations in tactics. In the 1590s, the Dutch Maurice of Nassau took inspiration from ancient Roman military tactics in arguing for the deployment of linear battle formations, especially the use of volley fire by musketeers. Later, during the crucible of the Thirty Years' War, Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus combined linear infantry formations with light field artillery and cavalry charges for shock effect. These new tactics required more disciplined troops and hence more training and more officers as part of a permanent standing army. A major shift in strategy was the second key element as opposing coalitions began to use multiple armies to achieve larger strategic aims. The third tenet is the rapidly increasing size of these armies, said to be the result of revolution in strategy made possible by the revolution in tactics and made necessary by the circumstances of the Thirty Years' War, which some parts of Europe are still recovering from. The increase in army size was crucial in that it forms the link between the purely military and more generally political parts of the thesis. Supporting such large, permanent, professional armies put unprecedented administrative and fiscal strains on the polities of Europe. Military needs drove the monarchs into ever-increasing interference in the lives of their subjects. New agencies had to be formed to administer and maintain armies and the associated logistics. The use of violence increasingly became centralized as only larger and richer polities could meet the needs of contemporary warfare. This meant not only that what had been feudal vassals and regional grandes lost autonomy relative to the monarch, who now began to preside over much more unified, bureaucratic, hierarchically organized domains, but also that the use of organized violence by non-state actors on land and at sea also declined. Finally, these changes created the need for a lot more money. In the short term, this led to new forms of credit and debt, and later fiscal innovations. Hence, we have the creation of the modern sovereign state. Very little of this will seem new or surprising to international relations scholars familiar with Tilly's famous dictum about war making, the state, and vice versa, or works on state formation by Spruit, Ertman, Downing, and others. However, the point here is that Roberts preceded these social scientists by several decades, and thus that the influence of this dictum on comparative politics, sociology, and international relations theory is in large part the product of the history of the early modern military revolution, as well as earlier historians like Leopold von Lanach and Otto Hintze. The military revolution and European expansion now. That is the question. In the highly influential 1988 book titled The Military Revolution, subtitled Military Innovation and the Rise of the West, the author Parker agreed 
that the increasing administrative and fiscal demands of a new type of warfare had given rise to the modern sovereign state through a process of military competition, emulation, and conquest. For Parker, however, it was technology rather than tactics that was the prime mover. Specifically, the rise of cannons meant that medieval castle walls suddenly became obsolete from the middle of the 15th century. The response to these new gunpowder weapons was a new style of fortification. Trace Italiane Designs Or Trace Italien Designs with thick, low walls to resist artillery. The catch, however, was that these defenses were very expensive to build, especially as the idea was to have multiple mutually supporting fortifications, like a fire-based network, and required very large forces to either garrison or attack. This technological change in artillery and fortifications caused the increase in the size of armies, hence the need for greater revenue and administrative capacity, and hence the resulting rise of the modern sovereign state. As feudal lords and non-state actors simply could not afford to keep up with these advances, they lost power to the emerging centralized states. Much more importantly, for the purposes of historical reality, however, Parker turns the military revolution thesis away from purely European concerns in arguing that it also explains the rise of the West. For Parker, as for many others, the puzzle is how such a small, peripheral, and historically backward area like Western Europe ended up in control of something like a third of the world's land area by 1800. And so he summarizes his case, well, I'll just quote his tea. The key to the Westerners' success in creating the first truly global empires between 1500 and 1750 depended upon precisely those improvements in the ability to wage war which have been termed the military revolution. Essential to this more encompassing conception is a parallel naval aspect with the innovation of gun-armed, ocean-going sailing ships from the early 1500s. These new warships provided Europeans with the means to reach the Americas and the Indian Ocean, as well as to dominate local naval forces and project power into the littoral. Once again, the expense of capital-intensive war at sea was said to favor the use of organized violence by public authorities over non-state parties and Westphalian states over other forms of polity. Ultimately, intra-European military competition resulted in European dominance over the rest of the world. Circa 1982, McNeil replicated central elements of the military revolution thesis in his hugely ambitious work entitled The Pursuit of Power, subtitled Technology, Armed Force, and Society since A.D. 1000. Once again, Twas deemed that unremitting military competition in Western Europe was said to be crucial in driving and diffusing technological and organizational innovations. The presumption equally central to Paul Kennedy's 1988 magnum opus entitled The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers that has been so seminally influential that that would take an entire transmission devoted to that work alone to do it justice. The success of disciplined, drilled, professional infantry armies from the latter medieval period was the most important military innovation. Although non-Western actors like the Ottomans, Mughals, and Japanese mastered the use of modern artillery sufficiently to dominate local rulers, these gunpowder empires thereafter succumbed to a low equilibrium competence trap. Absent the driver of military competition on the scale of Western Europe, tis presumed they stagnated till the point where the gap with the West was unbridgeable. In sum, the most important common elements for Roberts, Parker, and McNeil are as follows. 
Although there was some reciprocal influence, the development of the modern state was primarily a result of the need to service increasingly large, complex, and expensive armies, and thus indirectly the result of military competition in Western Europe, said to be at a higher pitch than in other regions of the world. So even if Eastern powers could emulate some aspects of the military revolution in their armies, they could not keep up with the West because their political system did not conform to the model of the sovereign state. Uh, what's worse, they weren't at war with other sovereign states all the time on every side, so they weren't constantly advancing technologically to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. And the, this, is the, this is the thesis. This is the cycle of violence that is kind of like... This is like saying beating your wife in front of your kids so that they grow up to beat your, their wives in front of their kids is somehow constructive, that it somehow betters with the generations into something greater. Yeah. Finally, and crucially, the same military advances in Europe are said to explain European vi victories in the rest of the world. So this is where I have to present the irrelevance of the military revolution for European expansion. The first challenge to conventional military thinking, or conventional thinking at all, is that the key military and broader political institutional changes that comprised the military revolution in Europe were not replicated in the first two and a half centuries of European expansion. The tactics, armies, and states that defined 16th and 17th century warfare in Europe were almost totally irrelevant elsewhere. There were no massive combined arms forces, nor was there a sustained commitment of national economic resources, nor even were the most successful European empire builders states at all. Where the military revolution account stresses large armies controlled by states, employing the same tactics and technology developed in great power wars in Europe, this phase of my arc of narrative challenges each one of these elements. First, European forces across the oceans were tiny, and hence oft dependent on much more numerous local allies as articulated before and subsequently from now. Second, the process of early modern European expansion was mostly spearheaded by groups of adventurers or chartered companies. True corporate warfare not the armies of sovereign states. Third, tactically, Europeans were more often than not forced to adapt to local circumstances, a conclusion that undermines the belief, the misbelief, that there was one dominant superior form of warfighting in the early modern world developed in Europe and deployed to subordinate all others. Beyond the brute necessity of crossing the oceans, Early modern innovations in military technology were relatively insignificant in determining the success of European expeditionary warfare. The first of these three elements, the question of army size, is vital for the military revolution thesis. As noted, this is not just because the escalating size of armies in Europe is seen as a key historical piece of evidence for the competitive dynamic at the heart of the thesis, but even more so because this aspect provides the link between the strictly military and fiscal administrative parts of the argument. The need to raise and support more and more troops to stay competitive in the context of relentless military rivalry required more and more taxes and an increasingly sophisticated state administrative apparatus. Yet, in direct contrast to developments in Europe, the historical record proves that European successes in Asia, Africa, and the Americas were achieved with minuscule forces operating on shoestring budgets at distances that precluded any substantive logistical support or even much administrative direction from their home states. In fact, once Whitey was across the sea, Basically, the only thing they had was a note saying, you're on your own, good luck. Famously, Cortez and Pizarro 
defeated the Aztecs and Incas despite having only a few hundred Spanish troops at most behind them. At roughly the same time, the Portuguese managed to create a network of fortified ports and control key sea lanes extending from East Africa to the Persian Gulf, Eastern and Western India, Southeast Asia, China, and Japan with a total force that never exceeded 10,000 men. A ridiculously small number by European or local standards. The key campaigns led by Albuquerque that built the Portuguese Estado da India in the early 1500s seldom had more than a thousand Portuguese combatants. The largest Portuguese expedition, which unsuccessfully sallied into the Red Sea in 1541, had only 2,300 troops. In the second half of the 17th century, the combined VOC, the VOC, Vernied Ustindish Company, or Company, the Dutch East India Company, established in 1602 and dissolved circa 1799. The VOC, the uh, Dutch East India Company forces across Southeast Asia, never exceeded 12,000 with individual campaigns seldom mustering more than a thousand Dutch troops at a time. As late as 1788, when the United States was actually around, there were only 8,045 British soldiers in the whole of the Indian subcontinent. Even in the 19th century, long after the formation of huge territorial empires that were very different from their largely maritime early modern predecessors, European states rarely sent large armies abroad in pursuit of transcontinental conquest. The second crucial component of the military revolution thesis is the growing public dominance of the means of organized violence, particularly modern armies, artillery, new style fortifications, and advanced gun arm sailing ships. War was said to have become the sole prerogative of the state. But the essentially private nature of the Spanish conquests in the Americas forcefully demonstrates the radically different nature of extra European expeditionary warfare compared with the tenets of the military revolution thesis. Henry Common explained this via his work entitled Empire, subtitled How Spain Became a World Power, 1492 through 1763, which was published 2002. It attests that, contrary to the idea of a growing state monopoly of the means of violence, oh fuck, let me read from the book, not a single Spanish army was expended on conquest. When Spaniards established their control, they did so through the sporadic efforts of small groups of adventurers whom the crown later attempted to bring under its control. These men, who proudly assumed the description of conquistadors, were oftentimes not even soldiers. And in his book entitled Seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest, released in 2003, Matthew Restel refers to the myth of the king's army in confirming that only a small minority of conquistadors, whom he refers to as armed Spanish entrepreneurs, had received any military training. He further observes that there were no officers and no formal chain of command in such forces. Nor was the private character of the Spanish military efforts in the Americas limited only to the initial encounters. With Wayne Lee, via via his essay entitled Projecting Power in the Early Modern World, subtitled The Spanish Model, with a question mark, which was edited by himself into his own book entitled Empires and Indigenes, subtitled Intercultural Alliances, Imperial Expansion, and Warfare in the Early Modern World, which was published in 2011, the year my mother died. So noting, therein, of subsequent expansion that appeals to the king's authority notwithstanding, 
Throughout the 17th century, virtually all of these actions were conducted as private enterprise ventures. Venture capitalists with guns who come to rape, plunder, and steal and say, uh, we call this business back in Europe, you know. For most of the time, there was no Spanish Navy either, the crown relying exclusively on chartered private ships. As fundamentally hybrid private public entities, the Dutch and English East India companies in the 17th and 18th centuries jointly comprise an even more obvious refutation of the idea that early modern European expansion was a product of state armies, and thus once again underlines the fundamentally different nature of war inside and beyond Europe. These had what are now taken to be defining features of a private company being owned by private shareholders in the business of trade and run for profit. Yet they also had quintessentially sovereign prerogatives, including the right to engage in diplomacy and war. Imagine if we gave postmodern corporations that power. Well, they also maintained significant military and naval forces. Again, imagine if we gave modern corporate entities that power. They don't want it because the cost is something they would rather parasitize off of from the state. But these two historical hybrid chartered companies, these super mega multi-nat corporations, were perhaps the most important agents of early modern European expansion. Corporate warfare on the road to worldwide conquest. By the way, this wasn't capitalism for all you communists out there. It was mercantilism. So it's corporate plunder in every sense of the word. It's no fair trade. Uh, anybody at the butt end of where they established themselves would tell you that. So, that having been articulated, the Dutch company built a sprawling networked domain concentrated in present-day Indonesia, the largest archipelago on planet Earth, girdling much of the equator, but also extending to Japan, Taiwan, mainland Southeast Asia, South, well, South Asia itself, the Indian subcontinent, and of course Southern Africa. Its English counterpart eventually became even more powerful in South Asia, though the company was still careful to acknowledge the overlordship of the Mughal emperor. There simply were no English, British, or Dutch armies in the East, in the sense of those paid for out of state taxes and directed by state officials, until late in the 17 fucking hundreds, after the establishment of the United States. When Britain kicked out of North America, well, the good part that wasn't frozen, had to go and find itself another fucking empire. Thus, whether it is in the Americas or to the East, European expansion was primarily driven by non-state armed private and hybrid actors, venture capitalists, or militarized corporations, paramilitary supercorps, in direct opposition to the idea that it was the fiscal military superiority of the sovereign state and its armies and navies that explainest Western expansion in this era. Turning to the third factor in explaining European conquests, Parker, McNeil, Hoffman, and Chase, as well as others drawing on them, like Annie Avis and Nisan Cioglu, the Romanians, emphasize Western technology and tactics such as volley fire from muskets and new style trace italienne fortifications. 
Yet technological and tactical advantages were rarely decisive in European expansionism. In the East, the technological gap between European and local forces was often quite slight or actually non-existent. Particularly in firearms, it was the Chinese who invented gunpowder, fools. Asian and African rulers generally found it easy to acquire Western weapons, even if they had not built them, either through open trade or with the defection of renegades or, hey, guess what? Kill the cracker and take his gun. You know, blow dart, sneak up behind him and knife him. Better yet, get him drunk. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. It's not that difficult, people. This was not true in the Americas, as the demographic catastrophe caused by exposure to old world diseases helped to bring about political collapse. But this had little to do with military factors as such. Spanish infantry forces in the Americas relied primarily on their steel swords and armor for their crucial early victories. Cavalry charges, volley fire, naval broadsides, and field artillery were mainly absent. Muskets were most often used as fucking clubs. Because, come on, get real, people. How off can you reload when your powder gets wet? And you're like, oh shit, the bag is empty. And oh shit, it rained. Oh, gunpowder wet. Oh, doesn't light. Oh shit. Anyhow, looking at the failed Western efforts to expand into Africa, well, the African interior in the early modern period, which have received far less scholarly attention because they were failures, Daniel Hedrick holds within his work entitled Power Over Peoples, subtitled Technology, Environments, and Western Imperialism, 1400 to the Present, published in 2010, that firearms were even less useful in Angola than in the Americas. Well, for one thing, you got to be able to see the enemy, and they could only see the blacks when they were smiling or opening their eyes, in which case, that was usually when they were standing over them with a war club or a spear to run them through. South Asia has a particular significance in being for Parker and others the primary theater of war between Western and non-Western powers prior to 1800 outside Europe. It is excluding the centuries-long struggle with the Ottomans to be discussed later within this arc of narrative. Given South Asia's, meaning the Indian subcontinent's, demographic weight relative to other regions, the 2002 essay entitled The Artillery Fortress as an Engine of European Overseas Expansion, 1480 through 1750, which was edited by the writer Geoffrey Parker into pages 192 through 218 of his own book titled Empire, War, and Faith in Early Modern Europe, as published that year by Penguin Press stresses the importance of trace Italian fortresses in allowing European forces in the Indian Ocean littoral to hold out against much larger attacking forces. Yet these are said to require very large forces to be effective. Forces that, as I myself exposed earlier in arc of this very narrative tonight, were simply not even available. Historians and contemporary observers, like Wellington, oft maintained that Indian artillery was as good as that of the East India Company in the later 1700s. Within the academic anthology, edited by Wayne Lee that I cited earlier, titled Empires and Indigenes, is an essay entitled Revolution, Evolution, or De-Evolution, subtitled The Military Making of Colonial India, writ by Dean Pierce, wherein the author speaks more generally of the East India Company's conquest of India by arguing that, defined in technological or organizational terms, military superiority had a relatively minor role. 
as I myself will expose it later, gun-armed sailing ships, oft times portrayed as the most decisive Western technological innovation, do not invalidate this conclusion. So turning to tactics, a mid-16th century Spanish combat manual excerpted it, excerpt it within Matt Restel's book, The Seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest. Well, to read therefrom, this Spanish combat manual argued that in the Americas, the patterns and practices of European warfare were entirely irrelevant. The treaties proposed that linear formations, hierarchical units, and permanent garrisons be abandoned completely in favor of small covert fighting units dedicated to search and destroy missions over several years. In North America, European settlers adopted the skulking way of war of their Native American opponents and allies rather than linear formations and volley fire. In the Indian Ocean, once again, few European forces used the tactics that defined warfare in Europe itself. The first use of volley fire by European drilled infantry in the East only came in the 1740s in India, almost 250 fucking years after Europeans had established their presence in the Indian Ocean, and right at the tail end of the period that Geoff Parker's and Will McNeil's arguments claim to explain us away. Recent historiography has stressed that rather than Western tactics reigning supreme, both Europeans and local forces hybridized in learning from the other. Exemplai gratiae. Whilst South Asian armies came to use more infantry and artillery, Europeans adapted irregular cavalry and Indian logistical solutions. Why did Europeans not use the same tactics overseas as at home? Responsible analysts have questioned the assumption that technology, tactics, and organization that may have been optimal in Western and Central Europe must have been optimal elsewhere. This is like the Americans who invaded Vietnam and acted as if they were on the battlefields of Central Europe engaging in mechanized warfare with an insurgency. And writing on warfare in Southeast Asia, Michael Charney's book entitled Southeast Asian Warfare, 1300 through 1900, published in 2004, notes that volley fire is just not very useful in a jungle. While John Thornton makes the same point about warfare in African forests with, within his work entitled Warfare in Atlantic Africa, 1500 through 1800, that was published in 1999. So the Dutch and the Portuguese were just as likely to mimic the tactics of their Javanese and Angolan opponents as vice versa. European horses and pack animals were eliminated by disease in sub-Saharan Africa, largely precluding the use of cavalry and cannons, which, you know, the horses had to drag because it's really fucking heavy and there's no man capable of doing that. Even a slave or a group of them under whip would have a very difficult time moving cannon. Even the eastern half of Europe, often so overlooked, provided notably different conditions that were much more favorable for a different style of war than in the other half of the continent. Those writing on the western steppe area stress how the different geographical conditions that obtained compared to western Europe meant that local warfare was not different because it was backwards. Thus there is a fundamental problem with the idea that Europeans could take as the allegedly superior style of warfare that they had developed at home and employ it to defeat backward opponents elsewhere. The European forces that fought in the Americas Asia and Africa in the early modern period looked nothing like the armies that waged the Thirty Years' War and enjoyed none of the substantial fiscal, administrative, or logistical support from sovereign states that was supposedly a prerequisite for those fighting according to the new methodology. Indeed, a closer consideration of all the preceding evidence 
suggests a new and very different picture of early modern European expansion. Where they succeeded, small, largely freelance European ventures, adapted local tactics, cultivated local allies and support, and successfully insinuated themselves into existing power struggles and hierarchies to build primarily maritime networks of overseas possessions. Where Europeans encountered great powers to the east, they practiced strategies of deference and subordination. On the rare occasions when Europeans' discretion was not the better part of their valor, they suffered military defeat at the hands of Asian great powers. Europeans were also consistently defeated in their attempts at conquest in both North and Sub-Saharan Africa in the early modern era. Explaining early modern European expansion requires the acknowledgement of local allies and indigenous support. If the military revolution thesis cannot explain early modern European expansion, what can? The most important determinant of Western successes were local support and the cultivation of indigenous allies combined with a judicious posture of European subservience when faced by far more powerful Asian empires. Especially in Africa and Asia, this strategy of insinuation and deference was crucially facilitated by Europeans' predominantly maritime orientation, meaning that they were perceived as generally unthreatening by land-oriented local polities. The exceptions tend to prove the rule, in that when Europeans took on Asian great powers, they lost. Even in maritime conflicts, when thanks to broadside firing sailing ships, the former had their greatest technological advantage. To make us up for their lack of numbers, described earlier, local allies were decisive for European efforts to establish and defend their presence overseas. Cortes was supported by tens of thousands of warriors from the local rivals of the Aztecs in the climactic battles. Rather than being a one-off, a heavy military and logistical dependence on Amerindians, you know, the Native Americans, was a constant and fundamental feature of Spanish expansion in the region. Local sources from the time tended to see these campaigns as internecine Amerindian wars, in which the Spanish played but a cameo role. The author of Empire, How Spain Became a World Power, Henry Cowman, concurs that the single most important factor explaining Spanish expansion in the Americas was that the conquerors always worked hand-in-hand -hand with native peoples who opposed the ruling empire. Wayne Lee goes even further in concluding that, in many ways, we might explain European success and failures entirely as an issue of logistics or, better, how well they succeeded in using indigenous aid to overcome the logistical challenges. The Portuguese presence in both the Swahili coast of East Africa and in India depended upon exploiting local feuds to cultivate sympathetic rulers in order to establish key early bases, expand their influence, and then defend their outposts. Exemplar Gracie, the Portuguese headquarters of Goa in India, was only saved from a rampaging Maratha army in 1683 by Mughal intervention. The Mughals later forced the Portuguese to pay for the rescue. So there. Elsewhere, small numbers of Portuguese fought alongside much larger armies from Ethiopia and Congo. However, there was nothing that mandated that European divide and rule tactics, even where they got purchased, resulted in European dominance. Thus, in discussing the consistent failure of European attempts at conquest in Africa in the early modern era, there be an essay entitled Firearms, Diplomacy, and Conquest in Angola that was published in the aforesighted collection titled Empires and Indigenes, writ by John Thornton that notes of Angola, I read here from the book, 
Portugal achieved its results only with major assistance from indigenous armies, and it fit into the regional politics as just one of the players in a system of interstate relations. It was required to make major concessions to its allies and to accept alliances that had a high cost in regard to Portuguese control. The Dutch East India Company also relied on local allies in besting the Portuguese in Malacca in the person of the Sultan of Johar, Ceylon in the person of the Raja of Kandy, and South Asia in the person of the Sultan of Bijapur. The most important arena of Dutch presence in the East was the island of Java, where the company was sucked into a series of civil wars. To quote is John Wills' essay entitled Maritime Asia, 1500 through 1800, the interactive, well, it's subtitled, The Interactive Emergence of European Domination, as published in the American Historical Review, that's a historical journal, circa 1993, well, to read from the journal. In the larger area of Javanese politics, the Dutch are shown being drawn farther and farther in by the unstable and highly personalized politics of the Javanese courts and then obtaining the cooperation of Javanese rules in some highly exploitative systems of forced delivery monoculture. Holy shit, it's like... Uh, uh, I don't know what that is, but it sounds pretty nasty. Uh, they, they got something they wanted bad. It sounds a lot like drugs to me. Uh, they grow these shrooms. Well, it's probably fucking rubber. Uh, the company was seen by Southeast Asian rulers as an attractive gun for hire. Literally a corporate mercenary force in resolving secession struggles given its lack of connection to any local societies and relative indifference to ter territorial conquest compared with its maritime and commercial goals. In other words, the company itself was hired out by the locals to do in their rivals, until their rivals were able to pay the company more. It's a good position to be in. Even many of the Dutch company troops, in fact, hailed from other Southeast Asian sultanates or from as far afield as Japan, with hired samurai mercenaries, what the Dutch called hired swords. The English East India Company's rise to dominance in South Asia is unthinkable without local support. In the period of turbulence after the disintegration of the Mughal Empire in the early 18th century, the company formed extensive alliances among the successor polities. A large majority of its troops were recruited lo locally, some drilled to fight as European-style infantry, many others employed as irregular cavalry. As in the Americas and Africa, local log logistical support was critical in determining the success or failure of campaigns, with company forces adopting Indian practices of resupply. Even in the area where the company might have been thought to be most self-sufficient, credit and finance, it depended on South Asian sources for up to 90 fucking percent of its financing. Believe that shit. Imagine a company in area overseas with 90 percent of its fucking finances dependent on the regional economy. That has nothing to do with your nation, whatever nation it originated in. That is truly an independent state of its own. You are no longer involved with whatever nation your company was founded in. It is important to appreciate that these European local collaborations generally serve the interests of the latter as much as the former, it was not a question of locals being duped by the canny white Westerners. Indeed, black Africans, yellow Asians, and those in the Americas, the Redskins, enthusiastically and effectively played off rival European powers against each other. Hey, you know, there's some, these white guys, they speak a language, sounds like a lot different from yours, and they smell different too. 
Oh, they smell like garlic? Yeah, no, they stink, man. Yo, those must be the frogs. Oh, the French, we gotta kill them. Oh, shit. Where are they? Uh, fucking limeys and uh, frogs and, uh, you know, they can all go at each other. You notice the Germans were so clean of this shit. Overall, as per Jean Gleet, via his work entitled Warfare at Sea, 1500 through 1650, Mar- well, subtitled Maritime Conflicts and the Transformation of Europe, published in the year 2000, he says... Major rulers, such as the Mughals in India, or the Safavids in Persia, usually cooperated with the Europeans, who were regarded for a long time as useful partners on the maritime fringes of their essentially land-based empires. And even Kenneth Chase, who wrote a work entitled Firearms, subtitled A Global History to 1700, published in 2003, agrees that the European empires of the 1500s and 1600s were but networks of trading posts that existed largely at the sufferance of the local rulers. As well as being a handy stick with which to beat local rivals, Europeans could also be a useful source of bullion for Eastern rulers. Of necessity, the European response to non-Western great powers was one of deference or defeat. One ahistorical perspective suggests that as European expansion progressed, the power of non-Western polities declined inversely, according to a zero-sum logic, or illogic, such as the case may be. In fact, however, particularly with reference to the empires of Asia, the construction of European maritime networks of trading posts and forts was oft time seen as a testament to local rulers' power and prestige. In accord with conventional practice, Europeans were obliged to acknowledge their subservience to these rulers. With reference to the Mughals, Ming, and Tokugawa shogunate, the English, Portuguese, and Dutch formally agreed to their inferior status as a race and paid obeisance to Asian rulers in return for trading rights. More than just a matter of custom and ritual, this positioning also reflected the hard fact of European military weakness. You've got no army behind you when you're forced to bow and kneel before a foreign court and swear your fealty, your loyalty to a foreign king for swearing your allegiance to whatever home you came from. There was no denying that these Asian powers enjoyed a vast military superiority. Even at home, the aforesighted Geoffrey Parker has noted that in the period 1550 through 1650, that 100 years, no European power could maintain more than about 150,000 troops. By way of comparison, already by the late 1300s, the Ming Chinese had a conscript army of over 1.2 million. The Mughal military census of 1595, and yes, they had to take a census of their own goddamn military, listed 384,000 cavalry and 4.66 million infantry. That army could absorb a salvo of nuclear strikes and maintain itself in the field. Thus, in his work entitled Mughal Warfare, subtitled Indian Frontiers and the High Road to Empire, 1500 through 1700, published in 2002, Joss Gomans attests that, For the Mughals, the maritime activities of the Europeans were certainly not a matter of equal partnership, but rather the result of the benevolence and generosity they had shown to a subordinate community. The Mughals regarded the Portuguese as their unpaid servants. 
Holy shit. You know what that means? That means slaves, people. They said, them law white slaves. Unpaid servitude. That's called slavery. Holy shit. And you guys thought you ruled the world. It's just too much. The English East India Company likewise had to pledge themselves as slaves of the Mughal Emperor. To prove their loyalty to the Japanese shogun, Dutch emissaries were forced to crawl to kiss his feet, trample their Christian crucifixes, smash their crucifixes and curse their god, and commit to act in the service of the shogun and to preserve the Japanese realm with our last drop of blood. They swore allegiance to the Japanese Empire. Earlier, the Japanese had expelled the Portuguese and beheaded a delegation, that means an entire group of people, an envoy, that sought to negotiate their re-entry. The Dutch company directors instructed their representatives in Persia to be equally deferential to the demands of the Safavid Shah. As is well known, the Chinese emperors of the Ming and successive Qing dynasties forced the Europeans and all other foreign emissaries to kowtow as one part of the ritual endorsement and enactment of the supreme status of the Middle Kingdom and the Celestial Emperor. That means to bow and bang your head against the ground until your forehead bleeds. The Portuguese toehold in Macau was very much at the mercy of local Chinese officials. And as late as the 1780s, Portuguese attempts to usurp sovereign prerogatives over the territory were firmly rebuffed. Further afield, even in areas like West Africa that lacked the huge empires of the East, European outposts only existed and functioned thanks to the tolerance of African rulers. If European deference and subordination were the norm in the early modern period, what happened in the exceptional cases when they sought to directly challenge non-Western great powers? In particular, what was the strategic effect of European attempts to leverage their tactical naval superiority in cannon-armed sailing ships via the land-based Asian great powers? Although these clashes were rare enough that conclusions can only be tentative, the clear pattern was that the Europeans fucking lost. Now, before I get into that, giving myself a quick check into the chat here. And, uh... Shout out to Boo Exis, who says, hello, DDD, hope you're doing well. I am. Thank you so much. I don't know whether it's a boy or a girl, but hugs. And um, even when the white Europeans scored tactical victories at sea, the brute fact was that Europeans depended on access to Asian markets far more than Asian rulers depended on any trade with Europeans. Furthermore, the fiscal, military, and ideational nature of these polities, even that of the Japanese Empire, was firmly land-based, meaning that they were essentially invulnerable to maritime coercion. Thus, the exceptional clashes provest why the Europeans were generally so realistic in recognizing their inferiority. When European forces fought against the Ming and later Qing dynastic Chinese in the early modern period, 
they came as Dorf distinctly second best. The Portuguese and Dutch East India Company sought to force open Chinese markets a century apart through campaigns of blockade, piracy, and attacks on ports. In 1521 through 1522, the Portuguese were defeated in naval clashes with the Ming Chinese in the Pearl River Delta. In 1624, the threat of a huge Ming army and being excluded from the Chinese market forced the Dutch East India Company to abandon the Pescadores Islands. Later, the company was expelled from its new style Trace Italiana Fortress in Taiwan after an amphibious landing operation by Imperial Chinese forces in 1661. Now, few listeners probably know that the Dutch ruled Taiwan in the 17th century, an occupation that ended after the greatest war between European and Chinese forces until the Opium War of the 19th century. The Chinese naval and land military defeats versus all foreign powers, including Japan, Russia, Britain, and France, from 1886 to 1947 are well known. What is not well known is the island Chinese defeat of Dutch forces over Taiwan in 1660. The popular position being that Europe conquered other continents instead of China, who developed earlier, because of European superior weapons and tactics, is forced into complete reversal by any serious further research on Chinese military evolution, culminating in the 1660 Taiwan conflict with the Dutch. This is how Taiwan became Chinese. And all because of Dutch, Spanish, and ultimately Han, which is ethnic Chinese, colonization in the 17th century. Now, when discussing the former name of Taiwan, Formosa, Isla Formosa, and Ilha Formosa all come up as previous terms used to refer to the island between mainland China and the Japanese archipelago that we know as today as Taiwan. So, Ilaz Formosa, to understand the origin of this particular name, we need to go all the way back to the mid-1500s of the 16th century, or sometime around 1542 through 1544. At some point during this time, a Portuguese exploratory ship sailed by, and its sailors were so impressed by the beautiful scenery of the island, they christened it Ilha Formosa, which transliterates as Beautiful Island. The name for this island eventually replaced all others, and up until the early 20th century, it was the most common title for Taiwan in European literature. Referencing a variety of sources, including travel and missionary accounts from Europeans, official records and correspondence from the VOC, the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, and documents from the Chinese, informs us of the early modern colonization of Taiwan by then known as Ilha Hermosa by the Portuguese, La Isla Hermosa by the Spanish, or Formosa by the Dutch. By focusing on 17th century Taiwan, the island east of mainland China, populated by aborigines who specialized in deer hunting, we can explore the theme of early modern colonization in a much larger context as part of my greater effort of analyzing global history. In my true homeland and heartland lies the story of a wild and uncultivated island originally inhabited by aboriginal hunters and traders. Taiwan aborigines have inhabited Taiwan for over 5,000 years. They were very private people, 
and until the Dutch invaded, they were left largely untouched and completely undisturbed. They would only trade occasionally with outsiders, and even China knew very little about the indigenous population on the island. To transport you back to Asia and Taiwan of that time, at the beginning of the 1600s, Taiwan was a Sylvan backwater, sparsely inhabited by headhunters, and visited mainly by pirates and fishermen. From 1600, this island became the object of desire for a number of different cultural groups, among them migrants from the southern Chinese province of Fujian, representatives of the Spanish crown, Japanese and Dutch merchants, and yet more pirates of various ilks. That takes us to 1624 and the invasion of Tainan. The island in question we now know as Taiwan, but for most of the chronological period that forms the focal point for the sole pivotal expulsion of Ural colonial occupation in history from 1623 through to 1620, well, from 1623 through to 1662, which was the Dutch occupation of my homeland until their expulsion that 1662nd year of our Lord. And that invasion took two years, making 1662 through 1624. Well, 1624 was the first invasion by the Dutch. 1662, of course, was the fall of the Dutch, which started in 1660. And for most of the people whose records I drew from for this history, the name of my true homeland and heartland was Formosa, from the Spanish La Isla Hermosa, the beautiful island. The Dutch then came us to the island in 1624 and founded a small colony on the southwest coast of Taiwan. At this time, the island's name was Tainan. The Dutch arrived for trade purposes. They traded a variety of products, including sugar, pepper, nutmeg, cinnamon, rice, pepper, and silk. The Dutch found this island very profitable. It's a great location for trade import and export. They would have stayed longer. However, the Chi well, soon the Chinese invaded. Because situated between two greater powers, and in an advantageous position for import and export trade, many countries and powers have fought over Taiwan over the years. Although a backwater in 1624 when the Dutch arrived, Taiwan had become a prosperous commercial center by the time China's Ming Dynasty fell in 1644. Indeed, by the end of the century, it was home to more than a hundred thousand Chinese colonists who grew rice for, and sugar for export on the world markets. By the time it became as more widely known as Taiwan, it was already Chinese. So the question we really must address is just how Isla Hermosa became Taiwan via via the Dutch East India Company, which attempted to colonize the island to compete against Spanish merchants in the prosperous Asian market. Rather, the Dutch got the name of the island, initially known only to its aboriginal inhabitants, who referred to it as Taioan, Taioan, as in T-A-I-O-A-N, from the indigenous Taiwanese aborigines themselves. That's where the Dutch got the name. This Taiwanese Aboriginal population still are a percentage of the population today, but said name, however, was never used by the Chinese after their victory against the Dutch company in Taiwan, and it became instead Takasago, or Takakuni, to the Japanese Shogun Hideyoshi Toyotomi. Formosa to the Spanish and the Dutch, and finally, Taiwan to the immigre ethno-Chinese identifying the main island and its archipelago as their home. To examine this remarkable transformation, 
we must draw primarily on Dutch, Spanish, and Chinese sources to learn that, paradoxically, it was Europeans who started the large-scale Chinese colonization of my home island. The Spanish, who had a base on northern Taiwan from 1626 to 1642, and, more importantly, the Dutch, who had a colony from 1623 to 1662. Now, the latter enticed people from the coastal province of Fujian on mainland China to Taiwan with offers of free land, freedom from taxes, and economic subventions, creating a Chinese colony under white European rule. A kind of Super Hong Kong. Taiwan was thus the site of a colonial conjuncture, ergo manifesting a system that can only be termed co-colonization. The Dutch relied closely on Chinese colonists for food, entrepreneurship, translation, labor, and administrative help. Chinese colonists relied upon the Dutch for protection from the headhunting aborigines and sometimes from other Chinese groups, such as the pirates who ranged the Chinese seas. My analysis thus sheds light on one of the most important questions of global history. How do we understand the great colonial movements that have shaped our modern world? By examining Dutch, Spanish, and Han Chinese, or ethno-Sinitic, ethnic Chinese colonization, in one island, my home island, I can offer the most compelling answer. Europeans managed to establish colonies throughout the globe, not primarily because of any technological superiority, but because their state sponsored overseas colonialism, whereas Asian states, in general, did not. Indeed, when Asian states did, European colonies were vulnerable and climaxed with the capture of Taiwan by a Chinese army led by a Chinese warlord named Zheng Chenggong. Consider the remarkability of such accomplishment in face of the fact that Spain strategically established a colony in northern Taiwan while the Dutch established theirs in the south in the first quarter of the 17th century. Recollecting how Taiwan became Mist Chinese makest a significant contribution to our understanding of the connections that shaped the 17th century world. Mine own study of the colonization of Taiwan demonstrated to myself the connections between Europe and Asia, which helps to illustrate a larger picture of early modern colonization beyond the Atlantic world. The multiple European and Asian colonizing powers in Taiwan also highlighted the intricate network of colonization in terms of not only military power, but also trading relations and migration patterns. Simply situating the analysis of these connections on my home island reveals how crucial its location has ever been. For the migrants from Fujian, the southernmost province of mainland China, it was within easy reach so that links between the pioneers and the community at home could remain strong. Not only did that connection provide the Dutch with access to more manpower to work the new land on the island, but it provided the island Chinese with military protection from those based on the mainland. For the Dutch, Fort Zealandia on Formosa was the ideal base to manage the highly profitable trade between China, the Japanese Empire, and their own home base headquartered in Batavia, present-day Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, where, of course, the Dutch established the Dutch East Indies. The Spanish saw Isla Hermosa as a strategic bulwark necessary to protect their colony in the Philippines. Galleons laden with silks, silver, and porcelain sailed constantly between China and Manila, where they easily fell prey to merchants and pirates based on the island. 
The island's strategic location explains its appeal to so many competing groups, which makes the story of co-colonization all the more relevant to understanding its 17th century development. Taiwan, in neighboring China, Japan, and the Philippines, which was controlled by Spain, was part of a colonial trade network and soon a focus of contention between the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Japanese, and the Chinese. After Spain's decreasing interest in Taiwan and their defeat by the Dutch gave the Dutch control of the island, the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, corrected the Spanish mistake of not making their colony self-sufficient by developing an interesting strategy which I deem co-colonization. Having determined that it would be too costly to send Dutch to Taiwan, the VOC, or the Dutch East India Company, introduced various incentives, including free land, tax exemptions, and property rights to attract Chinese from the nearby Fujian province in mainland China to immigrate to Taiwan. The plantation of sugar and rice soon became lucrative business not only for the immigrants but also for the VOC, the Dutch company. In the process, the Dutch company also developed a lord vassal relationship with the Aborigines and gained control over the native population. This co-colonization strategy was a key difference between the Spanish and the Dutch in their colonization efforts in my native homeland of Taiwan. The general point to be related in the telling of this story is that at times Violent competition ensued amongst these different groups in their attempts to colonize the space, but that the influence that most shaped the eventual development of the island was not a conflict, but cooperation between Dutch colonizers and Chinese settlers. We must integrate this modus of colonization co-colonization, into Michael Pearson's influential distinction between the land-based territorial expansion of Asian states and the overseas expansion of states heavily reliant on trade for their income, as articulated circa 1991 in his essay entitled Merchants and States, as published on pages 41 through 116 within the academic anthology entitled The Political Economy of Merchant Empires, edited by James D. Tracy of Cambridge University. Without hard graft, the semi-wilderness could not be turned into fertile agricultural land, and the Dutch had neither the manpower nor the intensive agricultural technologies required. Migrants in search of land, mostly from Chinese Fujian, provided the answer. The Dutch advertised the available agricultural land in Fujian, where the need for land was felt most acutely, and offered those prepared to settle there protection and regularity in exchange for the payment of taxes. The difference between this way of colonizing new land and the way the Spanish and the English went about it is striking enough to merit that all historians must take his note. This period of co-colonization between the Dutch and the Chinese was successful so long as the interests of both parties were met. If the concept of co-colonization is one part of the reason why we need to understand the rich detail in which I have ever related history. A greater understanding of why Dutch rule on the island came as to an end is another. 
This is not the first time historians have asked it. Historians working in mine own native Taiwan have studied the early history of the island in great detail. But mine own command, not only of a range of languages, but of unique access to both published documents and unpublished archival materials rated from across both Europe and Asia via the my uniquely privileged position when liaising under attachment to Michael Aquino as the United States Department of Defense research librarian that I was allowed myself to shed new light on this question. The extent of foreign source references in German, Chinese, and other languages I assessed thereby but reflect the extensive research I undertook in substantiating my deconstruction of reactionary revisionist military theory. Towards the end of the century, the Voxes, or the VOCs, the Dutch company's tax increase, lost the support of the Chinese immigrants, ultimately leading to rebellions from many Chinese settlers and to the Dutch defeat by Zheng Chenggong, the Ming dynastic loyalist of great military prowess and power. The relationship between the Dutch and the Aboriginal communities who worked together against the Chinese settlers, the decline in trade during the years of civil war on the Chinese mainland surrounding the fall of the Ming and the establishment of the Qing dynasty, and the effect of block of trade issued by the Ming loyalist and powerful sea merchant Zheng Chenggong, alias Ko Jinga are all part of the explanation for the decline and fall of Dutch Formosa, climaxing in Kojinga, wresting control of Fort Zealandia from the Dutch, the only time any indigenous population in all recorded history has ever done so from any European power. That made Taiwan a lost colony. And so, I will relate to you now the untold story of island China's first great victory over the West. This is something, of course, no one wants you to know. How a Chinese pirate general defeated European colonialists and won Taiwan during the 17th century. Now, during the 17th century, Holland created the world's most dynamic colonial empire, outcompeting the British and capturing Spanish and Portuguese colonies. Yet, in the Sino Dutch War, Europe's first war with China, or at least with Chinese, the Dutch met their match in a colorful Chinese warlord named Kojinga, part samurai and part pirate. He led his generals to victory over the Dutch and captured one of their largest and wealthiest colonies, Taiwan. How did he do it? Examining the strengths and weaknesses of European and Chinese military techniques during the period, I myself long ago acquired the balanced, true perspective on long-held assumptions about Western power, Chinese might, and the very nature of war itself. It has doctrinarily been asserted that Europeans of the era possessed more advanced science, technology, and political structures than their Eastern counterparts. But historians aside myself have recently been forced by realities I myself have exposed to contest this view. Finally realizing, as they have per force of facts, that many parts of Asia developed on pace with Europe until 1800. While the Dutch did indeed possess a technological edge, thanks to the Renaissance fort and the broadside sailing ship, that edge was neutralized by formidable Chinese military leadership. Thanks to a rich heritage of ancient war wisdom, Ming follower Kojinga and his generals outfoxed the Dutch at every turn. 
To relate the facts on several levels, I must convey at the same time a Ming transition into Qing, a transitional dynastic history from Ming to Qing, a Chinese maritime and naval history of the 17th century, and a global historical exposition about the relative places of Europe and Asia in world history. The Alden authors of China's dynastic histories realized that the root of good history liest in telling compelling stories. Those of us who study imperial China cannot help but recall Zima Qian's vivid account of the epic struggle between Zhang Yu and Liu Bang as recorded in the Shi Ji historical records, or the account of the Song emissary Qing Gui turning white when he beheld the armor and spheres of the Jin cavalry glittering in the sun as recorded in Song Shi, the history of the Song dynasty. But too oft nowadays academic historians seem to miss this fundamental lesson and dismiss narrative history as the province of popular historians. Yet major and even minor characters can be brought to life through capturing their personalities, motives, and interactions. They are not just names in a history book. The greatest strength for educators for this specific case study is probably how my larger exposition is supported by an engaging narrative that is frank in accessible prose, what makest it suitable for conveyance in high school or undergraduate university classes. For I am taking pains here to lay out large themes and histor well, historiographical controversies in clear, understandable language. Perhaps more importantly, the engaging narrative will hold students' interests. Out of Chinese and European sources, I have pulled not only support for my broader thesis, but also great stories, including the rise of the pirate-turned-Ming loyalist general Ko Jingan, political backstabbing and infighting among the leadership of both sides, the dangers of global travel and trade in the age of sail, and the vagaries of diplomacy and intercultural communication among a complicated multi-ethnic assemblage of Asians, Europeans, and Africans. It all starts in 1660, or rather climaxes then, when the supremely capable military leader born Zheng Chenggong was eyeing up Taiwan for himself. In prescience of Generalissimo Cheng Kai shek he himself needed a place to regroup his warriors as he was looking to destroy the newly founded Qing Dynasty, which had conquered mainland China, circa 1644. He ambushed two forts, Fort Zealandia and Fort Provincia. Fort Provincia fell straight away, but Fort Zealandia remained strong for nearly two years. However, disease and hunger plagued the Dutch military, and they were forced to surrender in 1662. As extensively cross-referenced via Chinese, Dutch, and English sources, the true history of victorious counter-imperialist warfare is personified in Zheng Zhenggong, a loyalist to the Emperor Ming, who failed to remove the Qing dynasty from its capital in Nanjing in 1659, but did defeat and remove the Dutch from Taiwan in 1662 under his nom de voir, or name of war, of Kojinga. Kojinga was able to incorporate new ideas and technologies. He was the son born of a Chinese pirate sire, Zheng Jilong, and a Japanese mother, known to history only by her singular name of Tagawa. But Kojinga himself, the Chinese military leader who 
defeated the Dutch on land and sea at Taiwan should not be introduced until after the listener learns of his powerful father, Zheng Jilong. Kojinga's father, Zheng Jilong, was the founder of the great Zheng family legacy on the Fujian coast. In 1625, Tuas Ti, who pushed the Dutch from their fort in the Penggu Islands in the Taiwan Strait, eastward to Taiwan itself, where the Dutch re-established their premises in swampy area farther from the center of their desired trade connections along the Chinese coast. In 1633, at Lao Liu Bay, Zheng's naval vessels defeated nine Dutch warships with super sampans, or war junks, as the Euros called them, that were deployed as fireboats, meaning he turned them into weapons of mass destruction by setting them aflame and charging them at the enemy ships without men aboard, only as directed missiles of flaming fury that crashed and set the Dutch vessels alight to force them to abandon their own ships. Zheng's unorthodox strategy of using these larger armed warships in this role, instead of the usual smaller watercraft, surprised the overconfident Dutch. Five surviving Dutch vessels fled to Taiwan. Delivered from his samurai mother's womb in the city of Nagasaki, circa 1624, the boy Zheng Chenggong, who was to become a, the man feared as Kojinga, was himself trained early on as a samurai warrior in Japan. When at but seven years of age, his father moved him to China, where he continued his schooling, latterly so as a Confucian scholar, eventually studying at Nanking University, whereupon he passed arduous stages of the imperial examinations in China. This complex background, including his difficult relationship with his larger-than-life father, challenged Kojinga to become a major force during the Ming-Qing transition period. When the Qing dynasty took over in 1644, his father surrendered, but the son continued resistance along the coast. Subsequently, the son was subsumed in the persona of Kojinga, who tried to restore the Ming Empire that had been defeated by the Manchu Emperor. Following initial successes and defeats, including the loss of his own capital of Nanjing to the Qing forces, he diverted his powerful army and naval forces to capture Taiwan from the Dutch in 1661. Like the nationalist Chinese forced to flee the mainland after the communists overran all China, he provided them the precedent. History is replete with stories of how natural phenomena, such as typhoons and storms, affected and helped determine military outcomes. As in Kojinga's first campaign in 1658 to take his Nanjing from the Manchu Qing. From 1658 to 1659, he assembled a large fleet, sailed to the north, and tried to recapture Nanjing, but was beaten back by Qing forces and by a typhoon which wrecked many boats and drowned many of his men. Kojinga's force included something like 150,000 troops on ships, the largest naval force put together in Chinese history up to that time. The force was devastated by storms en route to engagement and was forced to turn back. Kojinga's second campaign to take his Nanjing in 1659 is a fascinating study of early military successes followed by failure. 
Kojinga did not heed the advice of his leading field commanders. His decision-making process led to defeat in this second campaign against the Qing. During the following year, he was under increasing pressure from Qing forces, which pursued him down the coast. But the core of his life's narrative eventually goes to the breathtaking saga of Kojinga's subsequent campaign to take his Taiwan from the Dutch, including their fortress Zealandia near present-day Tainan, now a city on the island, the very island that used to have that name, which is Taiwan. You see, defeated by the new Manchu rulers, Kojinga, a Chinese general and a Ming dynastic loyalist, turned his attention to Sinophi, the island of Taiwan, meaning ethnically render it Chinese. Having myself discovered a number of original documents in my professional tenure as a Department of Defense Research Librarian, a military research librarian, I must emphasize, I am qualified to concentrate on Kojinga's successful 1661 invasion. In early 1661, he assembled some 400 boats and 25,000 men and crossed the Taiwan Strait to lay siege to the Dutch settlement at Anping, present-day Tainan. The result was a brutal campaign in which it cannot be overemphasized that Kojinga and Chinese leaders before he had studied and adopted Western military advances. Illuminatingly, this in turn casts all doubt on the reactionary misperception that Europe surged to global dominance after 1500 because Asian nations ignored its superior organization and technology. Because of information gleaned from a defector named He Bin, a translator who had provided him with maps of the fortress, Kojinga was able to enter the bay behind the fortress through a narrow channel and land his fleet outside the reach of the big Dutch cannons in the fortress. He attacked and took the smaller fort Provincia in today's Tainan, and thus cut off supplies both on land and sea. This started a siege that would last nine months. Like childbirth, Kojinga succeeded in taking the fortress and driving the remaining Dutch back to Batavia, currently Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, then the headquarters of the Dutch East Indies uh, Company, over the course of this bitterly contested nine-month siege. The Sino-Dutch War of 1661 through 1662 that resulted in the loss of the Dutch colony on Taiwan will be of great use for educators, their students and general listeners, if we treat the war as a case study to test competing explanations for the rise of the West to dominance in Asia, one of the largest and most controversial questions in the literature of world history. The contending positions on this question is between the malignly misnomered revisionists, factually and actually realists, who argue that the difference in technological political, economic, and social development between the West and Asians was minimal, indeed the Asians were far more advanced, before the Industrial Revolution, and the traditional explanation and its so-called counter-revisionists, factually and actually contrafactualist defenders, who hold that the rise of the West is attributable to the long historical development of unique and superior aspects of Western civilization. Read white supremacy into that. Hereby, I also test a more specific explanation, the military revolution theory, which holds that Westerners, even if not bearers of any superior civilization, enjoyed an advantage in military technology, organization, and discipline over other peoples. In other words, barbarians, in the Mongol sense, white Mongols. There are very polarizing discussions among military historical experts. Notably, one such, or primarily, 
is whether the European military worldwide colonization is really based upon military superiority over Asiatic, specifically Chinese, forces or not. The superiority is broken down into armaments technology, strategy, discipline, and tactical areas. The trois schools of thought are currently, and malintentionally, mistermed traditionalist and revisionist when they must be practically redesignated as reactionary and realist. I have ever been explicit about beginning in the realist camp whilst having arrived at a compromise position of sorts. The Dutch in the 17th century did indeed enjoy superiority in certain military technologies, specifically in ship construction and in the construction of fortifications per what must come to be recognized as the Renaissance fortress. These advantages, however, turned out to be marginal. In other areas, such as artillery, military organization, strategy, tactics, and discipline, Chinese forces were the equal of Dutch forces. Even in those areas that the Dutch enjoyed a technological advantage, the gap was not so great that these advantages could not be neutralized through adoption or strategic adaptation. Thus, the historical record reveals neither an insurmountable Western technological or cultural superiority nor a kind of equality that omits historical distinctiveness, but rather small differences that become more pronounced over time. Now, the contrafactualists are correct that the Dutch had a technological advantage over the Chinese in warfare. But the realists are right that it was a slight one, easily made up. Perhaps we have not a sudden great divergence occurring around 1800, but rather a small and accelerating divergence beginning in the 16th century. This position is unlikely to satisfy partisans of either camp, but is encouraging to those of us who find ourselves in this world walking tightrope between Eurocentrism and Europhobia, to borrow from the professor of economics and of history at Harvard University, David Saul Landis, who first is credited with coining the term Europhobia, which I think is total bullshit, and he just said he made it up when uh, the word's been around for fucking ever, but hey, if he wants to claim that, all right. As a singular case study, my work on record tonight won't settle the problem of how to account for the rise of the West, but perhaps it will inspire similar attempts at what elsewhere has been called global microhistory, which focuses on the stories of specific individuals and events more than abstract theoretical explanations of world history. The main thesis here from being that, contrary to conventional wisdom, or rather the lack thereof, Kojinga was able to defeat the Dutch settlement of Fort Zeelandia in present-day Tainan on, well, throughout 1661 through 1662 due to a relative equal level of gun technology, both big guns and smaller handguns, and superior military tactics and strategy. So we can compare Chinese 17th century military capabilities with those of the Dutch most decisively on four levels. The factual conclusions therefrom being that, firstly, the technology in guns was about equal, but that secondly, the military discipline of the Chinese was superior to that of the Dutch, whose own discipline was vaunted in Europe at the time. Cannon technology was about equal, yet most pointedly, Kojinga's sword and bow armed troops caused Dutch musketeers to break ranks and flee the battlefield in Taiwan Harbor. Thirdly, as for ships, 
the ability of the Dutch ships to sail to windward gave us them an edge over Chinese. The Dutch ships, with their complex spider web of sails and lines, could sail into strong winds, which was impossible for the Chinese with their sampans, or so-called junks. Yet still, a critical naval battle occurred in 1661 in Taiwan Harbor between five heavily armed Dutch warships against dozens of Kojinga's sampan warships or super junks. The large Dutch flagship Kukerken was sunk. Another Dutch warship grounded and a third was abandoned. But two vessels escaped. Dutch losses included 131 sailors killed or captured. Fourth, although the Chinese outnumbered the Dutch by a large margin, the Renaissance fortress configuration with cornered battlements allowed the Dutch to hold out for many months before surrendering. That was long enough for Kojinga to study and absorb the technology of the Renaissance fort and incorporate it into his own counter strategy. Each side had elements of relative strength and the elements were not static in terms of relative advantage. Thusly, it became as evident that during the 17th century China was fairly similar to Europe in terms of military capabilities. The Dutch maintained an advantage in terms of having a highly defensible fortress with Renaissance fort technology and the ability of their ships loaded with heavy guns to maneuver fast in deep water with sail rigging that enabled them to sail into the wind. However, these advantages were not sufficient to make us a difference in the conflict, particularly due to some basic errors made by the Dutch governor of Taiwan, Frederick Coye, the Swedish commander of the Dutch fort. In particular, Coye had not taken advantage of opportunities to build bridges and alliances both with the Dutch East India Company and with the Qing dynastic Manchu rulers who came as to power in China after 1644. He just kind of ignored the politics on the mainland. Koyet was, as I said, actually a Swedish nobleman in Dutch service. He was a proud and principled man and had his differences with officials in Batavia, as well as with key commanders of the fleet that was sent to break Kojinga's blockade, which lasted from April of 1661 to February of 1662. Miraculously, the Dutch were able to send word of the siege to Batavia, in one of the major daring feats of the episode, a small yacht named Maria, under Captain Cornelius Clausen, was able to sail against the prevailing monsoon winds and make us it to the Dutch East India Company VOC headquarters in seven weeks. A relief fleet under Commander Jacob Cow surname spelled C-A-U-W, was sent and had a speedy journey back to Taiwan. But the counterattack against Kojinga failed, partially due to a typhoon and partially due to disagreements between Kao and Koye. And what are students of history to make us of the accounts of Dutch participants like Frederick Koye and Jacob Kao? who hated each other, competed for favor with officials in Batavia, and tailored their accounts to present their conduct in the best possible light. 
As the siege continued, supplies in the fort began to run out, whilst Kojinga was also aided by another defector, Hans Ravis, a German sergeant who had been in Dutch service and who loved rice wine, or sake, which Kojinga gave his Tim plenty of. Radis gave his Kojinga inside information on the defense of the fortress. And so it fell. That's what brings us to free passage for its commander and civilian governor. The situation eventually prompted negotiations in which Governor Commander Koye, by the way, that's a title kind of like President General. I mean, this guy covers both civilian and military responsibilities because he's working for a fucking company, as opposed to a nation state, was able to ensure free passage for himself and other Dutch at the fortress. In total, some 630 Dutch and 9,000... Chinese combatants were killed, in addition to several thousand aboriginals fighting on the side of the Dutch. In addition, Kojinga killed several hundred Dutch missionaries and teachers in surrounding villages. However, the story doesn't end with the fall of Zealandia. The fighting continued across a broad front from 1662 through 1668. And while the realist historical thesis proves that technology, strategy and tactics, appropriate alliances, and even the weather helped to determine the battle's outcome, two other factors did make it a more significant difference in the conflict round Zealandia, distance and overwhelming force. Taiwan was a long distance from Batavia, several weeks of sailing, and very close to the Chinese coast. Kojinga could thus bring in large numbers of troops, reinforcements, and ships within a short period of time, whilst the Dutch had to travel large distances. My accounting could also contribute to the discussion of the use of historical sources and evidence, as I have always been candid in presenting the problems and limits of the available sources. Exemplae Gratiae, I explicitly come down on one side of the argument regarding Kojinga's loyalty to the Ming Dynasty that could be profitably debated, because in all finality, the greatest victory by quote-unquote China over the West implies island China. Ethnically non-Chinese, the more Turkic Caucasoid Qing dynasty nominally allied with the Dutch against Kojinga, though apparently the horse-riding Manchus were not of much use to the Dutch in a war that depended largely on naval power. It's kind of like bringing the Mongols in to fight the navy. So at that point, 1661 through 1662, it could be cynically propagandized that Kojinga was not representing China at all, but his own personal fiefdom along the coast. He kept the Ming Dynasty resurrectionist dream alive in order to maintain a following among the adherents of the defeated dynasty. That, again, is what a cynic would argue, I do not. What cannot be denied is that Kojinga was a renegade on the run from Manchu Beijing. In fact, Qing rulers were trying very hard to eradicate his strongholds along the coast, and that is why he took refuge across the Taiwan Strait, trying to get away from mainland China. He was the first ethno-Sinitic 
Han Chinese to identify as Taiwan. This is my home. This is where I stand or die. Thus it was Taiwan that defeated the wealthiest empire in the world alone and by itself. But twas a victory for the colored peoples of the world. Not just China. The victory of Kojinga did not last long histochronometrically, alas, meaning that comparatively speaking, it was brief. The Generalissimo, born Jing Chenggong, died relatively shortly thereafter from malaria. Kojinga and his heirs, his heirs, his successors in his own dynasty controlled Taiwan until 1683, when the Qing forces of the Manchu dynasty came as to attack the island upon learning of his passing that year, and they were defeated. His dynasty, his family, was defeated by a former Zheng family commander who had once worked for them. A traitor named Xi Lang, who had defected to support the foreign Qing emperor. After this, the island of Taiwan became as part of the Chinese empire under the Qing. Consequently, the Qing conquest of Taiwan in 1683 is arguably as important to contemporary communist Chinese claims to my Taiwan as Kojinga's victory over the Dutch is to all peoples of color the world over. Confer early rumors that communist mainland China's first aircraft carrier would be named the Xilong after the Qing general who successfully seized Taiwan from Kojinga's successors. Another fruitful discussion might interrogate mine own characterization of the war as island China's first great victory over the West. I must stress that my account is not one of a clash of civilizations, and my narrative illuminates the complexity of the politics and strategy involved in the war, as well as the diversity of the players involved. See, the West here is represented by the Dutch East India Company, whose forces included other non-Dutch Westerners, missionaries, traders, professional soldiers, Chinese, and indigenous Taiwanese allies. The island Chinese side, likewise, is represented by Kojinga, a half-Japanese pirate and trader loyal to the Ming, whose own father sided with the Qing enemy of the Ming. He's not a traitor, he's a trader, a pirate trader, meaning he did trade by plunder in the tradition of the conquistadors. His father did the same, and yet his father surrendered, and he did not. The role of the Qing, the foreign dynasty that had overtaken China, especially, seems to complicate the picture of the war as one between China and the West. Rather, it's an independent Taiwan fighting against both China and the West, and therefore, it's the first Formosan war against the world. And black Africans served on both sides of the war. So, in light of my own evidence, does Kojinga's victory represent a great victory of island China over the West, or an even more complicated story of competition to capture the gains from trade in an early modern world that does not necessarily conform to modern ethnic and national political boundaries? It is testament to the detailed evidence I present that it can be used to question the mission statement of my own work. 
I look forward to a future wherein my transmissions be taken advantage of in the teaching of world history and Asian historical courses. But that brings us back to the loss of Taiwan. There exists an evocative 17th century painting by Andries Beckman. His first name is spelled A-N-D-R-I-E-S and his surname is spelled B-E-C-M-A-N. Beckman. Andries Beckman. And he's an artist who produced this transcendent painting of the Dutch fort at Batavia, the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company. After the loss of Taiwan, Governor Commander Frederick Coyette returned to Batavia, where he was tried for treason and almost executed. Indeed, Coyet was executed symbolically in front of the very fort rendered on canvas by Andries Beckman for losing the profitable colony of Taiwan to Kojinga and thereafter banned to a faraway island. But after 10 years, he was released, returned to the Netherlands and wrote a stinging rebuke of his superiors in Batavia titled Te veux ver luchte formosa which translates as the neglected Formosa or the neglected beautiful isle which became as the bestseller that supported his retirement. In 1663 Dutch Admiral Balthazar Bort coordinated with the Qing Dynasty fleet and defeated Kojinga's remaining forces on Kinmen, which is also named Kuimoi, as in the famous Kuimoi and Matsu crisis that almost triggered a Third World War in the Taiwan Strait. That's a county of my Nationalist Republic of Blue China on Taiwan, located in the Black Strait of Taiwan between the Isle of Formosa and mainland China. In 1666, the Dutch had built up a fortress in the northern port city of Keelung and, with only 300 defenders, fended off an attack by some 40 battle sampans, or war junks, and 3,000 3, Kojinga troops. Kojinga himself had, of course, died in 1663, three years before that time. And the very year that the Dutch admiral coordinated with the Qing to conquer his homeland. But his successors held out until 1683, when they were defeated in the Battle of Pengu by Qing Admiral Xi Long, the traitor from their own family. Exploring this period when the military balance between Europe and China was closer than at any other point in modern history reassesses an important chapter in world history and offers valuable and surprising lessons for contemporary times. Most interesting is the fact that the Qing Dynasty, following the Taiwan campaigns of the late 1600s, was an era of 160 years of peace in China itself on the mainland, requiring very little in the way of military advancement. Meanwhile, Europe was embroiled in nearly constant warfare, improving its military capabilities decade by decade. Thus, the Chinese were to be at a distinct military disadvantage when the Opium Wars began in 1839, and the century of humiliation for China was by that time a faillite accompli with respect to relative military advantage. But inland, the Russian Cossacks were sharply defeated by Qing Chinese in the Amur Valley in 1654, 1658, and again 
in years of warfare from 1685 through to 1689. The year 1683, during that period of war in the north, where the Russians were defeated in Russo-Chinese or Sino-Russian conflict, amidst that conflict in the north, the 1,683rd year was struck on the Christian calendar when Taiwan became as part of the Chinese Empire by force majeure, or rule of force. Taiwan was now in possession of the foreign Qing dynastic empire. They were unsure what to do with the island and were tempted to abandon it as a worthless territory. These are fucking horsemen. Goddamn nomads, for God's sake. They ended up keeping it and making it a part of the Chinese Empire, just so no one else could have it. Chinese people were banned from migrating from the Chinese mainland. But during this time, there was a mass famine and poverty in the Chinese Empire, with the foreign rule being a bunch of ignorant fucking nomads who knew nothing about agricultural farming and the feeding of an empire. So despite the law, many people from nearby Fujian province on mainland China fled across the Black Strait to Taiwan in search of better lives, and Taiwan became ever more Chinese, Sinified in culture and ethnicity. The Europeans were so intimidated by the Japanese tendency for disproportionate retaliation that they carefully abstained from attacking even unarmed Japanese merchant ships far from home. So the Japanese ruled the high seas. On the occasion where some Portuguese killed a few Japanese sailors, the shogun captured and burned a great Portuguese merchant ship and its cargo at the time, in the year 1610, worth more than the entire capital of the Dutch East India Company, Batavia, on the Isle of Java, in the largest of the Spice Islands, in the largest archipelago on Earth. Europeans were simply too weak to engage in territorial conquests in South Asia until after the Mughal Empire began to break up in the 1700s. But there were occasional collisions with the Mughals. One of the most significant saw the East India Company attempt to force Mughals to rescind an increase in customs duties in 1686. Over the next four years, the Mughals succeeded in imposing a crushing defeat on the English and in driving them out of their settlements. The company was forced to petition for forgiveness as most humble and repentant servants of the emperor. This salutary experience meant that as late as the 17 fucking 20s, when the empire was in terminal decline thanks to chronic secession struggles and uprisings, the Mughal Empire of the Mongols imposed over India, the East India Company was still wary of Mughal military might. Despite their terrestrial orientation, Asian powers accomplished some feats of naval prowess at least equal to their European counterparts. The series of Chinese gun-armed naval expeditions to the Indian Ocean during 1405 through 1433 reached as far as East Africa at the least involving up to 26,000 men in a single fleet, far greater than the Portuguese, Dutch, or English managed for centuries thereafter. On this basis, Dost, the Warfare at Sea chronicler, Jean Gleet maintained that the Ming emperors possessed all the necessary preconditions to develop a maritime empire in Asia 
and even in America and Europe. Had the Chinese wanted, they could have easily conquered the world. Earlier, the Chinese naval battle of Lake Poyang in 1363 involved total forces of half a million men. The Japanese invasion of Korea in the 1590s began with ferrying an army of 160,000 samurai marines across the sea. Even the Ottoman force of 10,000 Janissaries, or foreign child soldiers, raised as Muslim warriors and sailors that sailed to western India in 1538, was the largest force afloat in the Indian Ocean since the Chinese fleets of the previous century, and once again was far larger than any European waterborne force in the region until almost 200 years years later. There were also notable non-Western innovations in naval technology. The Koreans used armor-plated cannon-armed ships as early as the 16th century, the first ironclads long before the American Civil War between the states which saw the West first deploy ironclads afloat. In sum, not only did Europeans have no monopoly in the maritime projection of force, but in some ways the most impressive feats of amphibious warfare in this era were accomplished by Asians. Now, this brings us to the historical Asian conquest of Europe. The final indication of how misleading the military revolution thesis is in understanding relations between the West and the rest. That's a term that the whites often use. And people of color use the term the West and the rest of us. Whereas the people who be white and Northwestern use the term we be the West and they be the rest. Well, the greatest misconception concerns the Ottoman Empire. For at the same time that Europeans were conquering parts of Asia, Asians were conquering much larger and more significant parts of Europe. Once again, reflecting Eurocentric biases in both the social sciences and history, the significance of this fact is all too oft seriously underappreciated. The Ottoman Empire represents a major anomaly for the military revolution literature, which is all shit anyway, as you must know by now. If you don't get it by now, you never will. As John Will Martin so observed, circa 1995, via his essay entitled The Military Revolution, subtitled Origins and First Tests Abroad, as recorded via V pages 299 through 333 in the aforecited collection titled The Military Revolution Debate. He says, The military revolution is generally understood as the product of a Europe to which the Ottomans were external. This omission is particularly striking given that they were a non-European power engaged in major warfare with European great powers for centuries and long posed an existential threat to many Christian polities. Given this prolonged, sustained, and high-intensity warfare, one might have thought that there was no better place to look for early modern military innovation and a distinctively Western style of warfare than in the campaigns waged against the Ottomans. In the European context, the Ottomans have been referred to as the superpower of the early modern era. They were the Islamized Soviet Union of their day. 
the foundation for the Klingon culture of Star Trek. Yet, despite being judged as too backward to fit the modernizing military revolution template, the Ottomans did not seem to suffer any loss of inherent competitiveness against Western forces. For all the explosive growth in the territory under the sway of Western European powers in the 16th and 17th centuries, the Balkans and North Africa saw mainly European defeats at the hands of Ottoman and other Islamic opponents. In the period 1650 through 1750, a time span of a hundred fucking years, Europeans were progressively expelled by Muslim opponents from East Africa, the Middle East, and North Africa. It seems that the Ottomans anticipated the military revolution in several important respects. From the early 1500s, they had a much more advanced and professional system of logistics, administration, and finance than did European polities. As a result, they were able to deploy and sustain much larger permanent armies, said to be the primary marker of the modern fiscal military state, than even the most powerful Christian rulers. They deployed modern artillery and were leaders in siege warfare, whether it was against the last remnants of the Byzantine Empire in 1453 or the new Trace Italien fortifications of the Habsburgs and their monarchic empire. The sword and buckler of Christendom itself. Which brings us to putting this in some perspective. When it comes to a particular day in which the technology that led to those Renaissance forts became available to the West, those Renaissance forts were like nuclear submarines, the apex of the technology of their time. They were the culmination of everything Europe had outside of its nautical technology to maintain dominance wherever the Europeans were able to establish them. Being defeated in that sense only once by my people, the Taiwanese, even while my people were fending off the might of mainland China. Where'd that technology come from? Renaissance is simply rebirth. It was the knowledge of the ancients. And that knowledge happened to become available to the West the European West, or more geographically, Western Europe, when fell Byzantium. Byzantium fell in the year 1453 if I remember correctly. Sometimes, with everything that I'm juggling in my mind, I oftentimes forget. Matter of fact, let's look it up. This is a poignant subject for me, and it's one that's close to my heart. One that needs explaining as the culmination of a change in your world of which you know us nothing of. So, fall of Byzantium. It was May 29th of 1453. The culmination of a 53-day siege, which had begun on April 6th that year. The reason that this is so important in so many ways beyond description is that twas at that time that we had uh, 
Well, well, let's see. The Greeks, as they were known, for it was known as the Greek Rome, the second Rome. It was the fall of that Rome which had converted to Christianity under Constantine himself. Hence the name, Constantinople. In the ancient liturgical Slavonic, Skarlion Golat, or Meno Caesar's city. And the fall is a memorial day and, in a sense, a celebration because it's considered by historians to be the end of the Middle Ages and, ergo, the beginning of the Renaissance. On that uh, date, the 29th of May, in the 1453rd year of our Lord, the entire world changed for Europe. There was no such thing as Europe at that time. The closest concept you had to Europe was Christendom. And the day that the city-state of Skarlingrad Byzantium, the Meno Caesar city's city of Constantine, fell to Oz, the Osmantine or Ottoman Empire of medievalist Islam, aftermath a siege of nine twelve months, the fall of Tsar Luingrad prompted the flight of the Byzantine, or Greek scholars, en masse from the first capital of Christendom that had long served humanity as the second Roma, or Rome. This scattering encouraged studies of Grecian culture outside the Byzantine Orthodox Christian Empire and began a revival of learning based on classical Greek sources which ignited the Renaissance. All or much of what inspired Leonardo da Vinci, sourced from two major sources, the Greek scholars of Byzantium who brought forth the works of ancient mechanisms or blueprints, and the Chinese of his day who had sailed to Europe at the time of Jing He when China ruled the seas. This sino grecian hybridization is what enabled the Europeans to see the light and emerge from centuries of darkness. One of the reasons Byzantium fell was the deployment of artillery in the most modern sense of massed batteries by the Islamo-Medievalist Turks who had so obviously anticipated the revolution in military affairs which the Western scholars deem is the sole proprietorship of, you know, Euro-American culture in the West. Now, in terms of the man who commanded those batteries of artillery that brought brought about the fall of Byzantium, The man who commanded those batteries was a Lord Crusader of the First Reich. He was one of those Janissaries, a hostage, never converted to Islam as your average Janissary, but a true diplomatic hostage from the First Reich of the Holy Roman Empire of Greater Germany, Grossgermania. 
and his Romanian name was Vladislav Sepish. The Turks trained him in the ways of modern war, and the fall of Byzantium was his chance to escape. He did so by turning his entire battery around to face his overlords and slaughtered much of the immediate Muslim command in his vicinity with a salvo that destroyed their command tent. Thus it was that the one Lord Crusader of Das Erstes Reich, the First Realm, who survived the fall of the First Christendom, to inspire modern Europe, was but 22 years of age. The Voye Voidien, the Slav Latin European equivalent of the Japanese Shogun, it asked supreme military commander at the national level, Vladislavas, which transliterates as celebrated ruler, or rules, he who rules famously, the third Bazarab, the princely Generalissimo Vladislav III of the House of Bazarab, signed by his scribes as the Trakoguvie, uh, Anglo corrupted as Dracula but more properly the son of the dragon. Known to the world as Tsar Shepeshku Kazikli or the Caesar Sepish the Impaler, feared crusader against Dwar al-Islam or the House of Submission, and devout Christian ruler of the Khanate of Valachiorum Partium. Transalpinarum, the combined principalities of Wallachia and Transylvania, formerly subjected under the Golden Horde, and proposed deliverer of Tsarluingrad, or the men of Caesar's city, and the man who would be emperor of Novi Byzantium, a new Constantinopolis, the first modern hero of all Christendom the cartographic precursor of what we know today as Europe, both East and West. Born to Vlad II, the second ruler by way of lineage called Ditrakul, or the Dragon, a knighted title, who served as a noble knight invested of the Hunnish court, second of his own bloodline summoned to the imperial court of Nuremberg, for there to be inducted into the Ditrakonian or the Draconian Order, by decree of Daj Helige Romisch Deutscher Kaiser, the Holy Roman German Caesar, Sigismundus of Luxembourg, uh, and, of course, thereafter posted Supreme Military Commander of the Hungarian Principality of Transylvania, invested with the Valokia Romani Voj Vojdianship, or the shogunacy of Romania Wallachia, before assassination of both he and his firstborn, Mircea. Now brought into this world by the princess Snierna of Moldaviani in the year of our Lord 1431 in the Transylvanian citadel of Shigiswara, and he himself sworn to hereditary knighthood in Der's Reichs are the realm's most Catholic Draken Ordnung, are the Order of the Dragon, and honored by the folk of Servia as Secula Bond de Trakogovich, regarded in all the Germanies and all the Russias as Tsar Grozny Nos Ladislaus, or Caesar Vladislav the Terrible, and hated in Turkeskia land, or Turkey, as Kazi Glube or the Impaler Prince, in mortal life proclaimed by Pope Pius II, who ascended unto infallibility in 1458, as the athlete of the risen Christos, it bearing remembrance that this was because Dracula was deemed the hope for all of Europe being trained in the Turkish way of modern warfare 
he was the only man who knew how to operate, or rather command, massed artillery, and transport it in the manner the Turks had taught him. Therefore the Pope said he was the athlete of Christ, for hearkening the herald to crusade against the Mohammedan yoke of Osmania, or the Ottoman Empire in the name of Desiris des Reich, des Helesians Romischens Reiches Deutscher, the first Reich of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, which approached a thousand years of reign and devolved only by the first global war, the Napoleonic conflict, Dracula being arch-nemesis of Al-Fatih Sultan Murad II, Mohammed Sani, the Sultan Murad Mohammed II conqueror, who deemed Dracula a traitor to Islam. The Ottoman proclaimed Lord of the Romans. In objective of their intended conquest of all Europe, Yet Dracula himself sung of in ballad as the Dracagul Viode, the Grosh Terror Tactic Berserker, or Generalissimo Dracula, the Great Berserker Terrorist, into his undeath. He was renumerated as Vlad the Fourth, the fourth ruler on excommunication from the Greco Orthodox Pravoslav Reich Church of the late Constantinople, by one of his own seven brothers, this being Vlad the Monk of the same legitimate dynasty of Dithrakogul Vieste, thereby to remove him one step in heritage from the saintly common father of the seven Dithrakogulvies, or the seven Draculas, his other brothers. Remembered as the eternally loving husband of the Princess Ilona, Gilles Gallier of the Magyar realm, who succored him through over a decade of fortress imprisonment by her very own brother, Kirali Hunyadi, or John Hunyadi, as he's known in Hungary, the proper name thereof being Magyarozag. And, of course, he was the, noben, the noblemanly sire of Vlad the Fifth Dracula, Jepulshku, or Minor Impaler Vlad Dracula the Fifth, acknowledged of the family, the Thracio. And finally, unhailed as Nosferatu Rex, the Vampire King, or the Vianfiori, by Romanian history, or meta-history, myth if you will, upon his battlefield assassination because he had been excommunicated from the Byzantine church upon his seeking supply and finances from the Church of Rome through his knightly allegiance to the First Reich of the German Empire. And thereupon his battlefield assassination, death, and per Romanian folklore, resurrection, to be released from his consecutive sentiency and cursed blood rain only on absolution. And while the Western mind was misled much earlier by the monumentally successful publication of Bram Stoker's Victorian Gothic novel, and Stoker himself, it must be remembered, reimagined the historical Dithrakogulvier as becoming the king of the thralled undead, the Nosferat, literarily, in disambiguation from literally, in pat consummate with Satan or Satan itself, whereas the Romanian peoples insist the historic Vladislaus Dithrakogulvier did indeed become Vampiore, but under heroically tragic circumstances, in stark contrast from the lurid literary conceits of Vlad Shepescu's latter-day Irish-descended British publicist Bram Stoker. The Thrall Lord was never defaced as Dong Fanged until a full 
477 years upon his turning. In the 1953rd year of the Christian era, via via film entitled Dracula in Istanbul, produced by the heathen Osmani, or the Muslims he had so terrorized. And the original Biela Lugosi, who was himself of the Balkans. If you observe all the films in which he portrays Dracula, there are no fangs. Now, in terms of the fall of Constantinople, this was the equivalent, if you will, in Europe. Aside from providing them a pan-European champion, one of the most important things to take from the fall is the fact that the Europeans were overrun with refugees. And yet these refugees became the lifeblood of European rebirth. It was the equivalent as if the Soviet Union had overrun the Western European area defended by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was the blow to the sense of balance in the world that the Europeans suffered at that time. It is no small wonder they were desperate for a hero, and it is no small wonder that envious and jealous peoples then began to speak behind Dracula's back. And that's when, in paintings of the crucifixion of the Christ, you will find that they painted in Vlad Dracula to make it look as if he were there persecuting his god. This is probably something most Americans are not even aware of, but a propaganda a propaganda campaign was launched against Dracula during his lifetime. The end result, of course, was that he was betrayed by many around him, and this ultimately rendered him vulnerable to assassination. A tragic reality of the hero, as mentioned by Peter Moon, was suffered similarly by George S. Patton. Now, comparable socioeconomic and cultural parallels of Western revitalization via the Eastern debacle would be found in scenario of a far more successful, it as catastrophic, San Juichi Sensemi, or 311 terror attack against the Fukushima Daiichi, or Big One cluster of nuclear power plant facilities, on site, the 7,000 islands of the greater Japanese Empire. If Fukushima Daiichi had truly gone into full meltdown, all of the reactors, and Japan had to be evacuated, uh, because that uncontrollable meltdown would prompt consequent mass migration and resettlement. Bear in mind that it's easy as hell for anyone to get from Japan to North America simply by using a fiberglass bathtub because this is exactly what people have done in the past in a challenge to see how fast they could reach America using the Kurashiwa or the Black Current, the uh, Japanese current which is of course connecting the thermocline of the atmosphere as well as the warm current of the seas which travels in only one direction, the Japan current, from Japan to the United States. There's no way that Americans could pull the same trick as Japanese because the Japanese just take their fiberglass bathtubs and jump into the sea and ride the current. And they get to the United States within days. Depending on potential storms that might impede them along the way, people who have tried without sail using skiffs, reached America within weeks. You would have had, in the event of a true irradiation of the home islands of Japan, at least, well, you would have had over 40 million refugee boat people landing on the west coast of Canada and the United States 
that would have revitalized American society. There would have been nothing but good that would have come of a mass influx of Japanese genetics into North America. So that would be what Western Europe experienced with the fall of Byzantium. A combination of the existential catastrophe on scale corresponded to what would have transpired worldwide in the 20th century had NATO military, militarily collapsed and the godless Soviet Union overrun all Western Europe and combined with the influx of a mass migration of quality intelligence and skills into an otherwise stagnant and degenerate culture. That was what happened with the fall of Byzantium. That and the birth of Dracula from being a mere mortal into immortal legend. And as for the Ottoman Empire itself, aftermath that conquest, rather than any sign of inevitable decline, Ottoman reverses in the, the 1690s more likely reflect the impact of diplomacy as the Habsburgs, Venice, Poland, and the Russian Empire waged an unusually coordinated campaign associated with the Sacred League Alliance while the Ottomans were without their vassals, the Crimean Tartars. Much is made of the Ottoman defeat before the walls of Vienna in 1683. However, and bear in mind, that was ongoing while the Qing dynastic dominated mainland Chinese invaded my native Taiwan. And as the Chinese overtook my home island and the Austrians defeated the Muslim Turks in that 1,683rd year of our Lord, which people do remember. As a matter of fact, that's how crescents became a European thing. To celebrate their defeat of the Muslims, they made baked goods in the shape of crescents. However, even as far back as 1995, via via my off-site at Westview Press Collection, entitled The Military Revolution Debate, into which an essay entitled In Defense of the Military Revolution was anthologized, its writer, Geoff Parker, attested, It must be remembered that it was the Turks at the gates of Vienna and not the Europeans at the gates of Istanbul. So that which fell to the Turks has never yet been liberated. It could have been done in Dracula's time had he not been assassinated, just as Georges Patton could have liberated Eastern Europe had he not been assassinated. And through it all, the Ottomans managed to inflict serious defeats on the Russians and Habsburgs in 1711 and 1737 through 1739. Although they were outclassed after this, unlike the Spanish, Portuguese, French, Swedes, Poles, Dutch, and Holy Roman Empire of the First Reich, the Ottomans remained unconquered and held on to most of their territory into the late 19th century when it took the very same cataclysm of the First World War that wrought the collapse of the European dynasties to bring about their end. So, in conclusion regarding that period of history in which Taiwan defeated China and the West combined, we find ourselves entering the last two hours of transmission. The military revolution thesis 
continues to exercise a stronghold on key international relations and social science precepts, especially in relation to the emergence and triumph of the sovereign state, and how Europe managed to dominate the rest of the world. Despite this prominence, the thesis is poorly supported by any evidence, due in large part to the dissimilarities in how Europeans conducted wars at home and abroad. The excessive focus on Europe undermines key casual claims about the relationship between technological and institutional change, as well as obscuring theoretical insights from other regions. Reading history through the lens of current outcomes has exaggerated the importance of Western states at the expense of non-Western powers. Events like the Ottoman conquest of Southeast Europe and North Africa, the Mughal conquest of most of the Indian subcontinent, and the Manchu conquest of China are seen as fleeting and unrepresentative historical curios whilst relatively brief periods of success like those of the Dutch and Swedes are seen as being of epochal and enduring importance. Quantitative international relations works that are based on explicitly Eurocentric data sets, such as the correlates of war and great power wars uh, 1495 through 1815, which I've cited as studies, have been shown to be profoundly misleading in the conclusions they suggest about international systems. How would or should we see the world differently through addressing the bias of Eurocentrism? A more scientific, less ethnocentric perspective, giving due weight to regions beyond Europe, would show Western dominance of the international system as atypical and thus makest it much less surprising that this dominance is now being challenged. A multipolar global civilizational order becometh the historical rule rather than the exception. Back in the Cold War frozen year of 1983, Jack Levy's University of Michigan study reasoned that because European great powers have supposedly dominated the globe for five centuries, most of our international relations knowledge and theory is derived from the European great power system. And in his words, and so the most valid lessons for the future presumably can be learned from this system. Well, following this anti-logic, if the initial premise of half a thousand years of global European domination is wrong, as I myself have now so conclusively proven, what does this say about all our existing scholarship and predictions? It's all shit. And on foundations of shit, everything you construct sinks into the sewer. It be paramount to stress that none of these problems is inherently a problem of international relations theory. In principle, the field could have just as much realist constructivist or even Marxist theory of African international politics, for example, as it does concerning the European international system. Most international relations scholars have simply chosen not to pursue this option. The call for broadening the questions that international relations scholars ask and the range of evidence considered to give us due weight to all regions of the world is consistent with almost all theoretical orientations, and in keeping with these theories, ambitions to explain international politics in general. The limits of the field are instead very much those of research, design, and concept formation. In principle, they are not difficult to solve, but in practice, they continue to endure. Despite critiques, the final point to emphasize per this subject is that historians and political scientists have much more in common than is often realized. Both fields are belatedly struggling to overcome an entrenched Eurocentrism. Political scientists have taken up general theories first developed by historians. The idea of a division of labor whereby historians provide us the detailed descriptive historical raw material for social scientists 
To turn into casual claims and general theory is a false and unhelpful dichotomy. Instead, scholars from these different fields are working in very similar enterprises, and so the potential for each to learn from and benefit from the other is much greater than is commonly assumed. Now, by 1811, Taiwan had become an established territory. The cities Taipei, Chiayi, and Xinjiu were now much more developed. Many people began building temples throughout the island, some of which are still visible today. The island remained largely lawless. Consequently, crime was widespread. This is why Taiwan is oftentimes known as Pirate's Cove, or Pirate's Island. Due to a wide migration from Fujian, the population at this time was over 2 million. Ethnic Chinese Han from Fujian started to marry Taiwanese Aborigines, and this became a very common practice. In fact, studies today have shown that most Taiwanese people have Aboriginal blood in their veins. Now, by 1859, during the second half of the 19th century, the island drew lots of attention from other powers from the West, and also the Japanese Empire, making it the center of attention and desire of many militarized powers all over again. Because of the placement of Taiwan, it's in a very good spot for, well, both for economic and strategic reasons. This is why the Dutch Christian missionaries arrived in 1859, and in late 1871, there was the first Japanese invasion. Later on in the century, when China and France were fighting over Vietnam, French soldiers arrived in Kilung and the Pengyu Islands and occupied them. Because of this, the Beijing Imperial Court, under the Qing Dynasty, which was still extant at that time, was forced to commission forts and a railway. It was during this time that Taiwan earned its status as a province. This is a very important event in Taiwan history, since before 1885, Taiwan had been acknowledged as a part of Fujian, and nothing unto itself. So, how did the Republic of Formosa come into being? In 1894, the Japanese and Chinese empires went to war. And although much of the fighting took place in northern China, the Japanese viewed Taiwan and the Pescadores Islands, now the Taiwanese territory known as Pingyu, as pivotal in the fight for oceanic supremacy. To the north, the Japanese routed the Chinese armies and defeated their fleet, and with no other option left to them, the Chinese agreed to meet for peace negotiations. During this meeting, all hostilities were suspended. But understanding the importance of Taiwan, the Japanese intentionally removed the area from the scope of the ceasefire. So while the negotiations took place, the Japanese Navy seized control of the Pescadores, which essentially blocked the Chinese from sending reinforcements to Taiwan. By taking control of the islands, the Japanese forced the hand of the Chinese, and in the Treaty of Shimonoseki, on the 17th of April in 1895, they agreed to the cession of Taiwan to the Japanese Empire, an island nearly as large as Japan itself. Japan consists, of course, of 7,000 islands, Taiwan of 100. But then the Republic of Formosa was formed. Upon hearing of the cessation, many Chinese people in Taiwan felt aggrieved that the Japanese would now govern them and decided to resist the transfer of power to Japan. And on the 23rd of May, which uh, is remarkably close to the fall of Byzantium date, in 1895, the Taiwanese declared independence, establishing what they called the Free and Democratic Republic of Formosa. 
Now, Ching Ching Sung, or excuse me, Tang, as in Tang Dynasty, Tang Ching Sung, the governor general of Taiwan, became as the fledgling nation's first president, whilst other notable former Chinese generals and diplomats led the army and started work on garnering international support and recognition for the republic. Unfortunately for the Republic, due to the cessation of the country to Japan and the signing of the peace treaty of Shimonoseki, Western governments felt that they could not recognize Formosa as a legitimate government. Some felt that the declaration was simply a smokescreen that would allow us the Chinese troops on the island to fight against an invasion without breaking the peace treaty. They also understood that should they be successful in their attempts to repel an invasion, the island would almost certainly return to Chinese power, and everybody else wanted Taiwan, so they didn't, they didn't want that. <laughs> so it wasn't just the lack of sympathy from Western powers that put paid to this short-lived republic. Under pressure from the Japanese, the Qing court sent an imperial order to Taipei, the capital of my home island, to demand that all troops return to the mainland and that the transfer of power take its place immediately. This is what led to the collapse of the Republic. On the day of Byzantium fall, the day that Byzantium fell, May 29th, but hundreds of years anon, on that same date of May 29th, in 1895, the Japanese landed near Keelung and started their campaign to seize control of island China. Soon after, Tong fled the Republic sailing to the mainland on a ship out of Don Shui. However, the island's people had been bolstered by Tong's propaganda and believed that their militia, along with Chinese troops still in place, could resist the Japanese. Liu Yongfu assumed leadership of the nation and led his campaign of resistance from the city of Tainan, where originally the Dutch fortress of Zealandia had stood. And these troops, helped by guerrilla activity, managed to hold out until the fall of Tainan on October 21st, the day after my own birthday, but obviously long before I was born. The Republic of Formosa had lasted only five months, most of which had been spent at war with the Japanese. With the collapse of the Republic came, well, half a hundred years of Japanese occupation. Half a century, which would end with the cessation by the Japanese of power to the Nationalist Republic of China for enabling their occupation of the mainland in the half decade following 1945. Although Taiwan is still sometimes referred to as Formosa and has been for centuries, it was only known as the Republic of Formosa for five short months and even then it wasn't officially recognized by any foreign governments, which is probably why so very few people even know of its existence. Now, in terms of the Japanese colonization, as a found colony, 1895 through 1945, although in practice till 1950, because the Japanese maintained presence there, while the nationalists Chinese relocated themselves onto island. The Japanese invasion of Taiwan would change Taiwan's history forever. Traveling around Taiwan, you can still see aspects of the Japanese reign in both the culture and the architecture. China's defeat in the Sino-Japanese War in 1894 meant that the Chinese Empire gave us up Taiwan to the Japanese for Japanization in the same sense that it was originally subject to Sinification. The Sinification acculturated the Aboriginal 
indigenous peoples of Taiwan under Chinese acculturation. The Japanization acculturated the Chinese into a Japanese cultural mindset. Now, initially, many Taiwanese people were not happy with this and resisted. Consequently, many died resisting the Japanese. Despite this, everyone immediately, and I mean very quickly, came to conclude that the Japanese were heaven sent. The Japanese made innumerable improvements to life in Taiwan. They tackled widespread disease. Taiwan being a tropical environment, they initiated mass vaccination and eliminated all diseases within a few short years. They expanded the railway network and built roads. They did, however, remain in control of all natural resources. And this aided and abetted the Japanese Empire immensely. During World War II, many Taiwanese people fought in the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy. In fact, almost all American air power that was destroyed in the Philippines was wiped out by Japanese aerial forces based in Taiwan, which is the equivalent of 20 modern nuclear supercarriers stitched together. And even though the overwhelming majority of all Japanese air power was based in Taiwan, the Americans were never able to systemically bomb it throughout World War II. You can look this fucking up yourself. There are metaphysical reasons for this. I've stated in the past the guardian divinity of Taiwan is Matsu, the sea goddess. The few American bombardment campaigns, about literally three of them, maybe half a dozen, if you extend recognition of some bombing raids that were never officially listed or writ into the book, so to speak. The aerial bombardment crews all claimed they saw a woman flying in the sky catching the bombs that they were dropping. Their physical description matching Matsu, the sea goddess, a guardian divinity of Taiwan. They were, of course, declared mentally disturbed they didn't have the term post-traumatic stress disorder in those days. They used terms like shell shock, battle fatigue. So these men were sworn to secrecy and um, basically doped up and institutionalized, at least for a time. Sent into recovery back home in the States. After that, Taiwan was never bombed again. So Japanese aerial forces were based there with immunity. Now, Tokyo, of course, for the sake of their alliance with the Republic of China, renounced the colonies at the end of proactive prosecution of hostilities. Actually, around 1952, in the Anglo-American-Japanese, the Allied-Japanese Peace Treaty, which of course does not include the former Soviet and now Russian empires. And during this historic moment in Taiwanese history, Taiwan became as part of the Nationalist Republic of China, or Blue China, on the mainland. Until, of course, the end of the Civil War thereupon. China took back control of Taiwan between 1945 to 1950, while the Japanese remained in China and Taiwan through that half decade. And the president at that time was Chiang Kai-shek. 
Now, it was deemed by many critics that he made some decisions that would impact badly on Taiwan history. The economy went down as it was poorly managed, and widespread corruption became uh, an endemic problem. The new regime then came into place and were conscious of the problems Taiwan was facing, and Taiwan took a turn for the better. China began to implement new policies that sought to improve the lives of many, especially those in the rural population, because under the Japanese Empire, Taiwan was still very much underdeveloped in the sense that it was largely agrarian. And the island soon began to prosper, and between 1950 and 1970, the population saw an enormous baby boom. Taiwan doubled in population in just 20 years to 14.6 million people. That's when you finally had the movement reestablish itself overseas, Formosa for the Formosans. In around 1970, many Taiwanese said that for more than 20 years by now, the United Nations has failed to resolve the China question. The irony being that China is not really at issue, for it is quite clear that who governs the 800 million people of China, the communists, the real issue is Formosa, or Taiwan, whose international legal status is yet to be settled, and, and actually was never really formed in any sense that's understood by the rest of the world. The 1951 Japanese Peace Treaty affirmed the colonial status of Formosa and kept its legal status undetermined. Japan renounced all her rights, title, and claim to Formosa, but the treaty never specified any beneficiary. The sovereignty of Formosa has not been transferred to either the Nationalist Republic of China or the People's Republic of China, by the way the Japanese or Americans interpret it. Shortly afterward, however, defeated in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 through 1895, China, of course, was originally ceding Formosa to Japan, but, you know, before that, to try and put this in some context, By 1970, of the 14 million inhabitants on Taiwan, 12 million were native Taiwanese who were hybrid Aboriginal and Han Chinese, whose ancestors had migrated there 400 years ago. And 2 million were Chinese who fled with Chiang Kai-shek onto the island to reestablish the nationalist government of Blue China, on island China circa 1949. During the 17th century, of course, the Portuguese, Spanish, the Dutch, the Chinese vied for control, and only in 1887 did the Qing government of China proclaim Taiwan a province of China, and it was shortly thereafter, when defeated by the Japanese, that they ceded Formosa to Japan for over half a hundred years, 55 altogether. And then the supreme commander of the Allied Command in the Pacific tried to take credit for authorizing the nationalist Chinese authorities to accept quote-unquote Japanese surrender of Formosa and undertake temporarily military occupation of the island as a trustee on behalf of the Allied powers. Now, the Americans claim that Taiwan, my homeland, is a renegade American territory along the lines of Puerto Rico if that had suddenly declared independence and went rogue. That's how the Americans feel about my native Taiwan. The Japanese feel it's still a part of Japan. The Chinese want to claim it. When Chiang Kai-shek was reestablishing nationalist China, on island China, atrocities, corruption, and maladministration by the Chinese occupational authorities finally culminated in the 228 incident, which was a rebellion after which some 20,000 Formosan leaders were massacred. 
in March of 1947 by Chinese occupation forces and reinforcements sent by Chiang Kai-shek. Those who survived this genocide either went abroad or underground to struggle for self-determination and independence, and thus began what was a very loose, disparate, worldwide Formosan independence movement in the 1970s. Bear in mind, bear in mind Chiang Kai-shek, when he established himself on island China, had to get rid of any resistance by potential communists or subversives. He had to make certain Taiwan was ideologically free of communism. And therefore, 20,000 Formosan intellectuals died. When the People's Republic of China under Mao Zedong was established in October of 1949, and Chiang Kai-shek truly re-established Formosa as the Nationalist Republic of China, with the remnants of his military and civilian personnel. Many people think that on the 1st of March of 1950, that when Chiang Kai-shek arbitrarily became self-proclaimed president of the Republic of China, and ergo the dictator of Formosa, that he had done so illegally and arbitrarily. By the way, he was still representing all of China in the United Nations. But there were those abroad who argued that the exiled nationalist Chinese regime did not represent the people of Formosa. The 85% majority of native Formosans were at that time allowed only a 3% token representation in the congressional bodies. 32 out of 1,448 in the National Assembly, which elects the president and vice president, or did so at that time in the 1970s, around the time that I had left Taiwan because of my parents removing me physically, bodily therefrom, to bring me to the United States. And there were about 17 out of 447 seats in the legislative yuan in charge of legislation and appropriation, and six native Formosans represented out of 74 seats in the control yuan empowered to censure and impeach and to approve certain key presidential appointments. So a legally, politically, and morally sound solution to Formosa's indeterminate status was deemed to be to hold a plebiscite on Taiwan under United Nations aegis so that the Formosan people could freely express their will and determine their future. So this was the Formosan independence idea, that there was only one China which should be seated at the United Nations and there is only one Formosa which should be free, independent, and admitted as a separate member of the United Nations. That was when you had the birth of the Democratic Party of Taiwan, the DDP, as it's known, under the President Tsai Ing-wen. And in terms of that party which rules Taiwan now, that's how it was born. And it was born of the survivors of that massacre of the liberal progressive intellectuals that Chiang Kai-shek simply could not afford to trust. The Democratic Progressive Party is a Taiwanese nationalist and center-left political party in Taiwan, and it controls both the Republic of China presidency and the unicameral legislative yuan. And it is the majority ruling party and the dominant party in the pan-green coalition as of the 2020th year in our Lord. Now, from 1975 onwards, Taiwan saw an economic boom. And from the 1980s onwards, it became one of the wealthiest nations on earth. People were buying electric rice cookers, scooters, cars, and other things previously seen only as luxuries. And that economic boom lasted until the financial crisis, which affected Asia, circa 1997. Since that crisis, Taiwan's economic growth has slowed, but has been in continuous steady growth, with never a downturn in terms of anything that 
bears recording. It is a progressive society introducing the national health insurance system and impressive social welfare programs. Taiwan's history has been turbulent, but in turn, this means that it has an incredibly unique culture. This is why you should definitely put a visit to Taiwan on your bucket list. It is a place like no other. Plus, it's a great place to study Mandarin Chinese. In fact, the only place you can fucking study it now, since the communist Chinese have dumbed it down, and they create what's called simplified Chinese, which is kind of like phone text English, like cell text English and shit. It, uh, it's they, uh, the only place you can learn classical Chinese with the actual uh, traditional iconography used for thousands of years is on Taiwan. And perhaps Taiwan should follow East Timor. On September 27th of 2002, the Democratic Republic of Timor-Lé, or East Timor, joined the United Nations to become its 191st member. Since then, two other nations have joined, Montenegro on June 28th of 2006 and South Sudan on July 14th of 2011, the year my mother was murdered. The combined total of the populations of those three nations is just more than half that of Taiwan's baseline 23.7 million peoples. East Timor has but 1.3 million, Montenegro has slightly more than half a fucking million, and South Sudan has 10.9 million. They are all members of the United Nations, yet much more populous Taiwan is denied membership. Of those three nation-states, East Timor, as a Southeast Asian nation, is of particular interest to Taiwan. The histories of both nations have been, well, they have many related and informative experiences, and the indigenous peoples of East Timor and those of Taiwan have common ancestral links in their Austronesian heritage. Both nations became as involved in world trade and politics during the era of global navigation, a time when European powers came as to Asia in search of the lucrative Spice Islands. The Portuguese landed in East Timor in the early 16th century. They did not find spices there, but found sandalwood, which had definite commodity value, and so they decided to stay. Portugal would colonize the eastern half of Timor Island and fight the Dutch over who would colonize its western half. Related Dutch colonies would ultimately become as the Dutch East Indies, present-day Indonesia. In 1702, Portuguese Timor became the official name of that colony. As for the Dutch, the Portuguese would eventually make us peace and get them to guarantee Portugal's half of the island in the Treaty of Lisbon in 1859. Taiwan, on the other hand, only got its name, Formosa from the Portuguese when the mid-16th century Portuguese trading ships from Macau passed by Taiwan on the way to Nagasaki. However, while Portugal never colonized Taiwan to extent, the Dutch and the Spanish as fellow competitors for trade with China did so in the early 17th century, and the Dutch would drive the Spanish out in 1643, only to be driven out in turn by the fleeing Ming loyalists from China in 1662 that I articulated aforehand. The Ming loyalists in turn surrendered their part of the island to the Qing troops in 1683. And a period of relative stability followed, despite periodic uprisings and revolutions and the impact on trade from the Opium Wars in China. 200 years later, Japan entered the picture. It gained Taiwan in the Treaty of Shimonoseki, circa 1895, and set about making it a colony. And later, as the Japanese Empire expanded in World War II, the Japanese on Timor fought and defeated the joint forces of allies and Timorese. And in 1942, Japan ruled all of Timor, as well as Taiwan, and um, simply retreated from both territories years later with the conclusion of the Second World War in Japanese victory. In the aftermath of war, Portugal regained its colony of Portuguese Timor, whilst Indonesia, in 1945, declared itself independent and would soon control the former Dust, well, Dutch East Indian colonies.
were conquered by the Islamic expansionist state of Indonesia. Taiwan, on the other hand, entered its current limbo stage, created by the 1952 San Francisco Peace Treaty, being the main unfinished business of World War II. And uh, such it was declared, where the Americans said, it's a renegade territory. The Japanese said, hey, we can always return, and China claims it as a renegade province. Portugal would rule Portuguese Timor until November 1975, when it abandoned its colony. At that point, the people of East Timor declared independence only to be overrun and occupied by Islamist Indonesian forces. The people of East Timor had a week of independence. The Republic of Formosa in 1895 had fared little better when it existed for about six months after the Treaty of Shimonoseki, resistance lasting longer than five, actually, now that I remember. Half a year. In the 20th century, the United States, well, the American Empire, caused problems for both Taiwan and East Timor. Henry Kissinger, United States National Security Advisor under then-American President Richard Mulhouse Nixon, and later Secretary of State under then-President Gerald Ford, was, he was ready to sell out both. In 1975, the United States gave Indonesia assurances that it would not interfere, thus allowing Indonesian troops to pour into East Timor to make it an Indonesian province. East Timor's subsequent suppression by Indonesia would rage on until the Dili Massacre. That massacre of 1991 brought numerous surrounding nations in support of East Timorese. After decades of suffering, a United Nations sponsored referendum in 1999 allowed the East Timorese the right to choose their own government and they chose independence. Taiwan, on the other hand, after its own lengthy struggles under martial law, under necessity of conditions of war, because Taiwan is still legally at war with communist China, managed to successfully work out a peaceful transition from a one-party state to a full-fledged democracy, yet it still dwells in a limbo of unfinished World War II business. If the people of East Timor can have independence, why not the people of de facto independent Taiwan? On its side, Taiwan still has other issues to resolve. It must face how its nomenclature and its outdated constitution prevent it from joining the United Nations. The public must realize that the followers of Chiang Kai-shek were expelled from the United Nations in 1971, and not the Taiwanese people themselves, or at least that's how they can rationalize it for a presentation for representation at the United Nations. It is an ongoing conundrum, which points again to how the world needs a better way to handle the self-determination of all peoples, and move toward a global home paradigm where the entire planet is respected, and all peoples are treated equally as family members. For Taiwan, if the citizens of the small island of East Timor, with far less resources, could pull it off, certainly the Taiwanese can do it too. They have to find out who their loyal allies be and supporters of their democracy. However, outside factors are helping. The problems brought on the world by COVID-19 continue to demonstrate which nations are responsible players and which ones are not. If the World Health Organization's mission is to ensure the highest level of health for all, then no country should be excluded from this goal. And Taiwan's coronavirus protocol show us how it be done. The threat of emerging infectious diseases to global health and the economy trade and tourism has never abated. Pandemics can spread rapidly around the world because of the ease of international transportation. Among the most salient examples are the Spanish influenza of 1918, uh, the so-called, 
The American Army and Navy flu of 1918 through 1919, really. And the severe acute respiratory syndrome, our SARS outbreak of 2003, and the H1N1 influenza of 2009, hemogluten 1, neuromodase 1, the original avian swine flu, the fucking American Army and Navy so-called Spanish fucking flu, that came back in 2009 because they dug up cadavers preserving the virus just to see if they could fucking do it to see if the virus was still viable feeling they had it under control with inoculations, which they obviously did, or we'd have another 200 million dead people on our hands. Well, actually, the modern equivalent of it would be 2 billion, the populations of China and India combined, but spread worldwide. That's what could have happened with those motherfuckers digging up H1N1. And, um... You don't know what the fuck is going on in these people's heads. Uh, At any rate, intermittently, serious regional epidemics such as MERS, M-E-R-S of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2012, Ebola in West Africa in 2014, and the Zika virus in Central and South America in 2015 through 2016 have also reared their heads. And today, this novel form of pneumonia that first emerged in Wuhan, Communist China, at the end of 2019 and has since been classified as a coronaviral disease, 2019, COVID-19, has caused a global pandemic. The World Health Organization data shows... Well, oh my God, how many millions of people have been, let me see, COVID-19 worldwide, 19, worldwide. Okay, the world map, which countries have it, map of cases, 72 million, 72.3 million total cases, and 1.61 million deaths as officially admitted. We know the numbers are way beyond that. And this is throughout 211 countries slash areas slash territories. Taiwan, too, has not been spared, but Taiwan had strategy. In the 17 years since it was hit hard by the SARS outbreak, Taiwan has been in a state of constant readiness to the threat of emerging infectious diseases. As a result, when information concerning the novel pneumonia outbreak was first confirmed on December 31st of 2019, Taiwan immediately began implementing onboard quarantine of direct flights from Wuhan that same day. On January 2nd of 2020, Taiwan established a response team for the disease and activated the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center, on January 20th as a Level 3 government entity, upgrading it to Level 2 and Level 1 on January 23rd and February 27th, respectively. The CEC is able to effectively integrate resources from various ministries and invest itself fully in the containment of the epidemic, meaning it's a wartime occupation government, a wartime domestic emergency government that is capable of imposing martial fucking law to keep this disease from doing to Taiwan what it did to anybody else. So, with that level of power, uh, As of April 9th this year, Taiwan had tested a total of 42,315 persons, showing 380 confirmed cases, of which 54 had been indigenous, 326 imported, and 5 deaths. 80 people had been released from the hospital after testing negative. Despite its proximity to China, Taiwan ranked 123, in the best possible sense, dead last among 183 countries in terms of confirmed cases per million people. This proved Taiwan's aggressive efforts to control the epidemic 
were working in the town we need suffered not a single death ever since. And they've been harnessing technology to make it certain that no one dies again. Disease knows no borders. In response to the threat of the COVID-19 epidemic, Taiwan has implemented dynamic plans concerning border quarantine measures, including onboard quarantine, fever screening, health declarations, and a 14-day home quarantine for passengers arriving from nations it has listed under the Level 3 warning. Moreover, Taiwan has established an electronic system for entry quarantine, which allows passengers with a local mobile phone number to fill in health information using a mobile phone. A health declaration pass will then be sent to them as a text message. This is connected to the community care support management system, which allows government agencies to provide care services and medical assistance. The travel history of individuals is now stored on the National Health Insurance Card, the NHI card, to alert physicians to possible cases and prevent community transmission. For those undergoing home quarantine or isolation, the government is working with telecom operators to allow us GPS or geosynchronous uh, satellite positioning systems, tracking of their locations. Quarantine offenders are subject to fines or mandatory placement according to relevant laws and regulations so as to prevent transmission. Taiwan has also increased its laboratory testing capacity, expanded the scope of its surveillance and inspections based on trends of the COVID-19 pandemic, and retested people with higher risk who had already tested negative, including patients with symptoms of severe influenza, community cases with upper respiratory tract infections who were already being monitored, and cluster cases of upper respiratory tract infections to identify suspected cases and perform treatment in isolation wards. And meanwhile, Taiwan has designated half a hundred regional hospitals and medical centers and 167 community hospitals and clinics to create a tiered system for testing. And these hospitals and clinics are required to set up special wards or areas in principle, COVID-19 patients are isolated and treated individually in these wards and areas to prevent uh, nosocomial infections. Moreover, Taiwan has banned the export of surgical masks since January 24th, requisition masks, and expanded domestic mask production to more effectively allocate masks. And on February 6th, Taiwan launched a name-based rationing system for mask purchases at NHI contracted pharmacies and local public health agencies. It added an ordering system for masks on March 12th. This allows people to order online and pick up masks at convenience stores. These measures have helped Taiwan achieve effective allocation of limited resources and meet all healthcare, epidemic prevention, household and industrial needs without anyone being inconvenienced to any extreme. And all of this is part of global linking and beyond a crisis anywhere, readily becomest a problem everywhere. Global health security requires the efforts of every person to ensure an optimal response to public health threats and challenges. Taiwan, although not a member of the World Health Organization, cannot stand alone and must be included in the fight against such threats and challenges. Taiwan has fulfilled its responsibilities as a global citizen and abided by the international health regulations of 2005, uh, the IHR 2005 as uh, issued by the United Nations in notifying the World Health Organization of confirmed COVID-19 cases. And moreover, Taiwan has communicated with other countries such as the Japanese Empire, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, the United States, Canada, Italy, France, Switzerland, United Germany, the United Kingdom, Belgium, and the Netherlands, as well as the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control to share information on confirmed cases, travel, and contact histories of patients, and border control measures. Taiwan has uploaded the genetic sequence of COVID-19 to the GIS Aid Initiative, or the Global Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data. It did this 
months and months ago. Taiwan has worked with global partners to respond to the threat of COVID-19 to ensure that global health is not imperiled by a lack of communication and transparency. If it is indeed the World Health Organization's mission to ensure the highest attainable standard of health for every person, then the WHO needs Taiwan just as Taiwan needs the WHO. Yet Taiwan has forever been excluded from the WHO due to political considerations. This has been regrettable given all that Taiwan could share with the world. Thanks to its renowned public health experience, its health system, the NHI, and ability to perform rapid testing as well as research and manufacture vaccines and drugs against COVID-19. They also, they can certainly share their methods for analyzing the virus. The Taiwanese hope that after this pandemic abates, the WHO will truly understand that infectious diseases know no borders and that no country should be excluded lest it become a major gap in global health security. The World Health Organization should never have neglected the Taiwanese contribution to global health security or the contribution of any nation. So we must all urge the World Health Organization and related parties to acknowledge Taiwan's long-standing contributions to the international community in the areas of public health disease prevention, and the human right to health, and to include Taiwan in the World Health Organization and its meetings, mechanisms, and activities, Taiwan will continue to work with the rest of the world to ensure that all who enjoy the fundamental human right to health, as stipulated in the WHO Constitution, now echoing the mantra of the United Nations' 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, no one should be left behind. And regionally and globally, the lucrative gain of participating in communist China's Belt and Road Initiative is finally being exposed as coming with a high price in terms of body count, which is further exacerbated by excluding Taiwan's potential contributions to the World Health Organization. Rejigging the BRI, or the Belt and Road Initiative, to focus on soft infrastructure projects in the digital and health sectors could help rejuvenate the Communist Chinese initiative in a post-COVID world. I mean, COVID-19 may yet be the nail in the coffin of China's Belt and Road Initiative. In June this year, the Communist Chinese Foreign Ministry announced that about 20% of the projects under its ambitious Belt and Road Initiative have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same press briefing, Wang Xiaolong, Director General at the Foreign Ministry's International Economic Affairs Department, also revealed that a survey by the ministry estimated that some 30 to 40 percent of projects had been somewhat affected, whilst approximately 40 percent of projects were deemed to have seen little adverse impact. Even before COVID-19, the BRI was facing increasing criticism in host countries for its lack of transparency, displacement of local communities, adverse environmental impacts, and fears of debt trap diplomacy, among many other issues. With the pandemic inevitably delaying many of BRI's physical and infrastructure projects, COVID-19 may yet be the death knell. Uh, or at least a turning point for the BRI. According to the American Enterprise Institute's China Global Investment Tracker, the value of both communist Chinese investment and construction fell sharply in 2020 compared to 2019. On the Chinese side, the decline in funding can be attributed to a more cautious approach by Chinese banks towards dispersing unsustainable loans. The restricted movement of labor and goods caused by the border controls imposed by many countries in response to COVID-19 has also inflicted a significant toll, to use a pun, in the construction of the physical infrastructure projects. And while the COVID-19 situation has improved significantly within China itself, 
The situation remains bleak in many of the countries hosting BRI projects from Africa to Southeast Asia. In addition, the global economic sh slowdown brought on by the pandemic has also increased the likelihood of host countries canceling or delaying BRI projects, especially large-scale infrastructure projects. In March, Bangladesh announced the cancellation of a 350 megawatt coal-fired thermal plant project. Many BRI projects have previously been criticized for this lack of transparency, the unfair loan conditions, and the pandemic has worked to deepen many of these worries. They're beyond concerns. More importantly, many host countries are now voicing these concerns and displeasure toward Beijing. Since COVID-19 hit, many governments have approached Beijing to renegotiate the terms of loans for BRI projects. Exemplae Grecia, Pakistan, in April, requested an ease in the repayment terms for over 30 billion United States dollars in loans associated with various power projects under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the CPEC, the CPAC. Undoubtedly, COVID-19 has raised serious questions with regard to the future of Communist Chinese dictator Xi Jinping's grand initiative. Notwithstanding the existing criticisms and mistrust towards Chinese intentions for the BRI, it is unlikely that a BRI focused on physical infrastructure construction and connectivity will be able to return to its former scale and glory, at least within the short and medium term, as Red China grapples with increasing debt defaults and project delays as a result of the pandemic. Nevertheless, COVID-19 need not be the nail in the coffin for the BRI. It could also be an opportunity for Beijing to rethink the strategy and focus of the BRI or order to better meet the needs of a post-COVID-19 world. Because even before the pandemic hit, the Communist Chinese Empire had already begun to expand the BRI beyond physical infrastructure project. In 2015, China launched the Digital Silk Road, focused on the development of information and communications technology, or ICT, infrastructure in BRI markets. But yesteryear, China announced 5G investments in various countries, including Cambodia and Russia, which is kind of like as bottom of the barrel as you can get in either case. And at the first BRI forum in 2017, China, along with participating countries and various international organizations, issued the Beijing Communique of the Belt and Road and Health Cooperation and Health Silk Road. And since then, China has initiated several regional health cooperation projects with its neighbors, including the China ASEAN, or Association of Southeast Asian Nations, Human Resources Training Program of Health Silk Road, which aims to train more than a thousand ASEAN healthcare professionals by 2022. And just as COVID-19 has brought to light the insufficiencies in global healthcare and ICT infrastructure, especially within developing countries, it also provides an opportunity to, for the Communist Chinese Empire to fill these gaps through its Health Silk Road and Digital Silk Road. COVID-19 thus presents both a challenge and opportunity for the BRI in redirecting the BRI to focus on soft infrastructure projects in the digital and health sectors could help rejuvenate interest in the BRI in the coming post-COVID-19 world. And investments in such projects could also provide an opportunity for Red China to expand its soft power and shape its image as a responsible great power, which has taken quite a fucking beating. Mm. However, just as the traditional BRI is susceptible to criticisms and suspicion of other countries, the Health Silk Road and Digital Silk Road are likewise open to criticism as evident from the growing pushback against the communist Chinese telecommunications giant Huawei in many Western countries. 
the trust and confidence of host countries in communist China's push to accelerate the Hell Silk Road and Digital Silk Road will be directly dependent on Red China's ability to avoid mixing geopolitical rivalries with upcoming BRI projects. I mean, right across the strait lies my homeland of Taiwan, where the time has come for all to step back and rectify this unfinished business of the past. The communist Chinese would deem that to be invasion. The Americans may yet go to war because of its renegade territorial status by a United States military occupational government claims. But it's really time to recognize and give Taiwanese their true right of self-determination. And finally, close this chapter of World War II. And certainly, I would say something like takers anyone for anyone who would stand to support that, but of course, it's one of those things where Taiwan's special status also has its advantages. That's what brings us to the painful but necessary next steps in the United States-Taiwanese relationship. Now, we want to be, of course, as realistic as possible here. We're in the last hour of transmission. And I do want to, uh, if possible, conclude this element uh, on the topic. China is, of course, always rattling its saber at Taiwan. And throughout this year, that threat projection has increased. Beijing repeatedly sent fighter jets and bombers across the so-called median line, which has long served to unofficially demarcate Chinese and Taiwanese airspace over the Taiwan Strait. Chinese leaders were ostensibly reacting to United States Under Secretary of State Keith Crack's trip to the Taiwanese capital, a move that Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs held up as a symbol of the growing relationship between Washington and Taipei. Yet, the Communist Chinese Empire's hardline Global Times hinted at an even more unsettling motive. It called the exercise a dress rehearsal that showed the speed with which China could strike Taiwan if it so chose. Now, regardless of the specific message Red Chinese leaders wanted to send, Taipei and Washington will see the move as have seen such, and will see further such moves as yet further indicators that Beijing is considering military action to bring my home island under its control. Indeed, such exercises are but the latest examples of Beijing's increasingly bellicose rhetoric, policies, and actions at home and abroad. Communist Chinese aggression is also propelling a tectonic shift in amero taiwanese relations. As views towards communist China harden across the American political spectrum, prominent commentators are calling for an end to strategic ambiguity. Washington's long-held policy of deterring a war over Taiwan's status by remaining vague about whether it might intervene. The United States government recently announced that it intends to sell Taiwan 7 billion United States dollars in coastal defense missiles, drones, and mines and on top of the nearly 11 billion United States dollars in weapons it sold my home island. But yesterday, United States officials are even considering a potential bilateral trade deal. Meanwhile, United States Navy ships have passed through the Taiwan Strait at least 10 times since January. That was the last time I checked in the middle of this year. Such a reassessment of American policy toward Taiwan is overdue. At the same time, there are better and worse ways to approach the next phase in bilateral relations, especially since many Americans will be skeptical about adding yet another commitment to their country's already imposing portfolio of alliances and defense pacts. American voters will want to know that Taiwan is already doing everything in its power 
to prepare for a potential cross-strait conflict before Washington extends any new security commitments. The United States should make its security guarantee conditional on Taiwan embracing an asymmetric defense posture via the, the Communist Chinese Empire, reinstating universal military conscription and holding bilateral training exercises. This will cover everything from capability to resolve. In recent years, a consensus emerged among military experts that the best way for the Nationalist Republic of China on Taiwan to offset the Communist Chinese Empire's growing military advantages is to heavily invest in asymmetric weapons, such as anti-ship missiles, aero defenses, and drones. They argue us that Taiwan cannot afford to buy enough traditional weapons. Prestige platforms like surface ships and advanced fighter jets to keep up with the Chinese military, though they've already purchased many so-called Coast Guard warships, which will are not any waste of money and um, absolutely necessary. Taiwan has no less than six to seven fleets, as if it were a superpower. However, by using its limited resources to acquire large numbers of relatively inexpensive weapons, Taiwan could make it far more costly for China to project power across the Taiwan Strait and harder for the Communist Chinese Empire to achieve any quick military victory. So, this year's proposed arms deals prove that Taiwan is serious about improving its defensive capability. By buying the sorts of asymmetric weapons included in the package that I know of, ergo coastal defense missiles and mines, instead of flashier high-profile prestige platforms like main battle tanks or MBTs and advanced fighter jets, President Tsai Ing-wen is making it clear that the country is serious about addressing my island's actual security needs and acquiring the right military capabilities to defend against Chinese aggression represents an essential first step. The next step should involve strengthening Taiwanese resolve. After all, even the best weapons in the world will not make a difference if the people are not willing to fight. Unfortunately, recent public opinion surveys suggest that many in Taiwan do not yet take the risk of a war with the Communist Chinese Empire seriously. In early August, a poll commissioned by the Chinese Association for Public Opinion Research found that only 20% of the Taiwanese public even believed a military confrontation over Taiwan status might happen. It also revealed that less than half of those polled would be willing to fight if such a war did happen. The poll also asked respondents whether they thought the United States would send troops to defend the island from attack and how they thought Taiwan should react to a war between China and the United States. Nearly 60% said they had faith that the United States would intervene in a cross-strait conflict, yet a mere 20% indicated that Taiwan should return the favor by fighting alongside the United States in a war against Communist China. In contrast, two-thirds indicated that Taiwan was better off remaining on the sidelines. It is worth pointing out that these sorts of public opinion polls should always be taken with a grain of salt. Minor differences in framing and wording can yield major differences in how those surveyed respond. Moreover, in Taiwan's case, these surveys do not take its place in a vacuum. Rather, they occur under the omnipresent shadow of potential violence. Respondents know communist Chinese officials will pay attention to the results, so they face incentives to strategically misrepresent their true views. 
Nevertheless, some scholars and pundits will invariably overreact by taking all of this to mean that the United States should abandon my Taiwan alongside strategic ambiguity. The fear is that unambiguous support for the island will irrevocably or irrevocably undermine Sino-American relations, whilst risking a war that the United States has little chance of winning. But I disagree. It'd be far from evident that abandoning Taiwan will yield any sudden improvement in Sino-American relations, let alone reduce regional tensions. After all, the Communist Chinese Empire would be far from the first great power in history to respond to accommodation by deciding it wants much more. Instead, via my intervention as your advisor, I conclude American policymakers should look for ways to build Taiwanese resolve and resilience, especially in light of the fact that the Taiwanese public may be both overly confident that the United States can intervene and overly pessimistic about its own ability to fight. Washington can dampen this quixotic optimism, whilst helping to improve Taiwan's faith in its own warfighting abilities by making its security guarantees conditional on continued defense reform, and by playing a more active role in training Taiwanese military forces. Crucially, the United States should take us these steps before it can begin to seriously contemplate abandoning strategic ambiguity. After all, the risk of war increases to the degree that Beijing thinkest it might have a window of opportunity to act whilst Amero-Taiwanese relations be in flux. If Communist Chinese dictator Xi Jinping and his advisors sense that Taiwan's deterrence posture rests on shaky foundations, the United States could easily find itself fighting the very war it hoped to deter. This is all about improving resilience and resolve. The United States can start by ensuring any future security guarantee are predicated on a clear understanding of the painful but necessary reform it expects Taipei to undertake. In particular, the United States should insist that any new commitments to the island will be contingent on Taipei's continued willingness to invest in truly asymmetric capability. Even though this year's proposed arms sale suggests this shift is already underway, defense reforms are always difficult, costly, and controversial. Previously, Taiwanese governments faced public pressure to reduce defense spending, and some senior Taiwanese defense officials oppose the idea of embracing asymmetric weapons and capabilities. By placing conditions on my homeland's commitments. Washington can help elected officials in Taipei undertake politically and financially expensive long-term change by allowing them to credibly claim that their hands are tied. By linking its security commitments to Taiwan's defensive reforms, the American empire can also give its Taiwan the external push it needs to reintroduce two-year or two-year compulsory military service. Doing so would ensure Taiwan can field an active duty force that is large enough to meet its defensive needs, whilst also sending a clear signal to leaders in the Communist Chinese Empire and voters in the American Empire that the Taiwanese people are willing to make us major sacrifices to provide us their own defense. Prior to the year 2000, all Taiwanese men were required to spend two years in the army. The government slowly reduced this obligation as part of an attempt to transition to an all-volunteer force. 
Conscription still technically exists because Taiwan's military has struggled to recruit enough volunteers to join the fucking military. Nevertheless, conscripts now spend only four fucking months in uniform. Even the reduced training is seen as a waste of time in the eyes of many young Taiwanese. Taiwan's active duty units likewise see conscripts as a burden, not a force multiplier. Combat readiness suffers as a result. More appropriate weapons and a fully manned military represent urgent first steps. Yet missiles and men alone can, uh, well, may not convince many Taiwanese voters that the island is ready to stand up to the communist Chinese empire in a conflict. Thus, if and when Washington decides to drop the curtain on strategic ambiguity, the United States military will also need to actively help Taiwan's armed forces prepare for war. At a minimum, American forces should be ready to immediately begin hosting and participating in high-profile bilateral training exercises with their Taiwanese counterparts. The United States Army and Marine Corps can also play an instrumental role helping Taiwan organize a territorial defense force. Such a force would consist of reservists, volunteers, or both, trained and equipped to wage a guerrilla campaign against an invasion force. Several NATO allies, including Estonia, Lithuania, and Poland, have created similar forces to deter Russian aggression. Organizing a territorial defense force in and around the neighborhoods it will exist to defend and letting it train alongside combat-tested United States Army and Marine units can help enhance resolve and resilience across all Taiwanese society. After all, highly visible demanding and realistic training will make us the Taiwanese military more combat capable whilst demonstrating the same to the Taiwanese people. Deterrence and defense are enhanced to the degree Taiwanese families believe us they are sending their sons and daughters to fight for a winning cause, not die for a hopeless one. High profile bilateral military exercises also yield two additional benefits. First, they will help make us America's security commitments to Taiwan more credible. Indeed, United States training units can serve as a de facto tripwire, especially if they maintain a constant rotational presence on the island. Second, a robust training effort will help reassure Taiwan that the United States is serious about its newly clarified security commitments to my island. Although it is always important to reassure allies you can and will come as to their defense. It is doubly important in Taiwan's case. After all, even if Taiwan embraces an asymmetric defense posture, its geographic location and sheer size means it can hold for only so long in the absence of an intervention by the American Empire and potentially other partners. Beijing will undoubtedly take its umbrage at any increase in Amero-Taiwanese military cooperation. This inevitable reaction makes it all the more imperative and urgent that American and Taiwanese policymakers begin as taking these steps whilst Red China's military still faces major gaps and obstacles that would prevent it from undertaking an invasion. So what comes next? My suggestions are undoubtedly provocative. They should be. The American Empire's ambiguous posture toward defending Taiwan is decades old, and embracing uh, my recommendations would upset the status quo. However, strategic clarity cuts both ways, and neither American policymakers nor Taiwanese voters can afford to delude themselves into acting like the Communist Chinese Empire is a paper tiger that will fold at the first sign of resistance. Deterrence is costly and talk is cheap. If Washington truly believes that it is in America's national interest to deter the Communist Chinese Empire from attacking my true homeland and heartland of Taiwan, Washington should also be willing to pay the price and assume the risks associated with credibly enhancing Taiwan's deterrence posture. Armed sales are only the first step towards this end. The next steps, implementing defense reforms, reinstating military conscription, and holding bilateral training exercises will be harder.
Amero-Taiwanese relations are changing, but change takes time. Time, unfortunately, is not necessarily something Taiwan has in abundance. Therefore, as policymakers on both sides of the relationship contemplate what comes next, they should be clear about what it will take and how long it will take to prepare the Taiwanese military and her people for war. Peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait could very well depend upon it. Now even educators who daren't assign this episode in their courses should find a state useful background on topics such as world historiography, the characteristics and limits of early European colonialism in Asia, maritime trade and travel in East Asia, and the history of the Dutch Empire in the 17th century. In world history texts, the Dutch Empire tends to be lost between the Spanish and Portuguese conquests and the rise of the British Empire. Aside for a course, tonight's episode alone would provide us the basis for fruitful discussions of several important themes or topics. My basic exposition should generate plenty of discussion and my narrative presents enough evidence to test my thesis. Now, checking into... Holy shit! I'm told that I'm currently signed out of studio. How the fuck did that happen? Now, is anybody hearing me? Uh, it says unable to connect to chat. Holy shit. I'm going to uh going to stop streaming now since we apparently are Let me see. 20 watching now. Can anybody hear me? Holy shit. Fuck, I got signed out of YouTube. Oh, let's see. Uh, somebody's comment. Maybe she's saying she can't hear me. It says, wow. Uh, 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 what? Oh, okay. Hey, can anybody hear me? Holy shit. This is alarming. And, uh... How long was this like this? Oh god. Okay, well, uh, it says, oops, YouTube. Fuck! Well, hopefully my channel hasn't been shut down. We'll find out the hard way, won't we? Fuck if I've signed out of YouTube. Oh, I guess I'm signed out of my own uh, channel, or, or am I signed out? Of, fuck, I'm signed out of all YouTube. Holy shit! <laughs> Holy shit! Well, that's awful. So, I need to know if anybody can hear me, or if anybody's been able to hear me. And uh, I'll just wait for our man uh, to come back and fuck, we'll take it from there. Which is basically where we'll sign out. <sighs> oh, that's disturbing. Okay, George Knight says, I can still hear you, Douglas, on YouTube. Oh, you're fucking kidding me. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God. The gods of my ancestors. That's incredible. Okay. Hey, I'm, I'm signed out of my YouTube studio. Somebody signed me out. Uh, Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding. Uh, yet they say they can still hear me on YouTube. Well, now that you're back, I'll just like uh, do a kind of, uh, you know, uh, tell everybody to make their donations at the uh, GoFundMe. And I uh, guess I'll uh, dredge that up and... Uh, uh, tell everybody where to go. Uh, it, it's definitely frightening when something like that happens. It's it's bizarre. Hopefully, it's just a mistake or 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 something. But I can't get anywhere in YouTube. Uh, it says server encountered an error. Please try again later. So maybe I'm out of Google and in YouTube is part of Google. So I might be 
Oh, uh, I have a I have a screen that says something went wrong. Okay, so 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 it shows not... like a monkey. Yeah, yeah, a... yeah. It, it, you're getting that too, then. What the hell is going on here? Okay, so so I'm not alone. Would well, that's good? That's good because if you're getting it, that means it's something in the system. It's systemic, right? Yeah. Right. I think they're being hacked. <laughs> YouTube, you mean? Yeah, YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Well, how am I going to cruise for porn? Well, I don't cruise for porn on YouTube, but I need to be able to use <laughs> Google. I mean, seriously, I, after I'm done, I usually fucking relax. How the hell can I do that tonight? Oh, my God. Uh, it, it, life is hard. It's full of challenges. It, it, it's, yeah. it's like, um, anyhow. Um, so people are still hearing me. Thank God. Thank you so much, George Knight. Love you. Um, like I said, try to contact uh, Brian William Hall. Uh, let me see if I got anything uh, in response from him, like on uh, the mail. I can't um, see how much longer I've got. He says I signed myself out of admin on. It signed myself out of admin on YouTube, your YouTube channel. Okay, so George Knight was. I didn't even know George Knight was admin on my YouTube channel. <laughs> Just, I can't even connect to the stream. I can't connect to anything on YouTube. No, darn. Okay, um, holy shit. How about um, Google? Can you use Google? So, um, all right, so it's affecting people in England, so this must be systemic. God bless you, George Knight. Thank you for keeping us up to date on that. Um, and, uh, all right. It, well, I guess what we'll do is we'll just give a plug for the uh, GoFundMe. Let's do that um, and um, see if I can uh, call up uh, Facebook. Um, let's see if that even works. And uh, just go over there to the GoFundMe. I shouldn't have signed out of the uh, studio because I could actually see it at the time, even though I was signed out of it. Oh, oh, hell. Uh, Selena Khan put my stuff up as a story. That's cool. And I got a memory on Facebook. Okay, I might be able to share this. So Facebook seems to be working all right, which means the Google is working. Okay. And it's just YouTube. It, it's 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 youtube some other parts of google. oh hell what did she do that's 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 spectacular um and, and um all right so let's see and that sweet warlock Rivas gonzalez is you know back doing his thing you know, have fun kicking him around <laughs> uh other than that uh it's probably beneath your dignity to get your boots dirty uh kicking him around uh, all right. Yeah, I, I just don't have the time for it anymore. Yeah. I spend most of my time outdoors. I, I just can't stand being, like, cooped up, you know? I don't blame you. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. And uh, so let me see if I can find my um, GoFundMe and remind me. George Knight says, beg your pardon, it still got me signed in, but it won't allow me to comment of live stream on live stream there we are i can still hear you down on youtube and uh, it's signed myself out on your channel i uh, beg your pardon it's still got me signed in but won't allow me to comment on live stream so uh how much how much time do we have left can you give me the amount of time we've got left uh anybody george knight or uh it's seven thirteen a.m over here at eastern time no i mean like uh we've been on for 12 hours we're, cl we're getting close we're getting close to 12 hours so let me know how, how many hours we've been on. That That's usually on the live stream, which I was stupid enough to click out of once I saw that, oh, you signed out. It was like, you know, pretty freaky. So didn't like looking at that. So um, just everybody remember, I've got to go fund me. And this is to try and get new computer equipment because my equipment is old and sucks ass. And uh, we're trying to uh, get new equipment so that we can, uh, you know, um, take care of that. And this is via the GoFundMe uh, that's titled Urgent Contribution Professional Studio Supplies is the subtitle. And uh, so that everybody understands what's going on, uh, we've got to, um, I'm, uh, well, I'm impacted by mechanical and psychological injuries that be catastrophically chronic in nature and enrolled uh, Therefore, in the 250% working disabled program, wherein disabled individuals are required by law to work so long as our income is maintained at less than 250% above the federal poverty level, 
and we thereby become el eligible uh, by paying our monthly premiums uh, to Medi-Cal and uh, this enables me to receive the constant medical care I conditionally require to functionally survive. Given the details on this before, and we'll happily do so again, I don't know how much time we got left, so uh, to continue my work by which to literally maintain my very life, I must establish a professional grade in home studio with the latest equipment to meet technological quality standards that will be adaptable to emergent systems technologies as they come as online. So uh, my love unto all who have helped, and uh, you know my best unto um, everyone uh, tonight. And um, God bless you, George Knight. Uh, Dark Tally is asleep. Hope his dreams are pleasant. And uh, my best to everyone who joined us tonight: Selena Khan, Peter Moon, uh, Paco Morales, and of course all our listeners. The wonderful. Uh, uh, you know, Spartan no negative and uh, so many others who have been there. I wish I could have said more of a hello to them, and hopefully we'll do so with our next transmission. Hopefully there will be a next transmission <laughs> based on what's going on with YouTube. <laughs> and um, uh, love you dearly, Jameson. Um, you have a blessed night as well. I'm going to stop streaming in a second, and uh, let's uh, do just that. And uh, George Knight, my blessings to you. I'll check out whether or not Brian William Hall left me a message. And like I said, he wasn't responding when I was calling the other night, but I was calling him pretty late because my schedule's odd as hell, and uh, I'll keep trying. We're, we're going to make this happen. And um, all right, then. I love you all and uh, all those who support me. And for now, all I can say is join us on Wednesday night, which is very a very short time from now.